Kibaratsa. The Hernandezes tried to speak to Judge Soper about the case, but she refused to hear them. Gallegos requested an adjournment so he could familiarize himself with the case before entering any pleas. Richard stood behind him on the other side of a chest-high wire mesh and glass partition, his huge hands handcuffed to a chain belt around his waist. He made eye contact with Ruth, and with his steely black eyes and a nod, noted some of the women who'd come to catch sight of him. It was like seeing a dangerous animal in an exotic zoo. Richard glared at Phil Halpin, the reporters and the judge. He was no longer shy about showing his face. Now he stood erect, shoulders back, defiant, arrogant, like a star matador. He was very good copy. No one was interested in a meek, apologetic killer. After Richard was removed from the courtroom, Arturo Hernandez again tried to address the court, but Judge Soper said he had no standing in her court and wouldn't listen to him. Both the Hernandezes and Ruth spoke to the press afterward. Arturo said he, Daniel, Ruth, and Manny Barazza were going to the jail to speak to Richard again, and that they ultimately would defend him. The defense never rests, he said. Isn't it a shame when you have to fight to defend your client? We were retained by the family. Ruth said, We have confidence in Daniel and Arturo because of their track record. Egos too, gave interviews after court. I'm representing Ramirez, he said. From the court, Egos went to the jail and discussed strategy with Richard. Because he was with Richard, Ruth, Barazza, and the Hernandezes couldn't get into the jail that day. It didn't take long for the press to learn about Gallegos' prior problem with the law. Both the Times and the News did detailed front-page pieces on his arrest and trial for assault with intent to commit murder, and the subsequent reduction in charges by the judge, which led to the guilty verdict being put aside. Ruth stayed in Los Angeles that evening, and, armed with articles in the Times and News, she went back to the jail Thursday morning with Arturo, Daniel, and Barazza, showed Richard the articles, and read him the details. He realized that Gallegos's credibility had disappeared with the publication of his run-in with the prostitute. No judge will respect this guy, Ruth said, and the Hernandezes agreed. Like Gallegos, they said, they would work on the case with no money up front in exchange for the book and movie rights sales for payment. They insisted Richard fight the case and go to trial. I haven't seen anything substantially connecting you to the crimes, Daniel said. Artur agreed. It's all circumstantial. We can win this case. I agree with them, Barazza added. You really think you can win? Richard asked. We will win, Daniel told him. I believe in them, Ruth said. But the thing is, I don't want my mother and father having to go through a whole long trial and everything like that where all their lies will come out. Ruth said, Don't worry about that, Richie. If you are innocent, you've got to fight them. Otherwise, they'll kill you. You think if I plead guilty, they'll give me the death sentence? I'd be surprised if they didn't with all the press this has gotten. It's political. But we can try to work out a deal, Arturo said, if that's what you want. There was a long pause. Richard had a lot to think about. And you have the time and everything to go to trial, he asked. Yes, we'll make the time. This case will have our top priority, Daniel said. You can't ask for better than that, Barazza put in. Okay, Richard said. I want you guys to represent me. You've got a deal. Ruth smiled. They all shook hands. Ruth truly felt the Hernandezes would do the right thing by her brother. As they left the jail, they were again stopped by reporters. Ruth said Richard had changed his mind about Gallegos, now that he knew everything regarding his background. There's no way he wants a lawyer with a felony arrest representing him, she said. When Joseph Gallegos was contacted and asked if he was still representing Ramirez, he said, When I left him Wednesday morning, he was in very high spirits. He was very happy I had been allowed in. Asked if he had told Richard about his criminal record, he said, yes, certainly, everything. And he said none of that mattered. Monday, I'm putting in a motion to get copies of all police investigative records in the case. 31. The Ramirez family decided to show a united front for Richard and their support for Arturo and Daniel. Mercedes, Robert, and Ruth flew to Los Angeles on Sunday, October 21st. Mercedes wore all black, as if she were in mourning, with large, dark sunglasses on her face and a black veil on her head. Since August 31st, she seemed to have aged twenty years. The lines on her face were deeper and more pronounced. She walked slowly, with obvious strain. It seemed the weight of what had happened, a world of tragedy, had come to rest on her thin shoulders, bending her over and pushing her down. 
When she saw Richard, her heart rolled over at the sight of her last-born in jail, charged with the most terrible crime she had ever heard of. No matter what, Mercedes knew they were wrong. Her son, her Richie, who used to love to dance to the radio, could never have done the things they were saying. She felt that the drugs and Satan had caused it all and were at the heart of this nightmare. People looked at her, stared, pointed, and whispered. Richard told his mother, over the black jail phone, looking at her through thick, dirty glass, that he did not do the things he was charged with. He'd been framed. They needed someone, and they chose me. No matter what, Mercedes told her son, she believed in him and supported him. She also told him he must fight the charges, that the Hernandezes would fight hard for him, and he should not give up. She would pray for him. You cannot just roll over and give up and let them take your life. The next order of business for the Hernandezes was to get Judge Soper to appoint them as Richard's counsel. When they appeared in court on Monday, the press was there in full force, as were Mercedes, Ruth, Robert, and Reuben. Mercedes kept her face covered by the black veil and sunglasses. At a sidebar, Judge Soper explained patiently and slowly why she didn't want to allow the Hernandezes to represent Richard Ramirez, citing contempt charges from previous cases, which both Hernandezes protested saying the contempts weren't their fault, they were unwarranted and unfair. The judge's real objection was their very obvious lack of experience in capital crime cases. There were grave consequences at stake, she said. No matter what, Richard insisted he wanted the Hernandezes. Halpin also felt the Hernandezes weren't qualified to handle such a complex, heavy case. Judge Soper pointed out that the state could not pay the Hernandezes because they didn't meet the state's minimum criteria for a capital crimes case. The Bar Association recommended that such lawyers have ten years' experience as attorney of record in fifty trials, forty of them involving felony charges, and thirty of the forty felony charges had to have been completed before a jury. The Hernandezes countered by saying it was California law to allow a defendant the counsel of his choice. They were licensed to practice law in California, were members of the bar in good standing, and were going to represent Richard Ramirez. She asked the Hernandezes how they expected to be paid, and that Richard was indigent. They said they'd drawn up an agreement in which Richard would give them the rights to any film or book deal. She said she would have to review it and would appoint private lawyer Victor E. Chavez to read it and see if it was legal or went against the laws preventing criminals from benefiting from their crimes. The Hernandezes said the agreement had been drawn up in El Paso, where there were no laws preventing assigning book and movie rights to lawyers for payment. Gallego said he had no problem withdrawing from the case. The Hernandezes would cause Phil Halpin problems. He knew their representing Ramirez would slow the legal process down to a painful crawl and make an already exceedingly difficult case even more difficult. Their lack of experience would inevitably be a burden on his shoulders. I want these lawyers, Richard growled, very annoyed, opening and closing his hands as if they were claws making the guards weary. Ultimately, Judge Soper decided to put it all on the record and move the arguments to open court. As Richard was brought to the bar, he seemed like a man possessed. He moved from his left foot to his right and glared at Halpin with fire in his eyes. Mercedes prayed that he would calm down, but he didn't. Judge Soper began by saying the defendant wanted to change attorneys again, after she had just allowed a change of counsel not two weeks before. She went immediately to the heart of the problem, saying the Hernandezes didn't have enough experience and that they'd been held in contempt of court in Santa Clara County. Arturo Hernandez jumped up and objected, saying the judge had no right making public these alleged contempt charges. Richard, staring at the judge, shouted, I want these lawyers, startling everyone in court. Phil Halpin stood and suggested Ramirez confer some more with Gallegos. I don't want to confer with him, Richard said to Halpin venomously. I want these attorneys. Arturo Hernandez continued to register his dismay at the judges making public the Santa Clara contempt charges. Halpin interrupted him and said that he, in fact, had no right to speak to the judge on the record because they had not yet been appointed and had no standing. They do to me, Richard called out. Mercedes prayed that he would calm down, but she knew he wouldn't. Like his father and all his brothers, like his cousin Mike, he had a wicked temper. It was a family trait she had never really given much thought to. She'd just accepted it, like the color of their eyes or hair. She knew there were television cameras on him now, and she wished to heaven he would just sit down and not present such an angry face to the world. 
He was, God knew, already in enough trouble. Instead of being calmed by his family's presence, Ramirez seemed to be spurred on to be more defiant and angry. The reporters looked on wide-eyed, shocked and pleased by Richard's fury. He was the personification of defiance, obviously very dangerous, and didn't care, apparently. Who knew it? Richard glared at the reporters as Judge Soper and Arturo Hernandez argued about the contempt charges. The judge ended by saying she was appointing a private lawyer to review the assignment agreement between Richard and the Hernandezes, and she would render her decision on changing counsel on Thursday, the 24th. As Mercedes would not talk with them, the reporters took off to file their stories. The Ramirez family went to the jail after court. When their turn came and Richard's name was announced over the loudspeaker, all eyes followed Mercedes, trying to see some sign of how she could have spawned a child such as Richard Ramirez. With dignity and poise, she ignored the stares, the silence, the pointing. Why, she asked Richard, did he have to act like that when the whole world was watching? What were people to think? Richard said he didn't care what people thought, that Judge Soper had no right not appointing the Hernandezes as his lawyers. It was supposed to be a free country, and he had the absolute right to have the lawyer he wanted. Mercedes said she understood, but he mustn't act so aggressive, so hostile. Ruth agreed with her mother, telling Richard that scaring people only made everyone think he really was a killer. They already think I'm a killer no matter what I do, so fuck them, he replied. Ruth couldn't calm Richard down, and when the sheriff's deputies took him back to his cell, he was still cursing Halpin and Judge Soper. Outside, as Mercedes and Ruth left the jail, they saw a group of young women, all wearing black, milling about the entrance. One of them carried a sign that read, I love Richard. Mercedes looked at them incredulously, wondering what the world had come to. To malevolent occultists all over Los Angeles, Richard was a hero, someone who openly stood up and embraced the dictates of Satan and didn't care who knew it. Zena LeVay, Anton's daughter, went to the jail to visit Richard. She wore a long, skin-tight black dress over her intense hourglass figure and had bright blood-red lipstick on her full lips and long fingernails. She was with her then-boyfriend, a tall blonde named Nicholas Schreck, who had cut off his left ear as a token of his devotion to Satan. Nicholas also wore all black and sported an ankle-length black leather coat. Zena told Richard that her father and the church sent their blessings and were praying to Satan for him. They were making him an honorary member of the church. That made Richard's spirits soar. He held LaVey in high esteem, and Zena's visit made him feel the forces of darkness were being marshaled behind him. Thursday morning, October 24th, 8 a.m., Richard was shackled, taken out of his cell, and driven in a sheriff's van to the courthouse, where the press were lined up hoping to get some kind of outburst from him. Quietly, he hobbled out of the van to a holding pen behind Judge Soper's courtroom. Mercedes was too weak and distressed to go to court, and only Ruth, Robert, and Reuben took up seats at the back of the courtroom, not talking, sitting up straight as if they'd been called to the principal's office. In the holding pen, the guards noticed Richard was laughing to himself, walking back and forth, hyperkinetic, his chains rattling. His jailers wondered if he was trying to lay the groundwork for an insanity defense. They knew he was smart and wily, otherwise he'd have gotten caught much sooner. At the defense table sat the Hernandezes and Joseph Gallegos. At the prosecutor's table was Phil Halpin, with the very visible presence of Carrillo and Salerno sitting in the first row behind him. The bailiff silenced the packed courtroom. About a dozen women who had become known as Richard's groupies, disgusting but not surprising Salerno and Carrillo, waited anxiously for Richard, the object of their dreams and sexual fantasies. The bailiff carefully watched all these women. After all, this was the same courthouse where Charlie Manson's women created an uproar. The bailiffs knew only too well the terrible things such women were capable of doing at the bequest of such a charismatic manipulator. Richard's eyes searched the spectators, quickly identifying his supporters, detractors, and family. He smiled at his siblings, then scowled and sneered at the press, and still he laughed to himself. He stood to the right of the Hernandezes, facing Phil Halpin. Judge Soper, her eyes on Richard and his attorneys, told the packed courtroom that she'd given a lot of thought to letting the Hernandezes become Richard's counsel. She was concerned that a contract assigning book and movie rights to the Hernandezes in lieu of payment would violate Richard's rights, for a story that ended in acquittal would be less valuable than one that ended with a guilty verdict. 
but the defendant, she pointed out, had refused to see lawyer Victor Chavez, whom she had sent to the jail to explain to Richard his rights after he'd reviewed the contract. Nevertheless, she said, the assignment was legal under California law, and the defendant, according to the Constitution, could choose his own counsel. Judge Soper had decided to reverse herself and allow the Hernandezes to represent Richard. The Hernandezes smiled at one another and shook hands. Halpin shook his head in utter disbelief and disgust. Richard decided to play a card he'd had up his sleeve all morning, and he raised his large hand high, his face filled with defiance and malicious intent. He showed the spectators the perfect pentagram he had inked on his palm. Under it was the number 666, the Book of Revelation's number of the beast, that is, Satan. No, Richie, no, Ruth thought, looking at Robert and Reuben, as the press and spectators were suddenly in an uproar. Judge Soper banged the gavel and demanded silence. She hadn't seen the pentagram and couldn't imagine what the court was reacting to. When she saw it, she understood. To see Ramirez, the dreaded night stalker, standing there insolently with a blasphemous mark on his hand, was very sobering. It took a few minutes for the court to calm down. Richard smiled at his family, proud of himself. The Hernandezes asked to be allowed to read the charges before Richard entered a plea. The judge called for a short adjournment to give Daniel and Arturo the opportunity to go over the particulars of the complaint. As Richard was led back to the holding pen, he shouted, Hail Satan! again throwing the court into a tizzy. The Hernandezes said they hadn't heard it, but the court stenographer heard him clearly, and she put it in the record, Hail Satan! If anyone had had any doubts about Ramirez's guilt, they didn't now. It had been widely reported that pentagrams were found on Mabel Bell's inner thigh, on Nettie Lang's bedroom wall, and on the bathroom door at the Pan residence in San Francisco, and now one was inside Richard's hand, with diabolic defiance on his face. As the Hernandezes read the complaint, Richard paced in the holding cage, laughing. Cameras had been on him when he'd held up the pentagram, and the image had been beamed to televisions all over the country, making people move uncomfortably in their seats and in their sleep that night. The Hernandezes conferred with Richard after reading the complaint and told him they could win the case. The lineup had been unfair, as had all the suggestive statements. They felt confident they could get the contents of the luggage at the bus terminal thrown out, because the luggage had been gotten illegally. Richard had told the Hernandezes that he had never told any cops about the luggage in any voluntary statement. They had found the ticket in his wallet and had just taken it. The Hernandezes convinced him they really could win, and he decided to plead not guilty. They begged Richard not to make any more outbursts and not to show the press the pentagram. That kind of behavior could only hurt him in the end. Laughing, he said he would behave. The Hernandezes told the bailiffs they were ready, and court reconvened. As Richard was led back to the dock, all eyes were on him. He was smirking, but he kept his left hand to his side and winked at some of his followers. I don't know what he's got to laugh about, Carrillo told Salerno. Judge Soper took her place at the bench and asked the Hernandezes if the defendant was ready to enter a plea. They said he was. Richard was ordered to stand and tell the court how he pled, which he did, saying in a loud voice, Not guilty. Again the courtroom erupted, and Judge Soper had to bang her gavel and demand order. Ruth's heart soared. For weeks she'd been fighting Richard not to plead guilty. She had worried herself into a thin, nervous wreck. But finally her work and effort had paid off. She was so happy she cried. She knew if her brother pled guilty the state of California would surely kill him. Phil Halpin had said publicly he'd seek the death penalty. The thought of her baby brother being put to death totally unsettled Ruth. She knew him as kind, gentle, giving, and caring, not the monster the Los Angeles press, the mayor, and everyone else said he was. Judge Soper set Friday, December 13th, for the preliminary hearing to determine if there was enough evidence for the case to proceed to trial in front of Judge James Nelson. She warned everyone involved in the case not to make statements to the press. The gag order was still in place, and this admonishment, she emphasized, was also directed to the Ramirez family. The judge had read Ruth and Reuben's comments in the press and was distressed by their loose tongues. Phil Halpin did not like the idea of the two inexperienced attorneys being his adversaries. He knew they were in way over their heads, which would inevitably slow down the whole process, but he remained resolute in convicting Ramirez and packing him off to San Quentin. Richard felt that he had changed the judge's mind with the help of Satan. 
He believed Satan was as real as the American flag in the courtroom, and that in the end Satan would protect him from all his enemies. When it was reported in El Paso that Richard would be represented by Arturo and Daniel Hernandez, Julian felt his son would now at least have a fair chance, and that was all he could hope for. As always, Julian had arranged for one of his sons to have a lawyer, but never before for the kind of trouble his last-born had brought to the Ramirez's doorstep. The change in Julian was readily apparent. He seemed to grow older and shorter under the stress of Richard's arrest. He was appalled and horrified at the things the newspapers were saying his son had done. Julian continued to go to work every day. Staying home and sitting around only made things worse. When he worked, he was distracted. He was still laying track and was as strong as a Cape buffalo. At the Santa Fe Railroad, everyone knew one another, and Julian could feel their eyes on him. He knew for as long as he lived, people would point at him and say, There goes the father of the Night Stalker, and little by little it began to kill him, sap the life force from him. He seemed to begin to actually shrink. Doreen was sick and tired of how unfairly Richard had been treated. She wrote a letter, the first of many, to the L.A. Daily News in mid-October, which they published, outlining her grievances. What Heroes! A Daily News story on October 6th reported that the captors of Night Stalker suspect Richard Ramirez, Manuel and Angela de la Torre, are tired of the fuss. That makes three of us. The feigned modesty of the so-called heroes of Hubbard Street is equally tiresome. Heroes, indeed. According to one hero, Jamie Burgoyne, the heroic Manuel de la Torre, explained upon Richard's capture, Get my gun! Get my gun! I'll waste him right here! What makes de la Torre's brand of violence heroic, while Ramirez's alleged violence is considered satanic? If the man they chased and beat brutally had been an ordinary intruder and not the Night Stalker suspect, the so-called heroes of Hubbard Street might just as easily have been hauled away for assault and battery. The de la Torres have been lavished with praise, awards from the mayor, and scholarships to study English. While they and their neighbors dive for reward money, it must be remembered that Ramirez has yet to be convicted of any crimes. While the minor players in this game may have had something to gain, Ramirez has lost something, his right to justice and a fair trial. Doreen Lloyd, Burbank. She decided not to use her real last name. 32. By the time the preliminary hearing finally took place, it was Monday, March 3, 1986. There was a great deal of friction between Halpin and the Hernandezes. A preliminary hearing is held to determine if there is enough evidence to proceed to trial. Halpin was planning to put 140 witnesses on the stand. He would not put his whole case on display, just enough for Judge James M. Nelson to hold Ramirez over for trial. Halpin felt he had enough evidence to convince any jury that Richard Ramirez was the Night Stalker. The Hernandezes felt confident they could get thrown out all the evidence the police had gotten as a result of statements Richard had made during and after his arrest, which would severely hamper the prosecutor's case. They believed the lineup was overly suggestive, to the point of being illegal, for three reasons. The bald spot on Ramirez's head, after it had been widely reported he had sustained a head injury when captured, the witnesses had been allowed to sit next to one another and conversed, and a sheriff's deputy at the lineup had silently held up two fingers, Richard's number, while he was in front of all the witnesses in the viewing room. In a video of the lineup, the detective holding up two fingers, as in a V for victory gesture, could clearly be seen. The Hernandezes complained bitterly to the judge that the prosecutor was very slow in handing over important discovery items, such as fingerprints and police and lab reports, hamstringing their ability to cross-examine. In preparing the case, the Hernandezes had come to respect Richard. He had a keen mind, they felt, as evidenced by the caliber of the insights he offered into his defense. Richard hated the idea of all the crimes he was being accused of, particularly the abduction charges being made public. Then, as now, he adamantly claimed that he never sexually abused any young people and that the police and the prosecutor had conspired to hang abduction and sexual abuse charges on him so they could pollute the L.A. jury pool further, hopefully beyond repair. The Hernandezes planned to ask for a change of venue to Oakland, perhaps. As usual, the courtroom was packed. Richard's groupies took a dozen or so seats in the first row so they could be near him. Ruth had come up from El Paso and sat with Reuben in the last row. Richard was brought out, chained and wearing baggy jail-issue light blue pants and a short-sleeved shirt. 
On the starchy jailhouse diet and with no activity, he'd gained a good twenty pounds. His face was fuller, and he seemed to have aged in the months he'd been incarcerated. For Richard, jail was very difficult. He was a hyperactive person who had always moved around on the outside. Now he was locked in a six-by-eight-foot cell twenty-four hours a day, and he hated every second of it. Richard's eyes sought out his girls. As he spotted them, he'd nod, giving them obvious thrills. His eyes then moved to the reporters and newsmen. He snarled at them and curled his lips, not shy about showing his disdain for them. Trematodes, worms, he mumbled, and sat down at the defense table, long and lanky and very annoyed at being there. Carrillo and Salerno sat in their usual seats, just behind Halpin. The Hernandezes made a motion to move the trial, which was summarily denied. They then told Judge Nelson they were objecting to an audio tape of Richard making incriminating statements to Carrillo and Salerno at the first and only interview at the Hollenbeck jail. Judge Nelson said he'd listened to the tape in a closed session in his chambers. Both sides moved to chambers, annoying the press and spectators. Judge Nelson, a large, scholarly man who wore thick glasses and parted his hair on the left, listened to the tape. There were clearly incriminating statements in it, but the judge said he would reserve decision until such time as Halpin tried to put it into evidence, and the proceedings were moved back to the courtroom. The Hernandezes asked that any evidence found in Richard's Pontiac and the bag at the bus depot be thrown out. Those things, Daniel told the court, were seized illegally because Richard had said he wanted a lawyer, yet still he was questioned. His constitutional rights were seriously violated, he summed up. Judge Nelson reserved decision on that motion, too. The hearing continued with Halpin calling witness after witness, including survivors of the Night Stalker crimes and criminalists. The case against Richard seemed airtight. On all the important decisions, Judge Nelson ruled against the defense. He allowed in the evidence recovered from the bus station and from Richard's car and his sister Ruth's house. While the hearing was still underway, Richard was taken under heavy guard to Orange County, where he signed a speedy trial waiver. He wouldn't be adjudicated on the Carnes attack until the Los Angeles charges were disposed of. When Ramirez was driven back to the L.A. jail, he found scented letters from female admirers and a copy of Justine by the Marquis de Sade, sent to him by Tamara Cruz, a Santa Ana Satanist who had been writing him. Reading had become the only way Richard could escape the reality of his predicament. He had always liked to read, but had never found the time to get intimate with a good writer. Now he had all the time in the world and nothing else to do. With books he could leave his cell and go wherever the story went. In the Marquis de Sade, Richard had found an ally, someone who, he believed, was not hypocritical about sexuality and what he wanted. Society as a whole, Richard was sure, hid the truth. But de Sade told it and didn't care who knew it. Halpin did not want Ruth or Reuben in the courtroom, and he demanded they leave. He said they were going to be witnesses and had no right sitting in on the proceedings. The judge told them to leave. Ruth was very angry about being ejected from the proceedings, as if she had done something wrong. She was sure Halpin was keeping them from appearing in court because he didn't want Richard to have any show of support so people would think the family didn't care, indicating he was guilty. She wanted to go to the press and complain, but she was afraid they'd arrest her. Ruth went back to El Paso and followed the progress of the preliminary hearing in the papers. Her brother was the most infamous person ever to come out of El Paso, and his story was extensively reported. Julian kept reading the Spanish newspapers, and through them he learned the details of what they were accusing his son of doing. So far, he felt, the government hadn't shown anything that truly linked Richard to the crimes. Wednesday, April 16th, was a turning point in the preliminary hearing for many. Reporters who'd been thinking about writing a book on the case decided it was too upsetting a story to be that intensely involved with for months on end. The Hernandezes and Phil Halpin argued over every issue. At one point the judge moved their bickering into his chambers. The Hernandezes complained that Halpin was not presenting the case in the order of the crimes and was therefore making it impossible for them to be properly prepared for cross-examination. Halpin said he was not required by law to present the crimes in the order in which they'd occurred. There were over 150 witnesses scattered all over the country, making it virtually impossible to present all the crimes in their actual chronology. Halpin called Arturo a clown, and Judge Nelson took the case back into open court and on record. Arturo Hernandez demanded Halpin apologize for calling him a clown. Halpin refused. The Hernandezes then asked Judge Nelson to hold Halpin in contempt of court 
for leaving the hearing Tuesday to check on whether or not Ruth and Reuben were talking to the press. The judge refused and warned, Unless you are all very anxious to share the same cell, I would suggest you stop using the court record to cast aspersions on each other. The court was called to order, and 23-year veteran sheriff's deputy Russ Uloth took the stand and testified about the day he was called to the home of Vincent and Maxine Zazara. He told the court how he and his partner had found Vincent Zazara dead on his couch with a bullet hole in the left side of his head. He then described finding 44-year-old Maxine. There was her eyes. There was a lot of blood and disfiguration, and the coroner examined that area, and the eyes were missing. Richard began to laugh, letting out a high-pitched hyena-like cackle. The bailiffs closed in around him. Uloff stopped testifying and glared at Richard. If looks could kill, Richard would have fallen over dead. Richard continued to grin. The bailiff's dislike for him was evident. What kind of monster was he? The silent question hung over the courtroom. Angry-eyed, hard-jawed, Uloth continued at help and surging. There appeared to be numerous scratch marks around her eyes. Her purple pajama top was pulled up and there were deep cuts, like an inverted cross, under her left breast. There were stab wounds in the chest, stomach, and pubic area. Her pajama bottoms had been pulled down. People in the courtroom moved and squirmed in their seats uneasily. None of those details had ever been made public. Richard began to study photographs of Maxine Zazera that had been given to the defense by Halpin as part of discovery, a slight grin still about his face. Could he, legal experts and members of the press wondered, be trying to lay the foundations for an insanity defense? He would have to be crazy to laugh in open court after such brutal descriptions and obviously risk further polluting the Los Angeles jury pool. Russ Uloff described distinct shoe prints found in the flower beds under two windows and on the joint compound can under the small rear window the killer had used for access to the house. He further described the ransacking and the phone disabling that were trademarks of the Night Stalker's work. Under cross-examination by Daniel Hernandez, Uloff admitted that Vincent Zazara's son, Peter, had told him he thought his father had been killed because of mafia ties and drug dealing. Phil Halpin objected, saying the Zazara killings were not a mafia hit. Judge Nelson ruled against Halpin, allowing further cross-examination about Vincent Cesare's alleged underworld ties, which didn't, Uloth summed up, amount to anything but unfounded rumors. Under cross-examination, Sheriff's Homicide Deputy Paul Archambo also admitted hearing rumors about Vincent Cesare. He said, he, Peter Cesare, related to me at that time that his father was involved in mafia operations, that it could possibly come from a drug sale. Under redirect by Halpin, Archambo testified that the sheriff's office had thoroughly checked out what Peter Zazara had said, which, in his opinion, was not true. As the Hernandezes protested, Halpin used this to get Judge Nelson to reverse his ruling regarding Vincent Zazara's mob ties and have it stricken from the record. The next fight between Halpin and the Hernandezes erupted toward the end of the day, when Daniel complained bitterly to Judge Nelson that the sheriff's office, the LAPD, and the prosecutor had not yet given them copies of fingerprint and footprint evidence they had in their possession, which the defense was entitled to by law. Judge Nelson ruled that all fingerprint and footprint evidence be brought to court on Monday the 24th. Halpin complained to Judge Nelson that moving all the fingerprint evidence to the crowded court building could jeopardize and damage it. Judge Nelson was not interested. He said, if we have to, I'll order every jar and bottle and have them put on the table here in court. Halpin was very angered by this ruling. He wasn't going to put any of the fingerprint evidence up until the end of the case for the sake of expediency. He wanted the case to move along as quickly as possible, and with over 600 exhibits and 150 witnesses, that was not an easy task. There was another reason for hurrying to bring the case to trial. A few of the witnesses were close to death as a result of being attacked and others could very well die of natural causes soon. In the hall after court that day, he complained to the press about Judge Nelson's rulings, saying key evidence would be jeopardized in moving the fingerprints to the traffic court's building in downtown Los Angeles. Judge Nelson reversed his ruling on the material being brought to court the next day, but assigned a special master to make sure the defense received the items they were entitled to. The hearing went forward, and Halpin put witness after witness on the stand, who pointed angry, often trembling fingers at Ramirez. Florence Lang was still in a comatose state and couldn't testify. But Maria Hernandez, Carol Kyle, Whitney Bennett, 
Sophie Dickman, Songkit Kovananth, Sakina Abawath, Virginia Peterson, Jesse Perez, and Felipe Solano all did testify, as did scores of technical experts who all inexorably linked Richard Ramirez to the crimes, Halpin said. It was heart-wrenching to watch Somkid Kovananth testify as she cried and sobbed, her shoulders shaking. He just called me bitch, and every bad word. He dragged me by the hair, everywhere he go. He took me. He beat me up and put a gun to my head. He did everything bad to me. When Sakina Abawath's turn came, she was so distraught at the prospect of being in the same room with Richard, her legs were weak and she nearly had to be carried to the stand by bailiffs. Are you enjoying this? Carol Kyle testified he had asked her while he was raping her. Unlike Sakina and Somkid, Carol was composed and matter-of-fact as she testified. When Daniel Hernandez asked Carol why she had engaged the Night Stalker in a twenty-minute conversation, she said she thought if she could make him care about her and her family, they might be allowed to live. She said the last thing she had said to him was, You must have had a very bad life to do this to me. She said he laughed. Hernandez asked her if she had described her attacker as very good-looking, painfully thin, with dark curly hair, who smelled very leathery. She said yes. I was afraid to make him angry, Sophie Dickman testified, and explained how she was eager to turn everything over to him. She described him as tense, but in control of himself and the entire situation. The animosity between Richard and his jailers grew daily to a palpable intensity. The bailiffs heard every witness's testimony, and the terrible details upset them and stayed with them. To then see Ramirez smile and laugh, scoff and swagger, and show no respect to the system, the victims, or them personally, and to see all the women coming to smile at him, stick their chests out, and sit with short skirts and legs slightly ajar for him, made their dislike for Richard a very real, tangible thing. It all came to a head at the end of April. The woman in Tijuana, to whom Jesse Perez had given the gun, was called to testify. As she entered the courtroom and approached the stand, Richard turned around and glared at her. His eyes then moved to Amy Rio, and he smiled. Often during the preliminary, Richard would mouth words to the groupies and try to communicate with them, which was not allowed, and the bailiffs had to warn him a few times every day about communicating with spectators. Twenty-eight-year-old bailiff Stephen de Prima moved closer to Richard and told him to look forward. Richard ignored him and kept smiling at Bernadette and his fans. Apparently de Prima thought Richard was trying to intimidate the witness, and he grabbed Richard by the head and forced him to look forward. Richard stood up and yelled, Get your fucking hands off me! He grabbed de Prima. Two other bailiffs rushed in. De Prima put Richard in a neck lock, and two other bailiffs grabbed him, and as the shocked courtroom and judge looked on, they dragged Richard from the court and into the holding area. Arturo Hernandez looked into a peephole in the door and saw the bailiffs pummeling and unresisting Ramirez. Hey, Arturo yelled, you don't have to hit him anymore. He's not resisting. Why don't you go in there and stop them, Halpin said. The animosity that had been building up between them spilled over, and Arturo took off his jacket and said to Halpin, Come on, me and you. You think you're so tough? Come on, let's go outside. Carrillo and Salerno had to get between Arturo and Halpin. The judge banged his gavel, calling court to order. Some minutes later, when Richard was brought back into the courtroom, he was smiling like a schoolkid who had gotten into a fight with a schoolyard bully. There was a pronounced red welt on his neck. In chambers after court that day, Hernandez complained to Judge Nelson about Bailiff de Prima's excessive aggression. The judge agreed with the Hernandezes, saying there was no reason for the bailiffs to act that way and removed De Prima from working the rest of the hearing. In the hall afterward, Daniel told reporters their client was behaving properly and accused the bailiffs of overreacting. He said, They don't think they are doing their job if they don't rough somebody up. Richard would later say that De Prima had been angry because Bernadette had given him the cold shoulder. Sheriff's Deputy Jim Ellis was called to testify. Ellis had been guarding Ramirez on and off at the county jail, Halpin said when Richard had made certain spontaneous statements to him. He asked Judge Nelson to let Deputy Ellis testify in the judge's chambers because he didn't know if Judge Nelson would ultimately allow the statements in. If Deputy Ellis testified in open court and the judge ruled against allowing the statements in, it could become an appeal issue. Halpin had vowed early on that he would give Richard very little he could use for a possible appeal. Judge Nelson moved the proceedings to chambers. Deputy Ellis was sworn in, and as Richard gave him the evil eye, he stated that when he was guarding Ramirez on the evening of October 10th, 
Ramirez had started talking to him. Ellis testified that he did not encourage or take part in any conversation with Ramirez. Ramirez was angry about the food at the jail. He said it was always cold and filled with drugs that were giving him headaches. Ellis testified Ramirez proceeded to dump the food in the toilet bowl. He stated that he killed 20 people in California, that he was a super criminal, that no one could catch him until he fucked up. He said he left one fingerprint behind, and that's how he got caught. He made the statement that he went to San Francisco and killed Peter Pan. He stated he waited outside by their house by the garage, waited until it was dark. He said he went upstairs, saw two people living there, and the statement he made was, Boom! Boom! I did them in. Then, according to Ellis, Ramirez said he could have killed at least ten police officers and sheriff's deputies, and that the next time no one would get away. I would shoot them in the head, and then they would wriggle and squirm all over the place, and then just stop. Or I'd cut them with a knife and watch their face turn real white. I'd love all that blood. I told one lady one time to give me all her money. She said no. I cut her and pulled her eyes out. I would do someone in and then take a camera and set the timer so I could sit them next to me and take our picture together. Judge Nelson ruled that these statements by Ramirez were admissible because they were voluntary and had been made after Richard had been read his rights and spent many hours with attorneys. However, statements by Richard supposedly made to LAPD on the way to the Hollenbeck station were not allowed because he had not yet been given any Miranda warning. When later on Richard was asked about the episode with Deputy Ellis, he said, That's bullshit. What happened was I was pissed because of the shit they were putting in my food, and I threw it away and yelled and cursed at him. I told him I'd fuck him up. Halpin questioned the second sheriff's deputy, Bob Anderson, in Judge Nelson's chambers, and he said that Richard had recently given him a postcard to mail, which was addressed to his former friend, Earl Gregg, in Lompoc. On it, Ramirez had drawn a scorpion and a pentagram, and he had written a threatening poem to Greg, which Halpin said he wanted the judge to be aware of. "'Cry, baby,' Richard said. When the proceedings were brought back to open court, Halpin told Judge Nelson he had no more witnesses and had presented the people's case. The Hernandez strategy was not to offer any defense at the preliminary hearing. We'll wait for the trial, where guilt has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, whereas with the hearing, the prosecutor only had to show a strong suspicion of guilt. There's no reason to use up all our ammunition at this time, Arturo said. Halpin asked that 18 of the charges be dropped. These included three abduction molestation cases and the robbery of Clara Hadsalt's home because of her recent demise. The families of all three victims in the abduction cases didn't want them to be re-traumatized. Richard would say later that that was the best news he'd heard since he'd been arrested. He hated the idea of being labeled a molester and said it wasn't true. The cops just made it up to get somebody to give me up. Judge Nelson announced he'd found enough incriminating evidence to hold Ramirez over for trial. Because of the multiple murder counts, Ramirez could face the death penalty. The judge read into the record all the counts, 14 murders, 5 attempted murders, 15 burglaries, 5 robberies, 4 rapes, 3 acts of oral copulation, and 4 acts of sodomy. The attacks were on 16 different L.A. households between June 27, 1984, Vinco, and August 8, 1985, the Abawats. While the judge read the counts in a factual, dispassionate way, Richard sat low in his seat and looked forward as all eyes in the courtroom focused on the back of his head. It was all over, and the stage was set for one of the biggest murder trials in American jurisprudence. Judge Nelson set May 21st as the date Richard had to enter a plea on the 50 new felony charges. There were now 58 including the initial charges leveled in September 1985, Richard was taken out of the courtroom, chains rattling, feeling triumphant, feeling that Satan's hand had helped in getting the 18 charges dropped. In the hall, reporters hungry for good quotes gathered around Halpin, Salerno, and Carrillo. Halpin said, It's gone smoothly because there was a lot of preparation. There were a number of investigators who worked on the case for a long period of time, and we were very prepared. I'm satisfied. I felt confident we had enough evidence to hold him over for trial. Frank Salerno, who hadn't said a word to the press throughout the whole preliminary, talked now. When asked how he felt about the long hearing being over, he said, It's just a big relief to get it in the system and get it going, to move on to the next step, which is the one that really counts. Halpin was hopeful the trial would start in the summer, and he would push for it. 
The Hernandezes were also surrounded by the press. When asked how Richard felt about the day's proceeding, Arturo said, He advised me to tell the media he thought there were a lot of politics involved with the position of the judge. He feels we won, and there was a tremendous breakthrough in the case. At this early stage of the proceedings, I think that if you knock off 30% of the charges, you are talking about a significant breakthrough. The molestation charges in particular were bogus. He said they had a slew of pretrial motions to file, the most important of which was to move the trial out of L.A. County. They would, Arturo said, take any ruling against a change of venue to a higher court. In El Paso, the news of Richard being charged with so many more crimes hit like a thunderclap. Led by Mercedes, they had all been regularly praying, going to church every day, lighting candles, beseeching Jesus, Mary, and the saints to help Richie. Mercedes felt that Satan was the root cause of all these problems, and that ultimately the Lord Jesus would prevail. She constantly reminded everyone with an indomitable strength that seemed far beyond her capacity to have faith and to continue to pray. Satan, in the end, she predicted, will lose. After the preliminary hearing, Richard often thought about suicide. If he hadn't been on suicide watch, he would have tried to kill himself. He believed they'd convict him. They were bloodthirsty and hell-bent on killing him. To him, death was preferable to a life behind bars, in a small steel cubicle, being told what to do and when and how to do it. But the sheriff's deputies were always sitting there, looking in on him every fifteen minutes, staring at him like he was a caged human oddity in a zoo, then writing down what they'd observed. Every day Richard received dozens of letters. He chose to answer very few. Some of the letters offered spiritual guidance, others sexual fantasies, others condemnation and scorn, still others high praise and congratulations. One of the women who wrote him the most often and seemed the most interesting was Eva O. She said she admired him for his courage and would love to have sex with him over the bloody bodies of his victims. She told him that she too was a Satanist and thought of evil as a virtue. Evil is, she pointed out, live backward. She said she slept in a coffin and did not go out during daylight hours unless she had to. Little by little, Eva, Richard would later relate, pulled him out of his shell. Even before he'd been arrested, Richard had been a loner who very rarely confided in people or shared intimacies. He felt what was in his heart was his own business, and he had never revealed it to anyone. But Eva O., oh, if she was sincere and not just looking for some of the heat from his notoriety— might be someone he could share intimacies and perhaps secrets with. He began writing back to her. She wanted to visit him. In order for her to be able to, the Hernandezes would have to get a court order, a requirement for anyone but immediate family. However, Richard wanted to first make sure Eva was the real thing, not a psycho-Satanist or a police plant or a nut. He received letters from born-again Christians, Protestants, and Catholics, all trying to convert him and turn him away from the clutches of Satan and there were letters from women who wanted to mother him and show him the difference between right and wrong. One nurse who'd lost her son felt that Richard, because he didn't have her love, had gone astray and understandably vented his anger with guns, knives, and fists. There was also Tamara, a full-figured redhead who had made an altar with Richard's picture on it and a black candle always burning. She'd later say, I used to go to a cemetery in Santa Ana and sit on a tombstone and write Richard poems and letters. I think he's gorgeous. But Richard wrote only to Eva and to his family. If it weren't for the books and the letters, I would have done myself in, he later confided. It was not only letters people sent him, but also books. It was during the weeks and months before, or during and after the preliminary hearing, that he became a book junkie. He read all day and all night. Frequently he couldn't sleep at all and would read for several days straight, stopping only to eat. He read Carlos Castaneda, Sigmund Freud, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Arthur Conan Doyle, Norman Mailer, Truman Capote, and as much true crime as he could get his hands on. His favorite books were about serial killers. Through the books, Richard acquired insights into human nature and the world he'd never known existed. The more he read, the more certain he became that society was hypocritical and malicious and would cut you up and spit you out like so much cow cud if you let it happen. The Hernandez's strategy was to delay the proceeding as long as possible. In a multiple murder case, the best friend a defense lawyer has is time. Witnesses die, as evidenced by Clara Hadsall, move away, forget, confuse details, and change their minds about testifying at all, 
not wanting to err in public and relive what amounted the worst experience they've ever had. Any time a trial is delayed, you have the potential for the unavailability of witnesses. When we talk about justice delayed, it benefits only the defendant and his attorney, District Attorney Gil Garcetti would later say. Defense attorneys say that overly swift justice is an abuse of the defendant's rights. A criminal defense lawyer has to have time to prepare himself and plan strategy and counterattack, which, in a case as large as Richard Ramirez's, was very time-consuming, a noted criminal attorney practicing in L.A. said. On May 21st, Ramirez was back in court. Ruth and Reuben wanted to be there but couldn't. The courtroom was once again packed. Ramirez had become big business. It seemed people loved to hate him. The groupies as well as press from all over the world were there. None of the reporters knew what to expect. Ramirez was an enigma who was capable of anything. He turned down all requests for interviews. He hated reporters and felt they'd been very unfair to him and made him guilty before he'd ever gotten to court. Eva O. was in the courtroom, wearing all black, as pale as white marble. She had dark hair parted in the middle, the part colored blood red. Her heart skipped a beat as Richard was brought into the courtroom. He smiled faintly at her and scowled at the reporters. When asked how he pled to the charges, he said, Not guilty. Halpin was half expecting the Hernandezes to offer an insanity defense. He had to be crazy to do those things, was a much-repeated statement in L.A. An insanity plea might work, particularly in light of the Zazera eye removal and the pentagrams. Ramirez pled not guilty, indicating to Halpin he was ready to do battle. Halpin believed Richard belonged on San Quentin's death row, not in some state hospital. In Halpin, Richard Ramirez had found a very worthy adversary, prepared, tough, experienced, and very smart. Judge Nelson sent the case for trial to Superior Court Judge Dion Morrow. Halpin wasn't happy about it, but he had no choice. The problem, as Halpin stated in court, was Judge Morrow's busy calendar. Sure enough, month after month dragged by as Morrow kept giving the Hernandezes postponement after postponement, until Halpin was red-faced and fit to be tied. He kept getting ready for trial, lining up all the witnesses, law enforcement people, and experts, over 160 individuals now, then having to cancel them all and reschedule everyone again. By the end of November, Halpin had had enough. He made a motion to have the case moved to another judge, citing all the delays Morrow had allowed in the case. Morrow granted Halpin's motion, and the case was moved to Supreme Court Judge Michael Tynan, who would preside over the case to its resolution. Tynan was a no-nonsense jurist who liked to move his cases along expeditiously. He had a gentle demeanor and was always polite. Halpin made the judge aware of the Hernandez's delaying tactics, and Tynan promised not to let the proceedings be held up unduly. Judge Tynan wore thick wire-framed glasses, which often moved down the bridge of his nose. In 1981, he was appointed by Governor Jerry Brown to the Los Angeles Municipal Court where he had been supervising judge of traffic court. In 1984, he was appointed to the Superior Court. On May 28, 1987, Judge Michael Tynan set September 30th for the trial, warning the Hernandezes to be ready. On September 11th, the Hernandezes again requested a delay of a few months, citing the prosecution's failure to turn over items the defense needed to plot strategy and plan defense. Tynan refused to give them six months, and set trial for February 1, 1988, only to grant another delay before then because the Hernandezes appealed to the District Court of Appeals to get certain evidence the prosecution was refusing to give the defense, namely crime scene photographs. On January 19th, Tynan announced that the state court had granted a last-minute request by the Hernandezes for the state to turn over the evidence the defense wanted. On the 25th, he set March 22nd for the trial date, because of the uncertainty surrounding the appellate ruling. On March 16th, the defense asked for yet another delay to review the new material they'd gotten as a result of the appellate decision, which Tynan granted, making April 29th the date for trial. Again, on the 29th, the defense asked for a delay, citing the huge amount of work as a reason why they weren't ready. Tynan then scheduled June 30th for trial, but on June 21st, the defense filed a motion to exclude Tynan citing him as being racially biased against the defense, a tactic expected to buy more time. On July 8th, Orange County Superior Court presiding judge Philip E. Cox ruled that Tynan was not biased. Finally, on July 21st, 1988, jury selection began, and the battle began in earnest. 
Richard had gone through a metamorphosis during the long months of delays, hearings, and more delays. He had gained weight and was thicker around the middle. His face was fuller and not as boyish. His hair was to his shoulders now, black and unruly, like a lion's mane. He had not been allowed out of his cell for exercise, only to shower twice a week and for visits and court appearances. He mingled with no other prisoners. All the reading had as notable effect on him as the starchy food at the jail, for he had become quiet and introspective, and he seemed much more sure about who he was and what he stood for, what he cared and didn't care about. The visits from Eva and other female admirers had given him a newfound confidence and fueled his ego to new heights. Richard had asked the Hernandezes to have Eva approved for visits a year after she'd first written him. Through her letters and poetry, he felt she was truly evil in her heart, and as such, someone he wanted to get to know. When she first went to the jail, everyone who saw her did a double-take, stood still and stared. It takes a lot to turn heads at the L.A. County Jail, where all sorts of characters regularly show up. But Eva did it, wearing all black with the blood-red strip down the middle of her head. Eva told Richard that he was blessed with the power of Satan, that he was special and the most desirable a man alive. She told him, too, about the macabre fantasy she had involving sex and cutting and killing people. She was obsessed with death. She'd even once had sex with a body, she told him. Richard listened to her wide-eyed, like a school kid hearing about sex for the first time from an older kid. Soon, Richard asked the Hernandezes to have other female admirers of his approved by the court, which they promptly did. What Richard wanted, Richard got. There were quite a few women now writing to him every day, wanting to see him. When it reached the point of his having three different women on his visiting list, the jail stopped asking for a court order and relaxed visiting policies for Richard, and soon there were lines of women showing up at the jail to visit him. Nothing like this had ever been seen before. It was a bizarre phenomenon that none of the guards at the jail could get over. It was almost as if Ramirez was a movie star rather than a man accused of entering people's homes while they slept and tearing their lives and bodies apart. All the women who went to see him had different reasons, but they each found him, they said, attractive and cute, so dangerous he's a turn-on. The forbidden fruit added another, I think he's the most attractive man I've ever seen. He didn't do the things they are saying. No way, said Diane Harella, a Mexican-American woman who believed Richard had been sent from God to avenge all the wrongs society had perpetuated on her. There's something in his eyes, like a little boy who needs help. I just wanted to reach out and embrace him. He's so sexy, said Doreen, when asked why she was attracted to Richard. Amy Rio began wearing a sticker over her heart that said, I love your smile. He's vulnerable and so sexy, she said of Richard. Just look at his eyes. They are like an animal's. The Daily News printed a large photograph of Amy on March 19th as she was sitting on the floor outside the courtroom. Amy was usually the first one there, with her heart-shaped face big lips and huge dark eyes, sitting on the floor, waiting to see a shackled Richard led to his chair, hobbling as he moved, chains rattling. "'He loves me,' Patty, another other girl, said. "'He told me so. He's so nice, gentle, like a lamb. He talks so sweet, and he's very funny. He signs his letters, yours cruelly.' Some days as many as a dozen women would show up to see him. He was allowed only one visit a day. The rest would leave disappointed, but would be back the following day and stand in line for hours, hoping for a visit. It used to turn me on so much when he did that because he was so dangerous and so near, but he couldn't really hurt me, another Ramirez groupie admitted. Doreen didn't get to meet Richard until shortly before jury selection had begun. I was shy and I didn't want to be just another one of his groupies, so I waited. But Doreen continued to defend Richard mightily in the press, with scathing letters condemning anyone she perceived as having done something unfair to him. She finally sent him a birthday card in February with copies of all the letters she had written defending him. He was truly shocked that someone he didn't even know would so strongly take up his cause. He wrote right back and invited her to come to the jail. She was surprised when she got his letter, though quite pleased, and wrote him and invited him to call collect, which he promptly did. When I first spoke to him, my heart was going a mile a minute. I couldn't believe that it was him, that I was finally talking to him. He was so nice and sweet, like a little boy. Richard thanked her for taking on his cause. She told him she was in love with him, had been since she'd first seen his picture. 
Here, Richard thought, was someone he could really trust, and he told her to come and visit. The first time Doreen went to see him was at the end of June of 1988. She bought a new dress and fussed with her makeup and hair like it was her wedding day. When she was seated in a visiting booth at the jail and the sheriff's deputies brought him down, Doreen nearly fainted at the sight of him, so close she could touch him if not for the glass. Right then and there I told him how much I loved him. He told me he loved me too, that no one had ever protected him and cared for him like me. Ruth Ramirez came up when she could. Money was tight, but every few weeks she'd show up at the jail and have to compete with Richard's groupies. Reuben, too, visited Richard in jail. Julian would call him and remind him to go to the jail so Richard knew his family was there, behind him, concerned, always praying for him. From reports the Hernandezes gave Julian, there was a good chance they could win the case and prove his son had not committed the horrible crimes he was being accused of. Julian prayed for that every day morning and night. In the two years since Richard's arrest, Julian looked like he'd aged fifteen years. His shoulders had rounded, his face had thinned, his walk had slowed, and deep lines had formed on his face. Book Four The Trial These murders are in the first degree, were premeditated, and occurred during burglaries and other crimes. We are asking for the death penalty. Prosecutor Phil Halpin in his opening statement to the jury. 33. By the time of the jury selection, the state of California had spent $1,301,836 on Richard Ramirez, and the case hadn't even gone to trial. There were editorials and news commentaries condemning a system that would let a murder case take so long to come to the bar and cost so much. It was an outrage, was the sentiment of many of L.A.'s citizens, Richard Ramirez had affected them in a very real, tangible way, and they wanted justice swiftly, not years after the fact. Jury selection finally began on July 21, 1988, from a pool of 1,600 citizens. The Hernandezes were looking for Hispanics and certain minorities. They felt that with a jury of all whites and Asians, Richard wouldn't have a chance. They believed Hispanics and blacks would have a more open mind. Richard now wore a shirt and tie and a black leather jacket Doreen had bought him. She, with the rest of the groupies, was in court every day, her heart and libido doing a flip every time he looked her way. Doreen felt that she and she alone was good for Richard. All the other girls were nothing but a bad influence on him and were a bunch of street sluts. Her love, she felt, was greater and more pure than any of theirs could ever be, and she would make sure Richard knew it. I loved him so intensely it hurt. All I would think about was him, day and night, night and day. I never thought of other men. I was a virgin, and Richard knew it, and that's why I was different. That's why he loved me, she later confided. On the first day of jury selection, fifty jurors were called. Thirty-nine were summarily excused, and the rest were questioned and grilled further. The Hernandezes knew that they had an uphill battle finding an impartial jury in L.A. County. They constantly complained to the press how biased everyone in L.A. was, and repeatedly made reference to a study they had done proving it. Richard felt the whole trial was a farce. If he hadn't been forced out of his cell, he would never have come to court. However, it gave him a chance to see his admirers and to stretch his legs. The juror selection was a slow, tedious process. It bored Richard, and he soon began falling asleep. He'd stay up late at night reading and would be tired for court. Judge Tynan didn't like his sleeping and warned him to stay awake. Richard took to wearing large black Porsche-type sunglasses, also bought by Doreen, so he could close his eyes behind them. Toward the end of July, Richard reportedly told a sheriff's deputy that he was going to have one of his girls sneak a gun into the courtroom, and he was going to shoot Halpin to death, then people in the audience, then himself. Security was already tight. But the bailiffs took Ramirez's alleged threat seriously, set up metal detectors, and searched everyone coming into the courtroom. On August 2nd, Halpin entered court in a huff, angry that he had been searched in front of eighty prospective jurors. I was forced to remove most of my clothing while standing in the hall, surrounded by jurors. It seems a strange approach to search the district attorney, but not prospective jurors, Your Honor. Judge Tynan apologized for Halpin's embarrassment. Daniel Hernandez told Judge Tynan that Richard didn't want to attend the jury selection. Tynan said that he had to, whether he wanted to or not. Midway through the jury selection, juror expert Joe Ellen Demetrius was brought in to help the defense. 
She had a long, thin face, intense dark eyes, and bouffant platinum hair. Richard often conferred with her. Jury selection took six months, longer than most had anticipated. On January 10, 1989, a jury and twelve alternates were sworn in, comprised of six Hispanics and six blacks, seven females and five males. The Hernandezes felt it was a victory for the defense. For most of the jury selection, Arturo Hernandez had stopped coming to court. Daniel had hired a paralegal named Richard Salinas, who had wavy black hair, a pointed hatchet face, and dark eyes. Daniel would often confer with Salinas on important issues. Arturo had apparently become disillusioned with defending Richard. There was no big movie or book deal, and the case was costing him money. A television movie about the Night Stalker was in the works, but the Hernandezes hadn't gotten a dime. As long as Richard refused to talk about his alleged crimes, nobody was willing to put up money. Daniel did his best, but the arduous task of being in court every day, staying in hotels away from his family in San Jose, and working without the benefit of co-counsel was taking its toll. He was tired, yet couldn't sleep at night. He'd toss and turn and worry about the case, his two little girls, and his wife. He began eating excessively, and by the time the jury was finally sworn in, he'd gained twenty-five pounds. On the morning of the first day of the trial, the courtroom was packed. Photographers lined the top row of the jury box, and reporters lined the benches tightly. The few seats in the courtroom not taken by press and lawyers held Richard's groupies, who had arrived early in the morning while it was still dark and waited in line, for the most part not talking to one another. Another of Richard's admirers, Diane Harella, had said to reporters earlier that day, The whole story hasn't come out. Richard is innocent. He's been framed, no matter what the prosecutor says. I know he's innocent. There was electricity in the air. When Richard was brought into court, everyone fell silent. He was dressed in a charcoal gray suit Doreen had gotten for him. The only sound was his leg irons as he hobbled to the defense table, wearing Porsche sunglasses. Reuben was outside in the hall, pacing back and forth, and blaming heavy metal music for his brother's problems. Maybe he'll save some souls if people learn the truth about that kind of music, he said. Judge Tynan welcomed the jury and alternates to the trial. He warned them that it would be a long and arduous affair, and suggested that if anyone on the jury was thinking of learning a new language or playing an instrument, now was the time. He also suggested exercise as a way to take their minds off the case while they were not in court. He read every charge to the jury, then turned the proceedings over to Phil Halpin, who introduced Alan Yokelson, William Merck, Frank Salerno, Paul Tippin, Leroy Orozco, and Gil Carrillo. Halpin made his opening statement in a matter-of-fact, dispassionate way, never raising his voice, never resorting to histrionics. With the help of enlarged maps and huge color-coded charts, he explained to the jury the series of crimes in chronological order, what connected them, and how he planned to prove it. He told the jury he would link Richard to the crimes with surviving witnesses, glove prints, fingerprints, and shoe prints, at locations where he, Ramirez, had shot, stabbed, and beaten his victims to death, while committing robberies in every case but Veronica Hughes, he made reference to the pentagram found at the Bell residence, on the thigh of one of the victims. As Halpin systematically described the crimes, Richard made notes on a yellow legal pad. Whenever he moved his feet, you could hear the chains rattle. The attacks, Halpin said, stretched from Northridge to Sierra Madre in Orange County, and were always near freeways for quick escape. Halpin told the jury about Felipe Solano, how he had much of the stolen property and would testify how he'd gotten it from Richard Ramirez, whom he knew as David Mena. That stolen property, mostly costume jewelry, had been recovered from the defendant's sister's home in El Paso, Texas. He spoke about the similar language used in different crimes, and described Carol Kyle's attack, how she'd suddenly felt a gloved hand over her mouth and a gun to her head, and heard, "'Where's the money? Don't look at me, bitch!' He told the jury that Ramirez had left a handcuff key on the mantel so Carol Kyle could free herself. That key is identical to the key that was discovered in the home of Ma Bell and Florence Lang. Of Mrs. Lang, Halpin said, she cannot speak, and she is fed through a tube, but she is still alive. Therefore, the defendant is only charged with attempting to murder her. As Phil Halpin continued to describe the specifics of all fifteen attacks, for the first time made known to the public, there were audible gasps among the spectators, as well as the press and Richard's groupies. There were public defenders and ADAs in the courtroom who worked in the building, and even they, who dealt every day with the incredible savagery people perpetrated against one another, 
moved uneasily in their seats. Halpin told the jury about the luggage in the Greyhound bus terminal, saying items found in it, a nail clipper and a can of weight gain, had the defendant's fingerprints on them, and that there were twenty-five caliber cartridges with distinctive red marking in the primer. The experts looked at those cartridges, and by examining the still-live rounds, ascertained that they had been operated through the same twenty-five caliber auto that had been determined to have been used in the Aboeth murder and the Peterson's attempted murder. He said they'd be meeting Jerry Stubblefield, who had designed the Avia shoe with the distinct waffle pattern that showed up at seven of the crime scenes, the Cesara, Doy, Bell, Cannon, Bennett, Nelson, and Kovananth residences. With that, the prosecutor wrapped up his opening statement and told the jury they'd first be meeting Jack Vinco, son of Mrs. Jenny Vinco. Jack now lived in Brooklyn, New York, where he'd been born and raised. Since the 1984 murder of his mother, he'd been turned off to Los Angeles. He had taken the loss of his mother very hard. The pain and feelings of loss, he felt, hurt as readily as if he had broken bones. He had turned to meditation. I chose for myself two simple words to meditate on, calm and relaxed. Jack was now writing a book on meditation. Jack walked into the courtroom with a slow, shuffling step, a big man with a very sad face. All eyes followed him as Richard's chains rattled in the silence of the courtroom. Jack described for the jury the afternoon of June 27, 1984, how he entered his mother's apartment that hot June day, finding things thrown all over. He described how he found her, how he ran out of the apartment in a panic, yelling for help, and the police arriving, taking his mother's lifeless body away in a black plastic body bag. Halpin finished his direct and turned Vinco over to Daniel Hernandez. Questioning a witness at a preliminary hearing without a jury present was one thing, but questioning a witness like Jack Vinco with anything but respect was inviting the jury to dislike you. Hernandez's strategy was that the first crime on Halpin's list was a third-party defense, that is, someone other than Richard was the killer, and he was going to suggest Jack's brother, Manny, was that someone. The problem with this strategy was that Judge Tynan had already ruled the defense could not pursue that line of reasoning. Halpin had investigated Manny and learned he'd been in Brooklyn with witnesses to prove it. Daniel's plan to pursue this defense before the jury put him on a direct collision course with Halpin and Judge Tynan. He asked Vinco, Did you ever see, yourself, any type of behavior on your brother's part that appeared to be aggressive or violent towards your mother? Verbally abusive, but I corrected him. Nothing beyond verbally abusive that I saw personally. Never anything beyond verbally abusive, Vinco answered. But rumors you heard were beyond verbally abusive. Halpin's anger erupted. Standing, he said, Excuse me, Mr. Vinco. Let me object on two grounds, both hearsay and irrelevant. Sustained. Annoyed, Daniel asked for a sidebar, at which he described to the judge his third-party defense. Halpin told Judge Tynan about his certainty of Manny Vinco's whereabouts the night of the crime. Richard turned around and, with a deadpan, sunglass face, disdainfully looked at the press, snarling slightly as his supporters admired his profile and pined for his attention. When court resumed, Daniel took Jack through the day he had found his mother again. Most defense lawyers would have wanted Vinco quickly off the stand. It looked like he might cry at any second. Hernandez asked, How long were you in the in your mother's bedroom when you found the body? How long were you there before you ran out? Very brief. Seemed like seconds. And what are the injuries you saw? Hernandez wanted to know, opening the door for details which could only work against the defense. Vinco testified, the major injury, that there was a neck gash that looked like someone had attempted to remove her head and almost succeeded. Very serious neck injury. Hernandez interrupted. Non-responsive. I object and request that the latter portion be stricken. Overruled. Denied, Judge Tynan said. Hernandez then tried to suggest that Vinco had killed his mother because he had had a mental breakdown twenty years earlier. Halpin objected. Hernandez called for another sidebar, at which the judge slammed Daniel telling him he was being cruel, that there was no evidence indicating either Jack or his brother had anything to do with Jenny Vinco's murder, and that he was to stop implying they had. Daniel argued he should be allowed to impeach Vinco. The judge didn't agree and ordered his cross to continue. Daniel countered that Vinco had refused to take a lie detector test. Tynan said that that was irrelevant. Daniel continued to try to tie Jack Vinco and or his brother Manny to the murder, his effort proved futile and made the jury restless and uncomfortable. 
He hammered away at Jack, trying unsuccessfully to shed suspicion on him over Halpin's constant objections right up to the end of court that day. In the morning, Jack Vinco was recalled, and again Daniel Hernandez tried to link him to the murder and drilled Jack, clearly traumatized and suffering on all the details of June 28th, now implying he had killed his mother for money, as Halpin objected on grounds of relevance and was sustained. The jury began wondering what was going on. I felt so bad for that poor man, and here was Daniel Hernandez showing no respect at all, one juror would later say of Hernandez's cross of Jack Vinco. When Daniel asked Jack if it was he who'd handled his mother's financial affairs, Halpin strenuously objected, and another sidebar on the record was asked for by Hernandez. Judge Tynan refused to let Hernandez ask questions concerning Jenny Vinco's money matters, stating it wasn't relevant. The sidebar ended, and Hernandez repeatedly asked Vinco why he was frightened about talking to the police and taking a polygraph test. Mr. Vinco, Hernandez said, do you remember telling me that there was something frightening about the interview with the police? It was a poor choice of words, Vinco said. I should have, well, said concern. That was just a poor choice of words at the moment. I meant concerned and said frightened. With help in objecting, Hernandez persisted until the judge ruled the questioning irrelevant. Daniel then tried to get Jack to admit he was relieved when he saw the time of death on the death certificate. Halpin again objected, and the objection sustained. Hernandez moved to a statement allegedly made by Wanda Doss, the owner of the building. Halpin objected, Tynan sustained, suggesting Hernandez make an offer of proof at the bench at another sidebar. What is the statement Wanda Doss was supposed to have made? Tynan asked. That she saw someone like him having breakfast, or someone saw somebody like him having breakfast, and that would have made him, that made him develop some type of fear, fright, reluctance to cooperate. That goes to his credibility, Hernandez said. Tynan said, I'm going to sustain the objection. It is hearsay. Back in front of the jury, Hernandez again asked about Wanda Doss. Halpin objected. The court sustained it. This would become a mantra. Objection sustained through the whole length of the trial. Halpin next put on the stand Jesse Castillo, the LAPD detective who had caught the Vinco homicide, and he told the jury how he'd arrived with his partner, Mike Wynn, secured the crime scene, and run the evidence gathering. Using photographs, Halpin helped bring Castillo and the jury back to that June day in 1984, five years earlier, and Castillo described the crime scene. Halpin asked, Can you describe the trauma of Jenny Vinco that you discovered during your investigation? Sir, she had received many stab wounds to the upper chest area and some wounds to the hands. Halpin handed him a photograph. And finally, let me show People's Exhibit 1H and ask you to tell the jury what is depicted there. Sir, that is the lower part of her body, the end of her dress, and depicting some of the panty girdle that she was wearing at the time. All right. And specifically, with respect to that area of the body, did you notice any trauma? Some to the legs and to... The inside was torn out, the inside of the panty girdle, the inner crotch area was torn. Richard moved, his chains rattled. Spectators shifted uneasily in their seats, wondering why. Halpin finished, and Hernandez stood and began his cross, taking Castillo through every step of what he did that day, which took much longer than Halpin's direct. Detective Castillo had, in fact, had some difficulty with Jack Vinco. How would you describe his... Jack Vinco's demeanor in terms of his cooperation with you, Hernandez asked. Sir, he was difficult to interview. Can you tell me, can you describe his demeanor, what made it difficult? Well, it would depend on what day you are talking about. Sometimes he was very cooperative, and then he would turn hostile and be very uncooperative. Halpin didn't like that answer, but he could do nothing about it. Daniel proceeded to ask Castillo if his investigation of Vinco had moved out of state. Halpin objected on the grounds of relevance. Judge Tynan thought that it was a good note to recess for lunch, reminding the jurors and alternates not to talk about the case among themselves or with the media, reserving decision on Halpin's objection. Gill and Frank hurried back to the office and grabbed some sandwiches. Frank was still running Team 3, and there was a lot of work on his desk. He did what he could, and he and Gill hustled back to court. After lunch, and without the jury present, Judge Tynan took up Halpin's objections, regarding Detective Castillo's going to New York State. When asked for a show of proof for that line of questioning, Hernandez withdrew the question. Halpin moved on to another matter. 
Hernandez's objections to his direct as being leading and his having been admonished in front of the jury. He complained to the judge that they gave the jury the impression he was doing something wrong when in fact he wasn't, and said he didn't want the record to reflect any kind of improper questioning on his part. Heinen said he understood his concern and promised not to admonish him about how he did his direct. He then ordered the jury brought in. Halpin was saving his ace for last. He was sure once Ronaldo Clara, the fingerprint expert, took the stand, he'd get a conviction on count one. Clara told the court he'd had ten years' experience and had conducted 4,000 crime scene investigations, including work on homicides and bank robberies. He described for the jury, at Halpin's patient, methodical prodding, how he dusted the window screen with magnetic powder and discovered five fingerprints, which he'd lifted with lifting tape and placed on a print card. There were, he stated, four prints on the screen and one on the window. Halpin took the print cards out of a sealed bag and showed them to Clara, and he identified them as the ones removed from the Vinco crime scene. He said he'd also found two more prints on the screen which were not identifiable at all. When Halpin asked if he had compared the latent prints with the ones on file, he said he hadn't, that a colleague, George Herrera, at the coordination desk had done that. Halpin turned Clara over to Hernandez, who wanted to know if Clara had dusted anywhere else in the Vinco house for prints. He said he dusted the whole house. Anything that is printable by powder I tried. The bathroom walls weren't porous enough for dusting, and the detectives decided to use ninhydrin in the morning, Clara said. Hernandez's questioning of Clara also took far longer than Halpin's direct. After nearly an hour, he finished, and Halpin asked a few questions on redirect, about the exact place the four discernible prints had been found, whether they were on the inside or the outside of the screen, to which Clara said he couldn't tell. Almost as an afterthought, Hernandez reminded Clara that at the preliminary hearing he'd said that nobody could tell how long the prints had been there, a week or a few months or even a year. With that, Hernandez could later argue to the jury his client's prints could have been put there long before Jenny Vinco's murder. Richard felt that introducing the prints Clara had found was a travesty of justice. He'd later say, these fingerprints should not have been allowed in at all. They had only three discernible loops, and for a print to be admissible in court, it's supposed to have seven loops. Halpin then called John Herrera from the coroner's office, and he told the jury how he'd been called to the Chapman residence and was directed to a bedroom where he saw the deceased. He said he took her body temperature at 4.50 p.m., there was rigor mortis about the body and lividity on the back and neck area. There was the possibility that she had been sexually assaulted because her girdle was pulled down and her dress was partially lifted, Herrera testified. People in the courtroom cleared their throats and moved in their seats. As Richard crossed his feet, the chains rattled, and all eyes moved in perfect unison like a school of small nervous fish in his direction. Halpin had Herrera tell the jury what rigor mortis, lividity, and body temperature all meant. He knew there was going to be a lot of testimony about bodies, and the more the jury understood, the more they'd be able to evaluate and appreciate the evidence. He finished quickly with Herrera and handed him over to Hernandez, who again had Herrera tell the jury the rudiments of rigor mortis and lividity, and how they each had manifested on Jenny Vinco's body. It seemed he was trying to prove the time of death was closer to 9 a.m. or earlier, which he felt would tie Jack Vinco to the murder. Halpin repeatedly objected, and Tynan sustained it. In frustration, feeling the judge was conspiring to undermine his case, Hernandez finished with Herrera, and court was recessed for the day. Richard stood up, and tall and lanky, walked loudly toward the door leading from the court. He never took off the sunglasses, and no one could tell where his eyes were. Doreen hoped they were on her. Every woman there hoped his eyes were on her. As he looked in the direction of the press, his lips twisted into a silent snarl filled with genuine disdain. Halpin's next witness, Dr. Joseph Cogan, from the morgue, was unable to be there that day. The prosecutor moved on to the next case and called Maria Hernandez, now married and pregnant with her first child. Halpin had her describe what had happened the evening she had been shot and her roommate killed. He showed her pictures of the garage and Dale's car, marked Exhibit 3C, and asked her if she recognized the ACDC baseball cap in the foreground of the photo. Maria said she didn't. Halpin knew he had witnesses who would put that hat on Richard Ramirez's head. He had her tell the jury step by step how she parked in the garage and heard a noise as she was entering her apartment. 
Her eyes were big and filled with the pain of the memory, and they never moved in Richard's direction. When Halpin asked what she saw after she turned around, she said, I saw a man pointing a gun. She described being shot and told the hushed courtroom the details of how her assailant went into the condominium and her then hearing a shot as she tried to flee. For a moment, she told the jury, she thought he was behind her and had shot at her again, but there was no one there. She ran around front and saw the same man walking away from her condo. He saw her and pointed the gun at her, then ran. Maria, testifying in a calm voice, told the jury how she found Dale dead on the floor. Dale's sister and other relatives were in the courtroom, and they began to cry. Now, Miss Hernandez, Halpin asked, do you see in the courtroom the man that shot you that night? Yes. And will you point him out to the jury, please? She raised the hand that she'd been shot in, pointed at Richard, and said, The man on the end is all eyes moved to Ramirez. The defendant, Richard Ramirez, for the record, Judge Tynan said. Maria was now Daniel Hernandez's witness. He complained that she was out of sequence and he needed until one thirty to review and prepare, perhaps move things along faster than to start right away and not be as prepared as I should be for the specific witness. Halpin objected. Counsel knew she was going to be here for a couple of years now. The same thing happened at the preliminary hearing. We were out of sequence frequently, so we both had to be prepared. Judge Tynan told Hernandez to do the best he could, but Daniel repeated that he wasn't ready, saying the district attorney was switching witnesses and trying to confuse the defense. At a sidebar, Halpin told Judge Tynan to stop Hernandez from insulting him in front of the jury. Tynan agreed and told Daniel that as a trial lawyer, he should be prepared. He ordered him to continue. Hernandez took Maria through every aspect of her assault without regard for the trauma she had gone through on the night of March 17th, often asking what appeared to some to be impertinent or nonsensical questions. He seemed, however, to make some headway when he asked her to describe her assailant. She said, From what I can remember at this point, it is very fuzzy. I can tell you he was 5'10", something like that, at least as far as, as far as I know. I didn't have a tape measure with me. Dark clothes, dark hair. That's all I really can remember. It had happened four years before, and much of that whole evening was blocked and hazy. She answered, I don't remember, to many of Hernandez's subsequent questions. Do you recall seeing any details of the person's face, the person's physical qualities, or anything, Hernandez asked. I remember testifying that I did, but my memory now, I don't have a clear picture. Today, here today, you can't tell me that you remember seeing your attacker's face? No. So, when you pointed out Mr. Ramirez today, you were relying on some other time in terms of what you said then. I was relying on my testimony then. So, in your memory today, you can't really point at Mr. Ramirez and say that is the person. Everyone in the courtroom, it seemed, all at once, leaned forward to hear her answer, for she spoke softly now. Not truthfully. Not definitely, she said. A hushed exclamation of surprise rose and fell. As much as Gill, Frank, and Halpin didn't like the answer, Hernandez liked it fine. If that didn't lay the groundwork for reasonable doubt, nothing did. Daniel wanted to weaken the case even more, but his tactics caused Maria to seem more traumatized and vulnerable. At noon, Tynan broke for lunch, and a shaken Maria Hernandez stepped down from the stand. Richard didn't take his eyes off her as he grinned broadly. He felt that Satan had interceded and forced her to tell the truth. That she really couldn't recognize me. She saw me in the news and in the papers. That's why she ID'd me at the lineup. Her description to the police didn't look anything like me. Maria hated being near Ramirez while she was pregnant. She believed in her heart that he was evil from his shoes to the top of his head and not someone to be around when you were pregnant. At one thirty, Hernandez resumed the cross-examination confident he could further show the jury that Maria Hernandez wasn't sure Richard was her assailant. He tried to get her to concede that she'd used her purse to protect herself, and in doing had never even seen who shot her. But Maria was firm and sure when she told him the purse had not blocked her view. Halpin stood ramrod straight, absolutely determined to repair his case on direct. He had her detail the injury to her right hand, wanting to dispel any notion that her pocketbook had shielded her view. He then had Maria describe for the jury exactly what had happened at the lineup. On September 5th of 1985, when you identified the defendant as the person who shot you, were you positive of your identification? Yes, she said. 
Daniel Hernandez objected, calling it hearsay, and Tynan ruled against him. Maria didn't remember if she had identified Ramirez at the preliminary hearing, but at an April 9 motion in front of Judge Tynan, she had recognized him as the man in black who'd shot her. Halpin conferred with Yokelson, then asked the court to let her read her testimony at the preliminary, to which Hernandez objected vehemently. There was now a question about her identification, Tynan said, and the people had the right to set the record straight. Maria silently read her testimony. And do you recall now if you identified the defendant as the man that shot you? the prosecutor asked. Yes, I did. Halpin questioned Maria on her recollection of how clear her memory was at her previous appearances in court and at the lineup, and she was confident that her memory of her attacker's appearance was fresh in her mind at those times. It appeared Halpin had repaired the damage of Maria's memory lapse. Daniel Hernandez, though, was determined to take back the advantage. He questioned her again about her identification, but Maria held fast, and he couldn't dissuade her in the slightest. He suggested Gil Carrillo had told her Richard was number two in the lineup, which she denied. He went over the same thing again and again, getting the same answer and losing the attention of the jury. When Daniel finally sat down, a collective sigh of relief went throughout the courtroom. Halpin said he had no more questions. He wanted Maria to be able to get off the stand. He felt terrible that she'd been subjected to Daniel Hernandez's cross, but he couldn't do anything about it, and he apologized to her with his eyes. Judge Tynan told her she was excused and was subject to recall. He recessed court until 3.15. At the defense table, Daniel felt triumphant. He was sure he had invalidated Maria's testimony by showing the jury she really didn't remember anything about the events of May 17. Richard wasn't so sure. Joseph Kogan, the pathologist who'd done the autopsies on both Jenny Vinco and Dale Okazaki, was called. He testified that Vinco's stab wounds were arbitrarily numbered from head to toe. Four occurred in the trunk, six in the neck area. He described in detail the injury each knife wound had caused. Any one of the wounds would be fatal, he summed up. It was clear to everyone in the court that Jenny's killer had known exactly what he was doing. Dr. Kogan testified that the neck wounds were peculiar because they were stab wounds incorporated with slash wounds and went from ear to ear. And these stab wounds were, were driven in. One of them hit the spine and produced a small fracture in the spine, and then across the two stab wounds on either side of the neck was this, the slash wound, and the slash wound severed the trachea almost entirely, the trachea being the air tube which supplies air to the body and lungs, and it severed one of the deeper veins in the neck. There was evidence of blood aspiration into the lungs, indicating that the slash wound to the neck occurred while she was alive, and that she had breathed blood into the lungs. The eerie silence in the courtroom was tangible as the reality of the stalker's work invaded people's minds. A few of the press members subconsciously reached for their own throats. One of Richard's groupies later admitted she became sexually excited by the description of all the blood. Halpin asked the doctor if he'd found any hilt marks. Kogan said yes and explained that if a knife is driven into the body with force, black and blue marks form around the wound. He estimated that Jenny Vinco might have been alive for a few minutes after the wounds were inflicted. Judge Tynan interrupted, saying it was close to 4 p.m. and they should call it a day. The reporters hurried into the hall to try for quotes from the key players for the evening news. Doreen and a few of Richard's other admirers hurried over to the jail so they could visit with him. Halpin wanted to start with the neck wounds and show the jury close-up color shots of the slash across Jenny's throat, taken during the autopsy. Hernandez objected heatedly, saying the photographs were inflammatory and the jury should not see them. Halpin countered that the wounds were virtually identical to injuries at other murder scenes and evidence in themselves. Judge Tynan was very reluctant about showing these photographs to the jury. They were horrible and would inevitably cause emotional turmoil and nightmares. He told Halpin that if he could show him that the wounds that were identical, he'd consider it. Otherwise, only diagrams and drawings, which Hernandez had suggested, would be allowed. Halpin said he would need some time to go through all of the photos. Halpin said he had photographs with the same slash wounds from Incident No. 4, Maxine Zazera, Incident No. 8, Mary Cannon, and Incident No. 12, Max and Leela Knighting. Alan Yokelson was sent to get them. Tynan would delay his ruling on the admissibility of the photographs until he had seen them all. In the meantime, Halpin would resume his direct examination of Kogan. 
James Wegner had done the actual autopsy on Dale Okazaki, but he'd left the medical examiner's office and wasn't available. Halpin intended to use Kogan to establish the facts. Hernandez objected on grounds of hearsay, but Tyson allowed it after much arguing, based on its being an official business record. Allowed to read Dr. Wegner's report, Kogan told the jury the exact cause of Dale's death. A gunshot wound to the middle right forehead had caused massive hemorrhaging and hemorrhagic brain damage. He testified there was a second injury, blunt force trauma that had probably been sustained when Dale went down after being shot. Kogan said there was stippling, gunpowder marks, on Dale's forehead, indicating she'd been shot at relatively close range. The distance from the front of the barrel is about 18 inches. It varies from firearm to firearm depending on various factors, the type of weapon, ammunition, etc. Halpin handed the doctor a bullet envelope from the medical examiner's office, containing the small, slightly dented twenty two caliber projectile, which, according to the report, was the actual slug Wegner had removed from Dale's head. Halpin had the doctor examine how an autopsy was done and how such a projectile would actually be removed. Then they broke for lunch. When court resumed, Hernandez's first question was, Doctor, as far as the wounds that you described to the body of Jenny Vinco, can you tell me which of these wounds would be immediately fatal? None are such that they would be immediately lethal. The wounds to the neck, I would say, would be more immediately lethal than the wounds to the abdomen. For nearly an hour and a half, Daniel asked questions about the wounds and how long a person would actually live after receiving such injuries. Richard fell asleep behind his sunglasses. It became a meandering, repetitive cross that went around in circles. One court observer likened it to a dog chasing its own tail. Halpin asked a few questions regarding Jenny's time of death. He did not want the jury confused on that fact. The doctor reiterated that based on the liver temperature, she died somewhere between 1,200 and 1,600 hours, noon and 4 p.m. on June 28th. Daniel's recross questions concerned rigor mortis in time of death. He was obsessed, it seemed, with getting Dr. Kogan to concede facts he was intent on not conceding, and this went on for another full hour as Richard slept. Jurors moved about in their seats, and the journalist wished his testimony would come to an end. When he was finally finished, the prosecutor had no further redirect, and Judge Tynan dismissed him. He stepped down from the stand, glad to be away from Daniel Hernandez and his questions. After a brief recess, Gil Carrillo was called as the next witness. His huge presence, a regular part of court proceedings since the start of the trial, he mounted the witness stand and told the jury about the Sunday night he'd received the call at home, directing him to the Hernandez Okazaki residence in the city of Rosemead, only a ten-minute drive from where he lived. Using photographs Halpin showed him, Gill told the jury where he walked and what he did upon his arrival. Halpin had him describe everything he'd seen at the crime scene and how he'd gone to the Beverly Hospital the next day to interview Maria. Halpin moved to Gill's relationship with Maria Hernandez's family and had him explain to the jury how her mom had been good friends with his sister on the block where he'd grown up. Halpin had him recount for the jury the incident in which Maria's mother had come to the house that night to collect some personal things for her daughter. Gill testified he'd attended Dale's autopsy and had watched the twenty-two caliber slug being removed from her brain as her sister in the audience let out a small plaintive wail. He identified the slug for Halpin. Halpin moved to the September 5th lineup. He didn't want any confusion about Gill's influence over Maria regarding her picking Richard out of the lineup. Gill testified he'd never shown Maria Hernandez any pictures of Richard Ramirez. Halpin asked if Gill had communicated at any other time with Maria. Gill told the jury he'd met her at the house after she'd been released from the hospital and had her take him through every step of what had happened that night. Halpin tried to establish for the jury that Maria had had ample light to see her attacker clearly. The bulb, Gill testified, was part of the door closer and was in the center of the garage, hanging from the ceiling. Judge Tynan suggested they resume Monday morning at 10.30. Gill was just warming up and wanted to continue, wanted to get it over with but he had no say in the matter. 34. Richard hated weekends in the Los Angeles County Jail. On the outside, Saturdays and Sundays were always favorite days of his, and when weekends rolled around, the loss of his freedom seemed compounded. Richard had always been the kind of person who was always on the move. Ever since he was able to walk, he'd never been able to sit still. That was one of the reasons he was so uncomfortable in school. 
sitting still for hours on end had been very difficult for him. My brother, Ruth said, never stayed in one place too long. I mean, it was like he had jumping beans inside him. He was always active, going somewhere or coming back from somewhere. Now he could go nowhere. He lived in a six-by-eight-foot steel cubicle and probably would for the remainder of his life. Richard, however, continued to escape from the jail with books, and whatever he read picked him up and transported him to where the story took place. No matter what they do to me, my mind is free and it can go where it wants to go, and they can't do anything about it, he'd later say. An admirer of Richard's had sent him a story about Jack the Ripper and his grisly deeds, and that weekend Richard was, through the book, transported to Whitechapel in London, where he walked the cobblestone byways as fog swirled around his feet. Letters were also a way for him to find relief from the flat steel walls and guards' hostile, curious stares. He would later relate that whenever a new sheriff's deputy hit high power, he inevitably would come and take a look at Richard, at the fear-inspiring Night Stalker. To the guards, all convinced he was indeed the killer, Richard was the personification of the bad guy, the epitome of evil, as dangerous as a man-eating shark. Most of them wouldn't say anything, they just look at him with curiosity and apprehension. Richard didn't like people coming around and bothering him, staring at him. For the most part, he had very little contact with other inmates. Even when he received visits, the guards wouldn't bring him to the visiting area when other inmates were still there. Richard took to putting crime scene photographs on the walls of his cell, using soap and toothpaste as glue. He'd gotten the photographs, which were part of the discovery, from Daniel Hernandez. Sometimes an inmate mopping the floor or pushing a tray of books would pass by Richard's cell and call him names, curse him out. Richard would point to the photographs and say, There's blood behind the stalker, and the inmate would inevitably look once and go away pale. One of the photographs was of Maxine Cesara. The guards saw the photograph, but Richard was legally allowed to have it as part of his defense, and the guards could do nothing. Doreen, as well as a few of Richard's other admirers, came to see him that weekend. She wanted to be sure she wouldn't be shut out of a visit, because other women had gotten there before she did, and she was there at five in the morning, standing in the dark, leaning against the grey concrete wall of the jail. She had become as obsessed with Richard as a holy man is with his lord. He was her sunrise and her sunset, the moon and the stars. She thought of nothing but Richard— she was sure she could help him with the purity and sincerity of her love. Doreen wanted to marry him, to have his children and serve him breakfast in bed in the morning. She fervently hoped he'd win the trial and be freed so they could escape somewhere together. But with everyone lying about her true love and with all the unfair press, she knew his chances for acquittal were not good. Whatever Richard wanted, Doreen secured for him. He was the boss in their relationship. She made sure Richard had money in his commissary account at the jail and sent him books and magazines, writing paper and stamps. She wrote him religiously every day and often sent him funny cards. Richard was like no one she'd ever known. She'd come from a quiet, conservative background, had never been in any trouble and was always more interested in studying for school and in romance novels than in men. With Richard, everything changed. He was the ultimate rebel— Combined with his dangerous Latin good looks, he turned Doreen on in a way no other man ever could, she says. Doreen planned to give her virginity to Richard. She knew, however, that might never happen. She would sacrifice everything for Richard. That's what real love is about, giving, says Doreen. Isn't it? When she did finally see him, after waiting several hours, she could have only twenty minutes with him, and they talked about how well Daniel had done with getting Maria Hernandez, to admit she couldn't identify Richard in the courtroom. Richard wanted to write a letter to Ted Bundy on Florida's death row, and he asked Doreen to get Bundy's prison number and address. He had, he said, some things he wanted to ask Ted about. Doreen was very good at locating information, having done it for her job at magazines. If Richard asked for something, neither storm nor rain nor sleet nor flood would stop her from getting it. If he wanted Bundy's address, she'd find it. I'd cut off my right arm for him, she'd later say. Monday morning, Gil was back on the stand. Phil Halpin, fresh from the weekend and anxious to get into it, asked Gil if Maria had described her assailant when he and his partner had gone to visit her at Mercy Hospital. Gil testified, she had said, a light-skinned Caucasian or Mexican, 5'9 to 6'1, 19 to 25 years of age, with dark hair, wearing a black members-only type jacket, 
and also with a thin build. Halpin ended his direct examination. Hernandez began with the ACDC baseball cap, wanting to know if Maria had said her assailant had had a hat on. Gilt said Maria hadn't said anything about a hat until he'd asked her if the ACDC baseball cap was hers or Dale's. Gill assumed that it had belonged to the assailant. Daniel asked questions for an hour without eliciting anything that could help the defense, and he sat down, seeming tired and sluggish. "'I have nothing further,' Halpin said, in a hurry to put another witness on the stand and move the trial along. He made another motion to start showing the jury exhibits, particularly the photographs. Tynan asked for the prosecutor's argument to be made when they came back from lunch at one thirty. Court then resumed with the introduction into evidence of photographs that depicted Dale Okazaki lying on the kitchen floor in a pool of blood, her face obscenely swollen. Hernandez objected on the grounds that the photographs were excessively inflammatory and should not be shown to the jury under Statute 352. Judge Tynan said, I think under 352 I will permit the photographs into evidence. It is not a pleasant picture, but it is not unduly gruesome and does depict the wound causing death and the appearance of the victim in the case, so the objection will be noted for the record. Daniel voiced more objections about the evidence. Halpin moved to introduce photographs of the ACDC cap found in the garage, but Hernandez again objected, saying the hat was on a brown-colored mannequin, connoting a Latino, which Hernandez reasoned was unduly suggestive. Halpin said, I don't understand the objection to the mannequin being Latin. I didn't notice any particular ethnicity of the mannequin. Judge Tynan said, All I see is from the middle of the nose down. I don't think that is a Latin face. Hernandez said, I'm not referring to a Latin face, Your Honor, and I realize that sometimes certain symbols are not adhered to or in any way given value, but some portions of the population do. It may have some type of suggestion to the jury. Tynan did not agree and allowed the photo of the brown mannequin into evidence. Halpin moved to introduce the actual ACDC cap into evidence, but Hernandez objected, saying the pictures were enough and there was no chain of evidence which proved that this hat was the hat Gill had seen on the floor. Tynan let it in. Hernandez made a motion to exclude the next two witnesses, Jorge Gallegos and Joseph Duenas, from testifying, citing statutes 402 and 352. Tynan said the matter had been litigated at the preliminary and he was going to allow their testimony. Daniel wanted the charts Halpin had put up outlining the crimes to be taken down, as they were overly suggestive. Halpin had no objection. They were removed, and the photographs were put on a pinboard on wheels that faced the jury. June Wang, Veronica Yu's best friend, was called next. She was very nervous, as fragile and beautiful as a china doll as she sat in the witness stand. Wang was deathly afraid of Richard Ramirez. She felt he was in league with Satan and hated being in a room with him, breathing the same air. She answered Halpin's questions about Veronica Yu's last day of life and told the jury, always conscious of Richard's eyes on her, how they'd been together Saturday and Sunday. Halpin asked, And did she, sometime that night, leave your home to go to her home? Around eleven o'clock. And did you ever see her again? No, June testified, and tears that had been brimming in her eyes spilled over and ran down her face. Halpin finished quickly. Hernandez conferred with Salinas. June Wang was a sympathetic witness, and most defense attorneys would have left her alone. She'd only been put on the stand to establish that Veronica was alive and well when she left June's house that March night, four years earlier. Hernandez stood up and moved to the podium. He asked her to tell the jury everything she and Veronica had done that Saturday and Sunday. Hernandez wanted the jury to suspect Veronica Yu's boyfriend as the vicious killer. Halpin objected on the grounds of relevance, and Judge Tynan sustained the objection. Hernandez, flustered and angered by the block to his theory, demanded the sidebar. Reluctantly, Tynan agreed. To Daniel's defense of relevance, Tynan said, This woman is simply testifying the last time anyone saw her alive. That is all. This other thing, Veronica's boyfriend, is totally irrelevant to any issue that I can even take a wild guess at. Sustained. Hernandez finished up with a few simple questions. Halpin called Jorge Gallegos, who had been sitting in his uncle's truck with his girlfriend, Edith Alcaz, on North Alhambra the evening Veronica was gunned down. Interpreter Cynthia Parker would translate. Gallegos looked in Richard's direction as he took the stand, openly glaring at him as if to tell him and the world that he was not afraid. 
Egos told the jury how he was able to see the incident in the mirror of the truck and described seeing a man trying to pull Veronica from her yellow Chevy. As the man took off, he saw his profile clearly. When Halpin asked Gallegos if he saw in the courtroom the man who was trying to pull Veronica from the car, he looked at Richard, pointed and said, He's over there. His hair is just a little longer. Halpin now had Gallegos tell of his meeting with Monterey Park Detective Anthony Romero and his identification of a car the police had as the one used in the attack. The strain of the trial was showing on Daniel. There were dark circles under his eyes, his face appeared puffy and he moved slowly, as if he hadn't slept enough. Arturo hadn't been in court since the selection of the jury, and the workload was far too much for Daniel. "'What was the description you gave Detective Romero?' he asked on cross. I told him that it was a man, more or less my height, five-six or five-eight, wavy hair. He seemed to be oriental in appearance. The description didn't match Richard, and it seemed Hernandez had scored a point. He conferred with Salinas and Richard. Hernandez asked if the man at the preliminary hearing looked different from the man he'd seen that night. Yes. The hair, the dress? Yes, the hair, the clothing, the glasses. So he doesn't look the same as he looked that night? No, he does not look the same, Gallego said, peering hard at Richard. Can he stand? he asked Judge Tynan. Would you like him to stand? the judge said. Yes, I would like to see his profile without glasses and also from behind. Richard turned to Hernandez and said, Fuck him, man, I'm not standing up. Hernandez addressed the judge, said, Your Honor, he has already made an ID. I think this is just... The judge interrupted with, Mr. Hernandez, are you making an issue of it? Mr. Ramirez, would you rise, please? Take your glasses off and face the clerk. No, Richard yelled, all puffed up with defiance, obviously ready to fight. The bailiffs moved in. Very well, thank you, Tynan said to avoid trouble. He had no doubt Richard would resist rather than stand and accommodate Gallegos. He noted for the record that Richard had refused to stand and decided to end court for the day. As Gallegos stepped down, Richard snarled at him and cursed him under his breath, calling him punk and rat. The bailiff removed Ramirez from the court. That night, on the television news, it was heavily reported how Richard had defied the court and yelled no to Judge Tynan's request, and the next day his latest defiance made all the newspapers. As people read about it over breakfast, they shuddered. Never had there been an accused serial killer showing so little remorse. The next morning, Hernandez resumed his cross-examination. He tried to get Gallegos to admit that he had not really gotten a good look at the killer, but had little luck. Gill noted that one of the alternate female jurors kept staring hungrily at Richard. She had big round eyes, a pug nose, very white skin, dark red shoulder-length hair, and bangs. He pointed her out to Frank, who said he'd already noticed. They both hoped if an alternate had to be called, it would not be this one. All it took for a mistrial was one holdout. Hernandez's cross went on and on. Judge Tynan was getting annoyed and the jury was antsy. The judge admonished Daniel and told him to move on. Hernandez respectfully told Judge Tynan that he didn't appreciate being admonished in front of the jury. Tynan said he'd take his protest under advisement, and court was recessed. Phil Halpin very rarely ate lunch. It seemed the case never gave him the time. It was all he thought about from morning till night. He viewed his work as a life-and-death struggle between good and evil, and he was determined to win. Both Frank and Gill saw how consumed Halpin was, and they were worried. They knew if he didn't get at least a little respite from it, his health would eventually suffer, but no matter how many times they asked him to join them for a drink, he was too busy. Phil Halpin was the consummate professional. He was the most prepared, thorough prosecutor I ever worked with, Frank would later say. During the trial, Richard had his lunch in a holding pen behind the court. Always by himself, still segregated from other prisoners, he had a bologna sandwich on stale white bread and heavily sugared tea. He hated bologna and he hated sugar tea, but there was only one item on the courthouse lunch menu. After lunch, Halpin wanted to put crime scene photos of the U incident on the board. One was a picture of Veronica with a tube forced into her mouth. Hernandez objected, saying it was unduly unpleasant and not necessary. Halpin said it was the clearest picture he had of her, and that it was not in any way particularly prejudicial. He complained to Judge Tynan that Hernandez objected to everything, whether it was objectionable or not. Tynan allowed the photos to be pinned to the board facing the jury. Hernandez then tried to bar the next witness, Joseph Duenas, 
and requested a 402 hearing based on Duenas's not being able to identify Richard at the preliminary hearing. Tynan denied the motion. Joseph Duenas had heard Veronica Yu screaming for help and had called the police. Halpin took him through the incident. Duenas said he could not positively identify the man he'd seen that night. He had described the man to police as about 5'7 to 5'8, about 145, 150 pounds, light complexion, kind of long, shaggy hair, but I couldn't tell if his eyes were quite slanted or if they weren't. People in the courtroom tried to see Richard's eyes, but he was wearing his sunglasses and wasn't about to take them off. Halpin finished with Duenas, itching to keep the case moving. Hernandez stood and everyone dreaded another long cross-examination. He set out to show the jury that Gallegos and Duenas were liars, only out for the reward money, the limelight, some false sense of justice. Daniel had Duenas describe every minute aspect of everything he did, said, and saw. When Hernandez asked him if he'd heard any gunshots, he said no. Everyone knew Veronica had been shot twice before she'd gotten out of the car. Duenas testified he was put in a police car by himself when he said he'd seen the incident. At the police station, he'd told the detectives he could identify the killer if he saw him. Yet in court today, he couldn't positively identify Richard. Daniel wisely ended his cross on that note, and court was recessed until 3.15. Monterey Park officer Ron Endo was the next witness. He told how he'd been sent to Alhambra Street, what he'd found, and what he'd done. Hernandez had Officer Endo describe everything he saw and did again, questioning him as if he were part of some large conspiracy. The jury appeared to lose interest, yawning and fidgeting. One of them even fell asleep. The following morning, juror number four, Alfred Carrillo, couldn't make it to court because Route 5 was closed. Judge Tynan was forced to cancel the proceedings for the day and excuse the jury with his usual admonishments about their not discussing the case. Phil Halpin told the judge that he would like to introduce to the jury all the photographs from incidents already presented. He suggested they be put on the board and the jury allowed to look at them. He did not want the photographs in the jury room because they could cause dialogue and comments among the jurors. The judge suggested letting the jury pass the photographs among themselves in groups relevant to each crime for ten or fifteen minutes, and then let them have them when their deliberations began. Halpin and Hernandez agreed, and court was adjourned. Halpin next put Dr. Richard Ten on the stand. He'd been working in the emergency room of Garfield Hospital on the morning of the U shooting. He testified that Veronica had been brought in by a medevac unit, and that he'd checked her vital signs, pronounced her dead, and filled out a coroner's report, noting two gunshot wounds as the cause of death. As with previous witnesses, Hernandez had the doctor describe in detail the condition of the victim. Halpin summoned Dr. Susan Seltzer, and she testified she'd done an autopsy on Veronica at 10.30 a.m. on March 19th in the presence of Monterey Park Detective Anthony Romero. The cause of death was two gunshot wounds, and she briefly noted the injuries each had caused. Daniel Hernandez began his cross by asking, "'Can you tell me which nerves were damaged or severed completely?' The question required Dr. Seltzer to describe the damage to Veronica in greater detail. He implied Veronica might have been bruised prior to being shot because there were some bruises on her legs. But the doctor said they'd probably happened during the time of the shooting. He asked if Veronica had any defensive wounds, to which the doctor said no. Daniel wanted the jury to believe Veronica had been killed by an estranged boyfriend in an argument that might have started earlier. Before he moved to the next incident, Halpin wanted the jury to see the crime scene pictures. With Frank and Gill's help, the photographs were distributed to the jurors. The jury comprised ordinary people leading everyday lives, and it was a very difficult thing for them to look at the bodies and not be disturbed. They'd been changed forever, a juror would say later, but they all knew the worst was yet to come. After lunch, Halpin told the court he wanted to show the jury crime scene pictures of the Zazara incident. Hernandez protested, saying the enlargements were enhanced by artificial lighting, were excessively brutal, and would only inflame the jury, particularly the women. Halpin disagreed. The male had been shot in the head, which was consistent with other crimes yet to be presented, and the stab wounds Maxine had suffered were like others sustained in stalker attacks. Judge Tynan ruled. Under 352, after careful weighing of all relevant factors, the court will permit these to be shown to the jury during testimony, and they, I assume, will be attempted to be bidded by the people after a foundation has been laid. 
The door was now open for all the pictures of the bodies to reach the jury. Bruno Francisco Polo, Vincent Zazara's employee, who had discovered the crime, was next on the stand. He was nervous and cowed by the enormity of the proceedings. Patiently and professionally, Halpin had Polo tell the jury about how he discovered the tragedy on March 28th. He described finding the bodies, the police, the fire department, and a medevac arriving, then Peter Zazara with his wife and small baby arriving. Halpin asked for permission to approach the bench and told Tynan he was finished with Polo, but before he turned him over to Hernandez, he wanted it made crystal clear that he would not tolerate defense counsel asking about time Vincent Venera had done in prison, his having guns in his house, nor his alleged underworld ties. Daniel said he had the right to ask such questions, but Tynan ruled that he didn't. With the Cesare murders, Daniel was hoping to show the jury that Vincent's own son had said his father had mob ties, and that he and Maxine had likely been killed in a mafia hit. Though he knew it was out of the scope of his cross-examination, unless Halpin brought it up first, he was still intent about getting Peter Cesare's statement to Russ Uloff out for the jury's consumption. After a short recess, court resumed and Hernandez began asking Polo questions about his relationship with Peter Zazara. Halpin objected to this line of questioning as irrelevant and immaterial, and Judge Tynan sustained the objection. Daniel had Polo take the jury again through a detailed account of the events leading up to his discovering of the Zazara murders. Halpin eventually objected, as the question seemed to become increasingly more irrelevant. The lawyers approached the bench— and Tynan instructed Hernandez to find a more relevant line of questioning. Daniel went back to the defense table and conferred with Salinas, then grilled Polo on how many bags of money he had left at the Zazaras, trying to taint the pizza parlor receipts with some sinister underworld connection. After only a few minutes, the judge interrupted Daniel's cross so Chris Olson, the court reporter who felt ill, could go home. He reminded everyone not to discuss the case and that the weekend would be for three days because court was dark on Monday. The next time they'd see each other again would be February 14th, Valentine's Day. 35. For the most part, Doreen was the only one of Richard's dozen or so regular admirers who was still there every day, all day. Doreen's job at the magazine allowed her to set her own hours. The other girls, as well as many of the journalists, were now there just for the morning sessions, but Doreen was there for both mornings and afternoons, always hoping Richard would turn around and acknowledge her. She felt Richard had come to trust her. He knew she was out there, protecting his rights, writing letters to newspapers denouncing his unfair treatment. Samantha wrote him letters detailing how she would love to have sex with him in a cemetery at night, on a cold overturned tombstone, covered with the blood of one of the Night Stalker's victims. Eva O. told him when she came to visit how she wanted to have sex with him in her coffin, which she slept in every night. It, the coffin, would be their love nest, the place from which she guaranteed him she'd fulfill his every fantasy in the name of Satan, in the name of evil. Laura Kendall, a former fashion model turned professional dominatrix in New York, wrote to Ramirez that she fantasized about having sex with him in his prison cell. With Richard, she said, I'd want to be submissive. You can't dominate a man like that. Of all the women who claimed they were in love with him, Richard felt Doreen was the most grounded. She was a college graduate who didn't smoke, drink, or curse. Doreen's idea of profanity was, gosh, golly, and oh my lord. She was still a virgin, and was certain that appealed to Richard most of all. He felt she was his. All the other women he knew had had sex already. Many of them had sexual fantasies involving Richard, blood, knives, whips, and all kinds of sadistic abnormalities. All the attention from so many women changed Richard. On the outside, in the real world, he never had intimate sexual relationships with women other than prostitutes. The last woman he had had any emotional intimacy with was Nancy, fourteen years before. He had never thought of himself as particularly desirable to women. He felt he was too skinny, and he was self-conscious about his teeth. He was shy to the point that he had become more comfortable with the demons and evil entities that dominated the spirit world than with people. He never cared how he dressed, never combed his hair, and living as he did, on the move, personal hygiene wasn't one of his primary concerns. Yet now that his full-lipped, high-cheekboned face and his alleged deeds were one of the hottest news items in the country, 
Richard had become much sought after by females. That weekend he received scores of Valentine cards from women as far away as Israel, London, Germany, and Spain. All this adulation by so many females pumped up Richard's ego and aroused his sexuality. Some of the women who visited him would, upon his demand, when no one was looking, raise their dresses and discreetly show him their privates. Of all the cards and love letters he had gotten that weekend, none was, Doreen felt, as important to Richard as her own. I was, she'd later relate, the only one who truly cared. All the others were a bunch of freaks and weirdos who wanted to use Richard for their own aggrandizement and kicks. But I didn't want anything for myself. It was only what I could do for him, how I could help him. When asked about the crimes Richard was accused of and the dire consequences if he was convicted, she said with patient finality, None of that matters. I love him for who he is. You have to take the good with the bad when you're in love. Doreen waited for hours to see him that Saturday and Sunday. She wanted to look extra nice because of Valentine's Day, and she put bows in her long black hair and wore a flowered dress she knew Richard liked. When she saw him, she told him how much she loved him and how much she wished she could have a conjugal visit with him on Valentine's Day. They both knew that was not about to happen, so they did the next best thing. Tuesday, February 14th, court reconvened at 10.40 a.m., Judge Tyner announced that he had to go to a funeral the following day, and court would be dark for the afternoon. Sheriff's homicide detective Russ Uloth then mounted the witness stand to tell the court he and his partner, J.D. Smith, had gotten to the Zazera home about noon, and after finding the footprints in the flower garden at the rear of the house, called for photographers and criminologists. Using a series of photographs, Halpin and Uloth take the jury through the Zazera crime scene. Yuloth identified the close-up of Mrs. Zazera with her pajama top pulled up to expose her breasts and wounds. Halpin asked the detective to describe the wounds he and John Lorca, from the morgue, had discovered. We noted that her eyes had been removed, that she had sustained a left gunshot wound to her temple. There were three large stab wounds to the left side of her neck and one on her cheek. He described the knife wounds in detail. The testimony had a visible effect on the jury. They were very attentive, leaning forward and listening, horrified at the viciousness of the assault. As sad and troubling as hearing about the Yokozaki U incidents were, those attacks had happened with a gun. Killing was simply an impersonal matter of pointing and pulling a trigger. But here a knife had been used in unspeakable, nightmare-causing ways. Richard crossed his legs. The chains rattled. Doreen looked at the back of his head and wished she could hold him, stroke his hair, take him away from all this. The following morning, before Judge Tynan broke for lunch, Uloth told about the autopsies. Uloth, J.D. Smith, Frank, and Gill ate in a Chinese fast-food restaurant and discussed the effect Russ's testimony was having on the jury. Hearing details like he'd described about the Zazera incident was a very sobering experience and would, they all agreed, bring home to the jurors the true depth of the Night Stalker's horrible reality. After lunch, Uloth described the ransacking, the three bags of pizza receipts at the front door, and the pillow with the missing pillowcase, and identified the slugs removed at the autopsies. Hernandez questioned Uloth about the pry marks the killer had left on the entrance window. Daniel implied that the marks had been put there when the Zazera house had been robbed previously, and that this had been an inside job. Daniel moved on to the avia footprints. Uloth said they'd found the prints on the side of the house, under Maxine's bedroom window, and on the container used to get into the house. Daniel wanted to know if Uloth had ever seen a pair of the Avia shoes, like the ones that had made those prints. He said he had, in a footlocker store at the Downey Mall. And during your investigation, did you ever find any similar shoes other than at the shoe store? I didn't. Hernandez pointed out for the jury that no such avia shoes had ever been found on Richard Ramirez. Judge Tynan interrupted so the court stenographer could have a break. During the break, some of the female jurors gave Valentine candies to the judge and to the defense and prosecution lawyers. Alternate juror Cynthia Hayden had baked a few cupcakes that said, I love you, and asked the bailiff to give one to Richard. When the court reconvened, Ramirez found it on the defense table, and when he was told one of the alternate jurors had asked it be given to him, he picked it up and promptly ate it. Richard loved sweets, and this was a very welcome treat. 
Judge Tynan said, People versus Richard Ramirez, A-771-272. He is present with counsel. The people are represented. The witness is on the stand. The jury and alternates are in the box. The record will reflect that the court and staff, and I believe counsel, have received valentines from the jury. I want to thank you very much. They are not to be construed as bribes or in any other way affecting the integrity of the people in this case. Daniel took Uloth back to the crime scene and questioned him about what he'd seen and what he'd done, but none of these questions helped Daniel's quest for reasonable doubt. Los Angeles County Sheriff's criminalist Steve Renteria, who had worked the Zazara crime scene, was sworn in. His job had been to make plaster casts of the Avia shoe prints. He told the jury how first photographs were taken of the prints, then the plaster was poured onto the prints. Halpin handed Renteria a sealed brown paper bag, Inside were the actual casts he'd made that March day. The killer, it seemed, had large feet, as the casts seemed enormous. The juror's eyes automatically moved down to look at Richard's chained feet. When Phil Halpern finished with Renteria, it was 4 p.m. Daniel didn't look well. He was pale and sitting low in his seat. "'Your Honor, I was hoping to start fresh with this witness tomorrow,' he said. "'Give it a shot, Mr. Hernandez. Are you able to at all?' I'm somewhat exhausted. It has been really warm in here today. Well, I will expect you to move with alacrity then, tomorrow afternoon, Mr. Hernandez, the judge said, and court was adjourned. As the jury and the alternates stood to leave, Richard took off his sunglasses and locked eyes with Cynthia Hayden. It seemed like electricity was passing between them. She wasn't a juror yet, but he figured with Satan's help he could get her on the jury. He knew what he saw in her eyes, and he figured she would never convict him and send him to San Quentin to die if she became a juror. She had felt his eyes on her all day. She'd later say of them, They have an animal quality that makes you feel he's looking right through you. Gil, Frank, and Halpin had heard about the Valentine cupcake Cynthia had sent over to Richard. They also saw the way she and Richard had looked at one another as court ended. They only hoped she would never get picked if any alternates were needed. The chances were slim. There were eleven other alternates, and the present jury seemed healthy, well-adjusted, and running smoothly. When Doreen saw the Valentine cupcake, she immediately knew Cindy had been the one to send it over. All along she'd been watching how Cindy had been ogling and staring at Richard, and she didn't like it one bit. Cindy Hayden was not some weirdo Satanist or sexually deviant street trash. She was well-dressed and obviously intelligent, with good taste, looks, and breeding. Later that day, when Richard and Doreen shared their first valentine together, she told him that Cindy was in love with him and looked like she wanted to have sex with him right there in the courtroom with everyone watching. He laughed and said things like that only happened on television. You mark my words, Doreen said. When this trial is over, she's going to come looking for you. Richard let out a big laugh. As Doreen left the jail that day, a dark-eyed, dark-haired female college student was hanging around outside. She was carrying a sign that read, I love Richard. Richard refused to see her. She knew who Doreen was and was resentful of her and gave her dirty looks. If looks could kill, I would have keeled over right there at the jail, dead, Doreen would later say. At ten o'clock the following morning, Daniel Hernandez cross-examined criminalist Steve Renteria about the plaster casts he'd taken. Although Daniel could not change the facts, he seemed to feel if he asked the same questions long enough, the testimony would become beneficial to Richard. However, all it seemed to do was bore the jury. The jury knew there were two sets of prints, one the killer's, the other Vincent's, and no matter what Daniel did or said, he couldn't change that fact. Finally, Halpin had enough and objected. The judge sustained the objection, and Daniel finished with Renteria. Halpin was ready to play one of his trump cards. He told the court the coroner in the Doy assaults was not presently available, so he was going to move on to a burglary case in Monrovia that he was certain tied the avia shoe print to Richard Ramirez. He called Monrovia officer Tom Wright, who testified he'd responded on May 9, 1985, to a robbery call on Olive Street at the home of Clara Hudsall, now deceased, and had found evidence of a break-in. A patio chair had been propped up against the back of the house, and someone had removed a lower window, and going into the house had stepped into a kitchen sink and left a footprint there. When the intruder stepped down to the floor, he'd put his palm on the sink and left a latent impression, 
which Officer Wright had lifted with a fingerprint kit he kept in the trunk of his police car. As well as lifting the palm and fingerprints he found around the sink, he'd lifted the footprint right out of the sink using extra-long lifting tape and cards. He gave the lifts to Sergeant Christensen of the Sheriff's Department. Officer Wright stated he also found footprints in dirt on the north side of the house and made plaster casts of those prints, too. Halpin handed him a sealed brown paper bag containing the plaster casts of the Avia prints, the same size as the ones he'd found at the Zazara residence. Hernandez knew he had to discredit this witness. The last thing he wanted was Richard's palm prints linked to the Avia prints. However, Daniel's cross-examination was unable to weaken Wright's testimony. He was able to establish that Wright had not had any prior experience casting footprints at crime scenes. During Daniel's questioning, Wright mentioned that he had found a pillowcase on the floor of the den. It was not lost on the jury that a pillowcase had been taken from the Zazara residence and that Halpin had said missing pillowcases were a common theme throughout the stalker crimes. It was not a point Daniel had intended to make. Halpin's next witness was Monterey officer Mike Gorjewski. He told the jury how he'd been dispatched to the Doy residence a little after 5 a.m. on May 14th and had found Lillian and a bloody Bill Doy on the floor being treated by paramedics. He described the ransacking and the sad emotional state of Lillian. Halpin, as he would consistently throughout the long trial, kept his direct examination short and to the point. Very little of what Gorodzewski had to say was in dispute, and Daniel quickly ended his cross of this witness. Judge Tynan said he had to go to a judge's luncheon in Pasadena and told everyone to take an extra long lunch break and return at 2 p.m. Richard was taken back to the court's holding pen, where he had the same sandwich and tea, lay down and fell asleep, dreaming he was on a planet in outer space, where he was a king on a throne, with everyone bowing and scraping around him. There were alien creatures in the dream, tall monsters who called him master, with big muscles and pointed teeth lurking in shadows. There were shrunken heads atop pointed spears around the throne. He was rudely awakened for court. Helpin continued with his presentation of the Doy incident and put on the stand Monterey Park policeman Bill Reynolds, who had also responded to a call for help at the Doy residence. It was Officer Reynolds who had removed the bloody thumb cuffs from Lillian's hand. He identified a picture of Lillian Doy at the hospital with the cuffs still hanging from her hand, and then the cuffs themselves. They were still covered with blood. Some journalists and court observers wondered where the stalker had gotten the idea to use thumb cuffs. Gill remembered how he had thought the stalker was a Vietnam veteran, for the U.S. Army had used thumb cuffs on captured Viet Cong. Richard hadn't served a day in the service, and Gill would not learn about Richard's cousin Mike until after the trial. Daniel's cross-examination of Reynolds did not gain any ground in planting reasonable doubt in the jury's mind. Halpin called Monterey Detective Paul Torres. He said the inside of the house looked like a hurricane had gone through it that there was a lot of blood on Bill Doy's bed and in the hall and den where he had crawled to call for help. Richard had his head in his hand, daydreaming about being back in El Paso, hunting out in the desert. How, he wondered, did I get from that happy, carefree place to this courtroom where everyone is so intent on killing me? Often he thought of getting up and just making for the exit, forcing the guards to shoot him. A bullet in the head, he figured, had to be better than what life had in store for him. He hated jail. He hated being told what to do. He hated the idea of the system he despised so much, dictating when he would die. With Satan's help, he would pick the time and place he died, not them. He mused as he watched Paul Torres and listened to the sadistic havoc the Night Stalker had brought to the home of Bill and Lillian Doy. He turned around. All the journalist's eyes moved to him. They hoped he'd cause some excitement. As soon as he turned, his girl sat at attention, smiled and winked and blew him quick, secretive kisses. Doreen nodded at him knowingly, as if she and he had secrets no one knew about. Because of his sunglasses, she could never tell if he was looking at her or at one of the other girls, who stuck out their chests and pouted their brightly colored lips suggestively. Even if he was looking at one of them, it didn't amount to anything. She was the only one who mattered. She was the only one he trusted. She was the only one he confided in. Sometimes he'd be able to make phone calls to her, and she'd tell him all the things she'd do for him to make him happy. She'd even play some of his favorite music in the background. Doreen was very optimistic about the trial, 
and she often talked about how they would go somewhere private after it was all over and live happily ever after. After Tori's direct, Halpin moved to put the Doi crime scene photographs into evidence, as well as the footprint casts, the thumb cuffs, and the bullets removed from Bill Doi. Daniel objected to everything and was overruled. Judge Tynan also allowed two photographs of Maxine Cesara in bed that Halpin felt were necessary to establish the eye gouging and the viciousness of the stab wounds. Tynan then addressed the jury, warning them beforehand that they were going to see unpleasant pictures. He instructed them that seeing the horrible wounds was not to influence them against the defendant. He said, You must not assume guilt simply because the photographs depict somebody who has been severely injured. Do you understand that? That is your rule as jurors. You are to be as neutral and objective as you possibly can be. Given the intensity and the intimacy of the attack, that was a very hard thing to do, and Richard knew it. He didn't like the jury seeing those pictures. He was restless in his chair and moving around, rattling the chains. As the jury was given the pictures of the brutalized Maxine, Halpin moved to enter the palm prints, the fingerprints, and the footprints collected at Clara Hadsall's house in Monrovia. Hernandez objected strenuously. Judge Tynan offered a sidebar to hear the nature of the objection, which was that the crime at the Hadsall home was uncharged, and as such its evidence should not be allowed in. Also, it was irrelevant. No avia shoe had ever been tied to his client. Halpin reminded the court that he had never mentioned any crime happening there. All it did was put the avia on his feet, because the fingerprints and palm prints were his, Richard's. The judge allowed them to introduce the photographs, fingerprints, and shoe prints. Tynan told Daniel if he could cite cases which showed he would be wrong in allowing the Hadsall prints in, he'd be happy to reverse his ruling. As the jurors studied the pictures of Maxine, some winced, some paled, and a few prayed. They were given the plaster casts of the doy footprints and the Zazera shoe prints and asked to handle them carefully as they passed the foot-sized casts among themselves. They could clearly see the prints were identical. After collecting all the exhibits, Judge Tynan called it a day and told the jury to enjoy another three-day weekend. Noticeably shaken and taking curious, angry looks at Richard, the jurors and alternates stood and left. Cynthia Hayden stared long and hard at Richard. When he turned around, Doreen was the only one still sitting there. It wasn't lost on the bailiffs that Doreen was present every day, and they kept a close eye on her. Though she looked innocent and had no police record, they were leery of any woman who was that obsessed with a man who was accused of cutting out a pair of human eyes for the fun of it. 36. When court resumed on February 21st, Judge Tynan announced that Daniel Hernandez was ill. He said he had spoken to him on the phone and that he was suffering from nervous exhaustion, was under a doctor's care, and should be all right in a few days. Therefore, he had decided to postpone the proceedings until Monday, February 27th, allowing a week for Daniel to recuperate. Salerno and Carrillo welcomed the break. They would use it to catch up on lost time with their families and other cases piling up on their desks. Halpin said he knew something like this would happen and was concerned about Hernandez having recurrent relapses. He saw this move as a stall tactic Daniel would try to parley into a mistrial. The jurors welcomed the seven-day hiatus from court. It was an arduous, difficult task, sitting still all day, listening to horrible stories and viewing photos of murdered people. At 9 a.m. on February 27th, an obviously annoyed Judge Tynan took the bench. Paralegal Richard Salinas sat at the defense table with Richard. Is Mr. Hernandez coming into court this morning? the judge asked Salinas. Salinas said no. Tynan told Halpin to approach the bench and explained that he'd received a letter from Dr. Pace the San Jose physician who was treating Hernandez for nervous exhaustion and elevated blood sugar and blood lipids. The judge said Dr. Pace had told him he was putting Daniel on a weight loss program and that he was seeing to it that Daniel received stress management counseling. Daniel was not fit for the arduous task of representing Richard Ramirez and would need one to four weeks of recovery. Selena said Daniel's secretary had called Alan Yokelson the week before to inform him of Daniel's condition. Halpin was unconvinced. He had heard that Daniel had used this tactic during trials before. He thought about all the time, three and a half years, and hard work that had gone into this trial, the difficult tasks of finding the jury and setting up all the witnesses. Now he'd have to call the witnesses and reschedule everyone all over again. 
The judge was not going to accept at face value Daniel Hernandez's medical disability. He ruled that not only Daniel was to be in court for a hearing on his condition on Wednesday, March 1st, but Arturo as well. Arturo was still on record as representing Richard, and the judge wanted him in court. Halpin suggested he could draw up a subpoena and bring in Daniel's doctor as well. He said, I have been through this before with one of our local attorneys, and it turned out that he misunderstood his doctor and in fact was healthy enough to go forward with the case. Tynan agreed and said he'd supply Halpin with the doctor's address for the subpoena. Tynan told a bailiff to tell the jury to come back to court on Monday, March 6th, giving them another extended break. All the jurors were anxious to get the trial over with, to be finished with this nightmare of civic duty and get back to the comfort and regular duties of their lives. Tynan decided to bring the jury in so he could explain Daniel's illness and apologize for the delay. He was only too aware of the jurors' discomfort. He told them to remember to keep their oath and stay away from the media. It was widely reported in the press that Hernandez was holding up the trial, feigning illness, hoping to cause a mistrial. Ever since the avia shoe print had been tied to Richard's fingerprints, it became evident that Daniel would have a very tough time winning this case. Reporters began digging into his past with a diligence that soon revealed facts that had not been known up until now. It was reported in the papers, for instance, how Daniel Hernandez had been fined twice for not showing up in Santa Clara County Courts. It was also reported that Daniel had been given a hard time by the state of California in getting his license to practice law after he had passed the bar. Daniel attributed this to the FBI having taken a dim view of his involvement with farm workers, his protesting the Vietnam War as an undergraduate at San Jose State, and staying in Havana for a few months as a guest of the Castro regime. On March 1, as ordered by Judge Tynan, both Daniel and Arturo were sitting at the defense table with Richard. Richard was angry because Daniel was slowing up the trial process. He, perhaps more than anyone in the courtroom, wanted to get the thing over with, even though he knew it would lead to the death penalty. In death, Richard still believed he would have a place of honor in the court of Satan, and death neither scared nor unsettled him. Judge Tynan read a letter from Daniel's physician detailing the symptoms he'd been suffering, the tests he'd undergone, and an estimate of four to six weeks for recovery. The judge told Daniel sincerely that he was concerned about his health, but after having a lengthy discussion with Daniel's physician, he did not find just cause to allow Daniel to miss any more court. Daniel made a long speech about how tired he had been since jury selection, how he was the only attorney working the case, and how it was all just too much for one person. He requested a few weeks' recuperation time and asked Judge Tynan to assign another lawyer to the case to assist him. Arturo declined comment. Halpin complained bitterly about having to keep rescheduling witnesses, some of whom had been terribly traumatized by vicious sexual assaults, and all these delays were further traumatizing and upsetting them. These people are getting disgusted, he boomed. Judge Tynan told Daniel that he knew death penalty cases were very stressful. Some of us have chest pains, some of us have belly aches, but the point is, we all suffer stress in these cases, even the court. And it is part and parcel of a death penalty case and we have to deal with them as best we can. The judge went on to say that he saw no good reason to delay the proceedings further and ordered both Hernandez's in court on March 6th, ready to proceed with the trial. Halpin remembered clearly how hard Arturo and Daniel had fought for the right to defend Richard. He'd known, when Judge Soper had ruled that Richard had the right to choose his own counsel, that it would come to haunt the proceedings, and quite possibly even cause a mistrial, meaning they'd have to do everything all over again. That possibility loomed over the court like a dark storm cloud sent by Satan himself to help Richard. Halpin had vowed not to try this case again. It was too much for any man to go through twice. He already had an ulcer and high blood pressure. Both Arturo and Daniel said they would obey the court's ruling. They knew Tynan would hold them in contempt and throw them in jail if they didn't comply. Monday morning, March 6th, Daniel showed up in court with a new strategy. He was now certain he could not handle Richard's defense properly, even with Arturo's help, and he turned to seasoned trial lawyer Ray Clark, a light-skinned black man with salt-and-pepper hair and mustache. Daniel had been talking to him about coming aboard the defense team since January, and Ray had joined the defense team after Judge Tynan had agreed to see he was paid the standard rate for a capital crime case, $100 per hour, by the state. 
Tynan knew it would cost the taxpayers a lot more if Ramirez had to be tried all over again. Before court, Tynan met Ray Clark for the first time in a closed meeting with Daniel and Arturo. The judge had researched Ray's background and knew he was a capable professional who had had experience with capital crime cases. He even had special training enabling him to be a member of the group of California attorneys who met the standards required for death penalty cases. To Tynan, Ray Clark was a ray of hope. His arrival meant that this trial would actually move on to completion. No matter what, Clark told Tynan, I'm in for the duration. Ray Clark had been in private practice, handling criminal cases almost exclusively since he'd passed the bar exam in December of 1973, the year he'd graduated from Southwestern School of Law. He was partners with his daughter, Dawn Blaylock, and Ephraim Clark, no relation. They would be handling the firm's cases while he was committed to the Ramirez trial. Judge Tynan shook his hand and welcomed him aboard. Back in open court, without the jury present, the judge announced for the record and for Phil Halpin's benefit that he had appointed Ray Clark to the defense team. Halpin knew Clark and his reputation and was very happy to see him sitting at the defense table. Now he believed the case would move along quickly. Richard had no say in the matter. He knew Daniel was in way over his head, and he welcomed someone who brought as much experience to the defense table as Clark. Richard knew Clark didn't know anything about the case, though. Clark's appointment raised grave appeal issues. There was a landmark 1976 case in which a conviction against Charles Manson follower Leslie Van Houten was overturned by the California Appellate Court when a new attorney was substituted in mid-trial after Van Houten's attorney had disappeared. The court held that even if the new lawyer pored over the transcripts of trial testimony, he had missed the opportunity to view each witness's demeanor as he testified. It is elementary that the right to counsel means the right to effective representation, the appellate court had said in the Van Houten case. In our opinion, an accused is denied effective representation if her trial attorney is unable to effectively argue the case. Not only had Ray Clark failed to see any of the witnesses testify, he still had not read the transcript. Tynan was in no mood, however, for more delays and didn't give Clark so much as an hour to read up on the case. He said, It is my understanding, Mr. Clark, that you will be co-counsel and there will be no delays in the case for you to get up to speed, that you will do the best you can on your own time to prepare yourself, and that this case will continue apace. Is that correct? Ray Clark answered, That's correct, Your Honor. Very well, sir. You are appointed and welcome. Tynan set up a hearing for March 24th to resolve a dispute the special master was having regarding the prosecution handing material over to the defense team scientist. The 24th was a Friday, and the hearing wouldn't waste any jury time, Judge Tynan said. Daniel complained about the district attorney's office not trusting the defense and making things difficult. Tynan wanted to know why these issues hadn't been already resolved. Daniel, with newfound vigor from his rest, his new diet and stress management counseling, and boosted by the presence of Clark and Arturo, said he'd tried to resolve them, but the prosecution wasn't cooperating. The defense table now looked like a formidable force, with Salinas, Clark, Daniel, and Arturo all sitting there, looking attentive. Halpin countered by saying he'd been waiting to be contacted, and accusations went back and forth until the judge put a stop to them and ruled the issues would be resolved at the hearing on the 24th. The jury was brought in. Halpin had pathologist Kogan tell the jury the details of Maxine Cesara's murder, He described three gunshot wounds, eight stab wounds, ligature marks around her neck, and the way the upper lids of both eyes had been cut away to facilitate removal of the eyes. He described the stab-slash wounds in detail as the jury squirmed and moved uneasily in their hard wooden chairs, trying to see past Richard Ramirez's sunglass facade of indifference as he rested his cheek on the palm of his huge right hand. At this point, Judge Tynan broke for lunch. At one thirty sharp, Dr. Kogan was back on the stand. Halpin showed him the bullets removed from Vincent and Maxine and had the doctor explain what damage each round had done and from where each had been extracted. Halpin turned Dr. Kogan over to Ray Clark. Although he had not yet read the trial transcript, Clark asked questions that were precise and to the point. He knew what he was doing, and that soon became obvious. There was little Clark could do to help the defense with Dr. Kogan, who had been put on the stand only to authenticate the autopsies for the court. Halpin put Linda Doy Flick on the stand. 
She told the jury she was an intern in family, marriage, and child counseling. Halpin asked her to describe her mother's condition. She said, Cognitive level thinking ability to process information is at about a two-year-old child level. In the last few years, she's shown signs of senility. Certain things she is very sharp about, and other things she can't respond to as well. She testified that she lived four blocks from where her parents had lived. She had visited them early in the evening before the morning of the incident. Her dad was healthy and watching television, and her mom was walking around the home. She had received a phone call from the police at 5.20 a.m., directing her to Monterey Park Hospital, where her mother had been taken. She said her mother's face was swollen and black and blue, and she was disoriented. Linda told the jury that she had been trained at Casa Colina Hospital in Pomona to work with the cerebrally impaired and with stroke victims. With this background, she had developed a way of speaking with her mother. Halpin showed her photographs of Mrs. Doy in the hospital, which Linda described for the jury's benefit. Halpin moved to September 5th, when Linda went to the jail with her mother to view the property lineup seized at Felipe Solano's house and other places. And did you, on this occurrence, see some items there that you recognized as property of your parents? Numerous items, she said. She had identified an inexpensive coin purse, a VCR, a Cernel Betacord, a coin purse of her mother's, a makeup bag, Lillian Doy's wallet, an Olympic pin her father had bought her mother, her grandfather's pocket watch, and the Omega Constellation watch her father never took off. In fact, she testified, the jeweler used to complain to him about it because he kept saying that if he took the watch off when he went to bed, there wouldn't be so much lint on it and he wouldn't have to keep repairing it. When Halpin asked what was taken that wasn't there, she said a one-carat diamond wedding band set in gold which had belonged to her father. The prosecutor kept Linda on the stand for an hour and fifteen minutes. Daniel Hernandez stood up to cross-examine Linda, asking her questions about the items recovered as though he didn't believe what she was saying. He asked her about a crime report she had helped her mother fill out, which contained a description that clearly did not sound like Richard. Halpin objected and asked for a bench conference, at which he said Daniel's questions were irrelevant unless he was trying to impeach the witness, which he was not. He said he was not putting Lillian Doy on the stand, so it didn't matter what she said about her attacker. Daniel said he might call Mrs. Doy because Linda had seemed to be able to communicate with her mother, despite her stroke, when they'd filled out the forms on the night of the attack. Tynan said he'd allow one question of Linda about her mother's description. Halpin still objected, but was overruled. Daniel retrieved a police questionnaire from the defense table and asked for permission to show it to Linda, which Tynan gave. She said she remembered that Detective Paul Torres had come to the house two weeks after the incident and helped her fill it out. Did you assist your mother's putting together a composite for the police? Daniel asked. She said she had, at the hospital and at the house, two weeks later. Daniel conferred with Clark. The jury was getting restless. Doreen knew the truth about the discrepancy between Mrs. Doy's description and Richard's appearance, and she couldn't understand why Halpin was so afraid of the jury finding out. She started thinking about writing to some newspapers to point this out. Daniel announced he had no more questions. Linda Doy slowly stepped down from the stand. Richard did not look at her. Judge Tynan called a recess. Cynthia Hayden sat with her eyes cast down. Gil Carrillo watched Cynthia closely to see if she communicated with Richard in any way. If she did, he'd have her ass thrown off the jury. The Valentine incident did not sit well with Sheriff's homicide. You may call your next witness, Judge Tynan told Halpin after the break. We're starting into another incident, the matter of Mrs. Bell and Lang, that occurred between May 29th and June 1st, 1985, Halpin said, and received permission to approach the bench. Because of the unexpected hiatus, he was going to have to present witnesses out of order and wouldn't be ready with his first witness until tomorrow morning. Tynan said he understood. 37. Phil Halpin opened by reading into the record the list of 51 photographs he'd be using in the Bell Lang matter. Ray Clark asked if he could have a bench conference without the court reporter. Judge Tynan said the reporter had to be present. Clark asked for a copy of the list of photographs going into evidence because he couldn't write them all down fast enough. Halpin said he'd be happy to give the defense a copy as long as there was no complaint about the order of the items listed. You may have a different situation with Mr. Clark, Judge Tynan said. 
The prosecutor introduced Mike Bumcroft from Sheriff's Homicide, who would be sitting at the prosecution's table during the Bell Lang presentation. Sitting behind Mike were Carrillo and Salerno in their usual places, as well as half a dozen of the homicide detectives from different cities in L.A. County. Family members of Mrs. Lang and Bell were sitting in court on the side with the police and seemed terrified by Richard's devotees. Halpin called Carlos Valenzuela, the elderly gardener who had found the two sisters. Carlos needed an interpreter. He was a shy man who did not like talking about that day, but he knew it was his duty as a citizen and as a man. He, like most of the civilians who took the stand, did not look at Richard or even in his direction. Carlos was a deeply religious man, and he had heard about the pentagrams. He knew the hand of Satan had a prominent place in all this. Carlos described how he had seen the newspapers and mail piling up at the front door at the residence of Nettie Lang and Mabel Bell, and decided something might be amiss. He opened the door, calling their names to no avail. He found Nettie first, then Mabel, with the table the stalker had left on her chest still there. He removed it and saw the horrendous beating she had gotten and the pentagram on the bed, and hurried to neighbors to call the police. Clark stood for the cross-examination, asking Carlos how many papers were on the porch there. Carlos said four. Clark asked who he'd discovered first. Carlos said Nettie. Clark said he had no more questions of this witness. James Olds, the first Monrovia policeman on the case, was called next. He testified he had cordoned off the house and taken pictures of the wounds and the general areas where each woman had been found. He made certain to get clear shots of the pentagrams and of the hammer, still speckled with dry blood. When both sisters were removed to the hospital, Officer Olds went along so he could take more photographs of the injuries after they had been cleaned, he stated. He treated the assault like a murder because the wounds were so severe, he knew death was probable, and he wanted all the evidence needed to convict. As he described the horrible injuries for the jury, the people in the courtroom began to move uneasily in their seats. Several of the female jurors began to cry, and their sniffling filled the silence between Officer Olds' terrible words. Halpin finished with Officer Olds, and Judge Tynan called a lunch recess, knowing the jurors would need a break after listening to the wanton brutality upon two defenseless old women. The jury and alternate stood and left. Richard sat there silently, alone with his thoughts. It was as though he was still a boy in school having an epileptic attack. He would just zone out and not be there at all. Halpin's next witness would be out of order. He called Dr. Claire Paul Naby, a general surgeon, who had worked on Nettie Lang in Methodist Hospital in Arcadia, then Dr. Michael Agron, who had worked on Mabel Bell. Claire told the court she had done an examination on Mrs. Lang's genitalia and found two stretch marks. Appropriate smears and washing had been taken, and no usable secretions, that is, seminal fluid, had been found at that time. The injuries were very likely caused by sudden and violent stretching of tissue in that area, she testified, but she could not say how such injuries had occurred. Halpin had her read her preliminary testimony, then asked if she now concurred with what she had said then. Reading my testimony from that date, it was my opinion that some attempt had been made at entry to the vaginal orifice. That's what Halpin wanted the jury to hear, that 84-year-old Nettie Lang, probably bound and already beaten, had been raped. The thick silence in the courtroom was broken only when Richard moved and the chains rattled. Halpin had no more questions. Ray Clark stood to pick at what he perceived as the weakness in her testimony. Could you assign a probability of likelihood to the rape, doctor? When you say very likely, does that mean more likely than not? I believe, she answered, that the source of my speculation would lie in the instruments that might have been used to do this, make such wounds. Clark got her to concede that she had no idea what had caused the vaginal tears. Halpin summoned Sheriff's Homicide Detective Bumcrot to the stand, and he told the jury how he and his partner, Mike Robinson, had received the call and described what he'd observed at the Lang house. He had also attended the autopsy of Mabel Bell in the middle of July, after she'd finally succumbed to her wounds. Halpin asked the detective if he had interviewed Nettie Lang. He said, no, sir. When she would wake up and see me or my partner, she would pull away from us, become extremely fearful, and begin to cry. The best Ray Clark was able to do in cross to distance Richard from this crime scene was to ask if the soda cans had prints on them, to which Bumcrot replied, one of the cans had some portions of a fingerprint, but it wasn't enough to make an identification. Satisfied, Clark ended his cross. Next, 
Charles van der Wend testified he had found a fabric print on the Mountain Dew can, which meant whoever had held the can had been wearing gloves. Halpin planned to prove glove prints were found at most of the Night Stalker attacks. Clark wanted to show the jury that the print wasn't necessarily a cloth glove, that it might have been a leather glove, but van der Wend testified that they could tell the difference between the texture of the surfaces. For instance, he said, the little pimples in pig leather would be picked up by the lifting tape after fingerprint powders were applied. Clark then had van der Wend tell the jury exactly how the fingerprints were taken. He had already been given that information early on, but Clark wasn't aware of that. When van der Wend finished, Clark suggested the prosecutor show the crime scene pictures now. Judge Tynan addressed the jury. Again, ladies and gentlemen, some of the photographs that you will be looking at this afternoon are not pretty. Remember, you are acting as judges here. You are not to be inflamed or emotionally involved in the photographs. They are evidence. You are to view them as evidence. They, in and of themselves, do not indicate that anybody is guilty of anything in this case. It is just evidence. You must view them as neutrally and objectively as you possibly can. He warned them not to talk among themselves about the prints. Halpin read the numbers of them into the record, and they were passed to the jury by Alan Yokelson. Stone-faced, each juror thumbed through the eight-by-ten black-and-white prints. They were passed to the alternates and finally collected by Yokelson. Judge Tynan told the jury they were finished for the day. 38. Judge Tynan apologized to the jury for the air-conditioning system not working well. The temperature in the windowless courtroom was in the high 80s or low 90s, and it made this difficult task even more difficult. He told Deputy Martinez to make sure someone from maintenance fixed the air conditioner. Halpin called to the stand Dr. Sarah Reddy, the medical examiner who had performed the autopsy on Mabel Bell on July 19th. Dr. Reddy told the jury that Mrs. Bell had died of cranium cerebral trauma and that there were wounds to her chest, abdomen, back, and buttocks. At Halpin's urging, she said the wounds were those of thermal burns that is, electricity. Halpin showed morgue photographs of Mabel Bell with tubes protruding from her neck and mouth. The head wound was so severe the surgeon couldn't repair it, and brain matter was still visible. Halpin asked what effect such head wounds would have on the cardiovascular system, and Dr. Reddy said, these severe and fatal head wounds cause the brain tissue to swell and become soft and soggy and compress the breathing center and also the heart beating center and that causes the stoppage of breathing and heartbeat. She told Halpin similar head wounds she'd seen previously had been caused by hammer blows. After conferring with Daniel, Ray Clark said he had no questions. Michelle Lopiesto testified next, telling the jury how it was she who'd picked up the alarm clock with the avia print on it and wrapped up the section of wall with the pentagram on it that Monrovia firemen had cut out for her. Ray Clark asked her questions about sketches she'd made and whether or not she'd found any hairs. There were, Daniel Hernandez had told Clark, human hairs mentioned at the preliminary that hadn't belonged to Richard or to either of the victims. She said she had found some hair under Mrs. Bell's bed, but did not know if these were human hairs. Clark focused on these hairs, but all he could get from Le Piesto was, I don't remember. Clark felt the hairs proved that someone else did it. This was his basic defense strategy, as he really did not see any other viable defense except an insanity plea, which Richard was unequivocally against. Criminalist Lipiesto was excused. Halpin said they were going to move on to Incident 7, that of Carol Kyle. He read into the record the 29 exhibits he'd be using in his presentation of the Kyle matter, then they broke for lunch. Carol Kyle walked into the courtroom like a woman with a mission. Her head was back, her shoulders square, her step sure and confident, and when she sat down she looked directly at Richard. She was clearly not cowed by or frightened of him. He let out a laugh. Halpin had her tell the jury about the night she had been awakened with a gun in her face and a light in her eyes. She testified that she had double-locked the front and back doors and windows, and that she was always careful about making sure the house was secure before retiring. She had had a Lhasa Apso dog back then, and had installed in the rear kitchen door a doggy door, which her attacker had apparently used to unlock a lock and gain entry. She said the doggy door could be locked, but she only locked it when away on vacation. "'What was the first thing you recall that person saying?' Halpin asked. "'I believe it was, "'Get up and don't make any noise,' she said, and went on to describe her and her son's ordeal in detail. 
Carol's words seemed to hover and quiver in the air as she spoke, evoking vivid images all too clear to the jury in court. She tried to reason with the stalker, telling him that her son's father had been killed. He has been through a lot in his life, she testified, she'd said. His dad died when he was six, and he's had a lot of trauma. Please don't hurt him. And he told me to shut up and took me into my bedroom. She described how in the bedroom he looked for valuables as he made her stare away from him. He called me cunt and bitch. She told the jury how he kept asking her for valuables, that he was obsessed with gold, diamonds, and cash, and how she went to a drawer and reached in to give him a jewelry box. She said, at that point he put the gun to my temple and said, don't ever move fast like that or I'll kill you. Carol testified that he then bound her hands behind her back with her pantyhose, left the room, ransacking as he went, came back and punched her a few times. He then told her to lie down on the bed. She knew what was coming and tried to dissuade him. I told him just that I was having my period, that I had an infection, whatever, you know, to get him to stop. He told me to shut up, and that if I made another noise he'd kill me. He put the gun right to my head again. She said he got on top of her and began kissing her. Once he was on top of you and kissing you, what did he do? Halpin asked. Kyle gave a detailed description of the sexual assault. She said she knew he'd kill her if she didn't comply with his demands. Women in the audience and in the jury moved uneasily in their seats. Carrillo looked at Cindy Hayden and watched her stare intently at Richard, a blank, curious expression on her face. And for what period of time, Halpin asked. Three minutes. And then what? Then he seemed satisfied, and he got up off of me, and I rolled over. As he was standing at the edge of the bed, he zipped up his pants. He was smiling at me and kind of chuckling and said I wasn't bad for my age. Carol said he wanted more valuables and ransacked her home again, putting things in a pillowcase. She said he then disabled the phone, gave her a robe, and brought her son into the bedroom and handcuffed them together, leaving the key on the mantelpiece where Carol's daughter could find it when she came home. He seemed, she thought, solicitous and oddly courteous. At the end of her testimony, she identified Ramirez as her attacker. Clark had decided to treat Carol like a woman who had made a mistake, not a victim. He was not particularly polite as he stood up and began his cross, first trying to underscore her identification at the lineup, which proved very difficult to do. Carol was positive about her identification of Richard, and no matter how many questions he asked, he could not make her waver. He tried to imply that there hadn't been enough light in the bedroom for her to see her attacker well, and that when she'd first awakened, the light had been in her eyes and she could not make out particular details. However, she did not agree with his hypothesis, saying she had had enough light to see him in the bedroom and that he'd been standing a foot and a half away when she'd looked right at him. Clark then asked her if she had seen photographs of Richard before she had gone to the September 5th lineup. She said she and her son had seen a picture of him on television Friday night, and when she had seen that picture, she'd known he was the man who attacked her. Mark, too, she testified, had said Ramirez was the man. Clark asked Carol if she'd called the police and told them so. She said, he, the next day, as I recall, the same person on the news flash, was apprehended. She explained she'd gone to a class reunion. Her son was home with a friend, and they had inadvertently activated the alarm system, which she had had installed after the incident. The police came to the house that night, and Mark told them at that time that the person that we saw on the TV the night before was the one that was in our house. Ray Clark waited a few seconds, trying to give the jury time to comprehend and appreciate the fact that she hadn't called the police as soon as she'd seen the picture of the man she was claiming was her attacker. He asked her how many times Richard had struck her, and were the blows hard. She said she thought they were given one at a time, the first one the hardest, delivered to her right shoulder blade. Did he deface your home in any fashion, other than strewing these items about in an apparent search for valuable items? Clark asked. Not that I'm aware of. Trying to distance Richard from the Lang Bell incident, he asked, He didn't mark upon your walls, or draw pentagrams or anything on your walls? No. And other than obviously being an intruder in your home at that time of night, he didn't threaten your son. Is that a fair statement? he asked. No. Clark asked her about the type of gun she saw in the attacker's hands, but she didn't know the difference between an automatic and a revolver. He took her back to the lineup and asked her how many words she had heard Richard speak. She said whatever it was that he said, and I don't even remember what it was at this time, I just remember this horrible chill going through me and thinking, that's his voice. Clark moved to the composite Carol had helped put together 
and she testified she had never been happy with the first one, that the second one was more like the image she had of her attacker. 39. The following morning, Tynan announced that Arturo Hernandez had called and would not be able to be in court because of another pressing matter. Halpin moved to incident number eight, the murder of Mary Cannon. He introduced photographs of the crime scene and morgue pictures of Mrs. Cannon, showing her gaping neck wounds. At this crime scene, a butcher knife and knife sharpener had been found on the bed next to Mrs. Cannon. Mr. and Mrs. Frank Starrich, the couple who lived next to Barry, testified first. Frank told the jury about noticing that Mary's front window screen was down, entering Mary's home to find the ransacking and calling the police. Clark had a few questions about the distance the Starrich's house was from Mary's house, and he quickly got Starrich to agree he had no idea how the screen he'd found on the lawn had gotten there. Christine Starrich repeated with more detail what her husband had said. Halpin wanted to show the jury pictures of Mary's body, but Clark objected on the grounds that they were gross and gory and likely to inflame the jury. Halpin countered that the force and viciousness of the cuts were important to the case and were very much like Jenny Vinko's injuries, which he contended the jury must see. Clark objected strenuously to Exhibit 20G, a close-up of the neck wound. Halpin said he would be showing only 201 and 20H to the next witness, Lieutenant Ed Winter, one to identify the victim and one to indicate the wound. Judge Tynan agreed, saying, The body has been cleaned up and the great masses of blood have been eliminated, and they are not pretty, either one of them, but I think they are necessary for the purposes of this trial. Winter described the photos to the jury and testified about the ransacking, the disabled phones, and the arrival of Frank Salerno. Clark understood that the tissue with the avia print on it tied the cannon crime to other crimes, and he wanted to get Winter to say that it might have been the shoe print of a cop. Using a photograph of all the police and criminalists who'd been present, Clark asked Winter if he'd looked at the soles of the shoes of all ten. He testified that he had. In great detail, Clark had Winter describe the soles of the shoes he was wearing that day. Clark was unable to weaken Winter's testimony. The prosecutor put Dr. John Shipley on the stand, and he testified he had performed the autopsy on Mary Cannon. The cause of death was multiple trauma injuries as a result of blunt force trauma and an encircled wound to the neck to aid strangulation, he said. He described in minute detail the injuries Cannon had suffered, stating that there were at least ten blows with a heavy metal object. Halpin asked about the stab wounds to the neck. Dr. Shipley answered, What we're dealing with are four wounds, one of which is a large combined wound. That is, it has the features of both a stab wound and an incised wound, and then, in addition, there are three small stab wounds to the side of the neck. The single combined wound on the side of the neck is an extremely lethal enlarged wound. The knife penetrates from the side of the neck, and it is responsible for transecting the left carotid artery, and then it immediately cuts across the larynx so that it transects the epiglottis, which is the upper portion of the larynx, or voice box, from the lower part, and actually goes into the side of the mouth and back. This testimony was crucial, Halpin felt, because the distinctive stab-slash wound was present in many of the Night Stalker attacks. He asked how long it would take for someone who had sustained such an injury to die. The doctor said a matter of seconds. Halpin's first witness on March 13th was David Bruce Nip, Mabel Bell's grandson. Walking slowly and not looking in Richard's direction, he took the stand, was sworn in, and identified morgue photographs of Mrs. Bell and Mrs. Lang, and photographs of a cassette player he had bought his grandmother for her 87th birthday on April 6, 1985. Clark tried to suggest the cassette player might have been stolen before the May 29th attack, but without success. The prosecutor called Mark Cranebrink, David's brother, and he testified he had last seen Ma Bell and Nettie Lang two months before the attack, and that they were healthy and well on that occasion. He had gone to see them after the attack of June 1st in the Arcadia Methodist Hospital, they were both in a comatose state and could not communicate or acknowledge him. Halpin asked about the last time he'd seen his aunt, Nettie Lang. He said he had visited her at the Sophia London Hospital the day before, and that she, she just lays in her bed, and she is unable to speak. She can move her head to look at you, but you can't be positive that she knows you are there or knows what you are saying. How is she fed? She is fed through a tube. Halpin moved back to the Cannon incident, and called criminalist Lloyd Mahaney, who testified he had responded to a summons by the sheriff's office. 
He was greeted by Frank Salerno, who directed him to two footprints on the bedroom rug of Mrs. Cannon's home. He cut them out with a carpet knife, and they were rushed to the sheriff's crime lab, where they could be photographed under optimal conditions. Halpin showed the actual pieces of carpet, which over time had lost the impressions, and photographs of the rug with the prints still in them. They were very difficult to see. Clark went at Mahaney with a vengeance. He felt trying to introduce evidence that had once existed but had since disappeared was bogus, and he asked dozens of questions about how he'd cut the rug patch out, what exactly he'd done with it, and was it the right or left foot. The criminal said he didn't know, that he wasn't a footprint specialist. Clark was unable to undermine Mahaney's testimony. In fact, his cross brought out something harmful to the defense. The criminalist described for the jury how he had removed, with a tweezer, pieces of the glass lamp she'd been struck with, glass that had remained embedded in Mrs. Cannon's face. On redirect, Halpin clarified that the prints in the rug had been found in a second bedroom where there had been ransacking, not in the one where Mary had been attacked. Judge Tynan soon recessed court until 1.30, at which point Halpin was going to present the next case. Carillo and Salerno ate together just about every day they were in court. If it was sunny, they'd leave the court building and take a leisurely stroll over to the mall where they would sit outside and eat. It was relaxing to them both. Among the throng of people who worked in the downtown area and were at the mall, no one knew who they were, and they could relax and not think of Richard or the trial. They ate silently and watched people walk by and didn't talk about much. When court started up, Halpin announced they would be jumping forward to the residential burglary and attempted murder in the Bennett assault. He moved into evidence all the exhibits, photographs, the tire iron, and the comforter with the avia print on it, then called Sierra Madre police officer Jerry Skinner, the first policeman to arrive at the Bennett house at 5.06 a.m. on the morning of the assault. He told the jury how he was greeted by Mr. Bennett at the door and appraised the situation, and he said a medevac team had arrived 30 seconds later to take a very badly beaten Whitney to the hospital. He described how he had discovered a bloody tire iron on the floor of Whitney's bedroom, laying on the carpet in the middle of a large pool of blood. Frank Salerno had arrived and taken over the crime scene. Clark cross-examined Officer Skinner, having him repeat much of what he had already said in greater detail. The jury learned nothing new and became fidgety. Halpin told Judge Tynan the victim in this case had to be brought in from out of town and would not be available today. The judge said he understood, congratulated Ray Clark on moving the case along so quickly, and dismissed the jury until 10.30 the following morning. Halpin moved to introduce again the coroner's pictures of Jenny Vinco's neck injuries. Ray Clark objected strenuously, particularly to the fact that they were close-up shots, which made them twice as gruesome as they should be. Tynan didn't agree. He said they were morgue shots of the injuries and should, because the prosecutor was trying to show a similar M.O. in the knife killings, be allowed in. 40. Since the July 1985 attack on Whitney Bennett, Frank Salerno had grown close to the Bennett family, becoming personal friends with Whitney's father, Steve. Frank thought the world of Whitney. She had been through a nightmarish ordeal, yet rarely complained and often smiled when she should have been crying. Since her attack, she had had four operations to repair and remove the damage caused by the stalker. Steve Bennett came to the courthouse with Whitney. Frank and Gill stayed with them in the district attorney's office until it was time to take the stand. Whitney was nervous about testifying. She knew millions of people would be paying close attention to what she said, and she didn't like having to be in the same room as Richard Munoz Ramirez. She thought of him as the embodiment of evil a human being possessed of demonic force straight from the deep recesses of hell. Frank had come to consider Whitney as almost a surrogate daughter. He was very protective of her, staying close and reassuring her that it would soon be over. Frank's youngest son, Mike, took off work to be in the courtroom when his father would be testifying. Mike was six feet tall, muscular and well-built, with dark hair and large, dark eyes. He was a handsome man who had inherited his father's confidence. Mike was very proud of his dad and wanted to watch him testify. He knew his father had been particularly touched by Whitney and her ordeal. The people call Whitney Bennett, Halpin resumed. Whitney entered the courtroom, took the stand. She was no longer a teenager, but a beautiful young woman with honey-brown hair and large blue eyes. She saw Frank Salerno. He smiled reassuringly. 
Halpin had her describe for the jury the July 4th night she had been assaulted. She testified about the party she'd been to, coming home very late and going to bed. The next thing she remembered was waking up on her stomach in a pool of blood and much pain about her head and hands. She did not remember being assaulted at all. She testified that she got up and made it to the hallway, where she collapsed and screamed for her father. She said she vaguely remembered him coming to her aid and the paramedics taking her to the hospital, where she stayed for eight days. And did you continue to receive medical treatment after that? Yes. For how long? Approximately for two and a half years. What about now? Do you still have some medical problems? Occasionally I go and have my eyes checked and cosmetic surgery. I'm still seeing a plastic surgeon. The bone surrounding her left eye socket was smashed and had to be reconstructed. What type of surgery did you have? I had surgery on my hands and my face and my head. Halpin had Whitney recreate the attack for the jury using crime scene photographs of the bloody pink comforter with the avia print on it. Her bedroom dresser, where she testified she had put the jewelry she had been wearing, which was stolen that morning, and the can of Coke she'd taken into her bedroom. Halpin finished and turned her over to Clark, who asked Whitney if she had noticed anything unusual as she had driven home from the party, implying her attacker had trailed her home, rather than indiscriminately going in the window, as the prosecution was contending. She repeated that she had not been followed. She'd been speeding because she was late and had kept a close eye on the rearview mirror, Clark seemed intent upon proving Whitney had been followed, and asked her if her window was facing the street and had it been open, implying someone might have seen her through it, despite the fact that the window was above the surrounding landscape. He asked her if she normally kept her window open with the curtains pulled back. She said she had earlier opened the window to tell her dad that he had a phone call and had never closed it. Clark's questions did not undermine Whitney's testimony, and he finished without weakening Halpin's case. The avia print on the comforter he knew tied this crime to others, and he could not change that fact. Judge Tynan thanked Whitney, and she left the stand and headed for the exit. As she moved through the courtroom, Frank's son Mike stared at her intensely, admiring her courage and feeling a tremendous sympathy for her. He thought Whitney had an inner beauty and a gentleness that was rare. Halpin called Steve Bennett to the stand. Steve was a tall man with clean, well-defined features. As he sat on the stand, he looked at Richard, who stared at a yellow pad on the desk in front of him. Bennett told the jury he and his friends had sat outside that night and watched the fireworks display over the San Gabriel Valley. He wasn't sure whether or not he'd locked the front door. He described how he'd gone to bed and awakened to Whitney's screams, finding her beaten beyond recognition. The tire iron was on the floor of his daughter's room when he went to get a pillow to place under her head. Halpin told the court he would be moving to the next count because there were no more witnesses in the Bennett matter. Then, looking at Frank Salerno, he changed his mind and said he'd put Frank up next. Clark stood and said that he was not ready to proceed because the special master was still having difficulties getting samples of evidence from the prosecutor's office. He asked for a hearing, based on papers the defense had presented to the court and the district attorney's office the day before. Judge Tynan had set the 24th to hear that motion, and Halpin said he wouldn't be ready to argue until then. Tynan told him he would dismiss the jury until 1.30 so he could study the motion now. When court resumed, Tynan announced he had gotten a note from juror number 11, Maria Santos, which said that Steve Bennett was an employee of Southern California Gas Company, where she, too, was employed. Judge Tynan called Halpin, the defense team, and juror Santos to the bench. She said she had seen Bennett in the company cafeteria, but did not know him personally, nor had she ever spoken to him. At Judge Tynan's questioning, she said this would not in any way affect her judgment or decisions. Tynan saw no problem, and neither Clark nor Halpin had any objection. Carrillo and Salerno worried that Maria Santos would be disqualified, and that alternate juror Cynthia Hayden would take her place. They did not want her on the jury. They had often caught her staring at Ramirez with an intensity that made them uneasy. Aware of issues pertinent to appeals, Judge Tynan agreed that Richard should be told about this development. Halpin didn't want to be close to Ramirez at a sidebar, and said so. "'Well, go back to your seats,' the judge offered. Halpin knew Richard hated him. For all he knew, Richard was capable of jumping on him and trying to bite his throat out. He did not trust Ramirez in any way. To Halpin, Ramirez was as dangerous and unpredictable as a rattlesnake. Richard was brought in shackles from the holding pen to sit at the defense table. 
Clark leaned over and told him about Santos's working at the same company as Bennett. Richard's brows knitted together. He asked Clark and Hernandez what they thought, and they both said they had no problem with her still serving. Clark thought he would go along with their advice, but Richard didn't see it the way his defense team did. He said had he known she worked in a company where Steve Bennett was an executive, he would have said he didn't want her, right from the get-go. No matter what she says, she's fucking affected by him, if not consciously, then subconsciously. That's her boss, man. Richard's point was not lost on Clark. If Richard didn't want her, she had to go. I want her off the panel, he said with finality. Clark turned to Judge Tynan and said, Mr. Ramirez, in light of this fact, does not wish her to serve. He feels that it is, that there is something to it, the relationship, even though it's not apparently a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but it is something that had he known at the time, he would have urged defense counsel to exercise a challenge. Halpin had no objections. It seems to me appropriate, if that is what the defendant wishes, and he is correct, we really don't know what, what may exist. We don't know at this point whether the witness might be somewhere in the chain of the juror's command. We didn't get into that, but I think the position of the defendant's table is well taken. Halpin knew that if Santos stayed on the jury after Ramirez requested her removal, there would more than likely be an automatic reversal if there was a conviction. Halpin wanted to avoid giving Ramirez more ammunition than he already had because of the Hernandez's lack of experience in capital crime cases. He still felt that Judge Soper had erred severely when she'd okayed the Hernandez's as defense counsel. Judge Tynan turned to the defendant and said, That is your request, is it, Mr. Ramirez, that juror Santos be excused for cause because of the relationship with the witness? Yes, Richard said in a strong voice, and that was the end of juror Maria Santos. The judge asked her to be brought out and patiently told her of the court's decision, apologizing for having to dismiss her. She said thank you and left. Judge Tynan ordered the jury to be brought in and told them Santos had worked where Mr. Bennett was employed and for that reason had to be discharged. He asked his assistant, Josephine, to draw an alternate name from the round drum. Cynthia Hayden sat upright, leaning forward, hoping to hear her name. She locked eyes with Richard. Josephine read the name Donald G. McGee, and Gil, Frank, and Phil Halpin all sighed in relief. Mr. McGee left the alternates and took place number 11 in the jury box. Cynthia Hayden was clearly disappointed. Salerno was recalled to the stand. All the newspeople were anxious to know what he had to say. They knew he had spearheaded the two largest serial killer cases in California's history. Frank told the jury he had arrived at the Bennett residence a few minutes after 9 a.m., and Carrillo had gotten there five minutes later. He said he saw a bloody print on the windowsill, the tire iron, and the pink comforter. As of that morning, had you seen similar shoe prints? Halpin asked. I had seen similar impressions at the Cannon residence, and I was aware of a similar shoe print that was found at the Zazera location after reviewing the photographs of that crime scene with Detectives Uloth and Smith and my partner. Halpin then had Frank describe the visit to Methodist Hospital with Carrillo to see Whitney Bennett before she'd been bandaged. Frank identified the photograph he'd taken that showed a very badly beaten, unrecognizable teenaged girl. Clark was very aware of Salerno's reputation as a thorough, tenacious pursuer and investigator who did his homework and came prepared. Clark focused his attention on the phone, knowing severed phone lines had been found at most of the Night Stalker crimes. He wanted to show the jury the Bennett's phone line had not been severed, but a photograph of the cut line made that impossible. After the lunch break, the prosecutor said they would move on to the tenth incident, the murder of Joyce Nelson. Halpin knew the avia print had actually been left on Mrs. Nelson's face, and it was now fresh in the jurors' minds. Court resumed. Halpin moved Exhibits 12M to 120 into evidence, which related to the Bell incident. The jury was brought out, and he read into the record all of the exhibits pertaining to the Joyce Nelson attack, then put Joyce's neighbor, Bob Blanco, on the stand. He told the jury how he'd become suspicious when he'd gone out to get the paper at 6 a.m., and noticed that a gate linking their two yards was open, and that the rear door to the Nelson house was also open. When the door was still open at 9 a.m., he had approached the rear patio, called Joyce's name, and noticed a screen had been moved. Receiving no response at the front door, he'd pushed it open. He saw that a dresser drawer was ajar, like someone was going through them. He called another neighbor, Clifford Sharp, and the police were summoned. On cross-examination, Clark had Mr. Blanco testify to what had happened that morning again and again, 
until the end of the proceedings that day. 41. Court resumed with Halpin introducing all the photographs relevant to the Sophie Dickman attack. That done, a heated argument between the prosecutor and the defense team erupted over the material the special master was supposed to have gotten from the district attorney's office. Halpin complained that the defense team had just given him a long list of numbers without any description of the materials. He said the defense had been dragging their tails for years, and suddenly they wanted everything all at once. He was clearly angry and frustrated. Halpin was afraid the court would give the defense team a long period of time to review all the material they were now demanding. Tynan said he had no such plans, and added he thought an argument had been hammered out. He'd signed a rider that was prepared by the prosecution, and everyone had been in agreement as to the manner in which it was handled. Halpin felt he was being spoken down to by Judge Tynan in open court, and requested a hearing. Judge Tynan tried to work out the complicated business of the DA's office sharing all the evidence with the defense forensic experts. He told both sides to have their experts in court on the 24th that he would order the special master there, too. Until then, he wanted the trial to proceed as smoothly as possible. The jury was brought out, and Frank Salerno returned to the stand to testify that he'd arrived at Mary Cannon's house at 10.35 a.m. on the morning of the 2nd. He saw the broken pane of glass in the window the killer had used to gain entry, and the footprints on the rug. He got down on his hands and knees with a flashlight, scrutinized the prints, had them photographed, cut them out of the rug, tacked it to the plywood, and rushed it to the sheriff's lab. He described finding a tissue on the floor with the distinct footprint of the avia in blood. Halpin showed Salerno a close-up photograph of the victim as she was discovered. Her left arm is bent at the elbow and back behind her, with the palm of her hand facing up, he said, describing her pose for the jury. There is a broken lamp, a milk-glass-type lamp, that is on the bed directly next to her left elbow, and on the bed here, on the left side, I found a knife that was approximately ten inches in overall length that was blood-soaked. And up in the area of the shoulder and face, did you find other material? I found what would appear to be pieces of the broken lamp about the bed, near her face. I found pieces of the broken lamp actually in her head and hair, and the pillow to the right of the victim is, had, what appeared to me, blood soaked into it. Halpin had Frank now tell the jury how he had found that same shoe print in the planter area in the front yard and on the rear patio porch of Joyce Nelson's residence in Monterey Park on July 7th. Salerno testified to assigning two detectives to learn everything they could about that particular shoe, the avia aerobic. Frank was about to tell the jury what he'd been told about the shoes when Clark objected, calling it hearsay. Halpin said it wasn't hearsay that he was not asking for the truth of the matter, just an opinion. Judge Tynan reserved his ruling until after lunch. During lunch, Doreen grabbed a hamburger in a nearby fast food place. She wished she could bring Richard a nice lunch they could eat together in his little cell. As Doreen ate, she wrote Richard one of the several love letters she sent him each day. In them, she made observations about what was going on in court. She didn't miss much and often had astute insights. Richard had grown to trust and care for Doreen very much. She was, he'd come to believe, totally dedicated to him. She was probably the first woman he'd ever trusted. When court reconvened, Judge Tynan told the jury that Frank's observations of the shoe prints were noted merely to indicate the avenues he had taken in his investigation, not that the shoe was any particular brand. Halpin asked Frank to explain to the jury the great lengths the police department had gone to in analyzing and identifying the shoe print. He stated they'd even sent criminalist Burke to Portland, Oregon, to interview the developer of the Avia Aerobic, a Mr. Jerry Stubblefield. Halpin showed Frank crime scene photographs of Joyce Nelson as he had discovered her that day, and Frank said he noted the imprint of a shoe on the left side of her face, though he could not discern any particular pattern. Clark knew the avia print connected the crimes. Although the district attorney had no proof they were ever on Richard's feet, he would do what he could to undermine Frank's testimony. On cross, he asked Salerno if the shoe prints had a serial number that distinguished them from all other shoes. Frank said, not that I'm aware of. Clark asked a few more questions about the samples Burke had brought back from Oregon and whether or not Avia had a copyright on the sole, which it did. Clark was soon finished. 
Surprisingly, he did not ask Frank if such shoes were ever found in Richard's possession. Halpin now moved to the Sophie Dickman attack, residential burglary, rape, and sodomy. His first witness, Dr. Gerald Bross, had examined Miss Dickman when she had been brought to the emergency ward the morning of the incident. He stated he had given her a complete physical examination, finding rips and tears in the genital area and damage to Miss Dixon's anus, where there were also tears and some bleeding. Clark had no questions, and Bross was dismissed. Sophie Dickman told the jury that she had a master's degree in psychiatric nursing supervision and had worked as a psychiatric nurse for thirty-eight years. Halpin wanted her to identify Richard, but she had not worn her glasses and now had trouble distinguishing him from Daniel Hernandez. Halpin had to refer to Daniel's beard for clarification. Miss Dickman described how she was awakened at 3.20 a.m. as the light in her bedroom suddenly came on. There was a man standing in the doorway, very tall, very thin, dressed in black with black gloves on. He had a gun in his hand. He came round the table that the lamp was on, put the gun to my head and his hand over my mouth, and said, If you make a sound, I'll kill you. She took a deep breath and described the gun as a silver metal automatic. Halpin asked her if she knew the difference between an automatic and a revolver. She said she did. I was on the rifle and revolver team of Los Angeles County. She stated she was ordered to stand up, turn around, and put her hands behind her back. Embarrassed by her nudity, she told her attacker that the shutters were open. He pushed them closed and put handcuffs on her. He had ransacked her home, noticing immediately she had slipped off her sapphire and diamond ring to hide it. He made her lie on the bed, pulled off her underwear, and put one of his gloves in her mouth, telling her to bite down on this so you don't scream. She said the glove was leathery and had vertical and horizontal ridges, which she felt with her tongue. She told how he put a pillowcase over her head, threw himself on her, and proceeded to rape her. He asked her if she was enjoying it. Several jury members stared at Richard in wonder. Miss Dickman said the sexual attack lasted two minutes. I realized that he didn't have an erection. He was just thrusting and pounding, and that was it. He turned me over after two minutes and tried sodomy. You say tried. What was it he did? He was thrusting and pounding against the rectal area, except it was more like my tailbone. Your hand still cuffed behind you? Yes. And could you feel the defendant's genital area there against your rectal area? It was against my tailbone. It felt like I was being torn in two. How, alternate juror Cynthia Hayden wondered, did it feel like she was being torn in two if he didn't have an erection? And how did she get those tears Dr. Bross had told the jury about? Halpin seemed to come to the same conclusion. Could you, he said, determine at any time if the defendant actually penetrated your genital area? I don't think so. He didn't have an erection, she said. Carrillo looked at Salerno with a curious expression on his face. They both knew semen had been removed from Sophie Dickman by Dr. Bross at the emergency room of the hospital. At this point, Judge Tynan recessed for the day. He asked Miss Dickman to come back at 10.30, and she and the jury were excused. Tynan asked Halpin and Clark to come up to the bench. He wanted to know why Miss Dickman had said she wasn't raped, and if the charge of rape should be amended to attempted rape. Halpin explained that Dr. Bross said she was confused about what exactly had happened to her. He wanted to leave the charges as they were because the attempt is included in the act itself. I just asked, the judge said. In the morning, Sophie took the witness stand again, facing a sun-glassed, angry-faced Richard Ramirez. She saw Richard as a mentally ill person who had no right being free in society. She believed that the forces that drove him were totally out of his control. Because she understood the ways of the psychopath, she harbored no wish for revenge. She just wanted him locked away, forever. On the second day of her testimony, she seemed more composed than she was wearing her glasses, Halpin, like everyone else, noticed and asked her about them. She said she was nearsighted and could only see well for four or five feet. Halpin showed her the pictures of the crime scene, her home, and the pieces of jewelry that had been stolen, before directing her attention back to Richard. He asked if he looked different today than he had then. She said his hair was different and that he was wearing a suit and tie. Daniel Hernandez stood for the cross-examination. He asked her if she was married or divorced. Divorced. And did you see your husband at all that evening, he asked. 
I hadn't seen him since 1965, she said, derailing his intent to apply she had had sexual relations with someone other than his client earlier that evening. Daniel proceeded to have her again take the jury through what the man dressed in black had done to her, getting her to agree that she had told him at the preliminary that her assailant's shoes were dark canvas topped with a white line around the sole, and not the now infamous avia aerobics. Daniel tried to create a scenario in which she'd never truly seen her attacker because he had ordered her from the beginning not to look at him. This, combined with her bad eyesight, the poor light, and her having a towel placed over her head for much of the time, would prevent her from ever getting a good look at her attacker. He suggested she had chosen Richard because she had seen his picture in the news when he'd been arrested and heard comments by public officials promoting his guilt. She denied she'd told the police her assailant had been dressed like a camper and was five foot eight. No, I did not, she countered. Daniel asked if she had told the police her assailant was not Latino, and she said yes, she said he wasn't a Latino, Oriental, or black. Judge Tynan interrupted, saying he had to go to a meeting. As the courtroom cleared, Cindy Hayden and Richard stared at one another, to Doreen's displeasure. When court resumed, Daniel had a police report from Detective Corrigan, the officer Sophie Dickman had spoken to at the Monterey Park station the morning of the assault. Do you remember telling the person that you spoke to at the police department after the incident that the person looked like a hiker or mountain climber? Never, she said. Daniel smiled faintly. You don't remember that? I know I didn't say it. Her brows knit together and her lips tightened against her teeth. Daniel asked permission to show her the report. He seemed calmer and more in control of himself than at the beginning of the trial. Having Ray Clark lead the defense team had taken a very draining strain off Daniel's shoulders. He handed the report to Sophie, and he pointed to the third paragraph down. She read carefully. The first sentence I did say. He smelled leathery. But the rest of the sentence, no. The report read that she had stated her attacker was dressed as a hiker or mountain climber. Daniel again asked her if that didn't refresh her memory, and Halpin interrupted, saying, Excuse me, Miss Dickman had already indicated that she did not tell him that. I will allow the question, overruled. You didn't say that, did you? the judge asked her. No, I didn't, she repeated. Then the report is incorrect. That line is... Daniel again asked her if she had told Detective Corrigan her attacker was not Latino. I don't know if I said it that way... Daniel directed her attention to the second sentence of the second paragraph. Does that refresh your memory as to having told the officer whether or not you told the officer that the person was not Latino at that time? Well, I don't remember if I said it, if I said it at the time, but I did say he was not black, oriental, or Latino. Okay, Daniel said, and he had what he wanted. Salerno, Carillo, and Halpin all knew Dickman had very bad eyesight and wanted her off the stand as soon as possible. She was not a good witness for the prosecution. Daniel moved on to the cans of soda she had found out of the refrigerator and on the floor of the rear patio. He knew there weren't any prints on them and asked her if they'd been there before the incident. No, she said. He then asked her about the community meeting she'd attended in Monterey Park, if she had spoken there, to which she again said no. He wanted to know if the composite sketch she helped prepare was passed around at the meeting. She said it was. Daniel smiled. And the description that was on it, was that also your description? I don't remember, she told him. Doreen squirmed uneasily in her chair. Clearly, Dickman had described someone other than Richard, but wouldn't admit it, Doreen would later say. Daniel reminded Sophie that at the preliminary she had told him the leaflet passed out at the Monterey Park meeting had the description she had given on it. Well, she said, I don't remember telling you that, but if I did, I did. With her testimony damaged on several points, Daniel soon finished and turned Mrs. Dickman back over to Halpin, who was eager to repair the damage. He moved back to the lineup, and she said she had no confusion that Richard Ramirez was the man who had raped her and stolen her jewelry and dignity. How close did you get to him at that time, during the lineup? I got up on the stage and walked past him and back again, only eighteen inches from him. Do you have any idea how this description of a mountain climber got into somebody's mind? I cannot imagine, she said, with a slight touch of indignation. He showed her another flyer of the night stalker suspect, which she said she'd had nothing to do with. Halpin put it down where the jury could see it. 
Daniel objected to the jury being exposed to this other composite without it being admitted as evidence. The judge agreed with him, and Halpin put the flyer in his folder. Halpin asked why she hadn't called the police when she first saw Richard's picture on the tube. First, it was eleven o'clock at nightly news. Secondly, I just figured they knew what they were doing. That is their job. They didn't need any hints from me. Daniel asked her more questions about how many times she had actually seen Richard's picture before the lineup. Richard hated Halpin. He viewed him as the embodiment of all that was wrong with the legal system. He often dreamt about Halpin, saw him in his dreams with horns protruding from the top of his head, devil-like. Alternate juror Cynthia Hayden was becoming nervous about getting on the jury. There were only five more cases which had to be presented, and the trial would be over. Still, she knew deep inside it was her destiny to be called. She just wished it would happen soon. When she and the other alternates and jurors entered the courtroom on Monday, Richard was already sitting at the defense table. He looked at her long and hard with his black eyes, deadpan. His stare made tingles slide up and down the skin on her back. Doreen, ever vigilant, noticed him looking at her. Then she saw Hayden smile at Richard. It made her angry. Ever since the Valentine incident, Doreen had perceived Cynthia as a rival for Richard's attentions and affection. She only hoped Hayden wasn't picked if another juror had to leave the trial. Newspaper delivery person Lowney Dempster was called. However, before she could begin, the defense handed the court a motion to exclude her testimony because, as made clear at the preliminary, she was not certain of the days on which she said she'd seen Richard. The judge read the motion and offered the defense the opportunity to state their claim. Tynan ruled her testimony would go to the weight rather than the admissibility of what she stated and was going to allow it in. Halpin moved into evidence a large Thomas guide map and color photographs of the Pontiac. Lowney Dempster told the court about the three occasions she had seen a man in black near the Doy and Nelson residences and on San Patricio in Monterey Park. She identified Richard as the man she'd seen. On cross, Clark tried mightily to undermine Dempster's testimony, but she was strong and unwavering and wasn't about to let any defense lawyer get the better of her. 42. The following day, Halpin told the court he would, because of conflicting schedules, have to move on to the next case, the murders of Max and Layla Knighting, Incident Number 12. Glendale officer John Perkins joined Halpin at the prosecutor's table. Halpin first introduced all the exhibits, then called a friend of the Nightings, Roy Tesley Murley, who testified he had seen both Max and Layla alive and well at the Seventh-day Adventist Church on the evening of July 19, 1985. The defense had no cross. Mr. Murley was dismissed, and the Nightings' daughter, Judith Arnold, took the stand. As she was sworn in, she looked in Richard's direction. Like her parents, she was devoutly religious and viewed Richard as an actual extension of Satan, the embodiment of evil. Without drama or tears, she told the jury how she'd gone to the restaurant that morning, then to the house, seeing her parents' car in the driveway, and entering the house through the rear door, which was ajar and had a broken window. I walked down the hallway and found them in the bedroom. She took a long, deep breath and fought to hold back the tears the bloody sight of her parents brought on. She said her husband had called the police. Halpin did not question her about the condition her parents were in when she'd found them. He had the photographs, the most brutal and bloody of the trial, to show the jury, and he knew the pictures would speak for themselves. Clark had no questions for Mrs. Arnold. Next was Ella Francis, another daughter of Layla and Max Nightings. Halpin, using photographs, had her tell the jury about the individual items she recognized as her parents at the property viewing room. When he showed her a photo of her mother's wedding ring, she began to cry. She identified a few other pieces of jewelry and was dismissed. Halpin wanted to give the nighting crime scene photographs to the jury, but Clark said the morgue shots were brutal and would inflame the jury, citing a blow-up of the stab-lash wound on Mrs. Needing, which Halpin felt was important for the jury to see. They argued, and Tynan finally agreed to exclude some of the pictures. Halpin next called Detective John Perkins. The prosecutor had Perkins describe in detail the specifics of the horrendous wounds the Nightings had sustained. The jurors and alternates looked at Richard. As usual, he sat slumped in his chair, his chained ankles crossed, his jaw resting on the palm of his right hand. 
Halpin asked Perkins to identify the bullets taken from the bodies of the Nightings. He described in graphic detail all the wounds, both knife and gunshot, that he'd observed at the autopsy. When the afternoon session started, Halpin said he was not able to get the doctor who had done the autopsies on the Nightings to court until the following week, so he was going to present the thirteenth case, the murder of Chenorong Kovananth, and the beating and rape of Somkid Kovananth. The prosecutor put all the evidence he'd be using on the record, then called Somkid to the stand. Doreen was not in court. No one had been available to babysit for Somkid's five-year-old daughter, and Doreen had volunteered. Somkid thought she was in some way attached to the court. Doreen watched the child in the hall as Somkid testified. Somkid told the court she'd been born in Thailand and English was not her first language. She spoke so softly that Halpin suggested she bring the microphone forward. She told the jury how her husband had come home that night and hadn't gone right to bed. It was very hot, and she'd gone to sleep on the couch in the living room. The patio glass door was open, but the screen door was closed, though not locked. She was awakened by the sound of the screen door sliding open. Some kid had a Thai accent and spoke without syntax. "'What did you see?' Halpin prompted. "'I see a tall, skinny man with a gun. Did he say anything to you? Yes, he say, shut up, bitch, do what I tell you. If not, I'm going to kill you.' and she went on to describe how the stalker went into the bedroom where her husband was sleeping. She heard a gunshot. And after you heard the gunshot, did the man come back to where you were? Yeah, the man come back. Say, I killed your husband already. What else did he say? Do what I tell you. If not, I'm going to kill both of your kids. She told him she would give him anything he wanted if he did not hurt her children. He ripped her nightgown off, took her to the bedroom, said, This is your husband. He's already dead. He then slapped her to the floor, put the gun to her head, raped her. Shaking, trembling, crying, she continued her testimony, describing how he bound her hands with electrical wire he cut from a hairdryer in the bathroom and beat her. Some kid testified that he then orally raped and sodomized her. The alarm in her son's room had gone off, and her tormentor had gone to the boy's room, tied him up, then returned to her and bound her legs with a belt. He then proceeded to the kitchen, returned drinking apple juice and demanded valuables and jewelry. He took her to the kitchen and she showed him where she had stashed her expensive pieces taped under a kitchen drawer. He put the things he wanted in a pillowcase and soon left. She then untied herself and ran to her son. Sobbing heavily now, she described returning to the bedroom with a neighbor, anxious to see if the intruder had truly killed her husband. She said, as the jurors looked on spellbound, Several of the women and two of the men crying, even hardened season reporters cried. I just opened the cover and I see him is gunshot on the side of the head. I know he's dead and the police and the neighbors pulled me out. I don't want to go out. Halpin offered her water and tissues to dry the tears. He then proceeded to show her the crime scene photographs and they further fueled some kid's terrible suffocating grief. Seeing her testify was one of the saddest things I've ever been exposed to in a courtroom, Il Carrillo would later say. Just about brought tears to my eyes. Finally, Halpin asked, Do you see the man in the courtroom today? Without hesitation, she raised her right hand and pointed at Richard. He grimaced at her, then laughed. She began to cry harder. Halpin showed her a photograph of Chenorong Covenant as he lay dead. Is that the way you found him that morning? She said it was, and totally broke down. Clark, during the cross, brought out the fact that the light in her home had been poor when the stalker had entered, but she said she had gotten a good look at him, particularly when he had put on the bathroom light. Clark tried to undermine the description she had given the police by suggesting she had described her attacker as a white man. She denied it, saying she had told the police he had brown skin, like a Mexican, and curly black hair. Clark asked her if she had seen Richard's picture on television and in the newspaper, intimating that was why she had picked him out at the September 5 lineup. She answered with resolution, But I know it is him because I never forget his face, even today. And no matter how hard he tried, Clark could not dissuade her. Diane Fitchner, the first police officer to reach the Covenanth residence that morning, was called next. Reading from her report, she stated that some kid had said that he was a male possibly Hispanic, about six foot, 
thin build, about thirty to thirty-five years of age, and he had wavy brown hair, soft waves, light curls, and he was wearing brown pants and a blue, multicolored type shirt. Did you then broadcast that description? She said she had. Clark asked several questions about Somkid's description before court was recessed for the evening. The next witness was Carlos Brizolara, who testified he and his partner, Al Michelorena, arrived at the Kovanath residence at 9.08 a.m., the morning of the 20th. Halpin had Brizolara recreate the crime scene for the jury. The prosecutor showed him photos of the ransacking and phone disabling, which were the stalker's signature. Halpin made sure the jury saw a close-up of Chainerong's gunshot wound, which was identical to Vincent Zazara's and Elias Abowitz's gunshot wound. He also showed Brizolara photographs of size eleven and a half shoe prints that had been discovered about the house. On cross, Ray Clark was unable to put distance between his client and the Sun Valley crimes. Brizolara was dismissed, and Halpin told the court he would again have to put a witness on the stand out of order because of conflicting schedules. He would present incident number 14, the attack on the Petersons, the next-to-last count. Judge Tynan said fine. Clark told the judge that Richard was not feeling chipper and wanted to waive his right to be in court the following day for a hearing. Tynan agreed, and the paperwork was completed and signed by Richard. Richard was convinced the guards at the jail were still putting something in his food to poison him. He was always listless and without energy. All his joints ached, and he felt sick in the morning. His dreams were becoming more and more bizarre, which he blamed on the poison. He didn't want to eat, but there was no other source of food. They had me locked up twenty-four hours a day. No exercise, no fresh air, no nothing. They were trying to kill me slowly, and they were succeeding. I felt like I was dying, he would later relate. He complained to Doreen about his food being poisoned. She wrote articulate letters to the jail's warden, but nothing changed. Assistant District Attorney Yokelson read the exhibits in the Peterson matter into the record and called Virginia Peterson to the stand. Virginia was a large woman with wide, square shoulders and had a strong, powerful gait. She gave Richard a dirty look on reaching the stand. She was sworn in and told the jury about the morning she was awakened by a footstep and saw a man pivot into her bedroom from the living room, where the light had been left on by her husband. He was, she said, ten feet away. Can you describe him as you saw him then? He was over six feet tall, he was wearing dark clothing, and he had shaggy dark hair. What was his build? Halpin asked. He wanted the jury to know Virginia had gotten a good look at the man. He was lean, muscularly built, not lean as in skinny. He was holding a gun in standard combat position, she said. Did that image put you in mind of something? Is there some way that you can describe it as it appeared to you at that time? Halpin asked. Someone was sneaking into the house. Someone was intruding. Did you say anything? I sat up in bed and I said, Who are you? What do you want? Get out of here. And was there any reply from the man? Shut up, bitch. Where is it? She stated the intruder had said. She described being shot, falling back into bed and feeling numb. The intruder's laughter, her husband waking up and his being shot, though he still jumped out of bed and ran at the intruder, who fired a third round at her husband, then a fourth shot. Her husband had gone down, but he'd come back up and the two men had grappled. Her daughter had been screaming, and she, choking in her own blood, had retrieved her child and called 911. Halpin showed her photographs of her house for her to describe to the jury, then asked if she saw her attacker in the courtroom. She pointed at Richard. Richard's eyes were covered by sunglasses. He laughed, making her skin crawl. Halpin asked, at the time you saw the defendant enter your room with his hands up in front of him, could you see his hands? Yes, she said. Could you describe their appearance? They stood out from the rest of him in that they were much lighter in color, and I was struck by how long and how large they were. All eyes in the room, even Judge Tynan's, moved to Richard's hands. They, like his father Julian's, were huge, and now they rested on the defense table defiantly. The prosecutor asked her if she could tell if he'd been wearing gloves. It could have been gloves, she said. Clark began his cross of Virginia after the lunch recess. Virginia was a difficult witness. She was sure of herself and had all her facts straight. She did not cry or become overwhelmed by emotion, and the hatred she harbored for Richard was real and tangible, easy for the jurors to perceive. 
He began by clarifying the amount of light she had to see her attacker. She conceded it was a hundred-watt bulb under a shade, three feet off the ground, in a lamp against a wall in the living room. He used a diagram of her home and had her draw an X where the lamp would have been, which she said was about seventeen feet away. He asked her if the intruder was only backlighted. She agreed, but added, at times the light shone directly on his face by the way he was standing. Clark asked her how many times she had seen Richard's face on television and in the newspapers before she'd viewed the September 5th lineup. The question could only help Richard. There was no way Clark knew Virginia Peterson hadn't seen Richard's face multiple times before September 5th. She testified she'd seen his picture on TV six or seven times. On redirect, Halpin returned to the intruder's hands, making sure the jury would not miss the resemblance between Richard's and the hands Virginia described. Halpin moved all the photographs of the Nighting and Kovanath incidents into evidence. Judge Tynan then addressed the jury, complimenting them on their behavior through the long weeks. After his remarks, the Nighting and Kovanath photographs were distributed among the jurors and alternates. Halpin wanted the images to stay with the jurors on the upcoming long Easter weekend. Tynan explained to Richard that he would not have to attend the hearing in the morning involving the differences between the special master for both the defense and the prosecution if he didn't want to. Richard did not want to be present and signed a 977 waiver. The following morning, without the defendant or the jury present, Halpin argued his position on why the defense was not being given all the pieces of evidence they were asking for. He felt what the defense wanted was unrealistic that their requests for material were lacking specificity, and that they failed to refer to the number system which appeared in reports throughout the case. He was also concerned about the length of time the defense was seeking to do their tests, which in truth should have already been done. Halpin accused the defense of purposely trying to sabotage the trial. Clark's answer was put to Brian Raxall, the defense special master, on the stand. He was questioned by Clark, then grilled by Halpin, as Judge Tynan listened and made copious notes. He wanted this decision to be the right one. He did not want to be responsible for Richard getting a reversal if he was found guilty. Tynan thought this likely, as too many eyewitnesses put Richard Ramirez into the Night Stalker's large shoes. He listened to arguments until the court reporter requested a break. Then Judge Tynan finally ruled on exactly how all the items would be shared by the prosecution and the defense, and he recessed court for the weekend. 43. That weekend, Ruth traveled to Los Angeles to visit Richard. It was a long, difficult trip. Early Saturday morning, she stood in line with the others who were waiting to see the 6,000 individuals housed at the L.A. County Jail. Ruth nodded hello to a few familiar faces, but stood alone. She was the sister of the Night Stalker, and no one wanted to get too close. When Richard was brought down, he was in a foul mood because of the poison he was certain they were putting in his food. He complained, and Ruth listened with a patient ear and looked at him with sympathy and much love. All week, every moment of every waking minute, Richard wore a stone-cold face. But when he was with his older sister, it was different. He showed her his true feelings and looked to her for support and understanding, which he received. He was like a little boy all over again, Ruth later related. No matter what, Richie was still my brother, and no matter what, I love him and will be there for him to the end, whatever it is. Richard told Ruth he didn't have a chance. They would surely convict him and send him to San Quentin to die. Ruth hated hearing him talk like that, but she knew it could very well happen, and deep inside she prepared herself for that dreaded eventuality. She tried to give him a pep talk. She was afraid he might go mad and kill himself after all was said and done. She told him how much Julian and Mercedes missed him and loved him, and that Ray Clark was doing a fine job and he should keep up his spirits and not lose heart. You are a Ramirez, she reminded him. Remember that. When Ruth left the jail, she met Reuben for lunch. Ruth would still not go inside Reuben's house because of the running feud with Susanna. That night she again slept in the back of her brother's car, hidden under her raincoat, afraid of the rats, of the police, and of men who got their kicks from hurting women. Ruth knew it was a cruel world filled with people who were capable of terrible things. Richard didn't like her sleeping in the car, and he warned her over and over to be careful. He told Reuben to keep an eye on her, that if something happened to her, their father would go bananas. Early Sunday morning, Ruth went to church, prayed for Richard, prayed for her parents, 
and prayed that her younger brother would turn away from Satan and embrace Christ. If he was to find salvation, he must stop looking to Satan for redemption. Ruth visited Richard on Sunday, and their half-hour together was spent very much as it had been the day before. Richard complained. Ruth listened attentively with love and understanding. She wanted to go to the trial, to show the world she believed in Richard's innocence, but because she was a potential witness, she still was not allowed in court. That weekend Ruth met Doreen. She was at first leery of Doreen, but when she realized how much Doreen truly cared for Richard, she embraced Doreen as a friend. When court resumed on Monday, all but one juror looked fresh and more relaxed. Juror Phyllis Singletary looked worried and distracted. Some of her fellow jurors noticed a little swelling around her left eye. They did not ask what had happened, and she didn't offer any explanation. Cindy Hayden knew Phyllis was involved in some kind of abusive relationship, but she was not aware of how truly abusive it was. Cindy wondered if it would be this week that she was finally picked as a regular juror. There wasn't much time left, she realized, though she still felt confident she'd be chosen. Halpin told the jury they would be moving back to the Kovanath attack and put criminalist Charlie Vanderwend on the stand. Vanderwend stated that he and criminalist Gerald Burke had photographed and lifted footprints from several different areas at the Kovanath home. The prints were the same as what he'd seen in Joyce Nelson's home and on the clock at Mabel Bell's. Halpin handed him three footprint lifts. The jury could see they were the now familiar avia aerobic shoe. Because of witnesses' schedules, they would now have to jump forward to the autopsies of Chenereng Kovananth and Elias Abawath. Yokelson read into the record all the exhibits in the last case, number 15, which included residential burglary, murder, rape, oral copulation, and sodomy. Dr. Joseph Kogan was called, and he told the jury he performed an autopsy at 10.30 a.m. on July 21st on Chenereng Kovananth. Halpin showed him photographs of the wound, which was just above the left ear. There was gunpowder residue around the bullet hole, indicating the gun had been very close when fired. Kogan estimated an inch or less. Dr. Kogan autopsied Elias Abawath on the morning of August 9th. The cause of death was also a gunshot wound to the head, also from about an inch away. This projectile was copper-jacketed, while the one removed from Chenereng Kovanath was solid lead. Clark had no questions. Halpin had planned to put Sakina Abawath on next, but she was ill and would not be available until the following day. The prosecutor said he couldn't proceed any further. Court was recessed. Sakina Abawath dreaded being in the same room with Richard Munez Ramirez. In her heart, she was sure he was the man who had robbed her husband's life and her dignity, who'd made her grovel and beg and swear on Satan. Halpin called her name. She timidly entered the courtroom and slowly made her way to the stand, pale and trembling. She had been home in bed with the flu and a sore throat. Sakina was five feet tall, had pearl-black hair, cut short, large black eyes. Halpin hated putting her on the stand, but he had no choice in the matter. In a small voice thick with a Burmese accent, Sakina first told the jury she had awakened that morning at 2.30 to nurse her ten-week-old son. Their other child, a three-year-old boy, was asleep in his room. After she breastfed the child, she turned off the air conditioner, went to the restroom, took a glass of water in the kitchen, and went back to sleep. Halpin knew Clark would question the available light, so he had Sakina testify that the night light in the bedroom had been on, as well as a lamp in the living room. Sakina said she then heard a popping. All of a sudden someone hit me on the head real hard and turned me on my stomach, and he put handcuffs on me from the back. And what else was done? Halpin asked. Then he started banging me in the ears a couple of times real hard, and then beat me up like this, she said, indicating with open hands over her ears. Crying and sobbing, she went on to describe how her assailant had jumped on the bed and kicked her in the head so hard she landed on the floor, where he'd beaten her still more. He then went to the closet and grabbed a shirt of hers, and with it he bound her feet together. It was extremely difficult for Sakina to talk. She looked at the ceiling as if searching for strength. He said, you bitch, you motherfucker, you don't scream, otherwise I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your kid in the crib, and I'm going to kill your son. Then he stuffed a sock in her mouth. All right, now up until that point, had you said anything? Halpin queried. No, I said. 
I swear I won't. I swear I won't scream. I swear I won't go out. And he slapped me one more time. And he said, Swear up on Satan. And I said, Yes, I swear on Satan. I won't scream. Crying now, she said he gagged and blindfolded her, ransacked the house, came back, beat her some more, and demanded valuables. Sakina's hurt and pain reached out and touched everyone in the courtroom. Even Judge Tynan, normally stoic and stone-faced, had tears brimming in his eyes. Halpin asked her, "'Do you see that man in the courtroom today?' "'Him,' she said, pointing. "'I can identify him in a hundred people, if you like. "'He is not even big change, except his hair is longer.' She stood up, saying, "'You son of a bitch! Why did you kill him? "'I give you everything, you bastard!' "'All right,' Halpin said. "'Ma'am, I know this is tough for you,' Tynan said. "'I give him everything,' she wailed. "'I understand. Just try and stay calm. Just answer the questions, ma'am. If you need time off, we'll give you a few minutes. Just try and relax,' Judge Tynan said. "'We have to do this,' Halpin said. "'There are five men sitting at the end of the defense table. "'Him,' she said, indicating. "'The one in the red tie.' "'All right. The defendant, Richard Ramirez, for the record. "'Thank you,' Judge Tynan said. "'She sobbed, cried into her hands, and sat down, exasperated and beaten. "'Clark and Daniel knew Sakina was very bad for the defense. "'The two defense lawyers conferred. "'They wanted to get her off the stand as quickly as possible. "'Daniel stood up and said, "'Your Honor, may we suggest a brief recess?' "'No, you may not,' the judge said. "'Sakina, through tears and gasps for breath, "'went on to describe being beaten still more "'as her tormentor demanded cash and her diamond wedding ring. "'Then she said he'd left and come back after a few seconds. "'He'd tear off my clothes.' "'And were you still handcuffed behind your back?' "'She said she was, and went on to describe being dragged by the hair "'to the spare bedroom. "'And then he'd sit on the bed and he'd take out his penis, "'and he grabbed me from the hair and he pulled my mouth on his penis, "'and I don't want to do it, and he pulls me, he pulls me!' "'She cried out, broke down again, sobbed into her hands, "'cupped against her tear-soaked face. "'Halpin, in as gentle a way as possible, "'led her through the details of the rape.' She then told the jury about her son waking up, her going to him handcuffed, soothing him, lulling him to sleep, then back to the bedroom where she was raped again. She said that he tried to sodomize her but wasn't able to consummate the act, although he did vaginally rape her. While he was engaged in this, her son had come walking down the hall. The stalker had grabbed the boy, bound him, and covered him with pillows. You bitch, you don't scream. Tell your son not to scream, otherwise I will kill him. I said, I swear I won't. And he said, swear upon Satan. I said, I swear upon Satan, I won't scream, and I won't let him scream either. With that, she stated, he closed the door and left her and her son tied up. And when he came back, he was carrying the couch pillows, which he put on top of the boy to muffle his pleas. And the boy called out, Mama, please, I can't breathe. Sakina had begged him not to hurt her husband. In response to her plea, the killer laughed, undid her handcuffs, and cuffed her to a doorknob, he asked if someone would be coming in the morning so she could be released. She said yes, and he was gone. She said she first untied her son and sent him to wake up her husband, but Elias wouldn't get up. I get so panic. I thought that maybe he cut this cantaloupe and stuffed it into my husband's mouth, and he wants the scotch tape so he could tape it on Elias's mouth. That's why he couldn't scream or nothing. I figured it out that way. She went on to describe her making the boy go back to his father, telling him to remove anything from his mouth, that she heard her son trying to wake his father up, repeatedly call to him as she screamed, Elias, Elias, wake up! You could hear him saying, Daddy, Daddy, Halpin asked. Yes, and he was doing something, and he came back to me and said, Mama, there is nothing in his mouth, and he's not waking up. And I told him, Mama, go back again and wake him and shake him so he can wake up. And at the same time, I was screaming, Elias, Elias! She wailed, her pain and turmoil filling the courtroom. Women on the jury and among the alternates took out handkerchiefs and tissues and wiped at the tears streaking their faces. Even the male jurors were wiping back tears. Then she said she began the difficult task of getting the boy, still very traumatized and frightened by the stalker, to go out into the night to the neighbors for help. Sakina now told the jury that her neighbors did come, that Bob Wilson went and looked at Elias and came back crying, he didn't tell her Elias was dead, though she knew from Bob's reaction. When the police arrived several minutes later and she was freed, 
She ran to Elias to see for herself. Phil Halpin wanted to get Sakina off the stand as soon as he could, so he moved to the September 5th lineup. She testified she identified number two and wrote it on the card they gave her. She said she also found jewelry that belonged to her at the property show-up, two gold chains from Pakistan, a set of earrings, and an engagement ring her mother-in-law had given her, among other things, including a television and a VCR. Halpin proceeded to show her dozens of photographs of the inside and the outside of the house, which she described for the jury. Then he came to photograph number 40E, an autopsy photo of her husband's head. She took it in her hand, looked, and her eyes swelled and her face winced in sudden agony. You never showed me that before, she told Halpin, as if she'd been burnt. Please, just tell the jury who that is, Halpin said. My husband. This is my husband. Did he beat him up on the head, too? I didn't know that, she said, and again broke down. She turned to the judge. What did he get out of killing him? He's such a nice man. Ma'am, I can't answer that. I'm very sorry. I'm concerned about you now. Do you want to take a little recess? I want to go straight through, she said, anxious to get it over with. I have no further questions, Halpin said. You may cross-examine, Tynan said to the defense. Clark knew he had to be careful with Sakina. She was a very sympathetic witness. Before he could get up, Halpin stood and asked her, Did you see anything on his hands? Yeah, she said. He was wearing gloves. That was the answer Halpin was looking for. Did you ever see a picture of the defendant after this happened? No. It is our religion that after the husband died to give him respect. We didn't watch TV. We don't go out of the house. We don't do anything. Just for two months. We give him respect. We just stay in the house and pray and pray for him. And that is what I was doing. What about newspapers? Did you read any newspapers, Halpin asked. You cannot do anything. You pray a lot for him. Thank you, Halpin said, and sat down. Clark asked Sakina if the September 5th lineup was the first time she'd been out of her house since her husband's murder, and she said yes. He proceeded to show her the police composite drawing she'd helped to create, and he asked her if she'd ever seen it. She said she had worked with a policeman on it, but I wanted something better than this. It doesn't come out. Clark stopped her and asked her if she'd helped create it. Yes, yes, she said. Did you tell the artist he had light brown or dishwater blonde hair? I told him he got a light face, light colored hairs. This means light in color, he asked. Yeah, I told him that because the, the bathroom light, the restroom light was falling on his head. That is why I said light hair. Clark grilled her about the available light she had seen her attacker in and how many times she'd seen him. She did not weaken or become distressed by Clark's thoroughness. She seemed to reach inside herself and get stronger with each question. He focused on whether she had noted her attacker's shoes. I can't because he's so huge and I'm so tiny. Even if you kick me with the tennis shoes, I can't figure it out because it was hurting on my head so badly. I know that he was hitting me on the head, kicking her, with the shoes. Clark said he had no more and sat down. We are very sorry for your loss and God bless you, Judge Tynan said to Sakina. I hope you do good judgment, Sakina responded, and slowly stepped down from the witness stand. She looked at Richard, and it seemed she was going to fall down. Two court bailiffs rushed to her aid, took her by the arms gently, and led her from the courtroom as she sobbed. Halpin called Deputy Sheriff John Knight, and he told the jury about finding Sakina handcuffed to the door, locating Elias, and kicking the doorknob holding Sakina off the door. Did she give you a sort of description? Halpin asked. Yes, sir. She described the person who was responsible as a light-skinned male Mexican or a dark Caucasian. She described him as being tall, and I stood up in front of her and told her that I was approximately six foot six and asked her where he would come up to on me, and she said, No, somewhere, you know, down by your mouth. And I said, Six, three, six, four, and she nodded yes. Judge Tynan ordered a break for the court reporter, and when court resumed, Halpin put Gil Carrillo on the stand. The prosecutor handed him the remnants of the handcuffs used to restrain Sakina to identify. There was no cross. As Carrillo passed the defense table, Richard smiled and said hello in Spanish. Gill returned the salutation and resumed his place at the prosecutor's table. Judge Tynan told the jury the case would be getting somewhat technical now and suggested they resist the temptation to rest their eyes. 
If they needed more fresh air or longer breaks, they should let him know. Court was recessed. 44. When Richard returned to his cell, he lay down on his bed and read letters from Doreen and a few of his groupies. He wrote a few letters and fell asleep, dreaming he was in hell with a Satan who had a face like Phil Halpin. He woke in the middle of the night with a start and in a sweat and couldn't go back to sleep. He read Carlos Castaneda for a few hours, dozed off, and was awakened by the guard to get ready for court. He didn't want to go. He viewed the trial as a total farce, and he hated being there, but he had no choice. He sat up, cursing, in a particularly foul mood. Halpin opened by showing a videotape of the lineup to the jurors. He wanted to clear up, once and for all, any ambiguities and accusations that anything untoward had been done at the lineup. The lights were dimmed, and the thirty-five-minute tape was watched in silence. The jurors saw Richard step out from the other five men, walk to the edge of the stage, say a few words, and return to the line. When the tape was over, court broke for lunch. The first witness after the break was Richard's former friend, Donna Myers, flown in from San Francisco with Earl and D.D. Gregg for their court appearances. Of all the people in the world, Richard did not want to see Donna Myers in court. She was the first person he actually knew on the outside to take the stand, and as she was sworn in, he glowered at her. Halpin showed her a picture, which she identified as Armando Rodriguez. Halpin then asked her if she knew anyone at the defense table. Richard Ramirez Whitney, she said. Judge Tynan asked what count Donna's testimony was relative to, and Halpin said, this will probably go to all of them. Donna described first meeting Richard when she went to El Paso for a visit with Armando in 1979. She saw him again when he went to visit them when they lived in Richmond, California, from 1979 to 1981. Richard had stayed with them when he'd visited. She had moved to San Pablo, and Richard often visited her there, sometimes with Armando, sometimes alone. She stated the last time he'd come to her house was in August of 1985, the 15th or 16th. He came alone, she testified, then with Armando. He gave her an octagonal jewelry box, asking her to hold it for him. When he came back to retrieve it, he gave her a bracelet and three rings, which she then gave to her daughter, Dee Dee, and her son, Lloyd Vorak, who left San Francisco with one of the rings and returned to Utah, where he lived and worked. On August 30th, Donna said she was contacted by San Francisco policemen Frank Falzon and Carl Klotz. She told them where she'd gotten the jewelry, but said she did not know how to find Rick, that he'd stayed in different hotels and moved around a lot. Can you tell us how the defendant customarily dressed when you saw him, help and quizzed? Dark pants and shirt and dark shoes. Did he ever tell you why he dressed that way? So he couldn't be seen so well at night. Did he ever tell you what he was doing at night? Yes, he said he was ripping off people. Did you ever see the defendant wearing gloves? He wore brown cloth garden gloves, she said and went on to state Richard had often brought jewelry to her house and sometimes sent it to his sister. Once he'd given her five hundred dollars for her to hold, with instructions to give it to his sister if anything happened to him. He had not given her an address, just a phone number and the name Ruth. Halpin asked her if she had ever seen any tattoos on the defendant. No, he had a picture drawn of a pentagram on his arm, but it wasn't a tattoo, it was just drawn with ink. Did the defendant ever speak to you about Satan? Yes, he said he was the supreme being. She testified that Richard truly did believe in Satan, and that made him all the more menacing as he sat there with his sunglasses on, staring at Donna Myers like he wanted to take a bite out of her. She said she had seen Richard looking at a handgun Armando had for sale. Richard had said he wanted to buy an Uzi. When Halpin asked her if she knew what Richard was doing with the things he stole, she testified he had a fence in L.A., Richard had also shown her master car keys he had for Datsuns and Toyotas. Was there anything about the defendant's teeth that to you were remarkable, Halpin asked. They were decayed, and one of them was chipped, and they were discolored. She said there was a second time he had left money with her, seventy-five dollars. She ended up wiring it to him in L.A. under the name of Rick Moreno. She stated she saw Richard in possession of Japanese coins in coin pouches in the summer of 1985. Halpin asked about Richard's weight and his build. He was complaining. He was always complaining he was too thin. He used to drink a lot of this stuff called weight-on. To gain weight, to gain weight. 
The prosecutor was pleased. He felt Donna had put everything in perspective and pointed the finger of guilt directly at Richard. Ray Clark knew how much Donna had hurt Richard, and he stood to do serious battle with her. Now, you told Mr. Ramirez that he didn't have the guts to kill anybody, he asked. Yeah, we were talking about it. The reason you told him was that you knew his reputation for peace and quiet, didn't you? You knew his reputation was that of a non-violent person, didn't you, he demanded. He had never been violent around me, she said. That's right, Clark quickly agreed, seizing the opportunity to make Donna Meyer a positive character witness for Richard. And he'd been in your home many, many times, right? She agreed he had been, and that seemed a plus for Richard. Clark returned to his client's passive nature. Okay, and had he in fact been around any relatives of yours? She said he had. Clark asked which relatives. My daughter Deline, most of my relatives. I have a lot of children living in the area. Most of them knew him. The defense lawyer asked questions about Armando Rodriguez, implying maybe he was in some way involved with the crimes Richard was charged with. Clark asked her if Richard had bought the gun Armando had for sale, and she said no. He grilled her on the exact conditions of Richard's teeth when she had last seen him. On redirect, Halpin asked Myers to describe Armando Rodriguez. He's about 5'9", five 5'10". Five he has dark brown hair, he has a mustache, and his hair is kind of medium length. Would you say he and the defendant were the same size? No, the defendant is taller and thinner. Armando is a little heavier. The next witness was Earl Gregg, the fellow who had first gone to the San Francisco police and made them aware of Rick Ramirez. Gregg was tall, thin, and unkempt, and he looked like he wasn't eating or washing enough. He was very nervous, and he stole furtive glances at Richard as he took the stand. Halpin had him tell the jury he'd known Richard Ramirez for ten years and had met him through his mother-in-law. He had seen Richard at Donna Mayer's home shortly after Easter of 1985. Richard had tried to sell him a twenty-five automatic and showed him a small-caliber black revolver. Halpin gave him the gun retrieved from Tijuana, and Greg said it looked like the pistol Richard had shown him. Richard had wanted too much for the guns, one hundred twenty-five to one hundred fifty dollars each. It was high, that's why I didn't buy them, he said. He also had a couple of rifles for sale, he added. Clark stood to do the cross on Greg, who was, according to Richard, white trash, a drug user, and a two-bit burglar. Clark asked a few questions about the bags Richard had the guns in, and if he had seen them in a pillowcase at any point. Greg said they were in a brown gym bag with white handles, and he had never seen Richard with any pillowcases. He testified the same gun Richard offered him for $150 he'd bought new in a store for $53. Halpin now said he had a few fill-in witnesses, people who weren't available in the correct chronological order because of previous commitments. He called Dr. Irvin Golden, the medical examiner who had performed autopsies on March and Layla Knighting. He told the jury in gory, heart-wrenching detail about the wounds suffered by the Knightings. Clark had no questions for Dr. Golden. The prosecutor announced he was almost ready to move on to the arrest phase but he had a few witnesses coming from out of state on Monday and asked if the court could be darkened until then. Clark said he had no objections, and Judge Tynan recessed the proceedings until Monday, April 3rd. Jesse Perez was the first witness called. He took the stand tentatively and was sworn in. Richard hated Perez. He viewed him as a rat, a snitch, the lowest form of life there was in the world Richard had traversed. Perez wore a rumpled jacket, tie, and shirt. He looked like he hadn't slept in a week. He told the jury he was a little hard of hearing, sometimes wore a hearing aid, but wasn't today. He testified he had murdered a man in a barroom fight in Texas and had been arrested for burglary for stealing beer from a bar. Doreen made a face of distaste in Perez's direction, as if he had a bad odor. Richard kept moving. Being near Perez was making him very animated, and each time he moved the chains jingled, rattling Perez, whose eyes constantly darted about. Perez identified Richard Ramirez as someone he had met through his neighbor, Reuben Ramirez, three years before. He drove people around L.A. to Tijuana and back for a living. He had met Richard at the Greyhound bus terminal and started driving him places. He took him to Tijuana a few times and drove him to meet Felipe Solano at a barber shop on Alvarado and Third. Richard had told him that Solano owed him money, and he had waited in the car while Richard had spoken to Solano. Perez had a girlfriend in Tijuana who needed a gun for protection, and he had asked Richard if he knew where he could get one. Richard sold him a twenty-two for fifty dollars on credit. 
Perez, in turn, gave the gun to his friend. Halpin showed him a picture of Richard's green Pontiac, and Perez said he had seen the defendant driving around in it. Halpin moved back to the gun, intent on putting it in Richard's hands. The prosecutor had Perez tell the jury about his two trips down to Tijuana to get the twenty-two from his friend. Perez said he learned of Richard's arrest over the radio just as he and Sheriff's homicide men were crossing the border into Mexico. He testified he got the gun, gave it to the homicide detectives, and returned to L.A. with them. Daniel Hernandez's first question to Perez was to ask if the gun he received from Richard was loaded. That's right, Perez said. Daniel didn't elicit anything that could help Richard until he asked Perez when he'd bought the twenty-two from Richard. Perez said he didn't know, that he had nothing to hide, that it was he who had told the cops about the gun. Daniel asked him if he had said at the preliminary that he had gotten the gun from Richard nine months prior to his being arrested, which was clearly well before all of the assaults, except Vinco. Perez said he didn't remember. Daniel showed him a page of the hearing transcript and asked him to read it. That done, Perez said, I don't recall saying this. I couldn't say this was definite. I am. That's okay. I will ask you some questions. I'm senile. I can't remember that, okay? I don't know, he said contritely. Halpin was not happy with that answer. Daniel asked Perez if he had known about the reward money. Perez said he knew there was a substantial reward, but had thought the amount was a half a million dollars, not eighty thousand dollars split up among a few dozen people. Perez was contrary and uncooperative with Daniel. He often acted as though he didn't understand Daniel's questions, or had not heard, forcing Daniel to repeat himself. Daniel tried unsuccessfully to get Perez to admit he'd scouted locations for different thieves to rob. Daniel said, Mr. Perez, when you were convicted in Texas of murder, what kind of weapon was used? No weapon, no weapon. What was the method? Knife, knife fight, knife. Okay, so you killed the person with a knife. We had a fight in a bar. My question was, did you use a knife to kill a person? Did I use a knife? Yes. Well, how else can I do it? I cut him, and that's all. I was drunk. On redirect, Halpin asked, did you ever have a conversation with the defendant concerning yellow houses? Daniel objected. Judge Tynan allowed the question. He liked to burglarize them, that's all, Perez said. Did he say why? Burglarize. Burglarize them. Why? Why did he like to burglarize them? Jewelry. All right, did he say why he picked Orientals? Because they were easy, easy to do and no retaliation, Perez testified. Thank you, Halpin said. I have no more questions. Daniel stood and pointed out that Perez had said nothing about yellow houses at the preliminary hearing. That's because nobody asked me, the witness said. Judge Tynan soon dismissed Jesse Perez. The trial moved to the capture of Richard. The first witness called by Yokelson was Manuela Villanueva. Visibly nervous about being close to Richard Ramirez, she told the court how a man tried to steal her car as she sat in it at Indiana and Whittier Boulevards, but was chased off when friends came to rescue her. Yokelson called Frank Moreno, Faustino Pignon, Angela de la Torre, her husband Manuel, and Sheriff's Deputy Andres Ramirez. They all told about their role that scalding August morning of Richard's last day on the street. Clark did what he could on cross-examination, but they each told the facts the way they knew them, and nothing he or any other defense attorney did could alter it to benefit Richard. 45 in the morning, Halpin moved into evidence the items found in a black backpack Richard was believed to have ditched in the chase from the Greyhound Terminal. In it were a pair of binoculars, gloves, a white plastic flashlight, and a black leather jacket. Halpin put LAPD officer Bob Risden on the stand, who, with his partner, was directed to the black knapsack in a backyard on Bestwick Street. Risden identified the items found in the backpack. On cross-examination, Clark asked if the officer had found any kind of gun, knives, or cartridges, to which he said no. Surely, Clark reasoned, if Richard was the stalker, his backpack would have been full of weapons. He felt confident the jury would see it that way. LAPD officer Kaiser told the jury Richard had made a voluntary statement on the way to the station house. Referring to his notes, he read Richard's alleged statement to the jury. "'Why don't you just shoot me? I want to die. Now they are going to send me to the electric chair.' I was being chased all the way from Olympic. I know all the killings are going to be blamed on me. 
He stated that when Richard saw his mugshot on the sun visor of the car, he said, That's my picture. Officer Kaiser testified that when they arrived at the station, Richard was given the drink of water he asked for. Richard had then said, The 32 automatic is in the Greyhound bus locker, and that is where I keep it. In my wallet is a ticket for the locker. That, Doreen would later say, didn't have the ring of truth. It seemed too pat. Kaiser told the jury that his partner, Andres Ramirez, had since had a stroke and retired. Richard let out a laugh and moved around in his seat. He felt sooner or later Satan would exact revenge for him. Ray Clark was anxious to question Officer Kaiser. Richard had told Clark very adamantly that he'd never made any statement about the luggage ticket or the gun. However, Kaiser proved to be a difficult witness. He was sincere and testified in a straightforward manner, and Clark was able to do little to help Richard, who wanted to stand up and scream at Halpin and Judge Tynan, telling them the trial was a fucking farce, but he stayed in his seat and said nothing. Halpin moved into evidence all the items found in Richard's Pontiac Grand Prix, which included a coffee cup with Richard's prints on them, a set of handcuffs under the passenger seat, a handcuff key, a pair of gloves, and blown-up photographs of a pentagram drawn on the dashboard. He also moved into evidence photos of the items found at the bus terminal, a four-pound can of maximum weight, Duracell batteries, fingernail clippers, channel pliers, a blue bag containing a revolver, bullets of various sizes, a Remington ammunition box, a pair of Stadia sneakers, no avia aerobics, and other items. Halpin called LAPD Sergeant George Thomas, and he told the jury that he had been part of the LAPD stalker task force. When he arrived at the Hollenbeck station, he had put Richard in a small interview room, searched him, taken his shoes, and handcuffed him to a chair in the room. He testified he did not give Richard a Miranda and had not talked to him at all, other than to ask his name. However, he stated that Richard had said to him, What's today, sir? Friday. I replied, No, it is Saturday, Thomas testified. There was a short pause, and then he began with the following. He stated, I want the electric chair. They should have shot me on the street. I did it, you know. You guys got me, the stalker. Hey, I want a gun to play Russian roulette. I'd rather die than spend the rest of my life in prison. Can you imagine? The people caught me, not the police at which time he began laughing. There was a short pause, and he went on to state, You think I'm crazy, but you don't know Satan. And he began laughing, at which time he began humming a song. Did you recognize the song? Halpin asked. It was The Night Prowler by ACDC. Thomas went on to testify how he and his partner, Detective Joy, had purchased ACDC albums and reviewed the covers and songs, hoping to find some clue that might help the investigation. Thomas said he had to listen to The Night Prowler 80 to 100 times to get the lyrics straight. After you heard him humming The Night Prowler, what did he say? He stated, Of course I did it. You know that I'm a killer. So what? Give me your gun. I'll take care of myself. You know I'm a killer. So shoot me. I deserve to die. You can see Satan on my arm. And then he stated, Are you writing down everything I say? It was at that point he stopped talking, Thomas said. Daniel stood up to do the cross, and the jurors moved about uneasily. Daniel had Detective Thomas describe the function of the task force and the role he played in it. And would you say that your primary assignment on that task force had been to go and find some records and listen to the lyrics? That was one of my many, many jobs on the task force, yes. Daniel tried to wedge some doubt into Thomas's credibility, but Thomas believed what he said and was very specific on details and times. He had taken copious notes. On redirect, Halpin asked Thomas to tell the jury when the defendant had laughed. Referring to my report after making the statement, Can you imagine? The people caught me, not the police. He began laughing. After making the statement, You think I'm crazy, but you don't know Satan. He began laughing. And after humming a short portion of The Night Prowler, he began laughing. And after those three times were the only three times he laughed. Did he cry at all? The prosecutor asked. No. After a ten-minute comfort break, Halpin put Frank Salerno back on the stand, and he told the jury that he first became aware of Richard Ramirez on Friday afternoon, August 30th, and thousands of copies of his picture were distributed to every police agency in Southern California. Frank explained how the bag confiscated from the terminal was kept in the sheriff's evidence locker until Detective Bumkrod had a search warrant signed by a judge. When they learned about the Grand Prix, which Reuben had told them about, 
Frank had Bumcrot add an addendum to the warrant which would give the sheriff's detectives the legal right to search the car as well as the bag. Frank described in detail every item recovered from both the car and the bag. He said he'd found red circles around the primer of the twenty-five auto ammunition in the bag. Similar cartridges were found at several crime scenes. The prosecutor showed Frank a pair of aviator-type sunglasses that Frank testified he'd found in the Greyhound bag. Richard had been wearing the same style glasses since the beginning of the trial. Although Cindy Hayden was not on the jury yet, she was feeling the stress of the trial as much as any juror. As an alternate, she'd listened to all the testimony and scrutinized the crime scene photographs. The sights and sounds of Somkid and Sakina's grief and pain would never leave her mind. Often, in the middle of the night, Cindy would wake up and make sure the windows and doors were locked. Having learned how open windows, front doors, and screen doors had caused so many innocent people to suffer, she'd never sleep with an open window again. Judge Tynan had told the alternates early on that capital cases were extremely draining and distressing, and that the jurors should take some form of exercise to help cope. As Cindy walked through the halls to the elevator, she could feel people staring at her. She was not allowed to talk to the reporters, and they left her alone. In the elevator, she stood next to a Ramirez groupie she had often seen in the court. She had blonde hair and a very shapely figure, and in a low voice she said to Cindy, He's really very nice, you know, really. Cindy didn't know what to say and remained mute. She didn't want to do anything that could get her thrown off the trial. She viewed serving on the jury as her destiny, and this blonde wasn't going to put that in jeopardy. Cindy turned away from the woman, left the court building, and walked to the Nautilus Gym on Ninth Street. She changed into sweats and spent two hours lifting weights. She'd been going to the gym almost every night and had never been in better shape in her life. As she worked out, she tried to block out the blood and the suffering and got lost in the mindless repetition of her sets. 46. When Felipe Solano entered the courtroom, Richard's lips tightened. He despised Solano. As Solano was sworn in, Richard cursed him under his breath. Daniel told him to be cool. Halpin was ready to show where all the items taken from the Night Stalker crime scenes had gone. Richard had a notepad he brought to court every day. He had taped a piece of reflective foil on the back. He began reflecting the ceiling light in Judge Tynan's eyes. Tolano did not speak English well, and a translator was provided for him. He was sworn in and avoided looking in Richard's direction. Richard began reflecting the light into the translator's eyes, too. Halpin wanted it known for the record that Solano had immunity from prosecution for the handling of stolen property and that he had testified at the preliminary. Solano told the jurors in Spanish that in 1984 and 1985 he had lived on La Veta Terrace in Echo Park with his wife and two children. He identified Richard in court, the man with the red tie and vest, as someone he had known during that period. He had first met Richard in the Greyhound Terminal, when Ramirez had approached him and asked if he'd like a car to Tijuana. Solano said he did, and Richard had brought him to Jesse Perez, who drove Solano and five other passengers to Tijuana. Solano told Perez that he took cars to Tijuana because his own large car was a gas guzzler, and this way was cheaper. Richard said he could get a smaller car for him at a good price. Solano gave Richard his number, and he called, maybe five or six days later. He gave Richard his address, and within two hours he was there with a Toyota. He didn't have the title, and Solano didn't buy it. He said Richard asked him if he needed something else. Solano said a television, and one week later Richard was back with a color TV, for which Solano said he paid $200 or $225. Solano said Richard had said his name was Ricardo Moreno, then later said his name was David. Solano didn't know his real name until he saw his picture on the news bulletin of Sheriff Block's news conference. Solano told the jury Richard was back some three weeks later with some jewelry to sell, but he didn't buy any. Richard made a gift of a few pieces of costume jewelry. "'When did you see him next?' Halpin asked. "'I'm not sure when it was, because I went to Mexico, and when I came back, I think he was in jail, and when he came out of jail, he came to see me. It was in 1985, but Solano said he didn't remember when exactly. On this occasion, he said Richard brought some rings and earrings with him, which Solano readily admitted buying. He stated further that Richard had come back eight or ten times more, and that he had bought jewels, gold, a VCR, a television, radios, and cameras. Solano sold some of the items he bought to Jorge Castro, a man he met in a pool hall. 
After the police came to his house, Solano had gone back to the pool hall and brought back the items from Castro to turn them over to Sheriff's Task Force Detective Sergeant Carlos Avila. What did you plan to do with the jewelry, Halpin asked. Wait to get enough together so that they would be worth something. And then do what? Maybe buy something for my family or leave something for my children. Richard continued to reflect the light at the judge and interpreter. Tynan waved for him to stop, but he continued. Halpin asked Solano about the prices the defendant charged him. They were ridiculous. In what way? Cheap. Halpin asked the witness if he thought the things the defendant sold him were stolen. At first, no, but afterward I convinced myself because of the cheap prices. Halpin asked Solano if Richard was the only person he bought stolen property from, and Solano said yes. Richard's face bunched into a snarl, and he yelled in a bellowing voice, Liar! The bailiffs closed in on Richard. He didn't get up, and the bailiffs stood at the ready. Even though Richard's legs were cuffed, they believed his hands were lethal weapons, and they watched him very carefully. It was the kind of incident the reporters hoped for, and they wrote down details of the moment. Solano, obviously shaken by Richard's outburst, told the jury he had wired money to Richard in San Francisco on two occasions in the name of Ricardo Moreno. Halpin wanted to know how the defendant dressed. Dark colors. Do you recall if he ever wore a hat or cap? Yes, on many occasions. Can you describe the cap he wore? I think it was a baseball cap. Do you recall if there was any writing on the cap? Yes, it said D.C. or C.D., something like that or both of those things. Early on, the jurors had been told about the baseball cap with an ACDC logo that had been dropped in the Okazaki Hernandez garage. The witness stated he'd seen Richard with a Star of David in a circle drawn on the palm of his hand. The last time he'd seen Richard, he said, was when he'd come to his house on Wednesday of that last week, looking for money, saying he was hot and wanted to leave town. Solano testified he'd moved his family from the house when he'd seen the orange Toyota the police were looking for on the news. Monday of that week, I saw on the television a station wagon, orange, that he had used in a crime, and he had, he showed it to me on Saturday night. Solano conceded he couldn't be sure it was the car, but it sure looked like it. Judge Tynan was becoming annoyed at Richard's shenanigans with the aluminum foil. He again waved for him to stop, but Richard continued. The witness told the jury that he gave his son a bag of jewelry to hold and brought some of it to work. He said the police arrived at his house at 7.38 a.m. on the morning after Richard was arrested. He described how the detectives confiscated all the stolen property after he'd given them permission to search. He stated he was then taken to the sheriff's office where he spoke to Detective Avila in Spanish and agreed to recover all the things he said he'd gotten from Richard, which he quickly did in a hurry to distance himself from Richard and to ingratiate himself with the police. He hoped if he cooperated he would not be arrested as an accessory or for receiving stolen goods, which did happen. At the end of Halpin's direct, he showed Solano a photo of the Green Grand Prix, which Solano said he'd seen Richard driving on several occasions. Halpin announced he was done, and Judge Tynan recessed court until Monday, April 10, telling Solano to return then. As soon as the jury and alternates left, Tynan turned his attention to the defense table and complained about Richard having a mirror in court, that he was shining it in his and the interpreter's eyes and maybe even in the witness's eyes. He instructed the bailiffs to remove the mirror. I don't know what he's doing with the mirror, but certainly it should not be brought to court, he said. Richard's mirror was confiscated and he was taken back to the jail. In the hall, Clark told reporters that any reflections were accidental and Richard used it to comb his hair. The incident was reported in the papers the next day and picked up by the wire services. That weekend, an earthquake rocked Los Angeles. Richard was reading when the jail started shaking and trembling. He watched the ceiling, thinking it was going to fall down and kill him. And he welcomed death, for then he'd be in a place of honor, at the table of Lucifer and out of the hated six-by-eight-foot cell he'd been in since September of 1985. The quake passed. The ceiling didn't fall down. He went back to his reading. Solano again took the stand on Monday. Daniel asked him if he had initially told the police he had not bought any jewelry from Richard. Halpin, objecting on grounds of ambiguity, asked for a sidebar. At the bench, the prosecutor argued that Solano did tell the police he didn't at first buy jewelry Ramirez had, which was exactly what Solano had testified to. Judge Tynan suggested Daniel make his questions more concise and clear. He said, You are always trying to trap somebody 
and we get into these discussions all the time. I know it is your style, and it really isn't very effective. You'd be surprised, countered Daniel. Daniel grilled Solano on what he'd said and when he'd said it. The witness remained sure in what he said, and it seemed the longer he stayed on the stand, the worse it got for Richard. Solano said Richard was the only person he had ever bought stolen property from. According to Richard, Solano had bought items from other thieves in the pool hall, one called Jorge and another called Cameron. Solano denied ever buying anything from them. After the lunch break, the judge wanted to know where Arturo was. Daniel said he didn't know, that he had beeped him over the weekend, but Arturo hadn't responded. Tynan said he was issuing a body attachment notice for Arturo, but would hold it until Wednesday. Daniel asked Solano if he had spoken at the House of Billiards on 7th Avenue to a woman who'd offered him jewelry for sale a few days before Richard's arrest. Solano said he saw this woman the day after Richard's arrest, but he did not know her name, nor had he ever seen her before. Daniel asked him about the conversation he'd had with her. He said she'd been given his name as someone who bought things. He told her he wasn't interested, but the woman was insistent. He ended up telling her he was maybe interested in some gold chains, but she didn't show him anything that day. He told the court the woman then came to his house the next day. He had not given her the address, and he was angry. When she left, he tried to follow her, but she lost him. The police showed up half an hour after she'd gone. Daniel brought up a woman named Eva who knew both Richard and Solano. Solano was evasive and said Eva would sometimes help his wife with cleaning and babysitting, and he had once seen her talking to Richard at the pool hall, though he didn't know what their relationship had been. Daniel asked him questions for an hour more. After some redirect and recross, Solano stepped down from the stand. Sheriff's Deputy Durazzo took the stand next and stated he had learned that Solano had bought stolen property from Richard Ramirez, but they didn't have enough information to get a warrant, so the police had decided to try and sell Solano some stolen property. They had recruited the help of a woman whose name he didn't know. She lived in the area and was known to use drugs and deal in stolen property. They outfitted the woman with a wire, and five detectives had waited outside the pool hall as she unsuccessfully tried to sell Solano merchandise. The following day, they had brought her to the Solano's house, but he wasn't interested in what she had to sell. Solano then readily let the police in his house and gave them permission to look around after he had signed a consent to search form. They didn't remove anything until Sergeant Yarborough and Deputy Gunn, who were in charge of marshalling and inventorying all recovered property in the stalker case, showed up. Clark asked a lot of questions about the woman the police had sent into the pool hall in Solano's home. Halpin told Judge Tynan he would be putting some witnesses on out of order because they'd come from out of town and had been waiting for days. Halpin suggested it might be a good idea to take the jury by bus to all the crime scenes. He knew they'd seen the pictures, but nothing was better to get a feel of things than actually seeing the place. Tynan said he would contemplate it and recessed court for the day. Doreen visited Richard at the jail that day after court. A few of his groupies were there, but she ignored them. When Doreen's turn came, she excitedly waited for Richard to be brought down from his cell. She knew he was upset about Solano's betrayal and how Solano had lied to hurt him. When Richard sat on the other side of the glass and picked up the phone, he was fuming. He said Solano had bought hot things from a lot of people, not just him, that all Solano was after was the reward money, that he was a no-good dirty rat, that he'd burn in hell for his treachery. Doreen sympathized and listened to Richard with understanding eyes. He told her Eva, a professional thief, had sold Solano many things, which he in turn took to Tijuana and resold. He said his lawyers were trying to find her so they could show the jury what a lying creep Solano was. He said in the end none of it would matter because he'd be convicted and sentenced to die. Doreen begged him not to talk that way, to have hope. Just the thought of Richard being executed made her faint. 47. Halpin told the court the following morning they would have to move from the recovered property phase to the avia shoe print due to witnesses' schedules. You may proceed, Tynan said, and the prosecutor read into the record all the items relevant to the avia shoe print. These included business and sales records of the avia company, photographs of the avia aerobic prints found at the Zazara, Doi, Bell, Lang, Cannon, Bennett, Nelson, Covanant, and Aboath residences, and plaster casts of Richard's upper and lower teeth. The prosecutor put the data processing manager for Avia, Jeff Brewster, on the stand, and he told the jury how he fed into a computer, by style and number designation, 
how many pairs of shoes and what sizes were sold in any given region. He testified that the records for the period January to July 1985 indicated 24 pairs were sold in Southern California and only one pair size 11 and a half. Halpin asked how many Avia Aerobics model number 445B shoes were sold in the San Francisco Bay Area. Brewster said 41 pairs, two of which were size 11 and a half. That testimony, Halpin felt, proved there were very few people walking around L.A. or San Francisco with the 445B in size 11 and a half who also burglarized homes and killed people for the fun of it. Clark made a gallant effort and asked a lot of intelligent questions but didn't elicit anything from Brewster that helped the defense. There were two 11 and a half aerobics pairs sold in Southern California, and nothing Clark said could alter that fact. Halpin called Jerry Stubblefield, the owner of Avia and the designer of the aerobic shoe. He described in great deal the sole pattern of the aerobic and how different it was from other models they manufactured. On cross, Clark had Stubblefield concede that their coach model was very similar to the 445B, and that with wear and tear, the impressions the coach made were similar to those of the aerobic. Stubblefield told the jury he had been shown the crime scene impressions by the sheriff's department, and that he had identified the impressions as those of the aerobic shoe. Dr. Kenneth Moore, a medical doctor who worked in Pomona Valley Community Hospital's emergency ward, took the stand next. Jokelson had Dr. Moore describe some kid Kovanath's injuries to her wrists, face, and legs, as well as the tears which were consistent with a forced entry sexual attack. The prosecution then moved to Richard's teeth. Dr. Jerry Vale was called, and he testified he'd gone to the jail on September 13, 1985, and taken a series of pictures of Richard's teeth as they'd appeared that day. As Yokelson showed him the photographs, Dr. Vale described them for the jury. The teeth were jagged and decayed, and teeth were missing in both the lower and upper gums. He stated further he'd done a gelatin cast of the lower and upper teeth that were used to make plaster casts. Jokelson had Dr. Vale hold the casts and describe in detail each of the irregularities in Richard's teeth. On cross, Clark asked a few questions about some crowns and fillings in Richard's mouth. Dr. Vale was followed by another dentist, Dr. Alfred Otero, who told the jury he had been the senior dentist for the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department for the past 19 years and had seen Richard for the first time on September 3rd. Richard had nine decayed teeth. Over a period of nine months, the doctor had repaired nearly all the decay to Richard's teeth, filling them with a compound substance. Halpin and Jokelson, with the help of Carrillo and Salerno, moved into position displays of the avia shoe prints, which had been secured at the Zazara, Doi, Bell, Lang, Cannon, and Bennett crime scenes. Halpin moved the displays and the plaster casts of the avia prints into evidence. He called to the stand Gerald Burke, a criminalist from the sheriff's crime lab who had been in charge of analyzing and categorizing all shoe prints relevant to the stalker crimes. He told the jury how difficult it had been to identify the shoe. On cross-examination, Clark unsuccessfully tried to muddy the waters, but the facts were clear and worked against his client. Halpin moved into evidence in chronological order the footprints that tied Richard to the case, including photographs of all the items found in the Pontiac and in the Greyhound bag that had Richard's prints on them, and photographs of latent palm prints found on the kitchen sink of Clara Hadsall's home. He called Sheriff's fingerprint expert Hannah Wood to the stand, and she testified she'd been a deputy 23 years, 15 of which she spent in the Scientific Service Bureau. She had compared in excess of a million fingerprints, resulting in positive identifications of thousands of subjects, and had testified in over 500 court cases. Halpin had her identify Richard as the person whose prints she had taken at the county jail on September 9, 1985. Richard smiled at her. She frowned. Halpin showed her every print she had lifted from the confiscated items, and she testified they all belonged to Richard. She was the last witness of the day. In the morning, Halpin introduced into evidence the items removed from Ruth's residence in El Paso, the warrant to search the premises, and photographs of drawings of the 666 and the pentagrams found in Richard's car and Mabel Bell's home. Gil Carrillo was called, and he stated he had fingerprinted Richard the morning he'd been arrested at the Hollenbeck station. There was no cross. Halpin put Sheriff's homicide detective Carlos Avila on the stand, and he told the jury how he met Felipe Solano on several occasions and was given items Solano claimed he'd bought from Ramirez. He also told him a gun they'd found in Solano's Chevy truck had been left there by Richard. 
At that, Richard moved in his seat and laughed. I never left any motherfucking gun in Solano's van, Richard would later say. Next up was Deputy Homicide Detective Bob Perry. He stated he had made plans to fly down to El Paso on August 31st to gather information on Richard. Before he'd left, however, Richard had been apprehended, so his task had focused on recovering stolen property, especially Maxine Cesara's eyes. Using the phone number he had been given by Sergeant Yarborough, Perry secured the address of Ruth's home. The phone number, however, was registered to the Ramirez home in Hacienda Heights. Daniel objected to Halpin's putting the address into the record, saying that the parents were elderly and ill. At a sidebar, Daniel told Tynan that nothing had ever been recovered from the parents' home, and they had already suffered much because of Richard's arrest. Halpin agreed. Back in open court, Perry testified he went to El Paso District Attorney Bill Moody's office for warrants. With three El Paso detectives and his partner, he'd searched Ruth's home and confiscated a wooden box filled with costume jewelry she said she received from Richard. They confiscated it, as well as numerous other pieces which Ruth would later complain belonged to her. They went to the parents' home, but didn't search it. Why not? Halpin queried. Primarily the medical condition of Mr. Ramirez, and more so his wife, who was bedridden and under a doctor's orders not to be disturbed in that residence. I felt from the totality of the information I had that there probably wasn't anything there for us to rescue or retrieve. So did Mr. Ramirez ask you not to search his home? He did, Perry said. As Richard sat there, he wished he'd never gotten Ruth or any of his family involved in his lifestyle. Again, he wanted to tell everyone in the court to fuck off and get up and leave. He had to fight hard to resist the temptation. He knew the guards were hoping he'd do something like that so they would have a reason to lay into him. The prosecutor moved into evidence a chart of the recovered property and called Sheriff's Detective Yarborough. He told the jury how he had gathered all the items in Solano's home and put them in a locked room next to the sheriff's homicide office. On December 3rd, he and 12 other detectives numbered, photographed, and categorized all the items taken from Solano and brought them to the county jail for the property viewing on September 5th. On cross, Clark got Yarbrough to testify that fewer than 25% of the items in the September 5th lineup, 1,500 in all, were identified. That, Clark believed, clearly implied Felipe Solano had other sources. Detective Michael Griggs next took the stand and told the jury he had been there when the twenty two was recovered in Tijuana. It was loaded with five rounds of live ammunition. There was no cross. Halpin introduced photographs of a jail cell Richard had stayed in, where he'd drawn pentagrams and 666 in his blood on the floor. Deputy Sheriff Norlhad had been on suicide watch for Richard when he was first booked into the county jail's hospital wing on the day of his arrest. He stated he saw Richard sitting on the toilet bowl with some blood in his hand, and that he noted the 666 and the pentagram on the ground. I watched him with his left hand take blood from his right palm and write the numbers and that five-pointed star directly on the floor in front of him. He testified he then advised his supervisor of this, and photographs were taken of Richard's artistic statements. There was no cross. Salerno was brought back to the stand to testify he was present at Richard's arraignment on October 24, 1985, in front of Judge Elva Soper, when Richard had raised his hand to the court and yelled, Hail Satan, as he held up his right palm, on which there was a pentagram. Daniel stood up for the cross and asked Frank if he'd ever seen a pentagram and 666 together at a crime scene other than at the stalker crimes. No, never in my life, Frank said. Deputy Daniel Laws, the last witness for the prosecution, replaced Frank on the stand, stated he'd been on the PM watch at the jail's hospital wing, and had guarded Richard for about a year and a half altogether. He stated that on October 30th, Richard had beckoned him to his cell, saying, Laws, come here. What did you do? Halpin asked the deputy. I went over. What did the defendant do? He showed me two pictures of a homicide victim. Can you describe them? The first picture was of a woman... Maxine Zazara. The photograph showed from the face down. She was nude. And then the second photograph had the same woman lying on the bed with her head turned away from the camera. Did he, did the defendant say anything at that time? Not at that time. Did you ask him why he was showing you the pictures? Yes, I did. What did he say? He said, people come up here and call me a punk, and I show them the photographs and tell them there is blood behind the night stalker, and they go away all pale. Halpin handed the deputy two photographs of Mrs. Zazara, and he identified them as the ones Richard had shown him. 
Halpin now moved into evidence a four-page list, then announced the state rests. Judge Tynan ordered a fifteen-minute break. As the jury and alternates got up to leave, Gill watched Cindy Hayden stare at Richard and was thankful she had never been put on the jury. When court resumed, Judge Tynan asked Ray Clark if they would be putting on a defense. Clark said he needed time to prepare, at least two weeks, as there were items that had still not been received by their experts. Tynan gave the defense two weeks to prepare their case and set a firm court date of May 1st to begin. 48. Richard didn't want to put on any defense at all. He had continually told his lawyers the trial was a circus and a farce. He refused to take it seriously or give it the dignity of putting on a defense. Clark strongly urged him to plead insanity and try to show the court, through expert medical witnesses, that he was crazy. But Richard told him he would never plead insanity. He had his pride, his dignity. Clark and Daniel spoke to Ruth and implored her to try and change her brother's mind. She came up from El Paso to visit Richard that weekend, but even she couldn't alter his resolve not to put on a defense. "'If they convict you, the judges will sentence you to die,' she said, her big brown eyes brimming with tears. "'I'd rather die than spend my life in jail. Any life is better than no life. If they execute you, Richie, it will kill Papa and Mama.' Richard stayed silent. Ruth began to cry in earnest. She knew when her baby brother made up his mind about something, neither flood nor fire could change it. Against Richard's wishes, Daniel and Ray Clark went ahead and put together as good a defense as they could muster without their client's cooperation, support, or input. They hired private detectives to dig up more information on Solano, and they had found several other thieves who dealt with him. They had also located a burglar who used to do burglaries with Richard, Sandra Hotchkiss, who was also the woman the police tried to entrap Solano with. On May 1st, the courtroom was filled with press, spectators, and Richard's groupies. Doreen took her usual place. Phil Halpin stood and told the court that a prosecution witness had lied, and he wanted to make the court aware of it and asked to reopen his case to straighten the matter out. It would take no more than ten minutes, he said, though he was not quite ready to proceed and asked for a little time to prepare. Tynan ordered the proceeding to resume at 10.30 the following morning, he asked to see defense counsel without help in present. The reporters gathered around the prosecutor in the hall. A witness lying in the Night Stalker case was big news, and they beseeched Halpin to tell them who it was. He refused to give any names, but said the lies were not earth-shattering. The witness had lied to protect a woman. There's nothing so unusual about that, he was quoted in all the Los Angeles newspapers as saying. In the morning, after Clark and Daniel Hernandez had had a chance to discuss the matter, Clark told Judge Tynan he thought that because the people had clear, accurate information that Solano had dealt with other thieves and knew he was lying on the stand, his testimony should be stricken altogether. Clark told the court a woman named Sandra Hotchkiss had a wire on when she went to Solano's house, and he talked on tape about buying items from people other than Richard Ramirez. Hernandez said the people, having information that Solano was lying, could be seen as subornation of perjury. He had spoken to Miss Hotchkiss, and she'd claimed Solano was wrestled to the ground by task force detectives and dragged into the house, where he was beaten and coerced into signing a form giving the police the right to search his home. These were grave charges, and Judge Tynan was suddenly interested in what Daniel was saying. If it could be proved all the materials confiscated at Solano should not have been allowed in as evidence, the prosecution's case would be weakened considerably. This could ignite a mistrial or a reversal if the jury convicted. When Daniel finished, the judge asked for Halpin's response. Certainly this is a good example of the incompetence demonstrated by Mr. Hernandez. I am going to object. I am getting tired of his ridiculous accusations. Judge Tynan tried to calm him. Mr. Halpin, why don't we just— The man is an incompetent. He has accused me of being a felon. Rise above it, Tynan suggested. There was, between Daniel Hernandez and Phil Halpin, a genuine, intense hatred, and they argued back and forth heatedly. Daniel said the only reason Halpin was reopening his case was because he found out the defense had witnesses lined up to testify and prove that Solano was a liar. The police and the prosecutor knew about it, yet they let him get on the stand and perpetrate a perjury. Tynan told Daniel to make his objection on the prosecutor, reopening the case, and he would rule on it. Daniel said he wanted a full 402 hearing to determine if the district attorney knew about Solano's other transactions 
and through the hearing determine if there was indeed subordination to perjury. Judge Tynan ruled there would be no hearing, that the defense had the right to cross-examine Solano when the people reopened the case. He said, As I've indicated before, I've had my skin abraded by Mr. Halpin, but I have never known him to be dishonest, and I see nothing at this juncture that would lead me to believe that he has been. The jury was brought in. Tynan told them he was allowing the prosecution to reopen its case for the purpose of calling back a witness, Felipe Solano. Richard glowered at Solano as he took the stand. Solano was not happy about being recalled. In the few weeks since he testified, he seemed to have aged ten years. Halpin went right to the point and said, Were there some things you testified to that weren't true? Solano said there were. He had known Eva Castillo, also known as Rosa Solis, since August 1983, and he had bought stolen property from her on three occasions. But she had given things to my family as a gift a few times. Halpin asked Solano if he'd received any of the property identified at the September 5th lineup from Eva Castillo, and with certainty he said no, that he'd received that property from Richard Ramirez. Richard moved about in his seat nervously, and his leg irons rattled. When Halpin asked why Solano had lied about receiving stolen property from Eva, he said, Just because I wanted to protect her. She's a mother. He said he had also bought things from a thief named Monje and from another who went by the name Cuba. Halpin showed photographs of confiscated items Solano identified as some he'd gotten from Eva, Cuba, and Monje, and the prosecutor said he had nothing further. At 2.50, Daniel Hernandez rose to do the cross on Solano. He tried mightily to rake Solano over the coals, but Solano had already admitted lying to protect Eva, and no matter how hard Daniel worked, he couldn't undermine Solano's character or truthfulness any further. Solano had never been a credible witness. He was a fence who worked the denizens of downtown L.A., and his credibility was inherently limited. When Daniel asked him if he'd voluntarily let the police go into his home, he said he had. After an hour on the stand, when Daniel's cross began to go in circles, Halpin started objecting. Court was recessed at 3 p.m. Cindy Hayden made wide, syrupy eyes at Richard. Ray Clark and Daniel went to talk with Richard in the court's holding cell, and Richard repeated that he didn't want to put on a defense. Clark tried hard to change his mind, but Richard said no, got angry, and showed the fierce Ramirez temper, cursing and yelling and demanding, No fucking defense, man! This trial's a fucking joke! The guards had to intercede and stop the shouting. After the break, Daniel asked Solano if he'd known, when he was lying on the stand, that Richard Ramirez was facing the death penalty. Solano said at the beginning he'd thought there was no death penalty, but he had since learned otherwise. "'But still you lied to protect a woman?' Daniel asked incredulously. Solano repeated that he lied only to shield Eva. It was a point well made, and it was not lost on the jury. When Daniel finished, there was some redirect, and again Halpin announced, "'The people rest.'" Ray Clark asked to approach the bench, and told Tynan they were still undecided about whether there would be a defense. He asked for a little more time to decide, and Judge Tynan gave them until the following morning. Daniel said they would need more time than that. Clark said if they did put on a defense, they would be doing it against Richard's wishes. He recounted to the judge the heated shouting match with his client, and that Richard was adamant about not putting on any defense. Daniel said he would need to talk to Richard's family and couldn't do everything in just one day. Judge Tynan relented and gave the defense lawyers until Monday. 49. According to Julian Ramirez, his youngest son was in El Paso for the communion party of Ruth's daughter Gloria during the time he was supposed to have attacked Mrs. Bell, Nettie Lang, and Carol Kyle. Julian told Daniel over the phone he would be willing to come up to Los Angeles, take the stand, and swear on a stack of Bibles it was true. Julian insisted he had a picture with Richard himself, Mercedes, and his granddaughter in her communion dress, standing in the front yard of the Hacienda Heights house. When Daniel and Ray Clark went to the jail to tell Richard of his father's willingness to help and about the photographs, Richard threw a fit, saying he didn't want to put his father through that. He yelled and screamed in a temper tantrum. Ruth came up to Los Angeles with Joseph, and they tried to convince Richard to put up a fight. But Richard yelled and screamed at them, too. Ruth begged him, but he stayed adamant and unmoving. There will be no defense, he said. Monday morning, Ray Clark, with large circles from stress under his eyes, asked Judge Tynan for an ex parte meeting in the judge's chambers with defense counsel and the defendant. 
Halpin objected, saying, at this juncture the prosecution had the right to be privy to all proceedings. Tynan disagreed and moved the proceedings to his chambers, minus the prosecutor. Richard was in a foul mood. When Tynan asked him if he wanted a defense, he yelled, no, and cursed the judge, calling him a motherfucker. He told him that he thought the whole trial was a scheme, a joke, and that he wouldn't take part in it. He said that he would put up a fight not to come to court. They'll have to bind me and fucking drag me in the courtroom. I won't go. Tynan said that could be arranged. He quickly saw the futility of trying to reason with Richard and ordered the proceedings back into court, after Daniel and Ray asked for a little time to talk with their client. In open court, a motion to drop the sodomy charges in the Sophie Dickman matter got underway. Clark argued that according to Ms. Dickman, Richard was humping her tailbone, and tailbone does not equal anus, which does not equal sodomy. Halpin said, In fact, as the court knows, penetration is not located in the definition of either rape or sodomy in the penal code of this state. Clark and Halpin argued as Judge Tynan listened and then ruled the charges would remain. Court was recessed until 1.30, when Daniel and Ray Clark had to let the court know if there was going to be any defense or not. As Richard was being led from the courtroom, he turned and faced the press, an angry snarl on his face. He said, Media, sensation-seeking parasites, and was led from the court. The press was taken aback for a few beats, then hurried to phone in this latest defiance of Richard Ramirez. Ray and Daniel returned to the holding pen and worked hard to convince Richard to change his mind. They both knew if no defense was put in, he would surely be convicted and given the death sentence. They didn't want that to happen. Neither of them wanted Richard's execution on their hands. Clark said it was stupid not to put his father on the stand. Daniel told Richard he had spoken to his mother and she had cried and begged him to convince her youngest spawn to put up a defense. That seemed to strike a chord somewhere deep inside of Richard. He said he would like to talk with Dr. Joe Ellen Demetrius and ask how the jury might react if he didn't put up a defense, didn't take the stand, and deny the charges. When court resumed, Clark told the judge Richard had changed his mind and was now thinking about putting on a limited defense, but he wanted to speak with Dr. Demetrius. Reluctantly, Tynan agreed to give the defense until morning to decide what direction they were going to take. Halpin moved into evidence all the documents he had relative to Eva Castillo's arrest and incarceration. Daniel didn't want them in and objected strenuously, but Tynan allowed the documents in and the jury would see them. That evening, Joe Ellen Demetrius went to the county jail to visit with Richard. He trusted her judgment, thought she was very observant and knew human nature. Dr. Demetrius advised him to tell his counsel to put on what defense it could and that it would be a good idea for him to allow his father to testify. Richard told her he did not want to take the stand and asked her if that would hurt him in the eyes of the jury. She said it would not, that frequently defendants in capital crime cases do not take the stand, and that during the charge the judge was obligated to tell the jury not taking the stand was not to be held against him. The next day Richard showed up in court wearing all black. Daniel announced they would be going forward with a defense and told the court he was ready to make the opening statement. Halpin had no objection. Judge Tynan gave Daniel the go-ahead to make his remarks. Arturo was now at the defense table again. Daniel faced the jurors, and using a large chart of the evidence as the defense saw it, began systematically to go over all the counts, pointing out weaknesses and discrepancies. He said, often using his hands for emphasis, there was only one fingerprint of questionable origin, connecting Ramirez to Vinco, and that Maria Hernandez could identify Richard only tentatively. Daniel referred to the different guns that were used, but his remarks weren't completely clear, and a few of the jurors looked at him with some bewilderment. No one looked more bewildered than alternate Cindy Hayden. Daniel had difficulty explaining away the eyewitnesses. He spent a long time breaking down the credibility of Felipe Solano and Jesse Perez, describing Solano as a downtown fence, a liar, a man who couldn't be believed about the correct time. He said Solano had recruited Richard and others to sell stolen items he'd bought at very cheap prices in the downtown area. He returned to Maria Hernandez, saying she had never had time to see her assailant because the lights had gone out. Richard took off his sunglasses, turned in the direction of his admirers, and smiled. The judge interrupted him and suggested a lunch recess. Halpin asked for a sidebar, complaining that Daniel's statements of facts were off-base and that he wasn't just making an opening statement, but was arguing his case. The judge agreed and warned Daniel to move along. 
Daniel brought up a September 4, 1985 Daily News article by Arnie Friedman, which clearly implied that Richard Ramirez was the Night Stalker, and said that he would begin a lineup at the jail on the 5th. It had accompanying photographs of Gil Carrillo, Frank Salerno, Phil Halpin, and Ira Reiner. Halpin objected. There was no offer of proof that Maria, or for that matter any of the witnesses, had seen the Friedman piece. Tynan agreed. Unless Daniel had eyeball witnesses, that is, people who had identified Richard, testify they'd been contaminated by the press, his argument was moot. Tynan ruled Daniel could not make reference to newspaper articles in his opening statement unless he made an offer of proof that witnesses had in fact seen a particular article. Daniel continued with his opening. He said no expert witness for the prosecution had come forth to testify that the ACDC cap left in the Okazaki Hernandez garage definitely belonged to Richard. DNA tests on the sweatband could reveal that Richard never wore that hat. He claimed the defense had had such tests done and would put witnesses on the stand to say that the DNA in the sweat was not Richard's. He moved to the U matter and said Duenas had admitted on the stand he could not honestly identify Richard as the person who had shot Veronica U. Daniel continued that Jorge Gallegos could not have perceived Richard as the assailant as the headlights were shining directly in the rearview window and in Gallegos' eyes during the entire incident. Daniel pointed out Gallegos had told the police officers on the scene that he could not identify who'd shot Veronica. Daniel added that the Catholic medallion found near Veronica Yu's hand, lying on the street, could very well have belonged to her assailant. It was no secret to anyone on the jury that Richard was a Satanist, and the last thing he'd be walking around with was a Catholic medallion. Daniel stated that there was evidence Veronica Yu was sitting in the car when she was shot, which clearly implied she had known her killer. Concerning the Zazara incident, there a fingerprint was found on the screen at the point of entry, and that fingerprint did not belong to Richard or to either of the Zazaras. Daniel mentioned the avia prints found under the window, but didn't offer a viable reason for their presence. He moved to the Mary Cannon murder and said she'd been struck by a milk glass lamp, and that weapon used against Mrs. Cannon didn't fit any pattern. Again, he mentioned the avia print had been there without addressing how it had gotten there. But more importantly, there was a light brown hair found in the bed that was not Richard's, as well as an unidentified fingerprint located on a green metal file in Mary's home. Daniel made reference to blood other than Richard's, and at Ms. Cannon's the police had found blood on the knife left on the bed and the lamp. He said, and that when a lamp is struck against someone's head and broken, that the person holding that lamp could very well get cut and lose some blood onto that glass, onto that weapon. Halpin moved about in his chair anxiously, having difficulty with Daniel's view of the facts. The defense lawyer moved to the Bennett assault, skirted over the shoe print, and made reference to a beer bottle found in the home with a print on it that didn't belong to the Bennett family or to Richard. More important, he said, were bloodstains the police had found on a blue sash on Whitney's bed, which was neither Whitney's blood nor Richard's. He said fingerprints found on the air conditioner near the point of entry also were not Richard Ramirez's. Daniel told the jury there had been testimony about glove prints having been found at crime scenes, but no glove prints like those had ever been linked to Richard. He moved to the bell matter and the open can of soda seen by Carlos Valenzuela, who thought it was odd for the sisters to just leave it lying around. The criminalists, Daniel said, had collected that can and inspected it and tested it for fingerprints, and there were no fingerprints found. About the nightings, he said both victims had been killed and there were no witnesses. He again offered no explanation for the presence of Avia Prince. Instead, he told the jury about a T-shirt found at a construction site next door to the Nightings' home, which had been photographed and tested by the police. It contained light brown hair similar to hair found on a nightstand in the victim's bedroom, which didn't match Richard's. Daniel was sweating profusely now. He consulted his notes, took a few deep breaths, and told the jury that there had been Avia Prince found at the Joyce Nelson murder scene, but he skirted over them, too, making reference to some brown hairs and fingerprints found in Joyce's home, which did not belong to her or to Richard. Finally, Daniel addressed the avia prints at all the crime scenes. No such shoe had ever been found on Richard, even though all his things had been confiscated, nor had a receipt for any avia shoes been found, nor any witnesses who could say Richard wore avia aerobic shoes. He said of all the glove prints found at so many crime scenes, no such glove had been located in Richard's belongings. Daniel seemed winded, obviously needing a break, 
and suggested to the judge they take a recess, which Tynan agreed to. Richard, Ray Clark, and Richard Salinas congratulated Daniel on the fine job he was doing. Halpin thought Hernandez was going in circles and grabbing at straws. Whatever might be said about Daniel's opening statement, he was impassioned and seemed to really believe Richard wasn't the stalker. When court resumed, Daniel brought up the murder of 26-year-old Patty Higgins in her Arcadia apartment, wanting to tell the jury about her. This was one of the murder counts against Richard which had been dropped by the state. Daniel said there was a similar M.O. in this murder, the slash throat. Serological tests done on Ms. Higgins showed that there was another party there other than Ms. Higgins or the defendant. Judge Tynan asked Halpin his thoughts on that, and he objected on grounds of relevance. Tynan sustained it, saying he'd instruct the jury to disregard anything Daniel said about Patty Elaine Higgins. The defense lawyer again reviewed all the inconsistencies he perceived with the people's case, then moved on to the Abawath assault, pointing out more brown hairs and fingerprints found on the premises which didn't belong to the Aboaths or to Richard. He said Mrs. Aboath had told police her attacker had light brown hair. He mentioned a private security officer who had heard the first police call go out and was speeding to the Aboath residence to assist when he ran into a man in a Datsun pickup truck who seemed to be fleeing the direction of the attacks. Daniel promised the jury this fellow would be testifying. He attacked Jesse Perez, pointing out there would be testimony that Perez had received the recovered gun in Tijuana many months before Richard Ramirez's arrest, up to a year before, and he ripped into the credibility of Perez and his testimony. He moved to Sophie Dickman and her statements that her assailant had brown hair and was not Latino. He reminded the jury she had admitted on the stand having seen many news shows and read many papers about Richard's capture. The evidence is going to show that she was identifying the person she saw on television rather than the person she saw the evening that she was assaulted. He described how terrible the light had been when Virginia Peterson had seen her attacker. There was no way that person could be seen. He pointed out that Chris Peterson, who was closer to the attacker, was not able to identify Richard as his assailant. Daniel now tore into the lineup, saying there had been a lot of media waiting for witnesses, that there was an air of celebration that Ramirez was on stage. He said the witnesses waited in the halls of the jail together and spoke to one another and that there was some communication from the people running the lineup about which person to focus on. He said Richard clearly had a shaved spot on his head, and it was reported widely he had sustained a head injury as a result of the chase on Hubbard Street. He would be putting Alan Adeshek on the stand to tell the jury how concerned Adeshek had been about this obvious head injury on the day of the lineup. Daniel talked about James Romero III, and said he was flown by helicopter from Orange County to the lineup and had been given rewards and plaques and even a motorcycle. The press had virtually crowded the streets and stopped traffic around the jail during the lineup. Daniel said of Romero's identification, and this gentleman will testify that he felt obligated, after the awards and after all the congratulations, he felt obligated to identify Mr. Ramirez. Daniel again reviewed his salient points, sincerely thanked the jury for listening to him, and ended his day-long opening. Judge Tynan wrapped up the proceedings and the jurors stood to leave, weary and anxious to be out of the courtroom. The press didn't move, hoping Richard would show some new defiance, but only his chains rattled as the bailiffs led him from court. The first witness for the defense was Dave Frank, a private detective with thirteen years' experience. A small, unassuming man, he testified he went to the Petersons' former home in Northridge and the present owner had let him in to take pictures, which Daniel now showed to the jury. According to Frank, it would have been nearly impossible for Virginia Peterson to have had enough light to make out the features of her attacker. Using the window as his focal point, he'd taken photographs from where he surmised the Peterson's bed had been on the morning of the assault. On cross, Halpin tried to undermine the private detective's testimony and his pictures, but the angles were clear and it appeared it really would have been difficult for Virginia to be able to see the man who had shot her and her husband. Clark told Judge Tynan he wanted to call either Salerno or Carrillo. The prosecutor said it was Salerno's day off and he was out of town. Carrillo was attending a function, but would be available the next day. Monterey Park policeman Dan Romero was called by the defense, and Clark, using Romero's report, got him to quickly concede that Jorge Gallegos had said he could not identify the man who'd shot Veronica Yu. 
Did Mr. Gallegos tell you he never heard or saw a fight between the suspect and the victim? Clark asked. That's correct. And did he also tell you that he did not hear any shots being fired? That's correct. And did he also tell you that he would not be able to identify the suspect? That's correct, Officer Romero said. Halpin wasn't happy, for that destroyed any credibility Gallegos had. Clearly he had lied on the stand. He had testified he'd seen the shooter, heard the gunshots, heard arguing. Clark had Officer Romero tell the jury that Alhambra was a dark street with a lot of trees on it. Phil Halpin stood to try and repair the damage, but this time the facts worked against the people. Officer Romero repeated under Halpin's questions that both Joseph Duenas and Gallegos had said they could not identify the shooter. On redirect, Clark asked if either of the witnesses appeared retarded, and Romero said no. Next, the defense put Monterey Park officer Anthony Romero on the stand, and he stated he spoke Spanish and had asked Gallegos on the night of the crime if he would like to add anything to the statement he'd made to Officer Dan Romero, and Gallegos had said no. Halpin had no cross, and the officer stepped down. He did not seem happy about his testimony helping Richard Ramirez. Ray Clark asked for a sidebar. They had run out of witnesses and wanted a postponement for the day. Judge Tynan pointed out that Detective Carrillo was now here. Daniel said they weren't prepared to examine him. Judge Tynan criticized Daniel for not being prepared. I'm going to let it slide this time, Mr. Hernandez. I really don't want this to happen again. Please. Daniel apologized. In the morning, Gil Carrillo took the stand. Daniel began with the ACDC cap Gil had seen in the Okazaki Hernandez garage and help and objected. At a heated sidebar, Tynan ruled that Daniel could question Gil about the cap if he did his questioning in a professional manner. If you begin the usual meandering that I put up with for the last two, three years, I will probably change my mind about allowing you to, or taking you at your word that you are simply laying a foundation. Daniel didn't like the judge saying his examinations were meandering and complained, but Tynan was adamant. Let's go, the judge demanded, losing what patience he had left. Daniel asked Gill when he had first observed the baseball cap, and Gill again took the jury through what he had done the Sunday night he was called to the Rosemead condo. He testified he didn't recall whether he or his partner had first picked up the cap, but the criminalist had placed it into an evidence bag to be removed for testing after it had been photographed. Daniel asked Gill what other crimes he had investigated that he believed were connected to the Okazaki killing. Halpin objected strenuously, asking for a sidebar. He felt Daniel's question could cause a mistrial, because Gill would have to say there were molestation crimes which the court had ruled could not be admitted. Daniel said he had meant crimes Richard was being charged with, and that his question was misinterpreted by Halpin. Judge Tynan warned Daniel he was not going to allow him to re-cross-examine Gill or any other witnesses unless his questions were focused and to the point Tynan said he'd been very generous with what he'd allowed in Hernandez's cross-examinations. Ray Clark told the judge that another witness of theirs, who would be testifying against Solano, was afraid of retaliation. He asked if the witness could take the stand under an assumed name and not have his photograph taken. Judge Tynan said he had no problem allowing the witness to testify under an alias. Carrillo returned to the stand. Daniel asked him questions about the photo lineup Maria Hernandez and Sophie Dickman had reviewed. Carrillo explained the surveillance that was placed on Paul Samuels, the man Maria had said most looked like her attacker. Samuels was arrested and his house was searched, but he was let go because the sheriff's office came to the conclusion that he was not their man. Daniel next tried to get Gill to admit that something untoward had been done at the lineup. He asked if investigating officers at the lineup had discussed whether Richard's picture in the paper tainted the lineup and made it unfair. On grounds of relevance, Halpin objected. There was a sidebar. Annoyed, the prosecution said the issue of the lineup had been litigated a half dozen times and to do it again was ridiculous. Clark argued that if the police had had such a conversation, it was not relevant. The prosecutor got into a heated argument with Judge Tynan and was asked to calm down. They broke for lunch. After lunch, the prosecutor opened up volume 21 of the trial transcript for February 25th and read the judge's previous ruling. Carrillo's state of mind and what he thought of the lineup and Richard's picture being in the paper were all irrelevant. Clark argued that what the investigators knew about the lineup's fairness was relevant. Halpin pointed out that other officers, not Carrillo, had been in charge of it. 
The judge agreed, and again ruled Daniel could not ask Gill about what he thought of the lineup. Alpin seemed satisfied. Ray Clark asked the court if they could recall Gill. They had other witnesses they had to examine because of pressing time restraints. Tynan said that would be all right. The defense will call Julian Tapia Ramirez, Clark announced. Richard's father entered the courtroom, looking confused. Tynan swore Julian in, and an interpreter was provided. Richard did not look in his father's direction. He kept his head bent, busying himself with some papers. Clark asked Julian his relationship to the defendant. He is my son, Julian said. There was a heavy silence in the courtroom. He seemed as much a victim as anyone else, Juror Chocolate Harris would later say. Clark moved to May 24th and 25th, 1985, asking Julian if he knew where Richard was on those days. Julian testified he was in El Paso, that he remembered this distinctly and clearly because it had been the time of his granddaughter's first communion and there was a party. Richard had been there, he was sure. Clark showed him a communion certificate which he identified as belonging to his granddaughter. And do you have any doubt in your mind that Richard was in Texas during the time that you just testified to? No, I'm telling the truth, Julian said, with sincere finality. Clark thanked him. He had nothing further. The prosecutor asked to approach the bench. At a sidebar, Halpin said that according to the penal code, he had a right to look into the alibi and he requested Julian be held over until Monday, at which time he would do his cross-examination. Daniel said Halpin had known all along that Richard had been in El Paso then, as it had been noted in police reports. The prosecutor said he had never heard of Richard being in El Paso in May of 1985. Clark asked for a recess so he could look for the reports, which Tynan granted. When court resumed, out of the presence of the jury, the judge said he wasn't himself quite clear on when Julian was saying Richard had been in El Paso. Julian said he'd arrived May 23rd, a Thursday more or less, and stayed eight days, which indicated Richard was out of L.A. during the Bell, Lang, and Kyle assaults. The judge ruled that the people had a right to a reasonable continuance to ascertain the correctness of the information testified to, and said Mr. Ramirez should stay in Los Angeles for the weekend so he could be in court Monday morning. He stated further that the court would pay for a hotel and give Mr. Ramirez a hundred dollars a day to cover his costs. Ray Clark told the court Mr. Ramirez was taking care of children and would like to return to El Paso for the weekend. He asked if the court would cover the round-trip airfare which was $450. The judge agreed. The jury was brought in, and Tynan told them Mr. Ramirez would be cross-examined on Monday and ordered him to return to court at 10.30. Julian said he understood and stepped down from the stand. Clark told the judge that two other witnesses the defense was going to put on who were in the hall were not going to be called, and Carrillo was asked to retake the stand. Daniel asked if Gill had been aware that Richard Ramirez had been portrayed on television and his picture had been in the newspapers during the period between Richard's arrest and the lineup. Gill said he had been, and Daniel tried again to find fault with the lineup. Gill told the events the way he knew them, and Daniel was able to do little to assist the defense. Julian Ramirez did not visit Richard at the jail after court that day. He flew back to El Paso to be with his grandchildren. They were the only source of pleasure he had left in life. Monday morning, May 15th, Ray Clark was given permission to put Rosa Solis's corrections counselor at Corcoran State Prison on the stand first. He told the court the testimony would be short. The courtroom was packed with spectators and press. The senior Ramirez was news. He had sired the man who was being tried for the most brutal, frightening murder spree in California's history. The correction officer, Alex Lujan, took the stand and testified he had gone to Felipe Solano's residence to verify that the address Solis had given was not bogus. There he had spoken to Solano's wife, learned from her Solis was not there, and issued a prisoner-at-large report. Clark was still trying to show Solano had lied, and that Halpin knew it and was trying to cover up the fact that Solis was one of the many thieves who had sold property to Solano. That was important for the jury to understand, Clark knew, if he was going to have a viable someone-else-did-it defense. Halpin's cross-examination of Lujan was interrupted because he didn't have all the pertinent files with him. Julian Ramirez was called back to the stand. Mercedes, who had returned with him, waited in the hall, sitting on a wooden bench and praying to Jesus that the jury would see the truth. Julian mounted the stand. Richard stared down, avoiding looking in his father's direction. Tynan told Julian he was still under oath, and Halpin asked Julian how many grandchildren he had, 
to which he replied, Six. Halpin asked the name of the grandchild who had received communion in May of 1985. Julian said it was Gloria. When the prosecutor asked him to spell her last name, Julian Romero said no and looked at Halpin defiantly, his eyes hard and cold and unwavering. Julian did not want his grandchildren to suffer any more than they would already because of Richard's notoriety. They were young and they were innocent, and Julian wasn't about to spell Gloria's last name. Halpin sensed his resolve in this matter and understood, though he asked Julian when Gloria had been born, and Julian answered, I don't remember. Halpin picked up the communion certificate and asked him when Julian had first seen it. Julian said just a week ago. Using a calendar, the prosecutor asked him to put a red circle around the day his granddaughter had received her communion. He circled May 25th and stated that Richard had come to El Paso to attend the communion party they'd had for Gloria at his home. Richard started to move about in his chair. It was just the family, Julian said. Clark interrupted, requesting a sidebar, at which he stated Richard was going bananas at the defense table. He didn't want any pictures taken of his father, which the court had agreed to, but Richard had seen the camera facing his father, and that had set him off. The cameraman was warned not to photograph Julian, and the proceeding continued, with Halpin asking what date Richard had left. The father said May 31st. Julian said Richard had come to El Paso a few times in 1985, but he didn't remember the dates. He said Richard had stayed in a hotel the first night he was there in May, that Mercedes had gone and picked him up and brought him to the Hacienda Heights house, where he stayed the full week. The prosecutor moved on to when the L.A. detectives had come to El Paso and searched his home. Julian said they had searched Ruth's home, not his. Halpin ended his cross, requesting Julian Ramirez be subject to recall. The prosecutor believed that Julian was lying. He was sure Richard had been in L.A. between May 22nd and 31st. Judge Tynan thanked the senior Ramirez, who in turn thanked him and the jury. As he left the courtroom, he passed within inches of Richard. He wanted to hold his youngest born close to him, tell him everything would work out and to be strong, but he did none of those things. After a five-minute recess, Alan Adeshek was called by the defense with Arturo during the direct. Adeshek testified he had been practicing law for 19 years, was a public defender in September of 1985, and had represented Richard Ramirez. He was now a traffic court supervisor for L.A. County. He stated he and five other public defenders and two investigators had gone to the lineup that they had sat in the audience to observe what took place and make sure everything was done fairly. He stated how he had seen a few witnesses waiting in the hall together and that ultimately there were so many witnesses the police had needed two separate lineups. He described how a witness sat in every other chair in a room about the size of the courtroom, which was thirty-six feet by forty-six. There had been a camera eight rows from the front, set on a tripod by the sheriff's people to document the lineup's correctness. Arturo asked if Richard's hair had been shorter during the lineup. The witness said it was longer now. Arturo then addressed the heart of what the defense felt was wrong with the lineup. Did he, did he have any injuries prior to, did he sustain any injuries? Adeshek said Ramirez had, and that there was a bald spot on the back of his head. Arturo had Adeshek tell the jury all the details of the lineup, then showed him a series of photographs which depicted the people in the lineup. He directed his attention to a photograph which showed the lineup from the rear and asked Adeshek if it depicted the bald spot as it appeared that day on the back of Richard's head, and Adeshek said it did, and added that the bald spot was visible in the photograph as well as to the witnesses at the lineup that day. The judge interrupted them for the lunch break. All the jurors except Fernando Sandejas left. The judge's clerk told Tynan that juror Sendejas had a problem. Sendejas wanted the court to know that he had gone to school with Alan Adeshek. Neither Tynan nor Halpin had a problem with that, but Clark said he would like to discuss it with Richard. Cindy Hayden went to lunch with Chocolate Harris and Phyllis Singletary. As they waited for the elevator to take them downstairs, they saw Mercedes and Julian Ramirez also waiting for an elevator, with reporters surrounding them and asking questions, which got no answers. Cindy thought that they looked like nice, hard-working people and was sorry they had to publicly be a part of the trial. Cindy could see clearly that Julian's heart was broken, that his son's trouble sat on his shoulders like a two-ton weight. The three women did not get into the elevator with the Ramirez's, but they did discuss how sad it was to watch Julian Ramirez walk past Richard and with neither one acknowledging the other. Cindy would very much have liked to have talked with Julian, 
to hear about his son's childhood and perhaps learn about some root causes for Richard's path in life. She hadn't yet made up her mind about whether Richard was the stalker, but he'd obviously been living on the wrong side of the law. As the women talked, Cindy thought Phyllis Singletary seemed troubled and distracted. She wondered if hearing Julian's testimony was the reason, and asked her. Phyllis said it certainly had saddened her, but added she was having trouble at home, that her boyfriend had a bad temper and he drank and became abusive. Cindy realized how hard it must be for Phyllis to go home to an abusive relationship after she had been subjected to all the gruesome testimony and terrible pictures every day. Ray Clark, Daniel, and Arturo asked Richard if he minded having Sendejas on the jury. Ramirez said he did, because Sendejas knew Adeshek and his impartiality would be affected. He said he wanted him off the jury. Richard realized this would probably be the last chance for Hayden to become a juror through what she had told him with her eyes and sympathizing little smiles that she would never convict him. He demanded his attorneys tell Judge Tynan that Sendejas was history. After lunch, Clark explained to Tynan that Richard adamantly wanted Sendejas off the jury. The judge had no choice but to thank Sendejas and dismiss him. He ordered an alternate be drawn. The clerk reached into the drum, drew a name, and read it out loud, Cynthia Hayden. Miss Hayden, you are now juror number one. You will sit in that seat henceforth, Judge Tynan ordered. Cynthia Hayden got up, walked to seat number one, and sat down with a huge smile on her face, extremely happy and apparently not caring who knew it. Finally her turn had come. Richard saw the smile and her attitude, and he leaned over and said to his defense team, She looks like she won the fucking lottery. She certainly does, Clark said. She'll never convict you, Daniel added. Salerno, Carrillo, Halpin, and Yokelson were not pleased. It took just one holdout to cause a hung jury. Halpin shivered at the prospect of trying this case over again. Coordinating all the witnesses and exhibits had been a Herculean task, and he didn't know if he wanted to or could go through it again. Doreen didn't trust Cindy Hayden and felt no good could come from her being on the jury. Cindy Hayden had been born in Portland, Oregon, the oldest of four children. She had one brother and two sisters. Her father, like Richard's father, worked for the railroad, and, like Richard's father, he had a very bad, excessively violent temper. He'd often hit my mother in front of us, and he often hit me, would beat the shit out of me. He liked it quiet at the dinner table, and one time I talked and he actually threw a knife at me, nearly knocked out my eye. Much of the responsibility of raising Cindy's brother and sisters fell on Cindy's shoulders, and she had aged before her time. It was like I was never a teenager— I went from being a little girl to being a mature woman. Cindy married at twenty-one. Though her marriage was a good one, she was not happy. She wanted something more out of life than just a good marriage. She didn't want any children of her own, perhaps because she had been a mother to her siblings at an early age. After seven years of marriage, Cindy left her husband and moved in with another man she'd become involved with. He told her he wanted to move to Los Angeles, and that, Cindy says, was the main reason she hooked up with him. She'd later say, I always felt that there was some kind of important destiny for me in L.A. She stayed in the relationship a while longer, then split. He had begun to drink too much and was getting pushy and abusive. Soon after, she got called for jury duty for the murder trial of Richard Ramirez, and she knew that was why she had come to Los Angeles, that the Richard Ramirez trial was her destiny. Arturo went back to his examination of Alan Adeshek as Cindy Hayden looked on from seat one of the jury box the smile still on her face. Arturo showed Adeshek the photograph of Captain John Jones making the V for victory sign, showing two fingers, and asked him if that represented what had taken place that day. The former public defender said it did, and Arturo said he had nothing further, feeling confident the jury appreciated the significance of the gesture. Captain John Jones had held up two fingers, indicating Richard's place in the lineup to the witnesses. Halpin asked Adeshek if he remembered speaking with him at the lineup about whether or not Richard's injury was evident, and Adeshek said he didn't remember. To nearly every question the prosecutor asked Adeshek, he said he didn't remember. He couldn't even remember whether or not he had objected to the bald spot on Richard's head. Solis's corrections counselor retook the stand for Halpin's cross, but said he didn't have the files because his superiors wouldn't release them. Annoyed, Tynan ordered Halpin to draw up a subpoena for the files and told Lujan to return to court at 10.30 in the morning with the files. 
Arturo called public defender Roy Wallen to the stand, and for the most part he testified to the same facts that his former colleague had. He gave Halpin a list of concerns the public defender had had, namely that the participants of the lineup didn't smile, showing good teeth, that Richard's head wound was exposed, that the young people at the lineup would say something to their parents which might be inadvertently overheard by other witnesses, and that all the participants didn't have angular faces. On cross, Halpin first said he had never gotten any objection sheet from Wallen, then looked through his file and found the objection sheet. He handed it to Wallen, who read it out loud for the jurors, proving Halpin had been wrong. The prosecutor got Wallen to concede nothing overt had been done to draw attention to Richard's head wound. He stated he hadn't seen any police officials indicating the number two, but that public defender Judy Crawford, who also had been at the lineup, had come to him later at the office and told him she had seen policemen indicating the number two with extended fingers toward the witnesses. Alex Luhan retook the stand and testified that Rosa Solis's real name was Eva Castillo, that she was now a fugitive from justice, and that the address she had given prison officials was not Solano's address, which Halpin was intent upon showing the jury. Solano was a strong link in the prosecutor's case, and he didn't want it weakened by the jury learning that Solano had dealt with many thieves. Luhan also stated that Eva Castillo was supposed to have been deported after her release from prison, but she had fallen through the cracks and gotten away. She was, according to the record, a junkie, an alcoholic, a thief, and a prostitute. Richard was bent out of shape about his father's picture being shown on the news, and he complained bitterly to his lawyers. He told them he didn't want his father to suffer any more than he already had because of his troubles. He was very agitated and walked back and forth in the holding pen like a caged panther. After lunch, Clark complained to Judge Tynan about Julian Ramirez being seen on the news when the defense had specifically asked he not be photographed. He would be putting on other witnesses who would not testify if their pictures were going to be broadcast. The judge apologized and said he would have the bailiff speak to the camera people. From now on, he would make sure no one would be photographed if they didn't want to be. Halpin complained to Tynan about the defense subpoenaing civilian witnesses, saying there was no reason to put them back on the stand after they had already been grilled during cross-examination. Tynan agreed and reminded the defense to clear any subpoenas they had for civilians with him. Carlos Valenzuela, the gardener who had discovered Mabel Bell and Nettie Lang, was already there waiting to testify. The judge reprimanded the defense for bringing in a civilian without asking permission. Daniel apologized. Their investigator had misunderstood his instruction and brought Valenzuela to court. Clark said they would forego calling Carlos if the people stipulated that he had seen an empty can of soda, which was out of place on the dining table, when he'd initially entered the house. Halpin agreed to so stipulate, and the next witness was summoned. Judy Crawford, a public defender from 1982 to 1989, was one of the seven lawyers who had come from the public defender's office to the lineup on September 5th. With certainty and sincerity, she told the jury how she had been standing in the left aisle to note any irregularities in the lineup and see Deputy John Jones hold up two fingers in front of the audience at the first lineup. She stated she didn't think much of it until she realized Richard was number two. Then she testified she noted a second sheriff's deputy, Tom Heiberg, hold up two fingers as he addressed the second lineup and say, Does anyone have any questions? Arturo then showed a photograph made from the police video of the proceedings the defense had received with discovery, and in it one could clearly discern Detective Highbrook holding up what she referred to as a V for victory sign. She didn't say anything to anyone until later, she stated. After a comfort recess, the prosecutor went at her with a vengeance, asking why she hadn't said anything of these illegal improprieties at the lineup. There was nothing I could do, she said. Well, now, what makes you say that? Halpin asked. She stated the lineups were in progress, and it was already after the fact. Those answers didn't sit well with the prosecutor, and he made sure the jury knew it. Knowing laws had been broken, how could she not do anything until so long after the fact, he asked. She said she had tried to tell Adeshek, but he was very busy and there was a lot going on. She had told him when they were leaving the lineup, but she didn't know what he'd done with the information, and it hadn't been her case. Halpin asked if she kept notes and wanted to see them, but she refused, saying they were work byproducts. Cynthia Hayden found Crawford's testimony hard to believe. She saw the photograph of Heiberg holding up two fingers, and Crawford's certainty and resolve were unwavering before Halpin's cutting questions. 
Halpin turned to the preliminary hearing transcript and had Crawford read into the record what she had testified then. She had not told Adeshek about the fingers at the lineup. On that note, Judge Tynan released the jury for the day. At a sidebar, Carlos Valenzuela was discussed again. The defense wanted the people to stipulate the dates on the newspapers that had first drawn Carlos's suspicion. Halpin said there was no proof as to what those dates were. Tynan agreed with the defense, ruling Valenzuela could take the stand and testify about what he knew of the dates. Halpin changed his mind and agreed to stipulate that the dates on the papers were May 30th and 31st. 50. Felipe Solano, Jr. took the stand at 10.50 the next morning to tell the jury that his father had given him a bag filled with jewelry to hold, then returned with the police for the bag, and that was the sum of his testimony. Monterey Park policeman Dave Corrigan was next, and he further undermined Jorge Gallegos' credibility. He testified Gallegos' description was vague and imprecise, and that he hadn't been sure if the attacker was Latino or Oriental. Photographer Dennis Lee testified, at Ray Clark's urging, that he had gone to Alhambra Street, the spot where Veronica Yu had been shot to death, and, with Richard Salinas's help, had taken 35-millimeter photographs there, as well as at the spot where Lowney Dempster had said she'd seen Richard near the Doy residence in Monterey Park. Clark showed the photographs to Lee and the jury, but not much could be seen in them. Halpin knew the photographs were not objective. Film ASA, shutter speed, and f-stop could all affect the photograph's clarity, and in cross he made that clear to the jury. Criminalist Giselle Lavigne was recalled by Clark. She had found on parts of the lamp that had been used to crush Mary Cannon's skull blood which did not belong to either Mary or to Richard. Sheriff's criminalist Gerald Burke testified after Lavigne about hairs found at the Aboath residence that didn't belong to the Aboaths or to the defendant. At a sidebar, Clark requested more time to interview Sandra Hotchkiss, who was in jail and was a very important witness for the defense. The judge gave him an hour and a half instead of sixty minutes for lunch. Without Richard's knowledge or authorization, the defense team went to the holding cell in the courthouse where Ms. Hotchkiss was being held. She was serving a fourteen-year sentence in the California Institute for Women for a violation of her parole she had gotten. As a result of help she had given police in the stalker investigation, as well as in three other cases, her sentence was commuted. Back in court, Hotchkiss was called as the next defense witness. When Richard heard her name, he looked up, startled and surprised. He had told his lawyers he didn't want her called, and they had gone against his wishes. He was furious. Sandra was forty, thin, with dirty blonde hair, and had a jailhouse pallor. Through Clark's direct, the jurors learned she used to caper with Richard, but it stopped because he was too messy and amateurish. She preferred not leaving a mess in any of the homes she robbed, unlike Richard, who threw things all over. She added that Richard was never violent, and she never saw him with any weapons. She described how she had been cooperating with Burbank police and setting up fences. She had been caught burglarizing a Burbank home, and the police told her if she gave up some fences, they would write letters to the judge. She testified Detective Knight had said if she gave up three fences, he'd personally make sure she didn't do any time on the Burbank robbery. Three for one, she said he had told her, and she successfully had two men arrested who'd operated out of jewelry stores in the downtown area. This brought her to the attention of the sheriff's task force when they decided to send someone to Felipe Solano to sell him stolen property, thereby giving them an excuse to enter his home. She stated she had known Solano before the sheriff's deputies had taken her to a downtown pool hall to try and set him up. Solano was a known fence who dealt with many thieves and even carried a jeweler's loop through which he could often be seen looking at a particular piece someone was trying to sell. Sandra said she knew another fellow named Huero, who had also sold Solano stolen property. One time she had seen Huero go after someone who had ripped him off with a tire iron. Sandra had first met Ramirez in the Yehi Pool Hall. She had seen him try to sell jewelry that he obviously didn't know the real value of. Always ready to take advantage of an opportunity, she'd approached Richard and bought the gold chain, turned around, and tripled her money. After that, they'd started burglarizing together. Part of Richard's problem, she sincerely told the jurors, was that he didn't know the value of jewelry and would take junk and costume pieces. They only worked during daylight hours while people were away working. Clark had her tell how she had met with Carrillo, Salerno, Yarbrough, and Gan, that they'd put a wire on her and sent her into the Yee High Pool Hall to trap Solano. 
She had asked a woman who worked behind the counter to call Felipe, and the woman had used a black phone book to retrieve his number. He'd shown up in twenty minutes. She had tried to engage him in conversation to entrap him, but he'd been wily and on guard. The sheriff's deputy secured a gold chain from robbery and insisted she go straight to Solano's house and offer it to him. She had told the deputy Solano would be suspicious as he knew she didn't have his address. They said that didn't matter. They did not have enough on Solano to get a proper warrant, and an arrest for buying stolen property would let them search his house. As Hotchkiss testified, the jury listened attentively. She was the first person other than family who said she'd known Richard and the inner workings of the world in which he lived. She didn't even get through Solano's front door, she said. As she walked toward his place, he pulled up in his car and asked, Are you a policewoman? Before she could even answer, the deputies knocked Solano roughly to the ground and put him in a chokehold. She was led away and taken home. She didn't know any of this had to do with the stalker crimes until she saw Solano linked to the crimes in the newspapers. She had then complained to Detective Knight, saying she didn't want to have anything to do with a multiple murder case and would not testify against Richard. Knight told her they had the swirls and loop of Richard's fingerprints at crime scenes and she would never have to face him in court. Halpin had Hotchkiss tell the jury that she had overdosed on Valium and Methadone and was unconscious from October 26th to 31st of 1985. He had her tell them how many times she'd been arrested and grilled her until lunch. From the defense point of view, Hotchkiss had illustrated for the jury that Richard was not violent, didn't carry weapons, and was a messy amateur, which clearly contrasted with the stalker's M.O., great strength, weapons, cunning, and severe jungle viciousness. When Halpin began asking questions about what crime she had committed with Richard, and when, she requested a lawyer. Tynan was inclined to provide counsel for her, and Matt Cooper was sent over from the bar panel to talk with Hotchkiss about her rights. So time wouldn't be wasted, Clark asked Judge Tynan if they could interrupt Halpin's cross of Hotchkiss to accommodate their next witness, Chainerong Kovanath's sister, who had two small children and had to get back to them. Halpin objected about being interrupted and objected to the defense putting the sister on the stand at all, but Tynan ruled she could testify. Debbie Pierata Fipat stated that some kid had told her the morning of the crime that the perpetrator had dark skin and was black, with curly black hair. She cried as she testified, still devastated over her brother's loss. There was no cross of this witness. The defense called sheriff's criminalist Melvin Kong and had him tell the jury that negroid pubic hair had been found at the Eboweth crime scene the morning of the attack, which didn't match up with Richard's. They had not been able to get a sample of either some kids or Chenarong's pubic hair. After a recess, Cooper told the judge that Hotchkiss was afraid to testify. Her protective custody status had been taken away, and he had advised her not to talk about any of the robbery she had done with Richard, in which the statute of limitations wasn't up or about a murder case she had been involved with. Tynan said he'd reinstate her protective custody status, and Halpin agreed not to go into those crimes. Criminalist Kong was put back on the stand. He stated that brown hairs found atop the nighting's pillows did not belong to them. They both had gray hair, nor did they belong to the defendant. There were hairs found at the Nelson crime scene which did not belong to Richard either. Sandra Hotchkiss retook the stand on May 24th. Cooper was not available, and a Harvey Sanford peerless had been found to replace him. Halpin was angry his cross-examination had been interrupted for so long, but he went at it with renewed vigor. Hotchkiss said there was an audio tape of her approaching Solano as a result of the wire the deputies had made her wear. On the tape, the deputies could be heard roughhousing Solano and coercing him into letting them into his house. When Halpin and Detective Yarborough had come to visit her, the prosecutor had warned her not to screw up his case. She testified she had committed 20 to 25 burglaries with Richard from January through July of 1985 in Allwater, Los Feliz, Glendale, Montrose, and Santa Monica. She would check mailboxes and look at flyers under doors to determine if people were away, and she would either use lockpicks or a Lloyd's, a stiff piece of bendable plastic, to gain entry. When Halpin asked why she'd stopped working with Richard, she said, It just wasn't smooth, or I would get, like, I would get nervous and scared myself and just end up starting to toss when it should have just went smooth. She said they got into arguments about time limits, noise, and his leaving with the car one time when he was supposed to stay put. Hotchkiss denied telling Yarborough that she had seen Richard write on a window with lipstick. 
Do you know, Halpin asked, if during any of those twenty-five robberies the defendant had a gun secreted on his person? Not to my knowledge, I don't. Halpin's cross lasted to the end of the day, when Clark began objecting that the prosecutor was becoming repetitious. Clark's redirect was postponed until court resumed on June 5th, giving everyone a needed break. During the court hiatus, Richard was kept in his cell at the county jail. The only time he was let out was to shower twice a week and for visits. His visitors became a topic of discussion among Richard's jailers and the press. So many women were coming to see him, the jail had to put limits on the number of visitors he was allowed. Doreen didn't like having to compete more and more for Richard's time and attention. She gave her would-be competitors dirty looks and refused even to talk to any of them. Their interest in Richard, she felt, was for all the wrong reasons, unlike hers, which was all for Richard, his welfare, comfort, and protection. At this time, actor Sean Penn had been sentenced to 32 days in the Los Angeles County Jail for punching out a photographer. Because of his celebrity status, he had to be kept in protective custody and was lodged in the cell next to Ramirez. At the time, he was still married to Madonna, and when she came to visit Sean, she saw Ramirez as she stepped off the elevator. When Sean was brought to the visiting booth, the first thing she said to Sean was, "'Who's that good-looking guy?' Sitting down, smiling mischievously, Sean said, That good-looking guy is the Night Stalker. Want to meet him? Gives me the goosebumps, Madonna said. But yeah, I'd like to meet him, she joked. I don't think so, he said, laughing. During the course of Sean's stay in the jail, Ramirez asked Penn for his autograph. Sean wrote, Dear Richard, it's impossible to be incarcerated and not feel a kinship with your fellow inmates. Well, Richard, I've done the impossible. I feel absolutely no kinship with you, Sean Penn. Richard wrote back, Dear Sean, stay in touch and hit him again. Richard Ramirez, 666. Penn said Ramirez masturbated excessively. It was like an animal in heat. He had pictures of his victims on his cell walls. He kept them up with toothpaste. When court resumed on the 5th, Sandra Hotchkiss took the stand for the entire morning. She stated that neither she nor Richard ever used gloves on any of their heists, though they sometimes covered their fingertips with nail polish. During the afternoon's redirect at Clark's urging, she testified she often saw guns being sold and traded at the Brunswick Pool Hall. However, she had never seen Richard with any. She said because of her cooperation with the police, she had been shot at twice, once outside the Brunswick Pool Hall and once in front of downtown's Cameo Hotel. She was not hit either time. On recross, Halpin asked, While committing those burglaries with Richard, you did not wear gloves? No. Never wore gloves, he pressed? No, she repeated, looking directly at the prosecutor. Did the defendant? No. Ever. No, she insisted, and explained that she had shown Richard how to hold things by their side and on an angle so as not to leave any prints. She mentioned her efforts to contact District Attorney Ira Reiner to tell him how Solano had been roughed up, but her efforts had been fruitless. When Hotchkiss left the stand, Gill, Frank, Halpin, and even Richard were glad to see her go. Richard still strongly believed she should have never been called, and he was still angry at Clark for putting her on the stand without his permission. I didn't even know the broad, he'd later say, angrily. In regard to the Veronica Yu murder, Dr. Susan Seltzer was re-summoned to testify. Halpin objected to her being called, saying she had already been cross-examined extensively. Clark complained that he had not yet come on board when she had been cross-examined. After an exchange of pointed remarks, Clark was allowed a few questions about trajectory. Dr. Seltzer testified that Veronica had been shot twice, that there was gunpowder around one of the wounds, and that the bullet had gone from left to right, which contradicted what Jorge Gallegos had testified. Halpin cross-examined her extensively, but no amount of questioning could change the trajectory of the bullet and the gunpowder around the wound. Clearly, unless Veronica was sitting in the car backward, she'd been shot from the passenger side of the car. After Dr. Seltzer, LAPD criminalist Michelle Lepiesto was recalled. Before she could be asked any questions, Halpin objected on the grounds she too had already been lengthily cross-examined. Tynan agreed and told Clark to go to the record and stop recalling people just to ask the same questions. After lunch, Clark told Tynan the defense wanted to call Le Piesto to ask her about hairs at the Lang Bell scene and would make an offer of proof to do so. They also wanted to recall Detective John Yarborough to ask him about the description Sakina Abawath had given police the morning of the assault. 
Halpin again complained, but Tynan decided to give the defense some latitude, warning the defense to be speedy and not redundant. The animosity between Halpin and Hernandez was becoming more apparent every day, and stood between the defense and prosecution tables like a thick, impenetrable wall topped with razor-sharp barbed wire. Judge Tynan called the jury out, and Clark, distant and aloof from the acrimony between Daniel and Halpin, began his direct. From Lupiesto, the jury learned that she had booked into evidence bloody pillows, electrical cord with human hair stuck to it, bloody sheet and bed pad, and a long list of other items from the Bell Lane crime scene. Clark had no more questions of Lupiesto, and there was no cross. The defense knew if Richard's hair or blood had been on any of the items collected by Lupiesto, Halpin would have used it against Richard. John Yarborough was again summoned to the stand, and Clark asked him how Sakina had described her tormentor. Reading from his notes, Yarborough said, Male, possibly Caucasian with Latin features, but not Negro. Tall, thin, with receding chest, light brown or dishwater blonde hair that had some curl to it, approximately twenty-five to thirty years old. All but the hair fit Richard. Yarborough continued, She recalled no accent, but said he was light complexioned with a yellow tint to his skin color. She described his teeth as wide, but didn't recall any gaps in his teeth. The only odor she recalled was his shirt area, and it was stale sweat. When he walked, it sounded heavy, like boots. She remembered after the rape the suspect pulling on boots as opposed to lace shoes. Knowing boots didn't fit in with the prosecutor's case, Clark said he had nothing further and sat down. On cross, Halpin established that Yarbrough had first interviewed Sakina at the hospital where she was suffering from shock, then, the next day, at her friend's home. Halpin established that Yarbrough had police artist Marlon Coleman with him, and that Coleman had done a sketch based on Sakina's description, which did resemble Richard. Halpin had little cross, and Clark again went at Yarborough, asking him if Mabel Bell kept a diary. The detective said she had been making several entries a day until May 29th. On recross, Halpin asked Yarborough when Mrs. Bell's electrical clock had stopped. 5.29 a.m. on May 30th, he said, which meant if Julian was telling the truth, Richard was in Texas. The trial resumed on July 9th, with Judge Tynan announcing the proceedings would be canceled for Monday so that alternate juror Bonita Smith could attend a funeral. That meant a three-day weekend, and no one on the jury had any complaints. Giselle Levine was recalled by Clark. He first apologized for not asking her all the questions he had the first time she testified, and proceeded to have her tell the jury all the items she had recovered from the Bennett crime scene. He then had her explain the facts known about blood in general, and state that Richard's blood type had not been present at the Bennett, Knighting, or Cannon residences. Steve Renteria was called and asked if a rape test had been done on Sakina Aboath. He said there had been one, and the tests on the semen recovered proved to be inconclusive. He did find a two-plus band, a genetic marker, which did not belong to Richard. As Cindy Hayden got up to leave at the end of the day's court session, Richard took off his glasses and stared at her. It seemed he was talking to her with his eyes, telling her to acquit him, telling her he'd give her what she most craved from a man. His eyes gave her goosebumps all over, she'd later relate. As she went down in the elevator, she realized that Doreen and some of Richard's admirers were also in the elevator. She could understand why these women were attracted to Richard. The guy was fiercely good-looking and dangerous. Since the beginning of time, women have never been able to resist that combination. The defense called Dr. Werner Spitz, who stated that he had studied the morgue photographs of all fourteen murders in the case. In his opinion, Veronica Yu was shot inside her car, and going by body and ambient temperatures, Jenny Vinko had died two hours before she'd been found. Not happy with this witness, Halpin demanded to know why the doctor was so sure Veronica had been shot from inside the car. Spitz replied that the wound was on the right side of the chest and the bullet's trajectory left to right. He then told the jury how he had calculated Vinko's time of death. Thirteen had always been a very unfortunate number for Richard. He knew it and was very leery of the number. He was being tried in Department 113 on the 13th floor for 13 murders. When court resumed, it was the 13th of July, and he was sure something bad would happen. A little after the jury settled back into their chairs, the rear door opened and Zena LeVay, with Nicholas Schreck and five others, entered the courtroom. Walking in, single file, all grim-faced and wearing black, they took seats on Richard's side of the courtroom. 
Zena wore blood-red lipstick and smiled seductively at Richard when he turned in their direction. They wanted Richard and the world to know that they were his supporters, that he was not alone in the world. The jurors stared at the six Satanists with guarded, wary curiosity. They all knew the power charismatic characters had over people, Charles Manson, for example, and were concerned for their safety. It was, a juror would say, a scary thing, sitting in judgment of Richard Ramirez, with six Satanists all giving them the evil eye. Who knew they could have been casting spells? I mean, we are in Southern California here, and this guy has become the poster boy for the Church of Satan. Daniel Hernandez announced the defense wanted to call invalid Lillian Doy to the stand, but needed the court's permission. When asked why they wanted to call Mrs. Doy, Daniel said because of the description she had given to the police the morning of the attack. Halpin was beside himself. He called this another example of Daniel's inattention. The police had trouble communicating with Lillian, and this issue had been gone over many times. He had spoken to Mrs. Doy himself, and she could only barely make herself understood, though, he added, she had identified Ramirez at the September 5th lineup. Tynan sided with the defense and said if they wanted Mrs. Doy on the stand, they should draw up a subpoena. He did not want to be reversed for unfairly hamstringing defense to create reasonable doubt. There was a lunch recess, and when court resumed, Clark said they wouldn't be calling Mrs. Doy. Clark said they had no more witnesses for the day. In the morning, the defense called paralegal Richard Salinas, who explained he had taken the videotape of the lineup which they'd received as part of discovery to the video lab in Burbank, and had the lab make photographs from the tape of the instance where Detective John Jones had held up two fingers. Clark now showed the photograph to the jury, who could clearly see the sheriff's detective with two extended upright fingers. At a sidebar, Clark again said they were out of witnesses, that their next witness would probably be on for the whole day, and he asked the court to be recessed. Tynan was not happy. He wanted this case over with. Halpin asked the judge to quash a subpoena the defense had issued for James Romero, who had seen the orange Toyota in Mission Viejo. The defense wanted Romero on the stand so the jury could see he had received rewards even before Richard was arraigned, let alone convicted. Halpin warned if they put Romero on the stand, he would, under Section 1101 of the Evidence Code, bring in the attack on Carnes and the fingerprint in the orange Toyota. Judge Tynan warned that if Romero was called, the defense would be opening up a can of worms and he wouldn't be able to help them. Clark said they'd like to rethink their strategy. The defense's witness, Dr. Linda Loftus, took the stand. She was a professor at the University of Washington who had written 15 books on human memory and the processes eyewitnesses go through under stressful situations. She stated she often worked for the IRS, the Justice Department, and the U.S. Secret Service. Her credentials were quite impressive. Under Clark's direct, she told the jury the human brain was not like a camera and did not retain exactly what had transpired. She said there were three stages to memory— the acquisitive stage, in which events occur and register in the brain, the period after the event was over and some time had passed was referred to as the retention stage, then there was the retrieval stage, in which an individual tries to recall information, tries to make identifications, tries to answer specific questions. Clark wanted to know if stress affected memory. She said it did, and that she had done many tests at the University of Washington in which a group of students were shown two different versions of the same film, in one version, there was foul language and violence, and in the other, no violence or foul language. Overwhelmingly, she testified, the students remembered fewer details in the violent version. She said it was human nature to look away from ugly situations. Using an apparatus that attaches to the pupil of the eye, researchers had found that someone held at gunpoint looked much more at the gun than at the person who was holding it. A gun had been used in every non-fatal attack Richard was accused of. She said of the gun, it caused a reduced ability to remember some of those details. Another factor that affected retention was passage of time, after which the mind begins to become vulnerable to post-event information, which causes a contamination or distortion of what really took place. Additional factors that influenced post-event information were witnesses talking to one another or witnesses being asked leading questions. She stated, when witnesses are exposed to media coverage, newspapers, television, these are opportunities for new information to become available to a witness that has the potential for distorting or changing the witness's recognition. 
She then testified that when people of different races try to identify one another, an inordinate amount of mistakes are made. When Clark asked if the media had an effect on memory, Halpin's objections that it was beyond her realm of expertise was sustained. Clark asked her if she had done any tests on media exposure in memory. She said, They, witnesses, will adopt what they've been exposed to in the media and claim that they experienced it themselves. Halpin didn't like Dr. Loftus, feeling she was a hired gun who was helping a sadistic murderer which he didn't try to hide from the jury. But she proved to be difficult to cross. She was sure of herself, had literally hundreds of experiments and volumes of research under her belt, and looked directly at the jurors when she spoke. When he asked her how much she was being paid for her testimony, Ray Clark objected. Tynan said he would consider the objection and ordered Halpin to continue. The prosecutor kept her on the stand right up to the lunch recess, grilled her, but did little to alter her opinion or testimony. When they came back from lunch, Clark said they wouldn't be calling Romero, and Dr. Loftus returned to the stand. The judge ruled the people could ask the amount Loftus was being paid. Halpin, aggressive and unfriendly, proceeded to cross-examine Loftus the rest of the day. It seemed the more questions he asked her, the more bona fide and sure her position became. The jury was clearly becoming tired of Dr. Loftus, but Halpin kept banging away at her and the credibility of her work. In the morning, Dr. Loftus again took the stand, and the prosecutor asked one very salient question. He wanted to know if constantly telling someone not to look at you will cause that person to, in fact, look. Like, he said, telling someone not to think of an elephant when, of course, they will. The doctor agreed, saying that it would be human nature for the pupil to move in the direction of a person giving such an order. On redirect, Clark asked her if the purpose of all the tests she had conducted was to ascertain the truth. She said it was, and soon stepped down from the stand. After a short recess, Clark announced they had one more witness and would then rest. The lawyers discussed schedules for their respective rebuttals and closing arguments, and court was recessed. 51. The people's first rebuttal witness was Bob Knight of the Burbank Police Department, the man responsible for Sandra Hotchkiss's becoming involved with the case. He testified he had heard the sheriff's departments needed someone who had connections in the downtown area and had suggested Sandra. He told the jury that he had offered her the three-for-one deal and related how she delivered several fences and testified against them in court. He knew her to be, he said, a thief, a drug addict, and a prostitute. On cross, however, he testified that Sandra was honest and reliable in all her dealings with him. Halpin called Felix Estrada, another LAPD detective. He stated he had sent Sandra Hotchkiss into two jewelry shops with stolen property, wearing a wire, and that she had entrapped the store owners, known fences, whom he'd arrested. He had spoken to her about Richard Ramirez, and she had said she hadn't known him or Felipe Solano. Most of the jurors found that hard to believe. From everything they'd already heard, they knew all three of them hung out in the downtown area and were involved in burglaries. Estrada further stated that he had gone to visit her in jail in 1986 after she'd called him. She asked him for help with a case and for some money, but when he wasn't forthcoming with either, she said she'd go to the defense to see if they'd pay her. He summarized that she had been reliable in bringing him information, but he had known her to lie. John Yarborough was called to the stand. He contradicted Estrada and said Hotchkiss had told him she'd known Ramirez, that she had met him in front of the California Hotel and had shot cocaine with him, and that he was known as Flacco, skinny, on the street. He stated Hotchkiss also said Ramirez lived with two lesbians, one named Baca. He then went on to confirm much of what Hotchkiss had said on the stand. When Halpin asked him if she had told him Solano had been jumped by sheriff's detectives, he said, absolutely not. He testified she told him she was in a car with Richard in Aliso Village when he'd hit a drunken man and killed him. When he checked police records, he did in fact find a hit-and-run killing which corresponded with the date and time Hotchkiss said it had occurred. When Yarbrough stepped down from the stand, court recessed for the day. In the morning, rebuttal witness James Njavro from the Metal Examiner's Office testified that coroner's photographer Steve Hansen had removed Veronica Yu's body from the crypt and photographed it, both with clothes on and nude. 
Halpin showed these pictures to Dujavro, and he identified them as the ones Hansen had taken. Halpin's objective was to prove that Veronica had not been shot inside the car, and the photographs would remind the jury of the terrible, senseless brutality of this murder. Richard turned to Daniel and said, I bet you some of those goons at the morgue have sex with the bodies. Daniel laughed. Halpin called Monterey Park police officer Ron Endo, and he told the jury, again, how he had been the first police official at Veronica's side and had given her CPR. He then identified photographs of how the body had been found, lying in the street rather than in the car, which is where Halpin wanted the jury to believe she should have been found if she'd been shot in the car. On cross, Endo conceded he had never examined any of Veronica's wounds, which made his testimony moot, Clark felt. Alan Yokelson called Steve Renteria, who testified there was no blood at all on the T-shirt found at the construction site next to the Nighting residence. He was the last witness that day. A little after 10 a.m. the next morning, the people called a few more rebuttal witnesses, the most important of whom was Dr. Peter Leung, the dentist who had worked on Richard's teeth in 1985. To show that Dr. Leung had worked on Richard, Halpin put Dr. Gerald Vale on the stand, who stated he had examined Richard at the county jail in September of 1985, had x-rayed his teeth, and had taken plaster casts of them, which were shown to the jury. Dr. Leung was sworn in with the help of a Taiwanese interpreter, and told the jury he had worked on Richard on March 8th, March 17th, May 21st, May 23rd, and May 30th. He described the kind of work he had done and the costs, saying that Richard, who had given the name Richard Mina, had paid cash. Halpin was sure the jury would realize that if Richard was in a dentist chair on May 30th, it proved he was in L.A. and had the opportunity to assault Mabel Bell, Nettie Lang, and Carol Kyle. Yokelson showed Dr. Leung the x-rays Gerald Vale had taken at the jail, and the doctor positively identified them as Richard's. Sheriff's Deputy John Jones was called by the people, and he stated he'd been at the lineup on September 5th, that he'd brought Minnie Kelsey there. She was in a wheelchair as a result of an intruder breaking into her home and beating her. She had a crushed larynx and broken leg bones. Jones said she had not identified Ramirez. When asked if he had held up two fingers, as the public defenders had testified, he emphatically said no. After Jones's testimony, court was adjourned for the weekend. Monday morning, Clark told Judge Tynan at a sidebar that the defense would like to call a rebuttal witness, but the witness was coming up from El Paso and would not be able to leave for a week. Tynan refused to halt the proceedings that long, saying the defense had had plenty of time to find witnesses. Reluctantly, he gave them until noon the following day. Finally, the people's last witness was called. Dave Hancock had worked as a reporter for the El Paso Times, he stated he had gone to the Ramirez Hacienda Heights home on August 31, 1985, and had found Julian Ramirez home. He stated further that he was fluent in Spanish and had asked Julian if he would agree to an interview. He was invited into the house for the interview and later wrote an article. He stated that when he'd asked Julian when he'd last seen Richard, he'd told him two or three years, which contrasted sharply with what Julian had said on the stand. On cross, the reporter testified that the interview had happened on a Saturday at 4.30 p.m. and had lasted ten minutes, that Julian had been alone in the house, and that he had taken notes but had thrown them away. He had found his way to the Ramirez home by talking to old neighbors of the Ramirez's on Lado Street, then calling his editor at the paper, who helped track Julian Ramirez to Hacienda Heights. Clark asked him for a copy of the article, and Judge Tynan gave defense counsel fifteen minutes to read it. Dave Hancock testified that he had taped his interview with Julian Ramirez and that Richard's father had been very distraught over what had happened. Clark also pointed out that Julian's remarks in the article were not in quotes. The defense had an ex parte meeting with Judge Tynan in his chambers. Clark said the defense could prove, by way of two eyewitnesses, that Richard truly was in El Paso from May 22nd to 31. Daniel would have to go to Texas to interview the witnesses during the court's July break. The judge was dismayed by the request, but he wanted to avoid a reversal at all costs, and reluctantly, after consulting his calendar, told Clark he would grant the request, give them until July 10th. He added that all this should have been done already. In open court, Tynan announced he was reluctantly going to allow the defense team to bring up witnesses from Texas 
to refute Dave Hancock's testimony and was going to give them until July 10th to do it. Phil Halpin was livid at this news. He reminded the judge that Dr. De Jong had identified Richard and even had x-rays and dated charts to prove he was in his office. The jury was told they were on vacation until July 10th. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you had a nice little respite from our work, Judge Tynan told the jury the morning of July 10th. The defense called Raimondo Pantoya, a thick, powerful man with a tough, weather-beaten face, for thirty years a friend of Julian Ramirez's. With the help of a Spanish interpreter, he stated that they'd worked together and that he had loaned Julian a plumber snake to clean his kitchen drain on May 25th, a Saturday. When he went to the Ramirez home to lend the tool, Ruth's daughter was having her communion party. He had seen Richard there. Raimondo Pantoya had a lifetime of hard labor on his face, and he seemed quite sure of himself, like a man who was telling the absolute truth, a court observer would say. Though Halpin stood and cross-examined him extensively, wanting to know everything about his visit to the Ramirez home, Pantoya said he didn't stay, didn't talk to Richard. He had gone there just to lend his friend a tool and had seen Richard. I just saw him, that's all, he said with annoyance to the unbelieving prosecutor. On redirect, he stated that the trip to Los Angeles was the first time he'd ever been on a plane. The defense wanted the jury to know this was a simple, hard-working, honest man who didn't have a dishonest bone in his body. Clark tried to show a Polaroid of Richard at the party, posing with Gloria and his mother and father. Halpin's objection was sustained. The judge said there was no authentication as to when the picture had been taken. Halpin said the 25th had nothing to do with the 30th, that Julian Ramirez was lying when he stated Richard had been in El Paso on the 30th. Clark, in turn, said it was the reporter who was lying, that he could have written anything he damn well pleased. He kept no notes or recordings of his conversation with Julian Ramirez. Judge Tynan ruled that unless the defense could prove the photograph had been taken in El Paso on that date, there was no way that a photograph was getting before the jury. The witness was excused. After lunch, Clark said he wanted to introduce the photograph and was prepared to make an offer of proof. He had a witness who had actually seen the photograph come out of the camera. Maria Torres was called to the stand. She was the sister of Joseph's wife and would be the last witness to testify in the trial. Maria was sworn in and told the jury that she had been to Gloria's communion party and seen Richard there. When Clark asked her if she was sure of the date, May 25th, she said she was absolutely positive because it was also her daughter's third birthday and she had had a party for her. Clark handed her the photograph and she stated she had actually been there when Ruth had taken the picture with Gloria in her communion dress. She testified she had seen Richard in El Paso a second time on May 29th at her sister's home. She was helping her sister clean when Richard entered, said hello to her, made a joke about some candy and went to talk with Joseph, who was lying down suffering from a migraine. Richard, she said, visited with Joseph for a few minutes and left. Ruth was waiting for him outside. She understood that Ruth was taking him either to the airport or the bus terminal. She was sure of the date because she had separated from her husband on April 29th, and May 29th marked the end of the first month of her separation. Halpin decided either she was lying or Richard had left that Saturday, flown to L.A. and attacked Mabel Bell and Nettie Lang. He'd be sure to point this out during his closing arguments. Maria Torres stepped down from the stand, and Ray Clark announced, The defense rests. They haggled about the times of their closing arguments and the judge's charge, and Tynan excused the jury until the next day, when they'd enter a new phase of the proceeding and hear summations. At 10 a.m., Judge Tynan told the defense the pistol the police had recovered in Tijuana had been mislaid, and the people would give the jury a photograph of it to take into deliberations. The judge thanked the jurors for their attention and asked them to try to concentrate on the attorney's summations. Phil Halpin began to outline all the strengths of the people's case and all the weaknesses of the defense. His summation was long and extremely detailed and went on for four full days. The air conditioner in the courtroom wasn't working well and everyone was hot and uncomfortable as Halpin went through the case like an unstoppable tank, shooting holes in the defense's picture of Richard's innocence. On the second day of the people's summation, Daniel didn't show up in court, and Judge Tynan issued a warrant, which he quashed when Daniel came to court the next day, apologizing and saying he had told Clark he wouldn't be coming in, but co-counsel had misunderstood me. 
Tynan said his actions were reprehensible and could be contrived by the bar as an abdication of responsibility. He warned Daniel not to disappear again and ordered Arturo to attend the proceeding through the next day. Daniel said he wasn't sure where Arturo was. Tynan told Daniel to get Arturo to court and ordered a subpoena sent to Arturo's office. Halpin did not like his summation being interrupted because of the Hernandezes and complained to the judge about their lack of professionalism. Tynan agreed and told the prosecutor to continue. At all costs, Halpin wanted Richard to be convicted and sentenced to death. He was a methodical killing machine who derived immense pleasure at the pain and hurt of others. He viewed Richard Ramirez as being in a class of his own in the world of serial murder. Halpin finished his summation on July 21st. The people had presented 139 witnesses and 537 pieces of evidence. On Monday, the 24th, Ray Clark stood, thanked the jury for their kind attention, and began summarizing the weaknesses in the people's case and the strength of the defense's positions. He pointed out the fallibility of eyewitnesses, how the descriptions of eyewitnesses were inconsistent, and that the death penalty loomed imminently. His summation lasted for two days. He spent much time debunking Lowney Dempster and spoke expansively of Sandra Hotchkiss's believability. He pointed out, toward the end of his summation, that Halpin had not proved that Richard had flown out of El Paso on the 29th. Richard always had taken buses and hung out at the bus terminal, he pointed out. As is the law, Halpin was able to speak again after Clark, and he told the jury that Clark's take on the facts was all wrong and briefly reiterated the strengths of the people's case. He read into the record the testimony of Monrovia officer Tim Wright, who had found the avia footprints, together with Richard Ramirez's palm and fingerprints on West Olive in Monrovia. He said that put Richard in avia aerobics and placed him at all the crime scenes where footprints had been found. At the end of the day, Halpin said he was finished, satisfied he had done his best. After the jury left, Clark asked Tynan if, during the jury's deliberations, Daniel would be able to leave town. Tynan asked Richard if that would be all right. Richard said it's okay if he leaves, and court was convened. The next day, at precisely 10.13, Judge Tynan told the jury that it was now time for the final act in the trial process, his charge, and went on to explain the law and how to go about reaching verdicts on all the charges. It took Tynan two days, and when it was over, the jurors were itching to start deliberation and to get the trial behind them. They had been sitting for fourteen months. During that time they had become close, a family of sorts, and friendships that would last a lifetime had been born. On July 26th, the jury entered the jury room. They began their deliberations at 11.25 a.m. 52. The jury cooked up some popcorn, then sat at a long, rectangular wooden table with twelve chairs. As Judge Tynan had instructed, they began with the first charge, the murder of Jenny Vinco. The only thing that linked Richard to this crime was his fingerprint on the window, and the jury got into a long, heated debate about what legally constituted a fingerprint as evidence, and ended up sending a note to Judge Tynan asking him the necessary elements for a fingerprint to be deemed legal evidence. The judge brought them back into court and again read to them what the law said about fingerprints. With that information, they went back to their deliberations and took a vote. With his print present there, and the stab-slash-knife wound, it didn't take them long to find Richard guilty of the Vinco killing. They began to review all the elements that connected the crimes and soon focused on the avia footprints. Using the prints as a guide, they discussed each of the crimes in which the print had been found. They went over the pros and cons of all the events, with Cindy Hayden playing the devil's advocate, saying things like, more than one person could have had such a shoe. They took votes on each of the crimes, and Richard was convicted of all the assaults where avia footprints existed. They moved to the cases where there were no prints, talked over what other factors interlinked the crimes. They reviewed the ransacking, phone disabling, burglary-type entry, and similar language, shut up, bitch, don't look at me, where is it? Everything was moving very quickly, considering the volume of charges. There was little disharmony among the jurors. They got along well and were always courteous to one another. The first problem they had was juror number four, a black man named Lee who kept falling asleep. They would be taking a vote around the table, and when they got to him, he would be sleeping, his head bobbing about. The jury foreman finally wrote a note to Judge Tynan and complained. The judge saw this as a serious problem and summoned the attorneys. 
Clark said he didn't necessarily want him removed. Halpin said he thought it best he be removed. Tynan ruled Lee had to go, that his sleeping could become an appellate issue. Lee was replaced by Vernon Sutton, another black man. The jury continued its deliberations. Some of the women brought in cookies and pies, and everyone would bunch away as the deliberations moved on. On August 14th, juror Phyllis Singletary didn't show up. Judge Tynan brought the jury into court and told the jury they couldn't continue without Mrs. Singletary, and court was recessed to the following day. In fact, the judge had learned Mrs. Singletary had been found murdered. However, the news media soon got wind of Singletary's death and swarmed over the story like bees on honey. The murder of a juror sitting on California's most famous serial murder trial was big news. Cynthia Hayden learned about the murder from juror Chocolate Harris, who called her at home that evening. Quickly, word of Singletary's death traveled to all the jurors and alternates, and that night few of them slept well. They were all haunted by the prospect of Richard Ramirez being responsible in some way. They had seen his groupies and the Satanists parading in and out of the courtroom daily for the last fourteen months. Charles Manson had, they all knew, sent people to kill Sharon Tate and her friends, and Mr. and Mrs. LaBianca. After all, this was Southern California. Anything was possible. In the morning, the jurors gathered in the deliberation chamber in numbed shock. The murder of Ms. Singletary hung over them like a dark storm cloud. Some of them wondered which of them would be next. At 10.47, Tynan brought them into court. He apologized for not telling them about the murder the day before, saying he didn't have all the details. Your friend and our juror here in court has been shot. I want to emphasize that it has, as far as we are able to determine, and I'm sure, nothing to do with this case. It is irrelevant to this case. Her death is tragic, and I think we all grieve for her, but what happened to her doesn't add or diminish anything to the evidence as to whether or not Mr. Ramirez is guilty or innocent of these charges. And I beg you, I beg you, to remember that for deliberations, your grief must remain separate from your duties in this case. You are human beings, but we are also citizens with work to do. Tynan now ordered his assistant, Josephine, to draw a name from the drum, and alternate juror Mary Helen Herrera was chosen. Miss Herrera burst into tears, her chest racked with sobs. She was so upset she couldn't stand and fill Phyllis Singletary's vacant seat. It had been learned at the voir dire that both of Miss Herrera's brothers, who were in law enforcement, had been shot to death. Daniel was now sorry he hadn't dismissed her for cause. Later that day, it was revealed that James C. Melton, age 51, had murdered Miss Singletary. He was her live-in boyfriend, an abusive man with an explosive temper. Sheriff's detectives who learned about his whereabouts through a phone call he'd made raided a hotel where Melton was holed up. Melton saw them coming, and before the deputies could do anything, he put the gun he'd killed Phyllis with to his head and pulled the trigger, killing himself instantly. The deputies found a note in the hotel room in Melton's handwriting, in it, he admitted to killing Phyllis, saying he had shot her twice in the chest over domestic disagreements. The detectives later learned that Phyllis had told Melton that she felt sorry for Richard Ramirez because he hadn't gotten proper representation with the Hernandezes. Melton thought Ramirez was a mad dog that needed killing. An argument ensued, which grew into a senseless, murderous rage. When Clark and Daniel visited Richard in the county jail that day, he said he didn't want to go forward with the trial, and his lawyer should demand a mistrial. There was no way, he insisted, the jurors could not be influenced by the murder of a fellow juror. He pointed out that the case was not about forgery or a stock swindle, it was about murder, and he was being tried for murder. There's no fucking way they won't be affected against me. Clark, Daniel, and Salinas agreed wholeheartedly, and they promised Richard they'd prepare a motion for mistrial. Amid a packed courtroom, Clark told the judge that the defense wanted the jury to have a period of at least a week to recuperate. If the judge wasn't inclined to give them a week, Clark asked that the juries be polled to see if they could still be impartial. He had been in contact with two psychiatrists, Dr. Joe Ellen Demetrius and Dr. Carla Weber, and they had both unequivocally advised him it would be wrong and improper to let this jury sit in judgment of a murder defendant without their being polled. He reminded the judge that the jurors had become as close as siblings, husbands and wives. Halpin didn't agree. He didn't want any delay, and polling the jurors would just serve to stir up their emotions. Tynan decided to bring out the jury foreman and get his opinion about the capability of the jury to go on with an impartial deliberation. 
Foreman Rodriguez was summoned, and Tynan queried him about the jury's ability to move forward. Rodriguez, a mustachioed man with very black hair, said, I feel it is somewhat tranquil, but it is... I feel we can probably continue today. They all seem to be able to carry out their duties then as jurors, asked the judge. Right. Everyone appears to have it behind them. I am delighted to hear that, Tynan proclaimed, an audible sigh of relief coming from him, and called for the jury to be brought out. He announced he was going to allow the trial to go forward. He looked at the defense table and said, If there's any objection from the defense, I'll hear it now. Richard leaned forward and said, I have an objection. I think that is fucked up. The bailiff closed in. The press, not knowing what Richard would do next, leaned forward. Daniel calmed Richard and told Tynan the defense objected strenuously to the deliberations going on with this jury. Tynan ruled they would continue with this jury. Richard scowled at the judge and moved about in his chair anxiously, chains rattling. The judge told the jury he was allowing their deliberations to go on and read a prepared statement to them, imploring them to put Miss Singletary's murder behind them. He reiterated her death had nothing to do with the trial and told them about James Melton, his suicide, and the note. At 10.45, the jury recommenced its deliberations. On August 23rd, a motion the defense was making to poll the jury was to take place. Richard adamantly did not want to be there, Daniel told the court, adding he would not be able to control Richard if he was forced to come to court. The judge didn't like this. He was not about to be bullied by Richard Ramirez at this late date. He told Daniel that Richard would have to attend. Tynan said, I don't want to play these games. I do appreciate the stellar job you have done in keeping him under control. If he wants to act like a jerk, we can deal with it at that time. Restrain him. Richard was ordered out of the holding cell. Surrounded by nervous bailiffs, he was brought out, openly scowling at Tynan, his lips silently mouthing curses. Hey, I don't want to be here, man. Don't you understand? Ramirez said as he sat down. I understand, the judge said. Then what is the problem? The judge ignored Ramirez and asked Daniel if he wanted his motion to poll the jury to be heard. Daniel said he did. Tynan ruled the people would be allowed ten days to prepare for the motion and offer the 31st as a date to hear arguments. Richard said, I won't come back in here again, you understand that? His trial is a joke, fucking asshole, piece of shit. As Richard shouted, the four bailiffs surrounded him, lifted him, and hurried him from the court. The jurors, spectators, and press looked at one another in amazement. Seeing Richard with the veins in his neck bulging, his face twisted into an angry animal-like snarl, and his huge chained hands grabbing at the air futilely was a very sobering experience. The judge cleared his throat. Halpin said he would be ready to respond to the defense's motion on the 31st. Daniel said that would be fine. At a conference in the judge's chambers, Daniel reiterated that there would be trouble if Richard was forced to attend the hearing on the 31st. He was adamant about not being there. Daniel said he was upset about the trial going forward after one of the jurors had been shot. Richard would sign a waiver. Tynan saw no reason not to grant this request. He knew Ramirez was very volatile and didn't want to deal with it. He agreed Ramirez didn't have to be present on the 31st, and the proceeding returned to open court. Richard was brought out, more subdued now, politely saying yes when the judge asked if he waived his right to be in court for the hearing. On the 31st, Richard listened over a loudspeaker in the court holding cell he despised so much, as the hearing to poll the jury took place. Clark reiterated the defense's position. Yokelson stood for the people, saying Ms. Singletary's murder had happened two weeks earlier, it made no sense to rehash the tragedy and stir things up after they apparently had been able to put it behind them. Tynan said he thought letting the defense question the jury about Singletary's death would be a fatal mistake, and he denied the motion. In his cell, pacing back and forth, Richard cursed the judge and told his jailers the trial was a joke. He spit and he cursed and kicked the bars. Daniel told the court Richard refused also to attend a second motion to be heard on September 5th, the judge said it would be all right, but he would have to sign another waiver. Deputy Warden asked to speak to the judge at a sidebar and told Tynan that Richard was cursing and yelling and it stated he'd fight before he allowed deputies to bring him into court. Tynan announced that for security reasons the defendant would sign the waiver on September 5th. The jury's deliberations moved on. On September 5th, when Ramirez was led into court, he was subdued. Doreen was in her usual place, her eyes riveted to him, there was not an empty seat in the house. 
Ramirez signed the waiver form and was taken to the holding pen. The defense had decided to seek a mistrial based on several points, one, the death of Singletary, the other, that the juror who had replaced her, Mary Herrera, had two brothers in law enforcement who'd been shot to death, which she had failed to mention in her initial questionnaire. The judge refused to grant a new trial. Court was recessed, and the jury continued its deliberations. On September 14th, court was convened because of Arturo Hernandez. He had been ordered to call the court daily, but had failed to do so on the 6th through the 14th. Judge Tynan found him in contempt and issued a body attachment with $5,000 bail. On the 18th, Arturo showed up in court. Tynan bawled him out for not calling in as he had agreed to. He didn't want to hear any excuses. He just wanted to know how Arturo pled. The lawyer said he was guilty. Tynan fined him $2,400 or 24 days in jail. He gave him until September 24th to come up with the money. The judge then had Arturo remanded to do a day in jail for a September 1st contempt charge. 53. At 10.50 on September 20th, the jury announced they had reached a verdict, a unanimous decision. Daniel Hernandez and Ray Clark were summoned. Richard was brought from the jail. He refused to change into a suit and wore jail blues. The press packed the courtroom. All the networks interrupted broadcast to announce that a verdict had been reached. At 2.12, everyone was gathered in the packed courtroom. Carrillo and Salerno sat in their usual places. Clark told Judge Tynan that Richard did not want to be present for the verdict. Halpin said he wanted him there. Tynan refused to have Richard chained up to hear the verdict. It wouldn't be good for the jury to see him that way before the penalty stage. He ruled Richard could hear the verdict from the court holding cell, citing the Ninth Circuit of California versus Spainer. He queried Richard on the record, asking him four times if he relinquished his right to be present during the verdicts, and each time Richard said yes. He signed a waiver and was taken back to the holding cell. The jury was summoned. Solemn and silent, heads cast down, they entered the courtroom. There was no sound but the soft shuffling of their feet. Good afternoon, folks, Judge Tynan said, and explained that the defendant had elected not to attend the verdict reading and that they weren't to infer anything from his not being present. He read each juror's name. Cynthia Hayden, Martha Salcedo, Verb Sutton, Alfred Carrillo, Arthur Johnson, Lillian Sagron, Felipe Rodriguez, Mary Herrera, Chocolate Harris, Arlena Wallace, Don McGee, and Shirley Zelaya. The judge then read the verdict sheets, announced they were in order, and gave them to the clerk, Josephine Williams, to be read out loud. Beginning with the Vinco charge, the jury voted guilty on every one of the 46 counts. No one in the audience was surprised. Doreen stood and, crying, hurried from the courtroom. Judge Tynan, at the defense's request, polled the jury, and each one said he'd heard the verdicts read out loud and agreed with them. It was over. The judge thanked them and said they would now be moving to the penalty phase. He asked them to step into the jury room. Judge Tynan asked the defense how long they would need to prepare for the penalty phase. Clark said three days. Daniel asked for at least two weeks, saying they were bringing people in from out of town. Tynan told Daniel he should have already lined up any witnesses and gave the defense one week to prepare. The jury was now brought out and told the penalty phase would take place on the 29th. The judge reminded them not to talk with anyone in the media. He offered them the use of the back elevator to avoid the waiting reporters and cameras. As Cynthia Hayden was leaving, Phil Halpin asked to speak with her up in his office for a minute. She followed him and Alan Yokelson up to the district attorney's floor. Halpin thanked her for the verdict and asked her not to talk with the defense if they approached her. She said she wouldn't and left, a bit bewildered about why they had apparently spoken only to her. When she got home, she called a few of the other jurors, and they said they'd not been approached by the prosecutors. That evening, Richard Ramirez's conviction was the lead story on all the news shows. Commentators gave their opinion as to whether or not Richard would be given the death sentence. In El Paso, Mercedes, Julian, and the rest of the Ramirez clan went to church and prayed Richard wouldn't be given the death sentence. In her prayers to Mary, Mercedes explained it was a big Satan-inspired mistake that her son could not have done the things they said he'd done, that Satan's hand was at work here. She implored Mary to speak to her son and tell him the truth. As cameramen and reporters taped news pieces in front of their home, Mercedes Ramirez cried herself to sleep. Julian sat in his easy chair and stared at the floor, immobile, unspeaking. 
When Ruth and Joseph visited and tried to talk with him, he ignored them. He had, Joseph thought, aged ten years in just a few hours. When Richard's lawyers went to visit him at the county jail that evening, he said he wasn't surprised he'd been convicted. The trial was a farce, and there was no way the jury would not convict him after Singletary's death. He told his attorneys he didn't want to put on any kind of defense for the penalty phase. Clark warned him that would be foolish, a mistake. If he wanted the jury not to give him the death sentence, they needed mitigating circumstances, something they could hang their hats on not to vote for death. He suggested Richard's father, saying he was a good, hard-working man, and he could very well stir up some sympathy among the jurors. Clark insisted if the defense didn't present something for the jury on Richard's behalf, they would surely sentence him to die. You are as good as dead, Richard. Richard said he didn't want to put his father through that, beg for his life, grovel in front of Tynan, Halpin, Salerno, Carillo, and the rest of the detectives. He wouldn't stand for that. He insisted he didn't want anyone in his family put on the stand. They'll kill you, Clark repeated. Richie, they'll execute you for sure, Daniel put in. Well then, let them. Fuck them. Dying doesn't scare me. I'll be in hell, with Satan. That's got to be a better place than this. I'd rather die than live in a cage. Fuck that shit, man, he said, and laughed, then sat back, suddenly serious-faced. Please, Richard, Clark began, but was cut off. We aren't begging, period, Richard said, and that was that. Daniel, against Richard's wishes, flew down to El Paso anyway and spoke to Richard's parents and siblings. He told them of Richard's decision not to put on any kind of defense for the penalty phase. Hernandez beseeched Julian Tapia to overrule his son and come up to L.A., but the senior Ramirez said if Richie didn't want them to speak on his behalf, then by God that's the way it would be. No one asked Richard's cousin Mike to come to court and tell the jurors about the photographs, his war stories, or his having killed his wife Jessie in front of Richard. Still, no one knew Richard had seen the murder. On the day of sentencing, the defense announced they would not be putting any witnesses on the stand on the defendant's behalf, calling it a tactical decision. Richard would not be taking the stand either. Tynan asked Richard if he was waiving his right to put on a defense and to speak on his behalf. Ramirez said yes. The next issue was the jailhouse blues. Clark asked the judge if Richard would be able to wear them. He didn't want to change clothes. Tynan said that would be all right and ordered the jury brought in. As they entered, Richard glowered at them. Cynthia Hayden couldn't look him in the eyes. She felt guilty about having convicted him. She thought the Hernandezes were so woefully inadequate that Richard hadn't gotten a fair shake. He was sold down the river, she would later say, and would make correcting that injustice her life's work. Court was recessed to one thirty to give Judge Tynan time to read some amended charges the prosecutor had. After the recess, a few issues involving the charges were ironed out between Halpin and Clark. The jury was brought out and told by the judge that the people would now present the reasons they felt Richard should be given the death penalty. Halpin stood, and filled with anger and with fire in his eyes, told the jury that according to Webster's, the word justice meant a reward or penalty as deserved, just deserts. If the death penalty was ever warranted, it was in this case, he said. He reminded them that they had each said, at the onset, that they could administer a death sentence if the evidence warranted it, and he went on to read the special circumstances the penal code outlined about extenuating circumstances which precluded the death penalty. None applied to the crimes Richard had been convicted of. He outlined each of the murders and why, in every case, Richard should be sentenced to death. Of Jenny Vinco's murder, throat slit from ear to ear, very violent and very brutal, inexcusable, not just a murder, not just a murder in the commission of a burglary, but an inexcusably violent act resulted in the death of that woman. Of Dale Okazaki's murder, very cold-blooded, deliberate act, and inexcusable. Of Veronica Yu's murder, another terrible act, again, with no time to mutilate, as with Dale Okazaki, but someone obviously that, across from whom, the defendant just came at that particular time and place and took her life. Of Vincent and Maxine Zazara, in their own home, again, not only murdered, but Maxine Zazara horribly mutilated. For what reason? Horribly mutilated. Eyes cut from her head. Why? Of the Doy incident, again, in the home where these old people had some sanctuary, some place to get in at night so that they wouldn't be preyed upon, another useless act. Of Mabel Bell, an elderly lady, beaten, beaten terribly, 
and the cavalier drawing on the wall and that type of thing, but the, the unacceptable, just intolerable brutality at the scene of the crime. Of Carol Kyle's ordeal, the killing didn't end there. The killing went on. Some people he let live, and I submit to you that was for the simple gratification of this miserable human being. Halpin stopped, letting his words sink in. There was not a sound in the courtroom. All eyes were on him. Spectators expected Ramirez to stand up, snarl, and curse at Halpin, but he stayed mute in his chair, looking at his hands folded on the desk. Mary Louise Cannon, Halpin continued, an elderly woman living alone in her home, beaten repeatedly beyond recognition, strangled. Her throat was slit from ear to ear. Little old lady that lived there alone. That wasn't necessary to steal whatever she had. Whitney Bennett had lived, despite Richard's repeated blows to her head with the tire iron, four and a half linear feet of stitches on her head. No question the defendant tried to beat this sixteen-year-old child lying in her bed to death. He failed because of what? Because of her constitution. He said of Joyce Nelson, Again, when we talk about this, a carbon copy of the cannon murder, beaten senseless, multiple, multiple fractures to the skull and head. Of the Sophie Dickman incident, Somebody tells you that was an act in mitigation, not killing her. He could have killed her. Yeah, he could have, except that she was a psychiatric nurse and knew how to handle that type of situation. Of Max and Layla needing. And why the mutilation again? Was it necessary to steal what these poor little old people had? Of the Kovananth attack. A bullet deftly put in the head of Chenarong Kovananth, his wife terrorized and beaten and raped and sodomized put through all sorts of things. August 6th of 85, Christopher and Virginia Peterson, both alive today, miracles, both of them shot in the head. You recall what else? Remember the colloquy between Mrs. Pearson and the defendant? The usual language, and then he laughed. What was he laughing at? Halpin demanded of the jury. Of the Abowath incident, again a bullet deftly placed in the brain of Elias Abowath, and his wife brutalized, dragged down the hall by her hair, raped, sodomized in the bedroom of her husband's dead body. In summation, he said, I submit to you that you have to look this case in the face. This man is the personification of evil, and if anyone ever deserved the death penalty, Richard Ramirez does. I urge you to vote for the death penalty. Thank you. Ray Clark stood to try and save Richard's life. He knew it was an uphill battle, but he was going to give it his all. He first spoke about mercy, Richard's father, the love of his parents. He told the jury, by virtue of their verdict, Richard would die in prison, that he would live in a six-by-eight-foot cell for the rest of his natural life. Life without the ability for parole means he will never see Disneyland again. He will never see Playa del Rey. He will never be free. This is severe punishment. He pointed out that the stalker had let people live, that he had asked Carol Kyle if someone would be coming so she would be freed, that he had left a handcuff key for her. He asked them to show Richard compassion and sympathy. Then he tried to hang the blame on the devil. And there is not a lot to be said here as to, as to he was a good boy, he did this, he went to this school or that school. Obviously you don't consider that. That wasn't presented, and I don't know what school he went to. You do know him between 1984 and 1985, principally in 1985, I think it is inescapable that something was wrong and that we don't know what it was. Even if we knew what it was, I'm not sure that would change your task any. Let's say that we believe that he was possessed, if there is such a thing as being possessed. The extension of mercy goes to the devil, because I guess it is one thing to say he is considerably more in need of mercy than anyone else. He went on about showing Richard Ramirez mercy, talking up a storm about why Richard should live, but the jury was as immobile as a rock their countenances as fixed and still as the faces on Mount Rushmore. In their eyes, one did not see the slightest glimmer of sympathy for the defendant, who had belligerently refused to take the stand or even deny the crimes he'd been convicted of. Clark politely thanked the jury for their attention and wrapped up his arguments at 4 p.m. After a recess, Judge Tynan charged the jury as to the legal parameters of the death sentence and sent them home. The jury began the deliberations of the penalty phase at 9.50 the next morning, September 28. 54. 
After a few bowls of popcorn had been made, the jury got down to the business of deciding Richard's fate. They first took a vote to see if they could each recommend the death sentence if the law warranted it. All twelve jurors said they could. They began to discuss the particulars of each murder. There was not, Cindy would later say, any mitigating circumstance which could have steered us away from the death sentence. It was criminal, absolutely criminal, that the defense had not put anyone on the stand on Richard's behalf. Be that as it may, as difficult as it was, it's very hard taking someone's life, Juro Santos would say. They voted that Richard should be executed on each of the first-degree murder charges. They wrote their decisions on pieces of paper, which were then tallied. After they'd done Vinko and Dale Okazaki, a few of the jurors began drawing little symbols. One drew a hangman's noose, one a gallows, one a tombstone with R.I.P. on it. Cynthia Hayden also drew a tombstone, though on hers she put a heart, which caused some raised eyebrows among the jurors. In all, it took five days for them to cover all the counts. When they sent word to Judge Tynan that their task was done, it was 10.20 a.m. on October 3rd. The lawyers were summoned, Richard was brought out and sat at the defense table, still wearing jail blues, cuffs, and shackles. As the jury entered, he looked up. Four of the women had tears coming down their faces, and he knew they'd voted death. He'd always known they'd vote death. Cynthia Hayden was crying the hardest. She mouthed the words, I'm sorry, to him. Tynan first called each juror's name, making sure they were all there. The clerk handed Judge Tynan the verdict sheets. He read the first one. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, having found the defendant Richard Ramirez guilty of the murder of Jenny Vinco in the first degree, and having found it to be an intentional murder committed during the commission or attempted commission of the crime of burglary, within the meaning of Section 190.2A.17.7 of the California Penal Code, as alleged on page 2 in count 2 of the information, fix the penalty therefore at death, dated this third day of October, 1989. Felipe G. Rodriguez, foreman. The judge read all the verdict forms into the record. As he spoke, his words hung over the crowded courtroom with a lethal finality. When Judge Tynan finished, he queried each juror as to whether the verdict form reflected his decision. Each said yes. It was hard for a few of the female jurors to speak. They were crying so hard. The judge thanked them and set November 9th for sentencing. Richard was remanded. He stood and hobbled from the court, head high, shackles dragging on the hard linoleum floor, as four sheriff's deputies walked in a circle around him. Judge Tynan turned to the jury and asked them to come to his chambers. For the record, I would like to thank you on behalf of the people of the state of California, all the citizens, perhaps, of this country, for your work. You worked under extremely difficult situations, and I'm very proud of you, and I know you've had a tough time of it. And I think I speak for all the citizens of this state we are very, very grateful for your service. We can't survive without you. But this was a highly unusual case, a very, very emotionally charged case, a difficult case for you in many reasons, and I do want to thank you and the public for your work. And God bless you, and thank you. The whole Ramirez family was gathered at the Hacienda Heights house when the verdict reached them. Daniel called to tell them. Ruth picked up the phone. The lawyer said one word, Muerte, death. Ruth told him to hold on. With tears filling her big brown eyes, she turned to her father and repeated, Muerte. Julian Tapia got up and went to the bedroom to tell Mercedes. She was kneeling in front of her white candle. She took one look at her husband's face and knew the state of California would be killing her last born. It should be Satan who's to die, not Richie, she said and began to cry. Julian held her, small and fragile, in his powerful arms, and her tears ran down his chest over his broken heart. The day of sentencing, the judge told the press swelling the courtroom and hall outside the court that civilian witnesses, victims of the case, were absolutely forbidden to be photographed. He moved on to the sentence. The court finds that the evidence concerning the special circumstances pertaining to each of the counts enumerated above is overwhelming, and that the jury's assessment of evidence that the aggravation outweighs the mitigation as to the selection of the proper penalties, that is, death, is supported overwhelmingly by the weight of the evidence. He described each murder and crime in brief, and said there were no mitigating circumstances in any of them that would forego a death sentence. He asked Mr. Clark if he wished to be heard. Counsel doesn't, Clark said. 
However, Mr. Ramirez wishes to be heard. Very well, Judge Tynan said. Mr. Ramirez, you may address the court. All the reporters leaned forward, and the court camera zoomed in on Richard, who removed a piece of paper from his jacket, opened it up with his huge hands, and read, in a booming, angry voice, You don't understand me. You are not expected to. You are not capable. I am beyond your experience. I am beyond good and evil. I will be avenged. Lucifer dwells in all of us. I don't know why I'm even wasting my breath, but what the hell. For what is said of my life, there have been lies in the past, and there will be lies in the future. I don't believe in the hypocritical, moralistic dogma of this so-called civilized society. I need not look beyond this courtroom to see all the liars, the haters, the killers, the crooks, the paranoid cowards, truly the trematodes of the earth. You maggots make me sick, hypocrites one and all. We are all expendable for a cause. No one knows that better than those who kill for policy, clandestinely or openly, as do the governments of the world, which kill in the name of God and country. I don't need to hear all of society's rationalizations. I've heard them all before. Legions of the night, night breed, repeat not the errors of the night, prowler, and show no mercy. Tynan cleared his throat and gave Richard the death sentence nineteen times, one for each of the murders and six for other crimes. He summed up each death sentence with these words. This penalty is to be inflicted within the walls of the state prison of San Quentin, California, in the manner prescribed by law, and at the time to be fixed by this court in the warrant for execution. After disposing of all the murder charges, Judge Tynan sentenced Richard to six years for each of the other thirty-three charges in the indictment. He then gave the victims and their family members a chance to speak before he signed the death warrants. The first was Virginia Peterson. Virginia Peterson. It has been over four years since the attempted murders of my husband and myself, an act which took only seconds, yet to this day reverberates with the original horror. Like a pebble cast into a pond that ripples outward, the effects of this crime touch not only us, but families and friends. When a crime of this magnitude is committed, it touches the heart of the community. These past years have been a constant strain on my family's emotional health. There have been many times for the two of us when walking away from each other would have been preferable, but we were determined not to let our marriage fail. Had we done this, we felt that he would have succeeded in killing us. We had to move from our home of nearly ten years, a home in which we planned our future and hoped to raise our daughter. It was in the neighborhood which my husband grew up in, close to our families, and we had wished to give our daughter the same childhood we had enjoyed. Over the last several months you have heard the facts of the night of our attack, but not of our daily struggles. Christopher lost his job of eleven years due to the injuries caused by the bullet. It rests at the base of his skull, very close to the spinal cord. The surgeons decided not to remove the bullet for fear of paralyzing him. He is in constant pain. At times the entire left side of his body will spasm, and he has lost a great deal of strength on that side as well. Last year I had to leave my employment due to the injuries that I sustained in the shooting. For the past four years I have had constant pain in either my arm, neck, or head. Without warning I have spasms in my head that can leave immediately, cause me to twitch for days, or cause me to lose control of my arms or legs. Nights are the worst. I suffer from a sleep disorder in which I wake up many times a night, sometimes with panic attacks. I scream in terror, not knowing why I'm frightened. It is beyond my control. I will then cling to Chris who will comfort me until I calm down. Usually, then, I will stay awake until dawn. Medication does not help. In fact, it has a paradoxical effect. Here lies the greatest indignity. We had planned on having another child, but we dare not do so while I continually need medication for pain. My daughter was four years old in 1985, the joy of our lives, as any child is to her parents. I can still hear her screams of terror during the shooting, and her crying, Mommy, please don't die, please don't die, while I was bleeding uncontrollably in front of her. When we were released from the hospital, I reached for her, but she recoiled at my face, saying, You are not my mommy, you are ugly. That wounded me worse than any gun could have. For days following the attack she would not speak, but would wander aimlessly, uninterested in her toys or dolls. In kindergarten she came to me one day to talk over something that was troubling her, she told me she could understand why people killed themselves because she hurt inside because of what the bad man had done. It is devastating when your child is severely troubled, 
but when the child is only five years old, it is unbearable. Despite what you have heard, I feel that I am the most fortunate of all women survivors. I have a husband I can turn to and a daughter whose only scars are emotional. Nevertheless, the future we face is not the one of our choosing, but one handed to us on the night of August 6, 1985. You, Your Honor, through your decision to impose the maximum penalty allowed, can help to secure a future for my family that we can face with dignity and peace. The Court. Thank you, Mrs. Peterson. You have the profound sympathy of this Court. Good luck. Christopher Peterson took the podium. Your Honor, I would like to add to my wife's statement. Now that Richard Ramirez has been found guilty for crimes committed against his fellow humans, it is time for him to become accountable for his actions. It is my belief that the death penalty be given without reservation. I'm sure he will now acquire a greater understanding for the value of human life than he had on the night we were shot. Thank you. The court, thank you, Mr. Peterson. Good luck. Joyce Nelson's son approached the podium. Dale Nelson. My mom... You know, she would have been retiring just about this time right now, and kind of really starting to enjoy life, was brutally murdered by Richard Ramirez, and it is really the pits. I mean, he has no, you know, emotion whatsoever about killing all these people, including my mother, and I just don't see why he should have any life left in him whatsoever. I mean, going to my mother's neighborhood, there were bars on windows all through it. He terrorized the whole state of California, and you know— then there is the implementation of the death penalty after it is even given. It should be done, I think, rather quickly. And as far as it being a deterrent, I heard you mention that a little bit ago. It isn't just being used, so how could it be a deterrent? I mean, you have to start, I believe, in the state of California, using the death penalty to make it effective. And as far as this even being other people, I understand there is 260 people on death row. I mean, I don't know about there being a line, but this guy ought to be in the front. So that is what I have to say, sir. The court, thank you, Mr. Nelson. Don Nelson, also a son of Joyce Nelson, spoke next. Don Nelson, Your Honor, Ray Clark, defense counsel, spoke of the quality of mercy demonstrated by my mother's murder, spoke of Richard Ramirez allowing several of his victims to live. I would like to talk about the other side of Richard Ramirez's mercy. Richard Ramirez murdered my mother three times. He beat my mother in the head with a heavy metal object. The same beating caused my mother to lose blood, blood that my brother and I cleaned up. People wonder when somebody dies, who cleans up the mess? It is the family, the survivors. He then strangled my mother. My mother was found by the police the next day. She was in a fetal position with her arm locked behind her back. She weighed about 110 pounds, stands about 5'2". Now, I just cannot imagine how anybody could get, could do this to a human being. This was the true nature of the mercy of Richard Ramirez. Thank you, sir. The court, thank you. Finally, a granddaughter of Joyce Nelson's addressed the court. Colleen Nelson. Basically, I'm just speaking for all my other cousins and my brothers and sisters because I don't think our lives will ever be the same. When I go outside, I'm scared of people because I just can't imagine how anyone can do this to people. For every person that he killed, he has put so many others through so much pain a lifetime of pain that will always be there. My grandma didn't deserve to die. She was one of the best women I've ever known in my life, and I just can't imagine that someone could do that to her and how scared she must have been. I think Richard Ramirez forfeited his right to live when he killed my grandma and all those other innocent people, and I think he should pay for what he did. Tears in his eyes, Judge Tynan proceeded to sign the death warrants and ordered Richard to be taken to San Quentin for the execution of the sentence. As the survivors wept openly, Richard Munoz Ramirez stood and was taken from the courtroom as his chains dragged behind him and his admirers looked at him forlornly. Epilogue 55 Frank Salerno and Gil Carrillo were anxious to speak with Richard. Early on, they say, he had told them when the case had been adjudicated, he discussed the crimes he'd been charged with, as well as other murders and assaults the two detectives suspected he had done. After the sentencing, they drove over to the county jail. They checked their sidearms and lockers on the ground floor, made their way up to Ramirez's cell. When they reached the cell, Ramirez was urinating. When he realized the two detectives were there, a smile broke on his face. "'Hi, guys,' he said." At this point, the cell door was opened by a sheriff's deputy. 
"'You have a minute, Richard?' Frank asked. "'I've got a lot of minutes,' he said, and they all laughed. "'A prison cell is like a man's home, and the detectives wouldn't enter it without being invited. "'Come on in,' Richard offered, and they stepped inside. "'Richard told them he hadn't been referring to them in the speech he'd made in court. "'Frank reminded him he said he'd talk about his crimes after the case was over, "'and asked if he'd be willing to talk now. "'Richard said he would not talk about any crime he wasn't convicted of, "'citing his family as the reason.' but he'd be willing to discuss the crimes for which he had been convicted. They moved to an interrogation room and began to talk. NBC was airing a made-for-television movie based on the stalker crimes. Richard said he was looking forward to seeing it. The two detectives said they'd be watching it, too. Salerno suggested they could come back the following day to talk some more and discuss the movie. Richard agreed. They discussed his sentence, his speech, the film, how packed the courtroom had been, and all the press the case had garnered. Salerno asked if it would be all right if they taped their conversation, and Richard said no. The detectives promised to come back in the morning. Could you use anything? Salerno asked, knowing the only way to get anything out of Richard was to treat him like a human being. Richard said he'd like some chocolate. Later that day, Richard was taken to the shower room and left alone. He saw a grated duct cover in the ceiling and decided to try and get it off. He couldn't move it with his hands, so he tried to kick it out of place. The sheriff's deputy on guard heard the kicks and caught Richard vandalizing state property, he wrote in his report. As punishment, Richard wasn't allowed to watch Manhunt, the TV movie he had inspired. Doreen hadn't been in court when Richard was sentenced. Daniel Hernandez had promised he'd call her at work and let her know what time to come to court, but he never did. She heard over the radio that Richard had been sentenced to death. She got pale and dizzy and nearly passed out, she later said. She was very angry at how the news people on the radio seemed happy Richard had been given the ultimate punishment. She had to see him and console him and let him know she'd be there to the end, that nothing would stop her from helping him, that she'd do anything for him. She left work, went home, and cried her eyes dry. With great effort, she then pulled herself together, put on a yellow flower dress, makeup on her face, combed her hair, set the VCR to tape the movie, and went to see Richard at the jail. Visiting hours didn't begin until 5.30 p.m. She got there at three and took her place at a long line filled with hard-eyed women and unruly children. It was very difficult for Doreen, standing there, not to cry. Two sheriff's deputies came out of the jail and asked her to come with them, so they could look in her pocketbook. When the deputies were convinced she wasn't carrying any firearms or weapons, they let her get back into the line. When her turn came, she took the elevator up to the second floor, where the sheriff's deputies again searched her pocketbook, and the female deputy searched her person thoroughly. She was told she'd have to wait for all the other inmates to have their visits, then they'd bring down Richard. She sat on a bench, dazed, shocked, and stunned, for two hours, until the whole visiting area was cleared and Richard was brought out. As usual, the visit was through dirty, smoked plexiglass. He sat down as if the weight of San Quentin rested on his shoulders. Well, they did it, he said. I told you. I'm so sorry, Richard. Me too. But not for me. For my family. For my mother. For Ruth. You'll appeal it. And judging by how unfair the whole trial was, I'm sure you'll get a reversal. I don't know if I even want to appeal it. I don't want to go through another trial. Fuck that. Did you speak to my sister? I tried calling, but the phone was busy and I couldn't get through. Call tonight. Tell them everything will be all right, that you saw me and I'm okay. I will. Daniel didn't call me. That's why I wasn't in the courtroom. I'm sorry I wasn't there for you. Don't worry about it, he said, and looked down. Doreen had never seen him so sad and downhearted. Tears started rolling down her face. She told him that she loved him, and in the end he'd win his appeal. He told her about the shower incident. So that's why they searched me and made me wait, you think? That's why. Did you set the VCR? Yes, of course. And I'll write you and tell you about all the highlights. He thanked her and told her Carrillo and Salerno had come to visit. For what, she asked. Just to talk. They're coming back to discuss the movie. Be careful. Careful? About what? It's all over. No, it's not. Don't give up. You can win an appeal. Fuck an appeal, he said, and the deputies came up and announced time was up. Richard stood. He was taken back to his cell, angry he couldn't see the movie, hating what life had in store for him. In El Paso, Texas, the news of Richard's sentence hit the Ramirez family hard. They were all gathered at Joseph's house. Reporter Tony Valdez from KTTV in Los Angeles was also there. 
He had been kind to Ruth when she was trying to get her brother a lawyer in the very beginning, and had asked for permission to come to El Paso with a camera crew so he could capture the family's reaction to the sentence. Right after Judge Tynan had finished the sentencing, a colleague of Valdez's had run to the phone and called El Paso from the courthouse. Ruth answered and gave Valdez the phone as he ordered the cameras put on the family. The Ramirez's had turned down dozens of offers, some involving money for interviews. Only Tony Valdez was allowed near the family. He listened to his colleague say, Nineteen death sentences, turned to Julian Ramirez and said, Muerte, diecinueve veces. A sudden sadness enveloped Julian. He looked down and appeared like a man whose heart had been cut in two. In Spanish, Valdez asked Julian what he thought. He looked up and said, That jury may have sat in judgment of my son, but really there's only one who can judge him, and that is God. The camera moved to Ruth. I feel bad for the victims and their families, but we too have been victims. Valdez signed off, saying the family were also victims. The piece was shown on the 4, 5, 6, and 11 o'clock Los Angeles news broadcasts, and family members and survivors of the Night Stalker crimes called the station, complaining that Valdez had no right saying the Ramirez family were victims. They didn't want any sympathy extended to Richard's family. When Mercedes Ramirez left Joseph's home, she and Ruth went to church. Mercedes knelt in front of the Virgin Mary and prayed for her youngest boy's salvation. Ruth was crying too hard to be able to pray. Julian went home and sat in his easy chair, his powerful shoulders bent by the weight of Richard's imminent execution. He told Joseph and Robert he wanted to be alone. The boys refused to leave him. They were afraid their father might commit suicide. Julian looked down and stared at the floor without blinking. Tears rolled from his unseeing eyes and fell on the backs of his huge, large-knuckled hands. At seven o'clock that evening, the whole jury panel met at juror Shirley Jones's house. It was supposed to be a party, but there was a somber, sad cloud over everyone's head. It had been a very, very difficult thing for some, not all, of the jurors to render a death sentence. Regardless of how heinous the crimes were, Richard was still a human being who was going to be put to death because of our decisions, juror Martha Salcedo said. Cindy, as well as Chocolate Harris and a few of the other female jurors, felt Richard had been railroaded into the gas chamber. Cindy said she thought the Hernandezes should be prosecuted for incompetence. They had no right not putting some evidence forward when it came to the penalty phase. Los Angeles Times photographer Mike Wu was there, and he took pictures of the jurors, in which they wore serious, stern countenances. Later, when Cindy arrived home, she couldn't sleep. She felt haunted and deeply troubled by what she perceived as a terrible injustice. Her heart ached at the thought of Richard being executed because of her. She felt that had she held out, she could have caused a hung jury. She was mad at herself for allowing the other jurors to convince her to vote for death. She was also mad at Daniel and Arturo and Ray Clark for not offering any mitigating circumstance that could have allowed her to vote differently about the death sentence. She was still crying at dawn when she had to get ready to appear on AM Los Angeles along with two of the other jurors. She was on the air at 8 a.m. At the host's urging, Cindy looked into the camera and told California that Richard deserved the death penalty. But she added quickly his lawyers had done a poor job representing him. She said she wondered what made Richard tick and hoped some day she'd be able to meet and talk to him. Doreen made sure to catch Cindy's appearance on television. Of all the jurors, Doreen held only Cindy in disdain. She had seen the way Cindy had been looking at Richard during the trial, like she was hungry and he was food or something. She knew that Cindy had brought the valentine that said, I love you, for Richard's benefit. Gil Carrillo and his whole family had gathered at his home to watch Manhunt. He was very proud of being portrayed on television. He knew there was much more to the story the film hadn't even touched on, and hoped one day the complete story would be told the way it had really happened. When the movie was over, the Carrillos had a celebration. It wasn't every day one of theirs was featured in a movie. It was a proud moment, one of the proudest moments in my career, Gill later said. He had, he knew, helped root out, prosecute, and convict probably the most dangerous serial killer this century has ever known, for Richard Ramirez came when you were sleeping in your own bed. Gill shivered at the thought of Ramirez stalking around people's darkened backyards, looking in windows, salivating at the very prospect of having a helpless woman in his control. It didn't matter what age, at his mercy. He looked forward to talking to Richard some more, maybe getting some insight into what the hell made him tick, 
what he did to avoid apprehension. The fucker's a walking encyclopedia about murder, and I'm going to find out what he knows, he said later. Later that night, as they were preparing for bed, Pearl saw how sad Gil had become. She asked what was wrong. He sat down heavily on the bed and didn't answer. His lower lip began to tremble as if he might cry. What's wrong, Gil? she asked. I've been thinking about my dad. I wish... I wish he was here to share with me, with us, this triumph. I mean, this is my shining moment as a detective, as a man. There'll never be another case like this, a killer as bad and cunning as Richard. I just wish... I wish he were here. And with that he did begin to cry, in earnest, a thing Gil very rarely did. Pearl sat up and embraced his huge hulk. He is here, Gil. He is with you. I know it. I feel it, Pearl said. Frank Salerno did not watch the movie. He didn't want to be reminded about all that had happened. Not yet. Jane taped it for him. When Carrillo and Salerno heard Richard hadn't been able to view the movie because of his antics in the bathroom, they decided it would be a good idea if they took a tape of the film to the jail so they could all watch it together. The day after the movie had aired, they brought a bunch of chocolate bars, some popcorn, and some soda to the county jail. A VCR and a television had been set up in an interview room so they could watch the film with Richard. Richard didn't think Greg Cruz, the actor portraying him, looked anything like him, and said it appeared as if they'd put black wax over his teeth to make them look bad. Whenever a body was shown being taken from a house, Richard got excited. He thought A. Martinez, the actor playing Gill, was too small. They all got a laugh at that. Richard asked if someday there would be a book about him, pointing out that there were a couple on Ted Bundy and half a dozen on the crimes of Jack the Ripper. Salerno said he didn't know of any book deals and explained to Richard that it would help the families of crimes they still suspected him of if he would now admit them. Richard said he wouldn't talk about anything but the convictions. Carrillo asked if it would be all right if they taped what he said. He said no. They then began asking him about the crimes and how he did them. Richard gave them, the detectives later said, which Richard vehemently denies, the details of how he worked, lived, and avoided capture for so long. The detectives say he told them he capered in stolen cars, which he sometimes left in the parking lot of the Greyhound bus terminal. He always stashed away any weapon he had in the terminal lockers until he realized the car might be staked out. At that point he began driving the cars around the block a few times before he retrieved his weapons. According to the detectives, they began talking about the actual murders, beginning with Vinco. Richard told them what he knew. They weren't sure if he was bragging and making things up, but he seemed sincere, they thought. For the next week, as Richard ate sweets, he told the two detectives the details of what he said had taken place. Both detectives enjoyed talking to him. He had a likable side to him that was easy to warm to, Carrillo later said. Their meetings were brought to a halt on November 16th, when Richard was taken to San Quentin. The last time Salerno and Carrillo saw him, he asked them if they were going to come to his execution. Carrillo said he wasn't sure, didn't think so. You bet I'm coming, Salerno said, dead serious, looking Richard right in the eye. San Quentin Prison was built in 1852. It is located on 20 acres of land at the foot of Mount Tam in Marin County, a 30-minute scenic drive from San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. Its south side runs parallel with the Bay of Skulls, the prison is painted a pale yellow with terracotta roofs. It comprises five different buildings, or blocks, A through F. Death Row is in E block. Since 1893, 409 people have been executed at San Quentin by hanging up to 1938, when the gas chamber was installed. Some of San Quentin's famous alumni are Carl Chessman, the Red Light Bandit, James Watson, known as Bluebeard, and C. E. Bolton, or Black Bart. In gun towers and strategic positions around the prison are expert marksmen with automatic assault rifles with scopes. They man them 24 hours a day. It is a very scenic, lovely spot, with palm trees rustling in the gentle sea breezes and waves rhythmically lapping the coastline. An occasional shark's fin can be seen slicing the placid waters of the Bay of Skulls. All men sentenced to die in California await their execution at San Quentin. Some of the serial killers presently housed in E-Block are Juan Corona, Randy Kraft, Lawrence Bitteker, Roy Lewis, David Carpenter, David Catlin, Douglas Clark, Mitchell Carton, and Bill Bonin, the freeway killer. These men would be Richard's neighbors. Richard was taken to San Quentin ten days after he'd been sentenced. The authorities viewed him as a security risk. 
They knew he had many female admirers, and they knew about the Satanists who had regularly visited the trial, and there were always rumors that someone was going to try and break him out. For security reasons, it was decided it would be better if he was flown to Quentin rather than driven. The helicopter landed on the roof of the county jail in Los Angeles and picked up Richard, and with three guards watching his every move, he was flown up north. Richard had never been in a helicopter before. He was like a wide-eyed kid with a smile on his face, intensely looking out the window, though he began to get motion sickness. Still, he liked the idea of being flown to Quentin. It made him feel important and dangerous. He was shackled at the wrists and ankles and was wearing a blue Los Angeles County jail jumpsuit. At this point, he still had no plans to appeal his conviction. He viewed the system as corrupt and hell-bent on killing him. When the time came for him to die, he had decided to commit suicide. He didn't want a whole bunch of strangers watching him kick around in San Quentin's green room. Death, as such, held no fear for Richard. More than ever, he believed in his heart that he would go to hell and sit at the right hand of Satan. He believed all the hardest criminals throughout history would be there, and he'd get to know them. Jack the Ripper, Al Capone... John Dillinger, Ted Bundy, Adolf Hitler, and all the others sent to hell for their deeds. Heaven and hell were as real to Richard as the helicopter now taking him to San Quentin. When the prison came into view, Richard sat up and stared at it. It looked, he thought, more like some vacation hotel, a club med or something. In truth, Richard welcomed the change. He'd been locked up in the Los Angeles County Jail for four years, Time was easier to do in a prison than in a jail. The visiting, food, and general conditions are much better. Richard was handed over to heavily armed, grim-faced San Quentin officials. He was put in the AC block known as Reception. His prison number was E-37101. All prisoners, except death row inmates, were kept in reception while they were evaluated, and it was decided where they would do their actual time. Richard still had the pan assault and murder charges against him, and until that case had been adjudicated, he would not be moved to E-Block after his obligatory three-month stay in reception. He would, after evaluation, be transferred to the San Francisco County Jail to be closer to court for hearings and motions on the Pan matter. Lawyers from the San Francisco Public Defender's Office would be representing Richard in the Pan incident. Richard was put in another six-by-eight-foot cell with an aluminum toilet, a sink, and a bunk bed. Prisoners in reception did not have access to phones, and their visits were for only two hours a week. In E-Block, the inmates were allowed 24 hours a week for visits, and reception inmates were kept in the cell nearly 24 hours a day. Richard was assigned cell number 3AC8. Cindy Hayden was having a hard time keeping Richard Ramirez off her mind. He was all she could think of. His intense black eyes, his wavy black hair, his absolute and undeniable arrogance and danger. She dreamt of him nearly every night, often wondering if he had put some kind of spell on her. She would later say, the truth of the matter is, I think I fell in love with him the first time I saw him. I know it's nuts and everything, but I couldn't help it. It was just one of those things. A week after the sentencing, the Hernandez is asked to meet with her in the office of an attorney in downtown Los Angeles. After she'd waited for two hours, she called Ray Clark's office, hoping to locate the Hernandezes there. Clark didn't know they had requested a meeting with her. Cindy took the opportunity to complain to Clark about the defense, which she thought had been woefully inadequate. It was a sin. No evidence had been presented on Richard's behalf during the penalty phase. Why didn't you do something during the penalty phase, she demanded. Because he wouldn't let us, Clark said. He's very stubborn. When the Hernandezes arrived, they told her Richard wanted to talk with her. If she was interested, she could write him in care of San Quentin Prison and gave her his prison number and address. Daniel then asked her what she thought of the defense they had mounted on Richard's behalf. Cindy Hayden laid into the Hernandezes, saying they had done a terrible job of defending Richard, that they hadn't had enough experience, that they'd missed the most crucial element to their client's benefit. When Daniel asked what that was, she told them it was Satan. She believed Richard had been possessed by some demonic force when he'd committed the crimes, and they'd not even mentioned it, let alone tried to highlight it as a viable defense. It was something the jury should certainly have known about, she said. When she got home, Cindy wrote Richard a long letter, saying how sorry she was about the death sentence, and tried to explain that she and the jury as a whole had had no legal alternative but to vote for death. She mailed the letter and anxiously waited for a response, which took only four days. Richard wrote her back and said he understood that she shouldn't feel bad about anything, not to beat herself up, 
and asked her to write him some more and maybe even come and visit. Cindy was thrilled when she got his letter and immediately wrote him back. The day after Richard left for San Quentin, Gil Carrillo left for Waikiki for vacation with Pearl, the kids, and four other couples. After ten days, he went back to work. He couldn't help wondering when the next serial murder case would come his way. During this time, Gil began thinking about running for sheriff. He had gotten a lot of publicity because of the stalker case, and there were certain things in the sheriff's department that he would like to see changed. He talked it over with his wife, who said if that's what he wanted to do, she'd support him. Something was wrong with Frank Salerno. The problems had begun at the end of 1989 and had escalated. He'd started experiencing dizzy spells, then vertigo so bad the room would seem like it was spinning and he'd have to sit down. He went to his family doctor, thinking there might be a problem with his inner ear, but the doctor couldn't find anything wrong. The dizziness and spinning not only continued, but got worse, and he developed insomnia. He told Captain Grimm, who sent Frank to see his own doctor, who did a complete physical. When the results came back, the doctor had bad news for Frank, which hit him very hard. Frank had high blood pressure and had developed a heart problem called arrhythmia. He told Frank he needed a lot of rest, little excitement, and to change his diet. No meat, no cheese, no fried food. Frank was forced to take a leave of absence, which proved to be very hard for him at first. He was a homicide detective through and through. Chasing and capturing killers was his passion in life, and now suddenly that was all taken away. The first time Ruth Ramirez saw Richard after the sentencing— she had come up to Los Angeles by bus, then, with Doreen, flown to San Francisco. Ruth felt Doreen really loved her brother, and Richard had told Ruth he could trust Doreen. When Ruth saw the first editorial piece Doreen had written defending Richard, she really believed Doreen was in Richard's corner, a hundred percent, and accepted her as if she had been a childhood friend or a sister. They drove to San Quentin and had to wait eleven hours to see Richard. There were always many prisoners in reception with a lot of visitors. The prison's facility for reception visits was small, and ten to fifteen hour waits were the norm. When Ruth finally did get to see her kid brother, she was surprised at how well he had taken the death sentence. It didn't seem to bother him, she'd later say. Richard was, though, concerned about what his parents were going through. Ruth told him they were not taking it at all well. Mercedes often cried at night, and their father was quiet all the time, never smiled and seemed to be drifting away. He doesn't look well. His diabetes is getting worse, she said. Tell him I said this is a bunch of bullshit, that I didn't kill anyone, that this is all a big railroad job. I'll tell him, Ruth said. Richard thanked Doreen for helping his sister, for waiting so many hours for a visit. She told him she'd do anything for him, that she loved him. Both Ruth and Doreen told Richard to appeal the conviction that he could win an appeal on grounds of incompetent counsel. Richard said he'd think about it. The following week, Doreen flew to El Paso to meet with the family. She stayed with Ruth. After a dinner at Julian and Mercedes' house, Julian took her aside and thanked her for being so dedicated to Richard. He told her he would like to see her and Richard get married. 56. In February 1990, Ramirez was moved to the San Francisco County Jail, where he had access to a phone and a television and interacted with other inmates. Almost immediately he got into a fight over the phones and beat up some guy who'd called him a punk. Richard knew he couldn't let anyone abuse him in any way, for the abuse would surely get worse and more than likely end up as an assault against him. He was quick to let everyone in the jail know if you bothered him, you'd better be ready to fight to the end. This resulted in his being left alone, and he could do his time without being bothered. Now that he had access to a phone, he called Cindy Hayden Collect, and they talked for the first time. She felt like an errant schoolgirl getting involved with the bad kid in the neighborhood. As a result of this first phone call, she thought he was sweet and shy and funny, nothing like the monster who had committed the murders and assaults she had heard about for so many months. Richard told Cindy he loved her. She was surprised and taken aback. You don't even know what love is, she said. You are right, he said. I don't. I had no one on the outside. Do you love me? There was a long pause. She laughed nervously, then said, Yes, Richard, I do love you. He invited her to come visit him in San Francisco, and that weekend she went to see him. The visiting situation was much better at the county jail, and Cindy waited only an hour before they brought him out. They spoke to one another through plexiglass and over the phone. 
Cindy later said she was so nervous her hands were shaking. Her heart was beating so hard she was afraid it would explode. He told her he was very happy she had written him. He had wanted to talk with her since the very beginning. Blushing, she said she had fallen in love with him the first time she'd laid eyes on him. She cried and apologized for voting to sentence him to death. He told her to forget it, that he understood. She told him she wanted to hold him, to have him inside her. He told her maybe she could come with his lawyers when they came to visit. They'd then be able to have physical contact. Their time was up. When Cindy left Richard that day, she felt truly alive for the first time. As she flew back to Los Angeles, she thought about moving to San Francisco so she could be closer to Richard. For the first time, she realized why she had left her husband and Portland, Oregon. She felt that being with Richard as near to him as possible was my destiny. As it turned out, it was very difficult for Frank Salerno to stay retired. After six months of recuperation, regularly swimming, hunting, and fishing, he told Jane he was feeling much better and wanted to return to work. He wasn't experiencing the vertigo any longer, his heart condition had stabilized, and he had no trouble sleeping at night. When he went back to work, though, the job wasn't the same. Something had gone out of it, he'd later relate. He began to think he might have done it all when it came to homicide work, and maybe it was time to quit. A deputy sheriff was murdered, and Frank, as an acting lieutenant, was put in charge of a task force of ten men to try and find the killer. Running this task force, however, was apparently too much for Frank, for he again started experiencing the dizziness and vertigo and shortness of breath. Jane didn't want him working homicides any longer and told him it was time to put police work behind him forever. He had to agree with her. He was still a relatively young man and could, he knew, have a long, wonderful life if he got away from Sheriff's homicide. In August of 1993, Frank Salerno, the famous bulldog of Sheriff's homicide, retired from police work for good. Jane thought it would be fitting if he had a retirement party, and with Frank's approval, she and Jackie Franco, a colleague of Frank's at Sheriff's Homicide, organized a huge affair at Stevens Steakhouse in Commerce. They invited all of Frank's friends and former colleagues and their wives, his and her families, and it turned out to be over 300 people. Among the guests was Whitney Bennett and her family. Whitney had grown into a very beautiful young woman, with honey-colored hair and large blue eyes. She had gone through a number of plastic surgery operations to correct the damage done to her by the tire iron, and one was hard-pressed to see any scars. At the party, Jack Scully, Frank's ex-partner and master of ceremonies, introduced her to the audience, including Mike Salerno. From the first time Mike had seen Whitney the day she had testified at Richard's trial, he thought there was something special about her. Later in the evening, he asked her if it would be okay if he called her, and she said yes and gave him her number. A few days after the party, Mike did in fact phone Whitney, and they began dating. The two hit it off very well and soon were deeply in love. It didn't take long for Mike to decide he wanted to be with Whitney forever, and he asked her to marry him. She said yes without hesitation. When Mike told his parents he and Whitney were getting married, Frank Salerno was a very happy man. He already cared for Whitney like she was his daughter, and this news put a huge smile in his heart and on his face. When Gil Carrillo heard Mike and Whitney were getting married, he too was overjoyed, saw it as maybe the only good thing that had come out of the Night Stalker case. Cindy Hayden continued visiting Richard every chance she got. She'd come mostly on weekends when Doreen was visiting too. The two women began seeing each other at the jail. Doreen felt Cindy was a low-down, hypocritical bitch who could have hung the jury. Whenever Doreen saw Cindy at the jail, she would narrow her eyes and regard her with utter disdain. When Doreen asked Richard why the hell he would allow that Benedict Arnold to visit, he said she was a juror and might be of help if he chose to appeal his conviction. After a few months of Cindy driving all the way to San Francisco every weekend, she began thinking she would move north permanently so she could be close to Richard. She was in love with him and had pictures of him in frames on her night table and on the wall opposite her bed. Cindy had told her parents about her relationship with Richard and had actually brought her mom and dad to the jail so they could meet him. When Richard first sat across from them in the visiting booth, Cindy said, Mom, Dad, this is Richard, as Richard smiled shyly. I know you've heard some bad things about him, but he's got a lot of good points, too. Richard sheepishly said hello, waved, and began talking to Cindy's father, who, like his father, had worked for a railroad. They had something in common, as Cindy later put it. Cindy agreed to do several national talk shows, Donahue once and Geraldo twice, 
and told the world in a very passionate voice that Richard Ramirez had improper counsel and his convictions should be overturned. Some of the groupies who had been visiting Richard in Los Angeles now began to go to San Francisco to see him. Doreen was unhappy with all the competition she had. She'd complained to him that they were taking visiting time away from her, but Richard enjoyed all the female attention. Never before had he had so much female admiration, and he reveled in it, thrived upon it. Cindy, unlike Doreen, didn't mind Richard's other visitors as long as none of them bothered her. But there was one woman Cindy and Doreen came to refer as the bimbo, who did in fact start getting aggressive with both Cindy and Doreen. The bimbo, a heavy-set, well-built, belligerent blonde with frizzy hair and a big nose, began to challenge Cindy and Doreen when she ran into them at the jail. He's mine. Stay away from him or I'll break your face, she'd say regularly. Cindy stood up to her, telling her to fuck off. But Doreen did not have Cindy's combative nature and would take Bimbo's threats, taunts, and admonitions. The Bimbo began regularly to step on Doreen's toes and called her Dog Green. It got to the point that Doreen began asking the jail guards to walk her to her car. She was so afraid of the Bimbo. Doreen again complained to Richard, but he didn't stop the bimbo from coming to the jail. Several of the Ramirez women would bring phallic-shaped vegetables with them on their visits and would sexually excite themselves with the vegetables while Ramirez watched. For many of these women, Richard Ramirez was a turn-on. The fact that he was so dangerous and so close, yet couldn't hurt me, got me excited as soon as I sat down for a visit, one Ramirez groupie would later admit. It was like the beauty and the beast kind of thing. Cindy Hayden wanted to be able to touch Richard, hold him and be close to him, and she constantly thought of ways she could make that happen. When her employer had a mass layoff and she was fired, she decided she would become a private detective. If she had a detective's license, she'd be able to work with Richard's new San Francisco attorneys and have a visit with Richard in a private room. She applied for a job with a San Francisco security firm, was hired, and moved to San Francisco. She took a quiet apartment in Richmond. The security firm sponsored her for a license, and she passed the required examination. She went to one of the San Francisco public defenders representing Richard and talked him into taking her inside the county jail with him when he went to visit Richard. She and the attorney were shown into one of seven rooms allocated for lawyers who come to see inmates. It was ten by ten and had a wooden table and a few chairs. There were panels of glass and a wall so guards could look in. As Cindy waited for Richard to be brought down, her heart raced. She paced back and forth, her hands trembling. When Richard got there, the guard uncuffed him and he sat at the table. They were like two school kids, laughing and giggling. Under the desk, she raised her foot and put it on Richard's thigh. His eyes bulged. He couldn't believe he was actually sitting with one of the jurors who had handed him a ticket to the death room. After a few minutes, Cindy later related, the attorney went to look for a bathroom. When he left and Cindy was sure there were no guards about, she stood and quickly gave Richard a deep kiss as he groped her with his huge hands. She nearly passed out. She was so excited. When later asked if she was afraid to be alone with Richard, she said, No, absolutely not. He'd never hurt me. When the lawyer returned, Cindy sat down, breathless, her heart pounding. On subsequent visits to the jail, as she helped with Richard's legal problems, she says, she was able to have more contact visits and was actually alone with Richard. Gil Carrillo decided to run for sheriff. He felt there were grassroots changes he could make which would vastly improve the efficiency of the sheriff's office. His platform would be that of a detective who had intimate working knowledge of the problems inherent in any huge police department. He took a leave of absence in the spring of 1994 and began campaigning intensively. Pearl and his sisters pitched in and helped run his campaign office, made mailings, and hung up posters. His opponent, Sheriff Block, had become a giant in L.A. law enforcement. Gill's going up against him was akin to David taking on Goliath. Gill lost in the primary and dropped out of the race. As a result of his involvement in the stalker case, Gill is often asked to speak to police agencies around the country, including the FBI Academy at Quantico, Virginia, and he always warns his colleagues to never discount any possibility when it comes to serial killers. Gil Carrillo is presently working homicides out of the East L.A. station. He is not at all bitter about losing the election. He always knew it was a long shot, but he had to give it a go. Today he is again trying to solve Los Angeles homicides, enjoying the work as much as ever. 57. 
Doreen continued to visit her true love on weekends and whenever she could get away. She wanted to move to San Francisco, but couldn't because of her magazine job. Whenever she saw Cindy, her stomach would turn. She'd later confide, I knew she was up to no good and really wished she'd just get lost. Doreen acted as Richard's confidant and secretary, took care of his correspondence and passed messages to his lawyers and family. Often he received mail from all over the country, and Doreen helped him with his letters. He'd call her collect from the San Francisco jail, and she'd play heavy metal music for him over the phone. She put what money she made as an editor in his commissary account and did whatever she could to help him. When asked if she ever thinks about the crimes Richard was convicted of, she says, When you love someone, you only see the good in them. And that trial was a travesty of justice. Doreen's family was quite displeased with her for getting involved with the likes of Richard Ramirez, but that didn't put a dent in her feelings for him. He was her sunset and sunrise, as she puts it, and she hopes one day to be Mrs. Ramirez. Indeed, she says Richard has asked her to marry him, and she's accepted. Richard was becoming a problem for his San Francisco jailers. He was having just too many female visitors, some of whom argued and fought with one another at the jail. A current affair learned of Richard's admirers and did a story about all the fans coming to see him, which they appropriately called Death Row Romeo. It was decided Richard should be moved back to San Quentin for security reasons, the county jail told the press. On September 21, 1993, Richard was returned to San Quentin. He didn't want to be there, for he'd be housed in the Adjustment Center, where visits were exceedingly limited, he had no access to the phone, and he was locked up almost twenty-four hours a day. Doreen finally decided she had to be closer to Richard, and she moved to the San Francisco area and got a job as a caretaker. Although she didn't have to drive the seven hours from Los Angeles anymore, in order to have a visit with him she now had to go to San Quentin in the early morning hours to get a number— there were only three shifts of thirteen visitors each visiting day for inmates in adjustment. Visitors' days were Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Doreen was regularly waiting ten to twenty hours to get into the prison for a thirty-minute visit through glass over the phone, though she didn't mind. She'd sit in her car eating sunflower seeds and write him love letters as she watched the sun come up, glistening like fire on the Bay of Skulls. With a job and someone she had to account to, she managed to see Richard only on Sundays, her day off. Likewise, Cindy Hayden had to wait many hours for her Saturday visit. Richard tried to keep the two of them apart. They are, he laments, like oil and water. Doreen kept pressing Richard to make Cindy and the other women stop coming, especially the bimbo. But her demands fell on deaf ears. At times, Doreen would get so mad she'd leave San Francisco and go back to L.A., but inevitably she returned to Marin County. She realized Richard wasn't the most rational person, and she fervently hoped he'd see how much she loved him and make her his bride. She'd later say, I'm not just another one of his numbskull girlfriends. I believed we were getting married. I mean, otherwise I'd have left. When she pressed Richard for a specific date for them to take vows, he'd put her off. He'd tell her he loved her and that she was the only person he trusted outside his family, which was true. No matter what, Richard knew Doreen would do anything for him. When recently asked if she believes Richard is innocent, Doreen said, I've always fervently believed in his innocence. I can't even conceive of his being guilty of the terrible things they say he did. He received an unfair trial with very inadequate legal representation. Some day the truth will be known. Julian Tapia Ramirez took his youngest son's plight to heart. After the conviction and sentencing, his diabetes progressively worsened. He lost weight every week. He had tomatoes and chilies growing in the backyard, but he stopped tending them and they died. His broad, powerful shoulders were shrinking and rounding. More and more lines formed on his high cheekboned face. Nothing Mercedes did or said could bring Julian out of the deep depression that followed Richard's sentencing. The only thing that put a gleam in his eyes that he looked forward to was being with his grandchildren. Like her husband, Mercedes had been devastated by the death sentence. She aged twenty years in the months following her son's sentencing. Deep, bitter lines like cracks and fallow soil completely mapped her face. She, too, lost weight. She went to church religiously every day and fervently prayed, eyes closed, hands clasped, for the salvation of the family. Julian was diagnosed with bone cancer in the spring of 1991. 
The cancer spread quickly, and he died of it on August 16th of that year. Julian's death crushed Mercedes. Life without Julian wasn't worth living, and she surely would have died of a broken heart. But she had to be there for Richie, and wasn't about to give up until she'd done all she could to help him and the rest of the family. Joseph's children were stigmatized by being related to Richard. It was no secret the feared Night Stalker, now even more famous than John Wesley Harding, was their uncle. There were always taunts and rude remarks at school, though the children acted like they didn't notice the pointed barbs thrown at them or written on their lockers. But they knew what was said, and it hurt them deeply. Troubled, they went to Joseph and complained to him. He'd tell them just to ignore those stupid people, though he remembered only too well the mean things that had been said to him as a child. He prayed his children would be thick-skinned. Richard's oldest brother, Reuben, turned to heroin and found solace in its numbing embrace. He felt responsible to a degree about what had happened to his kid brother, and after the death of his father, he very rarely smiled. Ruth never remarried. She lives with her mother and daughter in the Hacienda Heights house. Whenever she can, she goes to visit Richard. No matter what, Ruth will be there to the end for her baby brother. I love Richie to death. We were always the closest in the family, she would later relate. If they kill him, I'll go crazy. Joseph has a good job designating maintenance people at the Fort Bliss Army Base. He has many commendations, plaques, and awards. He works hard every day and goes to church several times a week. He still has much difficulty getting around, but he does his best and rarely complains. He too visits Richard when he can, twice a year or so, but it is a difficult trip for him, though he gladly makes it. Joseph loves Richard dearly. He gets a heavy heart and is brought to tears when he thinks of his brother's fate. Joseph, like Richard, Robert, and Reuben, often gets migraine headaches that are so bad he must lie down in the dark. You can't even talk to me when they come. It's like having hot needles in your brain. Robert still lives in Marenci, Arizona, working in its mines. He is divorced now and sees his two daughters on weekends. When he can, he drives to El Paso to see his mother and his siblings. He has stopped using drugs and avoids trouble at all costs. Cousin Mike, the person most people believe put Richard on the path he traveled, died of a massive heart attack in April of 1995. He was overweight and still haunted by the ghosts of things he'd done in Vietnam, regularly using heroin. The Army gave Mike a hero's burial with a 21-gun salute. For the first time since he'd been arrested, Richard has excellent, very competent legal counsel in the form of five foot seven Michael Burt with the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. Burt is a handsome, natally dressed advocate who knows the law backward and forward and comes to court very well prepared. He was one of the lawyers who helped defend Lyle Menendez in his first trial, and he represented the very infamous Charles Ng, who, with Leonard Lake, tortured, sexually assaulted, and killed dozens of people in front of a video camera on a ranch in Wesleyville, California. The San Francisco district attorney had been planning to try Richard for the Pan murder. Many in law enforcement say it was a waste of taxpayer money. However, when Bert had extensive psychological tests done on Richard, for the first time, and moved Richard's plea from not guilty to insanity, the San Francisco district attorney backed down. He said they would prosecute Richard only if he won an appeal in the L.A. convictions. Jerry Russell, out of San Diego, is Richard's appeals lawyer. She, like Bert, is an excellent attorney who leaves no stone unturned. She believes Richard has a very good chance at getting a reversal and is presently working hard on perfecting his appeal. There were many major mistakes, the least of which was incompetent counsel. The Hernandezes should have never been allowed to represent anyone in a capital case. If, indeed, Richard wins the appeal, he will have to be brought back to the L.A. County Jail and tried all over again, a very daunting, unsettling prospect for the L.A. District Attorney's Office. The appeal, Russell says, won't be ready until the end of the century, and by then it will be nearly twenty years after the crimes, which would put the prosecution at a huge disadvantage. Witnesses die, move away, and forget details. Today, Frank Salerno has adjusted to his retirement. He has no heart problems. The vertigo is all gone, and he sleeps well. He doesn't miss being a homicide detective at all. I did it all and saw it all. There just wasn't anything left I'd not done. I got out just in time. It takes its toll on you. You think you are okay, but it breaks you down. Murder is not a healthy occupation.
Often, Frank is invited to speak at police seminars about the stalker and the hillside strangler crimes around the country. He feels obligated to tell people in law enforcement what he learned about apprehending serial murders as a result of all the experience in the two huge cases. He recently said, What makes serial murder cases so difficult to solve is the fact that the killer and the victim are strangers. You've got two ships passing in the night, and for no good reason, one blows the other out of the water. Today, Ramirez is still sitting in his cell in the Adjustment Center at San Quentin, waiting for his appeal to be argued, getting visits from Doreen, his family, and other supporters. He says he was railroaded and has hopes in the appeal. He has changed much in the eleven years since August 1985. He's gained thirty-five pounds, and he's mellowed out. The seething anger he often expressed in court seems to be filed in a place he now has control over, but by no means has he adjusted to the reality of his existence. He does not like being in the adjustment center, saying it's cruel and unusual punishment, and he often paces his cell like a caged panther. He recently said of his predicament, I don't know how much longer I can hold out in here. This existence sucks big time, boring as hell. No drugs, no pussy, might as well be fucking dead. Check this out, a little bit of philosophy. Desire comes from the loins, emotions come from the heart, and knowledge comes from the head. When not pacing, Richard writes letters and reads books, everything he can get his hands on about murder. He's become quite the expert on killers and killing. Richard believes he will win the appeal, win at a new trial, and be set free. He still has faith, as strong as ever, in Satan, and believes he, Satan, will ultimately make him victorious and free. In early 1995, when Richard was coming back to San Quentin from court appearances on the Pan matter in San Francisco, the prison's metal detector went off. The guards searched him thoroughly and couldn't find any contraband, yet the metal detector still sounded when they passed him through it again. Officials put him in front of an X-ray machine and discovered he had a handcuff key and a hypodermic needle in a little vial hidden in his anal cavity a very common practice in jails around the world known as keistering. Because of this incident, the San Quentin guards these days watch Richard Ramirez very carefully. When Richard was asked recently how to avoid becoming the victim of a serial murderer, he said, you can't. Once they're focused on you, have you where you are vulnerable, you're all theirs. Dahmer used to invite you home for a drink, and the next thing you knew, he's eating you. Same thing with John Gacy. He put on his clown face, do a couple of tricks, and suddenly he had you handcuffed and in his control. What people can do is not trust someone you don't know, and to always be aware of what's going on around you. When you drop your guard, that's when a serial killer moves. 58. The Wedding Thursday, June 27th of 1996, Richard Ramirez was moved out of the Adjustment Center to San Quentin's East Block, Death Row, where he would be allowed regular contact visits with his family and friends, the first since he'd been arrested. His attorney, Michael Burt, had been writing letters to the prison for many months, demanding that Richard be taken out of the Adjustment Center. His family had been praying for that, and Doreen wanted him to be moved more than anything in the world, for in East Block, Richard Ramirez would be allowed to wed. Richard had taken the bimbo off his visiting list and had told Doreen that if he was moved to East Block, he would marry her. Since the first time she'd seen Richard on TV being taken away from the angry mob on Hubbard Street, she had wanted to marry him, to fight his battles, to be known as Mrs. Richard Ramirez. That day Doreen went to the prison for her regular Thursday visit, but was told that Richard had been moved. Moved to where, she asked the guard. Don't know yet, she was told curtly. Doreen had always been afraid that something terrible would happen to Richard while he was at San Quentin. She knew it was a dangerous place. Men were being killed all the time in fights with other prisoners. In a panic, she went back to her little apartment in San Rafael and sat by the phone, hoping, praying that Richard had been moved to East Block. She sat by the phone, not eating or sleeping the whole night. As each hour passed, her heart sank lower and the knots in her stomach grew tighter. As dawn slowly broke in the east, she looked out the window. A low, gray sky hung over San Quentin like a funeral shroud, portending something ominous. At 8 a.m., the phone rang. She jumped at the sudden sound, nearly falling out of her chair. It was Richard calling from East Block. When he told her he'd been moved, she cried with joy, almost unable to believe she would actually now be able to touch him for the first time. 
He told her that his cell was smaller in East Block, and that he didn't know anyone there, and was very uncomfortable. There were, he said, some very infamous serial killers in the cells to either side of him. Randy Kraft, Juan Corona, Lawrence Bittaker, a.k.a. the Pliers, because he ripped off the nipples of his victims with a pair of pliers. Doreen was so excited she could barely hold the phone. She said, Well, now that you are there, are we getting married? I said, he said, We would and we will. Promise? Promise. Oh, Richard, I love you, she gushed, crying uncontrollably with joy now, gasping for breath. He told her to put away all the tears and come on over to the prison. I'm on my way, darling, she said, and in a whirlwind of activity, her heart pounding away as if she'd been running, she showered, did her hair, put on her makeup, and a new, special flower dress she'd been saving for this occasion, and ran out the door. She jumped into her car and sped over to the prison, went through security, and with trembling legs and sweating hands, walked the one hundred fifty yards from the front gate to East Block. Just above the entrance to the short, squat, red-brick building streaked with water stains, stood a serious-faced prison guard, affectionately cradling a glistening blue-black assault rifle. He held it, she thought, as if it were a small child. She wanted to wave to him, to say hello, but she knew Richard wouldn't like that, and she walked up to the East Block's tall door. A guard opened it electronically from the inside. She gave him her driver's license and visiting pass, and with hesitation walked slowly into the room where all death row inmates have their visits. It was two hundred feet wide and fifty feet deep, the walls industrial gray. A hundred hard orange plastic chairs were bolted to the gray cement floor in neat rows going left to right. On her right there was a bank of coin-operated machines that dispensed coffee, candy, hot soup, and sandwiches, even foamy cappuccino. Nearly all the chairs were filled with the condemned and their visitors. Wearing their Sunday best, children of the convicts ran about. Doreen's eyes quickly scanned the room. Richard was not there yet. She recognized women she'd met over the years, visiting with their men. One or two waved to her, small, sedate movements. Doreen recognized notorious Los Angeles gang member and serial killers whose faces had been plastered all over the newspapers and television. She was so nervous her stomach felt as if there were huge butterflies fluttering about in it. Then, off to her right, on the far wall, a thick steel door opened, and there, suddenly, was Richard Ramirez. She couldn't believe her eyes. She walked slowly toward him, as if he were a mirage that might disappear any moment. When people in the room realized who was abruptly among them, there was a hushed silence. Richard had not walked free among men, women, and children since the day of his arrest one hundred and thirty-two months ago. Eleven years, she thought. He looked like a spooked deer caught in the headlights of a speeding car. He had to wear glasses now. They were silver, large, and round, making his dark eyes appear huge, owl-like. He spotted Doreen and slowly moved toward her. As she got closer to him, Doreen felt as if she might faint. She reached out and embraced him. He flinched at her touch and led her to a corner of the room where there were two empty seats. Awkward, uncomfortable being around people, he sat. Doreen kept thinking he would disappear any moment. She couldn't stop crying, which annoyed Richard. And he kept telling her to put away the tears. I can't. I'm sorry. I'm just so happy. She reached out to caress his face. He recoiled. He was not, she'd later tell a journalist, accustomed to being touched affectionately. He again told her they would be married, and they talked about getting his family up from El Paso. Marriages on death row occur every four months and Richard promised her he would tell the prison to put him down for it. The next time they'd be able to wed, he said, was October 3rd. Before she knew it, her time was up. They embraced goodbye, and she said she'd be back the next day. Now that Richard was in E-Block, he could have contact visits from 8 to 2 p.m., Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The thought of being able to spend so much quality time with Richard made her head swim. When she arrived home, feeling as if she were walking a foot above the ground, she called Richard's sister Ruth in El Paso and told her the wonderful news that Richard had been moved and that they were going to be wed on the 3rd of October. Ruth, too, cried with joy, congratulating her soon-to-be sister-in-law. She, Ruth, knew how much Doreen wanted to marry her brother, and she was truly happy for her. She thought also that Doreen would be a positive influence on Richard certainly a world better than the other women, the Satanists and freaks, 
that had congregated around Richard since his arrest. They made plans for Ruth to come up a few days before the wedding day so they could spend some time together and Ruth would be able to hold her baby brother. As if it were yesterday, Ruth remembered Richard as a little boy who used to love to dance to the radio. Thinking of him like that, with his wide-eyed innocence and easy smile, made her heart roll over in her chest. When Ruth hung up with Doreen, she told her family the good news. Her brother Joseph said he wanted to go to the wedding, and he immediately arranged to take time off of work. His older daughter, now seventeen, wanted to come. True to his word, Richard did ask prison officials for permission to marry Doreen on October 3rd. They gave him a form to fill out, which he promptly did, listing Doreen as his fiancée. According to the California Penal Code, prisoners have the legal right to marry. The prison approved Richard's marriage, and his and Doreen's names were added to the list of ten inmates marrying that day, three from death row. It was quickly pointed out to a curious journalist by San Quentin's Public Relations Department that prisoners on death row do not have the right to conjugal visits. Doreen had to have an appropriate wedding dress and went from store to store searching for one. I wanted something plain, not a gown with a veil, anything like that. I've seen women in bridal gowns at the prison, and they, well, they look silly. Mine, I decided, would be simple and plain, and, of course, white. Doreen was, she would tell anyone who asked, a virgin, and she would, she said, wear a white dress proudly. Richard knew I'd never been with anyone else. I'm sure that's one of the reasons he asked me to marry him. A suitable dress, though, was much harder to come by than she imagined. She finally found the right dress at Macy's. Tasteful and appropriate, it was satin and lace, knee-length with a wide neck, and cost $145. Next, she had to shop for the rings. She drove to San Francisco for them and picked out two simple wedding bands, hers gold and Richard's platinum. When later asked why Richard told Doreen not to buy a gold ring for him, he said, because Satanists don't wear gold. The press got wind of the wedding on Saturday, September 22nd. The first reporter to contact Doreen was Marsha Ginsburg of the San Francisco Examiner. Doreen, for the most part, was very distrustful of reporters and what they thought of her impending marriage to Richard, but Marcia assured her that the peace would be respectful. Doreen agreed to an interview, and the story ran on the front page of the Examiner's Sunday edition. The headline read, Night Stalker Gets Virgin Bride, Death Row Wedding, and the article went on to describe Doreen as a Catholic who vowed to retain her virginity until marriage. Says she loved the Satan-revering Ramirez from the first time she saw him in 1986 and doesn't believe he committed the crimes. The examiner's story hit like a bomb in northern as well as southern California. It made all the wire services, and overnight the Night Stalker wedding was the hottest story on the West Coast. Reporters descended on Doreen like hungry vultures with no table manners, she would say. They soon found out where she lived and staked out her house, but she saw them and took off, checking into a nearby hotel. Not able to get an interview with her, the reporters started interviewing her neighbors, told them Doreen was marrying the Night Stalker, and asked what they thought of that. An outrage. She needs a good doctor. How does that cold-blooded killer get married after killing people's husbands and wives? What he should be is shot like a rabid dog not getting married. Goes to show you, our society is going to pot. It's a travesty of justice. It's a dirty, rotten sin, were some of the responses. Even the Los Angeles Times did a story, a front-page piece by Pam Warwick. The Times headline read, I saw something that captivated me. Jay Leno began doing skits on the upcoming wedding. He did four consecutive nights of jokes. On one show, Leno said, They had the actual wedding cake, and a big cake was dramatically wheeled onto the stage, and the groom on top of it had wild hair holding a long knife over his head. The audience howled. However, victims of stalker attacks were outraged that the person who stole their loved ones' lives, their dignity, who beat, raped, and robbed them, was getting married, was having a happy day. A system, one said, that allows such a perverted, disgraceful travesty to take place is truly wrong and should be changed, must be changed. It's an outrage. Indeed, victims as well as a lot of police officials, including Attorney General Dan Lundgren, phoned the prison and demanded the wedding be cancelled but they were all told it was Ramirez's right by law and they couldn't intercede. Governor Pete Wilson said he would look into changing the laws right away. CNN picked up the story and ran it every half hour on headline news. 
it became the lead-off piece on every news show on every channel, day and night. Doreen Leoy had become very hot news, and reporters searched high and low for her to no avail. On the days before the wedding, she couldn't even leave her hotel room. Richard's sister flew up and stayed with her. They watched all the news shows, and Doreen didn't like the things reporters were saying, but she knew she'd become a target, a big red bullseye, when word of her imminent death row wedding went out. Reporters soon found out she had a twin sister named Donna living in Burbank, and news trucks lined the block where her sister resided. They relentlessly phoned her and knocked on her door. The Burbank leader did a big cover story with a 1973 photograph from Doreen's yearbook at Burbank High. Donna had always been afraid that the public would find out about her sister's relationship, and now it had become world news, the last thing she'd wanted. She wouldn't leave her house, she was so ashamed, but she did tell Therese Moreau at the Burbank Leader during a phone interview, Our only connection is that we were born together, but other than that, we have no ties. She called her sister in San Rafael and told her she'd been disowned by the family. From this day on, you are not my sister, and you will not ever be allowed near my kids. That, of all things, hurt Doreen the most, the loss of her niece and nephew. She loved children, yearned to have some of her own, but knew that was an impossibility, and had made her sister's kids her own. After all, she'd later say, my sister worked and I used to watch them all the time. I loved them so much. But for Doreen, to be known as Mrs. Richard Ramirez was worth any sacrifice. Once I was married to Richard, I would have a new family. His family would become mine, she proudly told a journalist covering the wedding. The day before the wedding, which was scheduled for 8 a.m., the press descended on San Rafael, the home of San Quentin. CNN sent a crew, as did Inside Edition, hard copy. The Associated Press and all the local and Los Angeles news outlets. Doreen was so nervous she could barely sit still. She paced back and forth, watching the news shows about her and her wedding, and critiquing every piece sharply. It wasn't until 3 a.m. that she finally went to sleep, but was up at six, primping herself, putting on makeup, and doing her shoulder-length auburn hair in big, fluffy curls. The day was gray. Fog rolled in from the Bay of Skulls and hung a foot above the prison grounds. Doreen, with Ruth, Joseph, and his daughter, left the hotel for the prison at 7.45 a.m. She knew there would be a lot of press outside the prison, but she wasn't prepared for the hundreds of reporters all pushing and jostling to get at her, and the satellite news trucks all over the place. She turned her face and refused to answer questions tossed to her as she made her way through security at the front gate entrance. The prison public relations man, Lieutenant Vernell Crittenden, a polite professional with a smooth, easy way about him, had let the press set up microphones near the post office just outside San Quentin grounds. He told the reporters he'd hold a press conference after the ceremony and that he'd asked Doreen if she'd talk to them. The press were not allowed in the death row visiting area. Ramirez's marriage was getting much larger coverage than such lead news stories as Mark Furman's pleading guilty to perjury, even the Middle East crisis that October week. Doreen and the wedding party entered East Block under the watchful eye of a prison guard, cradling an assault rifle, wearing tortoise-shell mirrored glasses. When they entered the death row visiting area, Richard was summoned from his cell. On this, his wedding day, he was wearing a baggy, light blue, long-sleeved shirt. He appeared thin and moved with the sure grace of a cat. This was the first time since his arrest he'd be able to touch Joseph and Ruth. When he entered the room, they rushed to him and he embraced them both. They cried. The guards did not intercede. They knew the family was innocent of anything and didn't want to intrude on this very special moment for the Ramirez's. On death row at San Quentin, it's live and let live. If you behaved, the guards were polite and courteous. Doreen, never letting go of Richard's hand, moved to a corner of the visiting area along with the Ramirez's and sat on the hard plastic chairs. Joseph could not stop crying. He wished their father could be there to hold and embrace Richard welcome him back to the family. Richard couldn't get over how big Joseph's daughter had gotten. The last time he'd seen her was when she was just a little girl. She smiled as she looked at her infamous uncle, more like he was some kind of rock star than her father's brother. After all, Richard was just about the most famous person from El Paso, and his celebrity had not been lost on her. Soon, other death row inmates were brought in from their cells for their visits, and the room filled up with convicted killers— 
Richard made his niece cover her legs. She was wearing a short skirt, and he didn't want the other inmates looking at her bare legs. The ceremony took place at 11 a.m. Mr. L. Weister, a civil servant, would perform the ceremony. He was a tall, robust man with a big, healthy red face and thick gray hair. Doreen was very nervous. Richard wanted to get the whole thing over with and get back to his cell. An author and one of Richard's attorneys joined the wedding party. In front of an alpine mural one of the inmates had painted, the ceremony took place. It was short and sweet. They did not say until death do us part. They exchanged vows, wedding rings, and it was over in two minutes. Richard gave Doreen a peck on the lips. Vernell Crittenden asked Doreen if she would talk to the press. He said they would probably not leave her alone until she spoke to them. Richard told her she'd better give a statement, and she reluctantly agreed. Soon Richard went back to his cell, and Doreen and an author walked out together. The family stayed behind because none of them wanted to be on camera. When the press saw Doreen walking toward them in her white wedding dress, they hurried en masse toward the exit area, anxious to get footage of her for the news shows that evening. When she arrived at the gate, four huge prison guards gathered around Doreen and the author and walked them over to the makeshift podium as the reporters surrounded them. With resolve, Doreen stood behind the podium and addressed the throng of reporters, cameras, questions. The sky had cleared, and the bright October sun was in Doreen's eyes. Squinting, she told the press, "'Thank you all for your patience. I just want to say I'm very happy to be married to Richard. I ask you please to let me go in peace and enjoy my day.' She stepped down from the podium, got into a waiting car, and pulled away, speeding toward her destiny as Mrs. Richard Ramirez. Special Update of the Tenth Anniversary Edition Often people ask me why I wrote The Night Stalker. Why the hell would you want all that negative crap in your head? This is a long, involved story, but to make it short, in 1992 I was intent on writing a novel about serial murder that truly would portray what goes on inside a serial killer's mind before, during, and after a murder. I plan to simply lay out in a compelling, suspenseful way the building blocks that make a serial murderer. I am a staunch believer in doing research, getting out in the world and seeing for myself what's going on, and talking personally to the players who know the truth. Toward that end, I began contacting convicted killers on different death rows around the country, intent upon shining light on this little-known dark phenomenon, amongst whom were John Gacy and Ted Bundy. Some were interested in talking with me, others weren't. Though little by little I began piecing together the hardcore realities, the building blocks, if you will, of what serial murder is about. My friend and agent, Matt Bialer, suggested I contact Richard Ramirez, the notorious Night Stalker, who in 1985 held the entire state of California in a grip of fear unparalleled in the annals of crime history. I am a born and bred New Yorker, and didn't live in Los Angeles when the Stalker was, at will, entering people's homes in the middle of the night, tearing, ripping, beating, and shooting them to death. But I did remember how incredibly brutal his crimes were, and that he was a Satanist, which I found particularly interesting and compelling. I wrote Ramirez. He responded. We corresponded by mail for a few months. I invited him to call Collect, which he did. Quite to my surprise, I found him to be open and forthright, and oddly enough, he possessed a keen sense of humor. He agreed to meet with me, and I was soon on a plane to San Francisco— and met Richard at the San Francisco County Jail, where he was being held because of crimes he was charged with in San Francisco, the rape of Barbara Pan and murder of her 62-year-old husband, Peter Pan. I had press credentials and was able to meet with Richard one-on-one -on -one in a small conference room. I arrived first. It took about twenty minutes for him to be brought down. When he got there, I was surprised at how big and fluid-moving he was, cat-like, and his hands were enormous, the largest ones I'd ever seen. These were, I knew, hands that had done terrible, unspeakable things. They were like two malevolent vultures fluttering about before him as he spoke. I had seen crime scene photos of the Night Stalker's victims. Heads had been nearly severed, eyes cut out. Some victims were beaten so badly they were not recognizable as the people they once had been. We talked for a few hours. Richard agreed to tell me the truth. I returned to New York and wrote a proposal for the book, sold it to Kensington Publishing, and I was soon back on a plane to California. Richard, however, had been moved to San Quentin's death row and was only able to have visits through plexiglass. 
Friends of mine in the NYPD Police Academy, where I had lectured numerous times, wrote a letter to the warden of the prison on my behalf, and thus I was able to sit alone in a small room with Richard and pick his brain. Altogether, I spent three weeks with him from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day. I made it a point never to judge Richard or talk down to him. I treated him just like another guy, and like that I was able to get inside his head with a flashlight and see what was going on. I found him to be surprisingly bright and well-read. He clearly had a deep, reflective, introspective side, which in my mind made him all the more interesting. Here now, for the first time, is part of my death row interview with Richard Munoz Ramirez, California's dreadful, infamous Night Stalker. Carlo, let's give it a couple seconds for the thing to start. Okay, it's February 8th, about 9 a.m. I'm inside of San Quentin Prison's death row with Richard Ramirez. So, Richard, we'll be discussing some topics. You were just talking about death and what it means to society. Would you continue? Ramirez, uh, now I'm freezing up. Carlo, so you find death funny? Ramirez, no, I just think society is fascinated with death. Instead of giving it just a little part in this project you're doing, you should devote enough space to it because... Carlo, what about How We Die? What's that about? The book How We Die you told me about. Ramirez, it talks about how people take death in. Today, today's society. Long ago, it was taken as a spiritual thing because birth and death are two very major events, not only in the person being born and also dying, but in the people around them and the legacy that we leave behind. In today's society, it's more of the scientific and medical aspects that are most talked about in death. And in this book, it tells about how different people die and different ways of dying. Carlo, different cultures? Ramirez, different cultures, I believe. I've read reviews on it. I haven't read the book myself. I've read reviews, and it says there is such a thing as a death rattle. There is such a thing, and it is a spasm of the voice box. Carlo, you mean it's like the last breath? Ramirez, yes. Tape shuts off. Carlo, about this death rattle, I've read about it a lot myself, but I've never heard it. Have you heard it? Ramirez gets up and starts to walk out. Carlo, hey, come on back. Ramirez, no, I haven't heard it. Carlo, describe, Ramirez, what I think it would sound like. Carlo, yeah, man. Ramirez, it's the last breathing out. It's one last breath out. I don't think it's one's last breath in. Carlo, the last breath out. Ramirez, right. Carlo, and what does it sound like? Ramirez, I assume, I suppose it, whoever is witnessing such a thing, it is sort of like the spirit leaving the body at the same moment this breath is given. But, uh, okay, some people actually fight, cling to life. Some people even ask permission from their loved ones if to die. See, because they don't want to leave their loved ones. Carlo, what does the rattle sound like, and why? It's the last breath going out, but does it affect the voice box? Ramirez, it is a spasm of the voice box. Carlo, it's a spasm of the voice box, I see. Ramirez, yes, I would assume it doesn't sound like any breath we take during our lifetimes. It is sort of like when a baby is born and he is slapped on the bottom, he takes a deep breath in. These things are to me mystical and spiritual, in that we don't experience them every day. When these things happen, we take notice. We have to. I don't think it's possible to not detect such things unless you're really stupid. Carlo, speaking of spirituality, let's talk about Satanism. There's been a lot in the press, Richard, about your devotion to and your affiliation with Satan. Can you tell me a bit about what Satan means to you? Ramirez, what Satan means to me. Satan is a stabilizing force in my life. It gives me a reason to be. It gives me an excuse to rationalize. There is a part of me that believes he really does exist. I have my doubts, but we all do, about many things. Carlo, when did you first turn away from Christianity? As I know, you were brought up a Christian and turned to Satanism. Ramirez, from 1970. Well, throughout my childhood and up to the time I was 18 years old, I believed in God. 17, 18 years old. Then, for two or three years, I became sort of like an atheist. I didn't believe in anything. When I reached the age of twenty, twenty-one, thereabouts, I met a guy in jail, and uh, he told me about Satan, and I picked it up from there. Richard had been arrested for stealing a car. I read books, and I studied, and I examined who I was and what my feelings were. Also, my actions. 
Just like the Hezbollah and different terrorist religious organizations around the world, it is a driving force that motivates them to do things, and they believe in it wholeheartedly. It had the same effect on my life. Carlo. In other words, their spirituality was what was the driving force in their life, and Satan became, in a sense, your spirituality and the driving force behind you. Ramirez. Yeah, exactly. Carlo. Richard, do you believe that Satan helps people who... Tape shuts off. Richard, do you believe that Satan helps people to be able to do things they wouldn't normally do? For instance, in Matamoros, Mexico, Adolfo Constanzo killed many people, and he was committing human sacrifices to protect the Hernandez drug cartel down there from the police. And he fervently believed that Satan would protect him, and so therefore made human sacrifices. Do you feel that kind of reasoning has any place? Ramirez. Place in Satanism? Carlo. Yeah. Ramirez. I don't know the structure of hell itself, or demons, or demonology, but I do know when you tamper with witchcraft, when you tamper with Satanism, be it voodoo, Carlos, Santoria, Tayo, Mayombe, Ramirez, yeah, any type of sacrifices or contacting the spirits, you're dealing with things that are very delicate and dangerous. I myself am no warlock, I'm not a wizard, I'm not one of these types of individuals that knows his witchcraft from A to Z, but I have heard and read of instances where people end up getting killed and, uh, arrested for tampering with the wrong demons and not using the right types of, uh, the right process of sacrifices and the right types of rituals. You have to know what you're doing. Everything from ropes to chalices. Carlo. Everything has to be done right. Ramirez. Exactly. From what I know, certain symbols like pentagrams are supposed to protect you from the demons themselves. Carlo. Yeah. You were seen in court once with a pentagram inside your hand, and you held it up and showed it to the press and the audience. Why did you do that? Did you feel that it would protect you? Or were you just making a statement that you were in alliance with the devil? Ramirez. Yes, it was a statement that I was in alliance with the evil that is inherent in human nature, and that was who I was. Carlo. Richard, tell us about the Marquis de Sade. I know that since you've been incarcerated— just about eight years, you've been reading an awful lot, and one of the things you've read is the Marquis de Sade. Richard. De Sade had a large, um, a large, somewhat large following in his time. He had a philosophy, a way of thinking that was contrary to what people of his time thought, and eventually he paid the price for it. They placed him in an insane asylum where he died. His belief was that there was pleasure in painful sex. He wrote many stories, short stories. One of my favorites was Justine. He talked about the governments and how they were oppressors. Carlo. Hypocritical? Ramirez. Huh? Carlo. And hypocritical? Ramirez. Hypocritical. Takers away. They took away rights that belonged to individuals. Carlos. Sexual rights? Sexual freedoms? Ramirez. Yes. Carlos. But essentially de Sade was a sadist, right? Ramirez. Yes, yes. He liked to inflict pain. Carlo. He liked to inflict pain. Ramirez. Inflict pain. Carlo, right. Do you feel he was ahead of his time, in a sense? Do you feel he knew something about human nature and explored it that other people seem to deny? Ramirez, well, I believe that, as time goes by, mankind will find new and different ways of living. Let's see, and, uh, he may have been ahead of his time, or maybe he just came about at the right time with his ways of thinking. Carlo, I believe they had the death penalty in the time period de Sade was alive. Ramirez, I think it was the guillotine, Carlo, the guillotine. Ramirez, I think this, he, uh, all this took place in or about France. Carlo, they did not give him a death sentence for his practices, but they indeed locked him up for the entirety of his natural life. But, Ramirez, because of the stories he wrote. Carlo, because of the stories he wrote? Ramirez, I believe. Carlo, they went against society. But what are your feelings about the death sentence, Richard? Tape shuts off. So, Richard, over the last ten years or so, there's been a lot in the press, and there indeed have been a lot of people arrested all over the country for committing what amounts to a series of murders. These individuals are called serial killers because they kill in a series of crimes. Would you tell us why you think there's such a phenomenal number of serial killers being identified and captured these days? Ramirez, you asked me why I think there's an abundance of serial killers, right? Carlo, in society today... Ramirez, right, in society today. I believe that, uh, 
tension in the workplace and also lack of jobs and the way families are are brought up and child abuse. Sure, it's like a recipe. Drugs, poverty, child abuse. All this creates angry individuals. And then again, lust killers. People tend to lump all serial killers in the same category, but there are different types of serial killers, as you know. Carlo, what are the different types of serial killers, Richard? Ramirez, some serial killers kill prostitutes. Some serial killers kill young boys. Uh, some serial killers kill homeless people. The only common denominator is that they kill people over a span of time. They keep on killing, and, uh, Carlo, the phenomenon of serial killers, is it a sexual thing too, Richard? Is sex part of the crimes? Ramirez, sex? For some serial killers, sure. For some, it is the very act of killing another human being that is, that, uh, that is sexual to them. It's a bloodlust, I guess you can say. Carlo, do you think a person who becomes like that is responsive to a bloodlust because of genetic propensity, or because of environmental influences, or both? Ramirez, both. Very good. You ought to be... Tape shuts off. Carlo, you think it's a combination of genetic and environmental influences? Ramirez, yes. Serial killers, and most killers in general, have a dead conscience. Carlo, when you say a dead conscience, that means they don't respond... Ramirez, no morals, no scruples, no conscience. They are, uh, they sometimes, some of them don't even care if they live or die themselves, and they are just the walking dead. Carlo, the first really noted serial killer was Jack the Ripper. Ramirez, yeah. Carlo, he killed seven prostitutes in London in the 1800s. Ramirez, yes. Carlo, I think there were other serial killers loose and participating in those types of activities, but they just never got the press that Jack got. Ramirez, Jack the Ripper created an aura around himself, or maybe the media did. Carlo, the press. Ramirez, but it was one of mystique and uh, a sinister character who was never identified. I remember in my childhood reading about him, and I was intrigued by the way this uh, killer, Jack the Ripper, was depicted. Where's a black cloak? Carlo, right. Ramirez, fog, Carlo, right. Ramirez, nighttime. Most of the time, the media tends to, if not glorify, but paint him in a way that is very sinister and diabolical, and to some of us, that is appealing. Certainly it was to me. Tape shuts off. Carlo, why do you think it was particularly appealing to you? It seems appealing to everybody. Ramirez, well, not everybody. Carlo, people are interested, though. Ramirez, Sure, I mean, they're interested, they're curious, but I don't think you could call it, I don't think they would call it appealing. I think people are, some people are fascinated by looking at how other people, such as killers, become who they are and how there are different types of people in the world. Certainly, madmen in the world are something to look at because they are very, they are a minority in numbers. Carlo, do you think Jack the Ripper was a madman? Ramirez, a madman? Carlo, yeah. Ramirez, some say he was a doctor. I couldn't say. Carlo, was he a psychopath? Ramirez, a psychopath? Carlo, yes. Ramirez, I could not tell you. I couldn't say. From what I've read about him, certainly he, if you came into his hands, and if you were a woman, certainly you would think this guy was mad. He would butcher you. He would cut your organs out and stuff and lay them right beside you in a very precise manner. A uh, madman, yes, there are certain types of mental illnesses, mental disorders that would characterize him as a madman. Carlo, Richard, how would you suggest that people can become, can avoid becoming the victim of a serial killer? Ramirez, there are ways. Carlo, how can society protect itself? Ramirez, there is no protection against a mass murderer, if you will. A mass murderer will come onto the scene whether it be a post office, supermarket, restaurant, an open fire. Unless the bullets miss you, you will become a statistic. A serial killer, if he's looking for a certain type of women, certain type of victims, and you happen to match his preference, it is possible that you could get away. You could even help in apprehending him. But it is said serial killers are very intelligent, otherwise they would not... Carlo, they would not be able to commit crimes over a long period of time. Ramirez, exactly. What constitutes a serial killer right now is four murders or more, according to the FBI. Four murders is not that many, but that's what characterizes a serial killer. I suppose to avoid being a victim is, Carlo, being aware of the environment, 
being aware of what's around you, Ramirez, taking precautions, locking your doors, having your keys ready when you open doors, being on guard. Carlo, your keys ready when? Ramirez, when you open doors. Carlo, look over your shoulder. Ramirez, yes, of course. One cannot live one's life like that in today's society, always aware. Especially if you haven't already been the victim of a crime. When you were the victim of a crime, a violent crime such as an assault or mugging, then throughout your life that will be at the back of your mind. Those types of people are more aware than those who have never been the victim of any type of crime. But sure, a serial killer takes opportunities in the victims being in the right place at the right time. He takes advantage of that. Carlo. In other words, people are a victim of circumstance. But how can a woman be more insulated and more protected from a serial killer? Ramirez, it's not possible, because to detectives, to apprehend a serial killer, they need to get inside the mind of the serial killer. Normal, ordinary people do not think like a serial killer. They have no conception of what is going on in a killer's mind, how he operates. They don't read, which is rightfully so. If they have a life to live, they're not going to spend a lot of time reading up on killers if that's not in their interest. Certainly, serial killers and killers have the advantage in that they use the element of surprise, uh, darkness, and such things as this. Carlo. I see one of the conventional ways police manage to apprehend people who kill one another is usually the victim is known by their killer. But in serial murders, the victim is not known by their killer, and therefore the conventional aspects that help homicide detectives tape shuts off. Do you think one of the reasons why serial killers are so successful in their crimes and are able to go on for years and years is because the police are not equipped to deal with this new phenomenon of serial murder, in that they don't have systems set up to help identify, categorize, and apprehend? Ramirez, once they have a suspect, because of the progress that has been made in forensics and all the new other evidence-gathering techniques, once they have a suspect, there is a good chance they will catch the serial killer, because we all leave particles of ourselves wherever we are. So, yes, it is difficult for the police. They are at a disadvantage, because these are stranger-to-stranger stranger crimes, and it will always be so. I don't think that can change. Carlo, you mentioned that people always leave a bit of themselves behind, and with today's technology, it makes it somewhat easier for them to identify serial killers. In an instance where a naked body is left out in a field, and uh, there are no clues left behind, it becomes virtually impossible, doesn't it? Ramirez, yes. Carlo, right. Can you suggest, Richard, to women out there? Ramirez, okay. There is no set rule, there is no proof positive that once you come into contact with a serial killer that you will survive the encounter. There is no assurance of any of that because every individual is different and the same goes for every serial killer. Some serial killers will let you live if you talk to them, if you get to them, if they get to know you. Some serial killers will take pity while others won't. This not only applies to serial killers but killers in general. Some killers are hell-bent on just killing regardless of circumstances or situation. They have made up their minds even before they encounter you, and uh, there is no way out of it. The victim is at a disadvantage because she or he does not know the mind of the killer or what he is thinking. Carlo, you once told me that— Tape shuts off. About what they call the devil's dandruff, cocaine, which is really prevalent in society today. What are your thoughts on cocaine, Richard? Ramirez. I love it. Laughs. No, well, if you look at it in broad views, it's a supply and demand type of thing. I saw a show not too long ago where the CIA, I believe, actually had been working with this stuff to get arms to the Contras and stuff like that. That's on a big scale. But on a street level, I think cocaine is addictive, and I think it's very harmful to the body. Carlo. What about to the mind? Ramirez. To the mind, sure. It depends on how you ingest it. If you mainline it, I've heard and read that it can cause brain clots that lead to strokes. Sure, it's harmful, but the sense of pleasure it gives is very profound. Carlo, what would you compare that sense of pleasure to, Richard? Ramirez, there is nothing, to me anyway, that comes near it. Carlo, you once described it to me as an intense euphoric heat, a rush, a light tingling that goes to the brain. Ramirez, exactly. Carlo, your feelings about capital punishment in this country are very profound. Ramirez, you better take away that CIA shit. Tape shuts off. Carlo, 
Your feelings, your opinions about the death penalty in this country are profound. Would you tell me your feelings about the death sentence? Ramirez. As far as the death penalty is concerned, I think it is a power against the powerless. There are not many millionaires on death row. A lot of people choose to die, though. A lot of people, a lot of murder defendants, actually get on the witness stand and tell the jury that they want the death penalty. They would rather die than spend the rest of their lives in prison. The death penalty is, to me, is not a very dignified way. They should have gladiator arenas like in the old Roman times, because what I... It's just, you know, it doesn't seem right. Carlo, do you think that the government does not have the right to take a life? Or do you feel that in certain crimes... Ramirez, well, they're doing it for the victims. If the relatives of the victims want the killer's blood, uh, I think one of the relatives should pull the plug, the switch. But they leave it up to the state, and uh, that is something to look at. I've given it a lot of thought, and I've written some things down, but I don't have... Carlo, how do you feel about it only being in 13 states, as opposed to it being in every state across the board? Ramirez, right. Well, the way crime is going nowadays, it'll probably end up being in a lot of states in the future. People in different parts of the country feel differently about it, and it's ultimately up to the people in every state. They vote for it, and some states vote yes, and some vote no. They don't want it. Carlo. Richard, do you think the death penalty is a deterrent? Ramirez. No. No. Most criminals, the majority of criminals, kill for money, to get money for drugs. Some are not in their right minds. Some are drunk. They kill for greed, lust, and things like this, and, uh, so no. I don't think it acts as a deterrent, because a criminal rarely thinks about his own death when committing a crime where such emotions as rage and hatred take hold of him. So very little thought is given to his own demise when such feelings are raging inside of him at the time that he commits a murder or a crime. Tape shuts off. See, governments kill with impunity, and sometimes they choose killers to go out and kill people for them. They justify it. They rationalize it. They pin medals on killers. Well, if you don't have a license to kill for the government, they won't pin a medal on you, but they'll put you in the gas chamber. Carlo, do you think the gas chamber is cruel and unusual punishment? If a state has to have the death penalty, which way do you think is the best way to go? The electric chair, lethal injection, or the gas chamber? Ramirez, that is up to the individual on which way he wants to go. Carlo, Richard, as we sit here, you've got nineteen death sentences on your head. Ramirez, yeah. Carlo, if, after your appeals are all exhausted and the day comes when you have to be executed by the state of California, which way would you choose? Ramirez, me, myself? I don't really care, because death is death, and it is said that no man knows his own death. Sure, for a few minutes you might feel it, but then you're gone. I've really not given much thought to that. To me, death is death, and whichever way I choose to go out, I'll choose it when the time comes, if there is a choice open to me. Carlo. Certain of the most notorious serial killers produced by society are Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Henry Lee Lucas. What do you think of a guy like Ted Bundy? Ramirez. Say what? Carlo. What do you think about Ted Bundy? Ramirez. See, when serial killers come up in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, these are media centers of the world. That's why more attention is paid to these guys, because of where they are located at. I've heard of serial killers in the Midwest who you've never even heard of, but they've got twenty, thirty murders under their belts. As far as my views on Ted Bundy, was that your question? Ted Bundy was intelligent. He, he grew up and he found, in his mind, his own pleasures. These were his pleasures. A man's own pleasures are his own business, I think. He, he liked to do what he did, which was kidnap women, have sex with them, torture them and kill them and whatever else. On the outside, to whomever he met on the street, he seemed like a very normal man, one you would never suspect of doing such things. Carlo. It seems that many serial killers on the outside seem very innocuous, like the guy next door. For instance, Jeffrey Dahmer. Of all the things he looks like, he does not look like a killer. What are your feelings about a fellow like Jeffrey Dahmer, who on the outside seems so normal, but inside is far from normal? Ramirez. I guess you could say, like, the balances of the mind, the chemistry, the psyche of a killer, a wolf in sheep's clothing, and he has learned to perfect it. Uh, this is a guy you'd think it'd be okay to go to his house, have a drink, and smoke a joint, but it would be your last drink because you'd find yourself handcuffed, and the next thing you know, this guy would be eating you. This is a very, uh, very interesting thing to look at in life. 
These types of individuals, because they're extraordinary, it's sort of like a strange car, a strange house. You ask yourself, how was it built? How did it get here? I've always been fascinated with killers and crime and murder and death. I suppose I started when I was twelve years old, the murder of Jesse by Richard's cousin Mike. I started reading crime detective magazines and stuff like this, and even the pages had a certain scent to them, a certain smell to them. It was very strange. It gave me a strange feeling. Carlo, can you explain the feeling? Ramirez, strange, because I had experienced the death of people I knew at an early age. I was four or five years old when I knew about a death of a friend of my father's. Then, when I was nine, I went to my grandfather's funeral. It's just, death had a very profound effect on me when I saw it. Death of my dog, death of a pet animal, just death. Carlo, do you feel that there's a life after death, that there really is a heaven and hell? Ramirez, I couldn't say for sure what there is, you know. I can't sit here and tell you, yes, there's this or that, because I'm not sure. I can only speculate. Carlo, well, what do you speculate? Ramirez, I think there is a divine force that is out there. I also believe there's a malevolent force that is out there. Then again, they could be one and the same. I also believe some in reincarnation. I mean, how do these child prodigies come about? A young child being able to play the piano very well at the age of three years old. Everything is open. I have an open mind. Carlo, do you feel that evil can be reincarnated? Ramirez, I hope so. Carlo, like a killer, like Jack Ripper, could come back in the form of Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer? Ramirez, yes, especially if Satan grants that wish to the individual. If Lucifer gives his unworthy servant that opportunity, that chance, Satan would be saying to me right now, Yes, you are unworthy. Author's note, because he was caught. Carlo, Richard, what are your feelings and opinions about women who are drawn to mass murderers and serial killers? It seems to be a phenomenon, somewhat prevalent in society today. Ramirez, a short comment on serial killers is that, is it a recipe that is created in their existence, or is it a bad seed, chemistry, genetics? Carlo, is it environmental, you're saying? What do you think? Ramirez, that's a good question. Is there such a thing as a bad seed when a baby is born? Is he already a serial killer, already made? Or is he created by his own deeds and feelings throughout his life and his environment? Carlo, it's a new field of science, but the connection between genetic propensity towards violence as opposed to our environmental influences, indeed it's been proven and established that without certain chemical balances, people have much greater proclivity towards violence, sexual deviance, drug abuse, alcoholism. Ramirez, I've heard that a lot of serial killers, John Gacy, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, have had head trauma, head injuries when they were young. They were knocked out, and so, like I told you the other day, I saw a show, 48 Hours, where this doctor came out saying that there are pieces of brain areas of the brain that are not functioning right, so that's always a possibility. Carlo, getting back to women who are drawn to serial killers and mass murderers, what are your feelings about that? Why do you think that happens? Ramirez, women. When I was on the street, I was a loner. I stayed to myself. I really had no contact with people. It's only been since I've been in prison that I have really developed relationships with people, and mostly women, though I now see that they have feelings, they have emotions, I mean, I always did, but I suppose I locked it out most of the time. I didn't think about other people's feelings and needs. Carlo, these women that you're making reference to, do you think they were drawn to you because of your notoriety? Ramirez, oh, they're drawn to me for all sorts of reasons. Carlo, such as what, Richard? Ramirez, to get something out of me, to question me. Maybe they're intrigued by murder or murderers. Some are religious, some are sympathetic, you know. They have sympathy for me. Some come just so they can tell their friends they came and talked to me. They've come to me from different walks of life, these women. Carlo, since your incarceration, which has been eight years now, how many women would you say have come to visit you? Ramirez, nine years come this August. What was your question? Carlo, how many women have come to visit you since you've been arrested? Ramirez, it doesn't matter. Carlo, six hundred? Ramirez, it doesn't matter. Carlo, it doesn't matter. Tape shuts off. Okay. Tape shuts off. Okay. Do you think that child abuse has anything to do with the development of serial killers? Ramirez. 
Oh, it has everything to do with development of all malfunctions in the adult life. Child abuse in its many forms can uh, produce many forms of uh, life's miseries and griefs as an adult, you know, mental disorders and such. Me, myself, I've never experienced child abuse. Carlo, you're laughing now. Why? Ramirez, no, wait a minute. Tape shuts off. Not more so than anybody else, Phil. Carlo, well, so... Tape shuts off. You say a lot of people think serial killers should be studied, Ramirez. Right. Carlo, what do you mean? Ramirez. Well, I've seen on TV a lot of people speak and say that serial killers should be studied. Me, myself, I care about my life, and already my life went downhill. It's already in the shit right now. I don't really give a fuck, you know what I'm saying? I don't concern myself with those types of decisions anymore because they have no effect on me. I'm on death row. So whatever society wants to do, they can do, you know? The legislators, the senators, all the lawmakers, they're the ones that make the decisions and the laws. Carlo. What's it like living on death row, Richard? Ramirez. Death row? Carlo. Yeah. Ramirez. It is monotonous. It is boring. Because it is so boring, it breeds tension. There's a lot of tension in here. Frustration. You never get used to it. I myself only tolerate it. I have acquaintances, no friends. Every day it's the same routine. The walls close in on you. It is like uh, some people, though. Every individual has his own program, has his own way of dealing with being incarcerated. Some can, it doesn't affect them at all, or so they say. Me, myself, I try and not let the situation deteriorate my mind to a point where I will go crazy, where I will lose a sense of reality. I always try and keep a sense of reality with me. Uh, sometimes it feels very strange to wake up and be in that cage, in that cell, and uh, I don't think man was meant to be locked up in such a way. Maybe they had a thing going on in the Western days where they would just lynch the guy right off the bat. See what I'm saying? But they don't do it now like that. Carlo, do you think that's a better answer? Ramirez, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that is what they used to do back then. I'm sure the people they hung back then would have wanted to live in a cage, see what I'm saying? Especially if they were innocent. But they were lynched anyway. Carlo. How many hours a day are you actually in your cell? Ramirez. Well, like I told you, the program they have me on now, which is maximum security, I got out 16 hours a week. So, Carlo, are you locked up 24 hours a day? Ramirez. On some days, some days, yeah. I go outside for about five hours on Tuesday. I got out five hours on Friday, and I go out five hours on Sunday. The rest of the time I am on death row. Everybody has a single man cell. Carlo, how's the food on death row? Ramirez, edible. Carlo, are you able to eat with the prisoners on death row, or do you? Ramirez, they feed us in our cages. Carlo, Richard, a lot's been said about you listening to heavy metal music with satanic overtones. What influences musically inspired you? Ramirez. Well, you might do some research on this, but I think it is believed that Satan was the one that made music in heaven before he got thrown down into the pit. I'm not sure. A lot of religious people think that Satan, melodies, people believe Elvis and the Beatles with their gyrations and the beat of their music were conductive to a trance, like a uh, form of, uh, for people that they would become possessed with the music. Like I said, me myself, I'm not sure of it, but I have an opinion. But I don't think music drives anybody to do anything. People, uh, when they're feeling bad, they listen to a song and they feel better. Carlo. When you were on the outside, Richard, before you got arrested, you listened to a lot of heavy metal music. Did it influence you? Ramirez. Influence me? It gave me a good sense of being, but the being of what I was was already there before the music. The music just inspired me. It gave me inspiration. It reflected my feelings. Carlo, what was some of the music that inspired you and reflected your feelings? Tell us. Ramirez, hmm, heavy beats. Carlo, like what groups? What album? Ramirez, ACDC, uh, Back in Black album, Highway to Hell album, uh, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Judas Priest. Carlo, what about Eyes Without a Face? Ramirez, Iron Maiden. Carlo, this music you listened to a lot when you were on the outside? Ramirez, yes, I would have a Walkman all the time, and I would take cassettes with me to play in the cars. Uh, so, that was it. Carlo, 
There was a song by ACDC called The Night Stalker. Ramirez, Night Prowler. Carlo, The Night Prowler. Did you used to listen to that? Ramirez, No, Phil, I didn't. Hysterical laughter. Tape shuts off. Carlo, So, did you listen to a uh, Night Prowler? Ramirez, No, I listened to Billy Idol, Flesh for Fantasy. You know, lyrics that would reflect my feelings. He has a song called Eyes Without a Face that he says uh, he's on a bus, which I was always on a bus most of the time, and he says that he's reading murder books to stay hip. Uh, he's on a psychedelic trip, you know? Carlo, so basically you uh, listen to this kind of music, the heavy metal, for entertainment. Entertainment to clear your head and to, Ramirez, give me a sense of well-being. Carlo, give you a sense of well-being. Do you think young children, young teenagers actually, should be kept away from music like that? Ramirez, no, because I believe that a person that a person that is destined or inclined to be evil will be evil with or without music. Music, I don't believe, has a part in anything. Carlo, even young, impressionable minds? Ramirez, yes, yes, because I believe that it is the environment that will determine who a child will grow up to be. Carlo, Richard, when you were ten years old, Ramirez, or thereabouts, Carlo, or thereabouts, your cousin Mike had just returned from Vietnam, and he was stressed because of the war, from being in three tours of duty, and got into an argument one day with his wife and shot her and killed her. You happened to be there that day. Did you tell us how that made you feel, to see that, and later on, when you went back with your dad? Ramirez, well, yes, it was, Carlo, how old were you, ten or eleven? Ramirez, Thereabouts, I'm not sure, ten or eleven. I can't say for sure. I was probably eleven. It was a sunny day. I had been with Mike that day, hanging out, and uh, he got to his house about three p.m. I was with him. The incident happened. Uh, he was arrested, taken to jail. His Mike's mother called my father and my mother a week or two later, asking them if they would go into the house and get some things for them. I remember me and my father and my mother going. We parked the truck. Me and my father went inside, not knowing what we would find. Tape shuts off. Ramirez. It was the strangest experience. I mean, being there after Jesse had been killed, the the aura of it was still kind of like hanging in the air. It was kind of mystical. I could still smell her blood. Sunlight was streaming into the room, and you could see particles of dust in the golden beams of sunlight. Carlo. What kind of effect did this all have on you, you think? Ramirez. Strange. I mean, to see something like that. The line between life and death right there in front of me. Intense. When she went down, I saw it all in slow motion. Carlo, he shot her in front of you, Richard? Ramirez, yes, me and my two cousins, his two kids, boys, three and six. Carlo, how close? Ramirez, a few feet away. Carlo, your cousin Mike also killed, raped and killed women over in Nam, didn't he? Ramirez, yes. Carlo, how do you know? Ramirez, he told me all about it, and I saw Polaroid photos he had. Carlo, please tell us about that, Richard. Ramirez, he had a shoebox in his closet. It was filled with these Polaroid photographs of women and girls he took into the jungle and did. Carlo, did? Ramirez, raped and killed them. Sisters, even a family, two daughters and the mother. He tore off their clothes and had them naked, tied to a tree. In another one there, they were dead. He cut off their heads. Carlo, did he rape them too? Ramirez, yeah, of course, while they were tied to the tree, all three of them, in front of each other. Carlo, he told you this? Ramirez, yeah, told me all about it, exactly what he did. We used to go for joy rides all around El Paso, smoke pot, listen to the radio, and he'd tell me what he did with the women. Carlo, you know how many he raped and killed? Ramirez, over twenty for sure. He had photographs of them. Young girls, mostly, but all ages. They were the enemy. They were, you know, V.C. No one gave a fuck. Carlo, what kind, what kind of effect did this have on you? Ramirez, heavy. I used to think about them. I mean, all that. Carlo, sexually, Richard? Ramirez, fuck yeah, of course, sexually. It was all about sex. Carlo, they were a turn-on, the photographs? Ramirez, yes, very much so. Carlo, do you think seeing those pictures helped you walk the road you eventually traveled? Ramirez, it's hard to say. I'm not blaming my cousin for anything. I want that clear. 
This just happened. Carlo. He also taught you about jungle warfare, guerrilla fighting, how to kill people, correct? Ramirez. Yes, he did. How to use a knife, where to shoot someone, how to be invisible at night, the whole enchilada. Carlo. Invisible? How? Ramirez. Wear all black, even shoes and socks, with a black hat with the brim pulled down to cover your face so no light can reflect off it. Avoiding the reflection of light, that's the key. Carlo. Interesting. Ramirez. For me, it was all very interesting. I was already stealing. I mean, getting into people's houses at night and stealing things and all that helped. Carlo. Did he teach you how to shoot? Ramirez. No, my dad did that. But my cousin told me where to hit someone for the maximum effect. Carlo. Where? Ramirez. The head, of course. Carlo. Any particular spot? Ramirez. Above the ear. Carlo. And the knife. I mean, what is the best place to use it? Ramirez. Across the throat. It's called a stab slash wound. That is, you drive the point into the side of the neck, then pull it across the throat. That cuts both the windpipe and the arteries. Always lethal. Carlo. I see. Tape shuts off. For me, one of the more bizarre, compelling aspects of Richard Ramirez's mind-numbing, violent story was the individuals who were so drawn to him when he was arrested. In my research for the book, I did interview many of these women and wrote about them in The Night Stalker. One of Richard's many women back then, in 1993 through 1994, was Doreen Leoy. Doreen did eventually marry Richard in a death row wedding, which I attended. The ceremony took place in the death row visiting room. As always, other inmates were having visits, and they all became respectfully quiet when the ceremony began. Here were many other notorious serial killers, heavily tattooed gangbangers, stone-faced, overly serious Aryans, all becoming quiet and still for Richard's wedding. It took place in a cafeteria-type room, one hundred by one hundred feet, plastic chairs bolted to the floor, vending machines lined the east wall. For me, it was kind of surreal to see all these stone-cold killers sitting there, quiet, like they were in a church or some such place, because Richard was having a wedding. The pastor, I noticed during the vows, didn't say the line, Until death do you part. When I later asked him why, he said, That would be bad form to say here, on death row. Yes, of course. Doreen Leoy had been one of many women who had been drawn to Richard after his arrest. They lined up at the Los Angeles County Jail during Richard's tumultuous fourteen-month trial, hoping to see Richard have a visit with him. While free, Richard had to pay for sex from lowly downtown Los Angeles streetwalkers. Now Richard suddenly was Rudolph Valentino, Mick Jagger, Brad Pitt, and the Boogeyman all rolled into one. Richard, more than anyone else, was stunned and surprised so many females found him so totally, completely irresistible. As per his instructions, some of them, indeed most of them, didn't wear underwear and would sneak him peeks at their excited charms as he masturbated himself. The old hand-in-the-pocket trick. They came in all shapes and sizes, colors and nationalities, tall and short and fat and skinny, teenage girls, women in their twenties and thirties, some of them exceedingly attractive, from all walks of society, secretaries, dental hygienists, teachers, college and high school students, a few strippers, a bank employee, postal workers, hookers, and a Satanist or two. One of the latter was Zena LaVey, the daughter of the once infamous, now deceased Anton LaVey, the founder of the San Francisco-based Church of Satan. Why, the question begs to be answered, were all these women so drawn to a cunning, remorseless, brutal serial killer, a man on trial for murdering seven women, nearly beating to death five others, raping old ladies, beating and kicking and sending them to the hospital barely alive. The crimes were committed across the wide expanse of Los Angeles County, as far south as Mission Viejo and as far north as Diamond Bar. Most of the Night Stalker's attacks, nineteen in all, over a fifteen-month span, took place in lovely upscale communities. Yet here were these girls and women wanting to have sex with him, do his bidding, fellate him, be sodomized by him, make themselves his willing, malleable sex toys. Richard was being tried, it had been written about extensively, for not only vaginally raping female victims, but sodomizing them as well. These victims all knew that, and yet it didn't matter. What Richard had done, sodomizing all his victims, apparently had given him some kind of unique atavistic appeal. Indeed, to many of these women it was a big turn-on, 
The sodomy was more giving, more painful on their part. If that was what he wanted, demanded, they were collectively willing to pull down their drawers, bend over, and say please as they willingly spread themselves for him. During the actual trial, females filled up whole rows in the courthouse, pressing close together, preening and strutting in front of him, his very own harem. They became known as the Ramirez Groupies, so dubbed by the unbelieving, wide-eyed press. Doreen Leoy called all of these ladies, her competitors back then, Pop-Tarts, which on face value seemed uncannily accurate. As I mentioned, I did interview many of these women while researching the book, and I initially learned firsthand what was on these ladies' minds. One told me, I'd get, you know, so wet when I wanted to see him. The fact that he was so dangerous, so close, yet couldn't harm me, caused me to have, to have spontaneous orgasms. When the Night Stalker was released, however, I began hearing via email, phone calls, and letters sent to my publisher from scores of women from all around the world. Because of my book, I wound up appearing in twenty hour-long documentaries on the Night Stalker case. These programs were, and still are, repeatedly aired all over the world, and thus Richard's infamy and unique appeal to women spread far and wide around the globe. Also, women who lived in Los Angeles during the Stalker's unprecedented reign of terror contacted me and admitted to me that they used to fantasize and masturbate that the stalker would come in their windows and rape them. Rape, for a whole host of reasons, is a fantasy reality that apparently many women secretly covet. Perhaps it is because all guilt is removed in forced sex. Perhaps it is because of strange childhood traumas associated with sex. Perhaps it is some kind of built-in mechanism that some women use to protect themselves from ever becoming a victim. One cannot be the victim of a sex attack if, in fact, the attack is craved in some strange, unexplainable way. To some degree, in any society filled with stringent rules and regulations about sex, the repression of spontaneous, natural sexual desires and inclinations, rape can become a source of erotic stimuli, not a criminal act, as indeed it is. I'm sure that many of these women didn't actually want to be raped by Ramirez, it was only a fantasy, a hidden sexual dynamic that played out in the secret recesses of their confused minds, whether they wanted it to or not. I received emails from Russia, England, Israel, Malta, Norway, Denmark, Finland, Italy, Germany, Japan, Paris, Holland, and from all over the United States, especially Los Angeles. Here were women begging for his address, asking how to visit him, wanting to know what he was really like. Even I, who had already interviewed many of these women, was taken aback and somewhat aghast by how many females found Richard so utterly irresistible. Truthfully, at first they were a bit annoying. Here are a few queries, verbatim. Oh my God, is he still alive? Please tell me he is. The devil is responsible, not Richard. Can you please, please tell me how to write Mr. Ramirez? Thank you for scaring the pants off me. I can't sleep with the windows open any more. Can you please, please tell me how to contact Richard? Hi, I'm a psych student doing a paper on the Night Stalker. Can you tell me how to reach Richard? I received over one hundred of these. I'm a filmmaker. I want to do a film on Richard, all these groupies of his. Please, sir, can you tell me how to visit him? After a while I realized there was a little-known, little-understood phenomenon going on, and I determined to study it and find out what the hell was happening here. I began interviewing many of these females. Here is some of what I found out, a mere slice of this bizarre element in the mind-numbing, violent complexity of the Night Stalker case. Julie Julie is twenty-one years old, two years out of high school. She has thick black hair, large, dark, walnut-sized eyes. She lives in Paris, France. She is so taken by Richard she changed her last name to Ramirez. She never has been in trouble with the law and is not overtly promiscuous. She is madly in love with Richard, however, and often fantasizes about having rough sex with him in a car. Julie was brought up by her grandmother. Her mother was a prostitute. As a child, Julie saw her mother turn tricks. As a child, Julie watched porn movies that her mother left around the house. This occurred before Julie went to live with her grandmama. When twelve, Julie was taken for a ride in a car by an older man who orally raped her. He nearly made her choke when he orgasmed, forcing semen to come out of her nostrils. 
This is what Julie told me. I first heard about Richard on TV. I right away loved him so. He is so beautiful. I bought your book and read about him and loved him even more. I began to write him. He wrote me back. He is so nice, so sweet. My fantasy about Richard is to make the love to him in a car, like he did with the prostitutes in your book. I want him to, you know, fuck me in the ass. He likes that, I know. I want to please him. For me, this is more powerful, more intimate than in the pussy. I love Richard so much, I would do anything for him. Anything. Carol Carol actually lived in Monterey Park while the Night Stalker crimes were taking place. There were five stalker attacks in Monterey Park. She was a single child in a loveless marriage of convenience. Carol is married now, not happily, with two children. She is thirty-four and looks like the actress Jennifer Connelly, a beautiful mind. She works as a computer programmer. She told me she was fourteen when the crimes were happening, that they were all over the news. She said, everyone was always talking about them. Many of them occurred just near where we lived. I mean, blocks away. For the life of me, I don't know why, but I began fantasizing. He, I mean, the stalker, would come in my room and rape me. Sick, I know. I'm, this is kind of hard for me to talk about, but it's the truth. I was, in fact, raped by my mother's boyfriend. I told my mother. She didn't believe me. I used to keep my window open and hoped he'd come in. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, I was trying to get back at my mother for, you know, allowing me to get raped, then not believing me. In any event, I used to think about that. Then, when Richard was arrested, I really started having heavy sexual thoughts about him. He was, well, he was so cute and so bad at the same time. His badness drew me to him even more, you could say. You know, I was too young to go visit him then, but I did write him letters, love letters. Then I, well, I grew out of it, you could say. Now I want to go see him. I know he's married, but this is between me and him. Victoria. Victoria is Danish. As of this writing, she is twenty-two years old. She first became aware of Richard when she saw an HBO special about him and women who were drawn to him. She was sixteen then. She thought Richard very handsome, loved his big lips and high cheekbones. She then read my book and contacted me. Oh, my God, she told me, is Richard still alive? Please tell me he is. I'm madly in love with him. We all are. There was a chat room here in Denmark devoted to Richard, and there were hundreds of girls on it, and we all talk. I want to marry Richard. I know he married Doreen, but she is only a convenience. She looks like his mother. She is ugly. I think he sees her like his mother. What do you think? He doesn't really love her. I write him letters five or six times a week. My greatest dream is to go to America and see him. I will, some day. If I could, I would like to make him breakfast and serve it to him in bed. Would they allow that? I'm saving myself for him. I know he likes virgins. He said I could come to see him. I'm going to go. That will drive all the others crazy with jealousy. Though I very much wanted to tell Victoria to get a life, I wished her luck. She'd need it. Angelina Angelina is Italian and lives in Milan. She is a tall, lanky runway model with never-ending legs and well-formed, chiseled high cheekbones. She told me, Richard is the most beautiful man I ever saw. Those cheekbones and lips, my God, he is like a Latin god, like an Inca prince. Don't you think? I read your book after I saw the story on, I think it was the Court TV channel. I love the photographs of him as a child. My God, was he cute. I would love to make love to him. When I am with boyfriends, I close my eyes and make believe it is him, Richard, inside me. I write him and send him photos of myself, naked. He loves them. It excites me so very much that he looks at them and masturbates. I sometimes send him a little money. Not so much, but he likes that. I send him books and magazines, too. Naked women magazines. He told me he likes Asian women, so I sent him some of those. I want to go see him, but he tells me not to come because of Doreen. A man like him should not be married. No one woman could ever satisfy him. I'm waiting for permission from him to go see him. To hell with Doreen, you know? Monique Monique first contacted me when she was seventeen. She lives in Hyde Park, England. She was very troubled and seeking explanations and assurances she wasn't insane, none of which I could give her. She is Chinese, polite, and quite attractive, with long, silky black hair, a heart-shaped face, big kissy lips. 
I think, she said, I need a psychiatrist. What do you think? I know everything Richard did. I've read your book many times over. I know whole pages by heart. It is the best book I ever read. I know he is very dangerous, like a wild animal, that he enjoyed raping and beating Asian women, yet I am so drawn to him, like a moth to a flame. It's like a sick obsession. I want him to tie me up and rape me. Sometimes I tie myself to my bed and fantasize he did it. I use different objects, all so big they hurt, like he would, and I have intercourse with myself, thinking it's him. I close my eyes and it is so real, so bloody real, I can smell him. He smells just like you wrote, wet leather with an animal-like odor. He is like an animal, a wild, dangerous animal. That's what I like, his danger. Well, I can't honestly say I like it. I'm just uncontrollably drawn to it. To him. If my parents found out about any of this, they'd disown me, I know. I once told my sister I thought he was cute. She told me I'm sick. Do you think I am? I sometimes think I am. It all is like some kind of fever inside me. I can't get rid of it. I want to. I can't. Please, can you tell me if it's okay if I write him, or is it sick? I'm not one of his groupies at all. I'm... I just have this fever. If my parents knew, they'd lock me up. Do you think I should be locked up? Sometimes I think I should. Should I write him? That's sick, don't you think? Do as your heart tells you, I told her. Definitely see a shrink, I thought. Luda. Luda lives in Moscow. She has a very white, cream-like skin, wears much makeup, is a bit overweight, but she's attractive in a dark, sultry way. She is a professional dominatrix. She abuses men for money. She likes her work a lot. She always wears erotic leather outfits that reveal her breasts and genitals. She has a golden ring through her clitoris. I have seen photographs of her naked. Like thousands of women, she has sent Richard nude photographs of herself. A while back, Richard wrote me and told me he had so many photographs of naked women, he couldn't fit them all in his cell. He asked me if I'd hold a few for him. I said yes. He sent me a thick, big manila envelope brimming with photographs of women and girls. Many of them were naked quite a few beaver shots. Luda's photo was among them. Since the recent conviction of Scott Peterson and the women who wrote to him subsequently, the media has newfound interest in this little-known bizarre phenomenon, women drawn to killers, the infamous. Compared to Richard Ramirez, however, Peterson is like an innocent, wide-eyed altar boy lost in the woods. According to Vinell Crittenden, the public relations liaison at San Quentin, no ten inmates put together ever got more mail from females than Richard. He gets hundreds, boxes filled with mail every week, he recently explained. It is my dream to have sex with Richard, Luda told me in heavily accented English. He is gorgeous. He is the ultimate man. I would love for him to dominate me. I want to be his slave, his sex slave. I swear I'd do anything for him, anything. I mean it. I don't care for normal sex at all. It's boring. All these men come to me and pay me all this money to abuse them. They are a joke. Men are a joke. But Richard, he is my god. Tamara Tamara is built like Jessica Rabbit. She lives in Sherman Oaks, Los Angeles. She is an avowed vampire. She sleeps in a coffin, has had her canines filed into points, is erotically aroused by the sight and taste and smell of blood. She works as a secretary for the city of Los Angeles. She covers her canines with caps. Tamara is in her mid-thirties today. When I first spoke to her, she was twenty-four. She has an altar in her bedroom devoted to Richard. It contains many photos of him, statues, burning candles, different crystals, quartz, and amethyst. One of the quartz crystals is in a penis shape. Tamara uses it to masturbate. She explained, My greatest fantasy is to have sex with Richard in a cemetery at night, on a black tombstone with only the light of the moon. I want him to fuck me with blood on his penis. I mean, I want our sex to be lubricated with the blood of one of his victims. And you know what? I'm not ashamed of that at all. I know you think I'm nuts, but I'm not. I'm just honest. That's what I love about Richard. He never judges me, doesn't think I'm out of touch at all. He is one of the few people, perhaps the only person who understands me, who can understand people like me. There are a lot more people, women, who would love to do what I just said wild, crazy things. I know a woman who wants to be murdered by Richard as he fucks her. For her, that would be nirvana, the ultimate. Who? 
Tell me who has the right to judge anyone about what they like sexually. No government, no church, nobody has the right to police your passions. If it was wrong, against God or nature, I wouldn't feel it. I wouldn't think this way. Just the fact that I have these desires and needs makes them right. I mean, I don't want to force myself on anyone, force anyone to do something they don't want, involve children in any way. Consenting adults should be able to do whatever they please. Period. End of story. The church, isn't that a joke? Them telling people what is right or wrong when it is filled with child rapists. Hypocrisy. Talk about hypocrisy. As of this writing, in 2005, Richard is still housed in San Quentin E. Block, death row. It is now sixteen years since he was sentenced to death nineteen times by Judge Michael Tynan. The average stay on death row across the country is thirteen years. To some degree, Richard has become used to incarceration. He has books, a TV, and a radio in his six-by-eight cell. He gets hundreds of pieces of mail a week from all around the world, mostly from females. He has a lot of correspondence to keep him busy. There has been much talk across the country about abolishing the death sentence, which very well could come to pass. If that does happen, Richard would be spared the lethal injection San Quentin now uses on the condemned. As of this writing, there are 667 men waiting to die at San Quentin's death row. Richard is one of the most infamous of all the condemned, a kind of homicide superstar, the Mick Jagger of murder. Richard's attorneys are planning to appeal his conviction— his appeals attorney, Jerry Russell, says there are numerous legal points she plans to perfect and argue, foremost of which is incompetent counsel. When recently asked when she will have the appeal ready to be argued, she said, Well, truth is, it is a voluminous record, and I won't have the appeal ready for quite some time. The truth is, she told me off the record, there is no hurry to argue Richard's appeal, for the longer she takes, the longer Richard will live. He might very well live to a ripe old age and die in prison of natural causes. Then again, San Quentin's death row is a very dangerous place, and there is no telling when sudden violence can occur, and Richard could end up dead. Meanwhile, Richard Ramirez, a.k.a. the Night Stalker, reads his fan mail, enjoys all the photographs of naked women sent to him, and dreams about being free so he can do all the grisly, ghastly things he did to get put on death row in the first place. Philip Carlo, Montauk, New York. This concludes The Night Stalker by Philip Carlo. Narrated by Tom Zingarelli. Copyright 1996 by Philip Carlo. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Kensington Publishing Corporation and was produced in the year 2016 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers.